The Adventures of Peregrine Pickle, Tobias Smollett, Chapter 46. By the fidelity of Pipes, Jolter is informed of his pupil's fate confers with the physician applies to the ambassador, who, with great difficulty, obtains the discharge of the prisoners on certain conditions. This plan he executed, notwithstanding the pain of his wound, and the questions of the city guard, both horse and foot, to which he could make no other answer than anglais, anglais, and as soon as it was light, taking an accurate survey of the castle, for such it seemed to be, into which Peregrine and Pallet had been conveyed, together with its situation in respect to the river, he went home to the lodgings, and, waking Mr. Jolter, gave him an account of the adventure. The governor wrung his hands in the utmost grief and consternation when he heard this unfortunate piece of news, he did not doubt that his pupil was imprisoned in the Bastille for life, and, in the anguish of his apprehension, cursed the day on which he had undertaken to superintend the conduct of such an imprudent young man, who had, by reiterated insults, provoked the vengeance of such a mild, forbearing administration. That he might not, however, neglect any means in his power to extricate him from his present misfortune, he dispatched Thomas to the doctor, with an account of his companion's fate, that they might join their interest in behalf of the captives, and the physician, being informed of what had happened, immediately dressed himself, and repaired to Jolter, whom he accosted in these words colon. Now, sir, I hope you are convinced of your error in asserting that oppression can never be the effect of arbitrary power. Such a calamity as this could never have happened under the Athenian democracy, nay, even when the tyrant Pisistratus got possession of that commonwealth, he durst not venture to rule with such absolute and unjust dominion. You shall see now that Mr. Pickle and my friend Pallet will fall a sacrifice to the tyranny of lawless power, and, in my opinion, we shall be accessory to the ruin of this poor enslaved people if we bestir ourselves in demanding or imploring the release of our unhappy countrymen, as we may thereby prevent the commission of a flagrant crime, which would fill up the vengeance of heaven against the perpetrators, and perhaps be the means of restoring the whole nation to the unspeakable fruition of freedom. For my own part, I should rejoice to see the blood of my father spilt in such a glorious cause, provided such a victim will furnish me with the opportunity of dissolving the chains of slavery, and vindicating that liberty which is the birthright of man. Then would my name be immortalized among the patriot heroes of antiquity, and my memory, like that of Harmodius and Aristogiton, be honored by statues erected at the public expense. This rhapsody, which was delivered with great emphasis and agitation, gave so much offense to Jolter, that, without saying one word, he retired in great wrath to his own chamber, and the Republican returned to his lodging, in full hope of his prognostic being verified in the death and destruction of Peregrine and the painter, which must give rise to some renowned revolution, wherein he himself would act a principal part. But the governor whose imagination was not quite so warm and prolific, went directly to the ambassador, whom he informed of his pupil's situation, and besought to interpose with the French ministry, that he and the other British subject might obtain their liberty. His Excellency asked, if Jolter could guess at the cause of his imprisonment, that he might be the better prepared to vindicate or excuse his conduct, but neither he nor Pipes could give the smallest hint of intelligence on that subject, though he furnished himself from Tom's own mouth with a circumstantial account of the manner in which his master had been arrested, as well as of his own behavior, and the disaster he had received on that occasion. His lordship never doubted that Pickle had brought this calamity upon himself by some unlucky prank he had played at the masquerade when he understood that the young gentleman had drunk freely in the afternoon, and been so whimsical as to go thither with a man in woman's apparel, and he that same day waited on the French minister, in full confidence of obtaining his discharge, but met with more difficulty than he expected, the court of France being extremely punctilious in everything that concerns a prince of the blood. The ambassador was therefore obliged to talk in very high terms, and, though the present circumstances of the French politics would not allow them to fall out with the British administration for trifles, all the favor he could procure was to promise that Pickle should ill set at liberty, provided he would ask pardon of the prince to whom he bad given offense. His Excellency thought this was but a reasonable condescension, supposing Peregrine to have been in the wrong, and Jolter was admitted to him in order to communicate and reinforce his lordship's advice, which was, that he comply with the terms proposed. The governor, who did not enter this gloomy fortress without fear and trembling, found his pupil in a dismal apartment, void of all furniture but a stool and a truckle bed. The moment he was admitted, he perceived the youth whistling with great unconcern, and working with his pencil at the bare wall, on which he had delineated a ludicrous figure labelled with the name of the nobleman, whom he had affronted, and an English mastiff with his leg lifted up, in the attitude of making water in his shoe. He had been even so presumptuous as to explain the device with satirical inscriptions in the French language, 
which, when Jolter perused, his hair stood on end with affright. The very turnkey was confounded and overawed by the boldness of his behavior, which he had never seen matched by any inhabitant of that place, and actually joined his friend in persuading him to submit to the easy demand of the minister. But our hero, far from embracing the counsel of this advocate, handed him to the door with great ceremony, and dismissed him with a kick on the breeches, and, to all the supplications, and even tears of Jolter, made no other reply than that he would stoop to no condescension, because he had committed no crime, but would leave his case to the cognizance and exertion of the British court, whose duty it was to see justice done to its own subjects, he desired, however, that Pallet, who was confined in another place, might avail himself of his own disposition, which was sufficiently pliable, but when the governor desired to see his fellow prisoner, the turnkey gave him to understand that he had received no orders relating to the lady, and therefore could not admit him into her apartment, though he was complacent enough to tell him that she seemed very much mortified at her confinement, and at certain times behaved as if her brain was not a little disordered. Jolter, thus baffled in all his endeavors, quitted the Bastille with a heavy heart, and reported his fruitless negotiation to the ambassador, who could not help breaking forth into some acrimonious expressions against the obstinacy and insolence of the young man, who, he said, deserved to suffer for his folly. Nevertheless, he did not desist from his representations to the French ministry, which he found so unyielding, that he was obliged to threaten, in plain terms, to make it a national concern, and not only wrote to his court for instructions, but even advised the council to make reprisals, and send some French gentlemen in London to the Tower. This intimation had an effect upon the ministry at Versailles, who, rather than run the risk of incensing a people whom it was neither their interest nor inclination to disoblige, consented to discharge the offenders, on condition that they should leave Paris in three days after their enlargement. This proposal was readily agreed to by Peregrine, who was now a little more tractable, and heartily tired of being cooped up in such an uncomfortable abode, for the space of three long days, without any sort of communication or entertainment but that which his own imagination suggested. Chapter 47. Peregrine makes himself merry at the expense of the painter, who curses his landlady, and breaks with the doctor. As he could easily conceive the situation of his companion in adversity, he was unwilling to leave the place until he had reaped some diversion from his distress, and with that view repaired to the dungeon of the afflicted painter, to which he had by this time free access. When he entered, the first object that presented itself to his eye was so uncommonly ridiculous, that he could scarce preserve that gravity of countenance which he had affected in order to execute the joke he had planned. The forlorn pallet sat upright in his bed in a dishabille that was altogether extraordinary. He had laid aside his monstrous hoop, together with his stays, gown, and petticoat, wrapped his lappets about his head by way of nightcap, and wore his domino as a loose morning dress. His grizzled locks hung down about his lacklustre eyes and tawny neck, in all the disorder of negligence, his grey beard bristled about half an inch through the remains of the paint with which his visage had been bedaubed, and every feature of his face was lengthened to the most ridiculous expression of grief and dismay. Seeing Peregrine come in, he started up in a sort of frantic ecstasy, and, running towards him with open arms, no sooner perceived the woeful appearance into which our hero had modelled his physiognomy, than he stopped short all of a sudden, and the joy which had begun to take possession of his heart was in a moment dispelled by the most rueful presages so that he stood in a most ludicrous posture of dejection, like a malefactor at the Old Bailey, when sentence is about to be pronounced. Pickle, taking him by the hand, heaved a profound sigh, and after having protested that he was extremely mortified at being pitched upon as the messenger of bad news, told him, with an air of sympathy and infinite concern, that the French court, having discovered his sex, had resolved, in consideration of the outrageous indignity he offered in public to a prince of the blood, to detain him in the Bastille a prisoner for life, and that this sentence was a mitigation obtained by the importunities of the British an ambassador, the punishment ordained by law being no other than breaking alive upon the wheel. These tidings aggravated the horrors of the painter to such a degree that he roared aloud, and skipped about the room in all the extravagance of distraction, taking God and man to witness, that he would rather suffer immediate death than endure one year's imprisonment in such a hideous place, and cursing the hour of his birth and the moment on which he departed from his own country. For my own part, said his tormentor, in a hypocritical tone, I was obliged to swallow the bitter pill of making submission to the prince, who, as I had not presumed to strike him, received acknowledgments, in consequence of which I shall be this day set at liberty, and there is even one expedient left for the recovery of your freedom it is, I own, a disagreeable remedy, but one had better undergo a little mortification than be forever wretched. Besides, 
Upon second thoughts, I begin to imagine that you will not for such a trifle sacrifice yourself to the unceasing horrors of a dungeon, especially as your condescension will in all probability be attended with advantages which you could not otherwise enjoy. Pallet, interrupting him with great eagerness, begged for the love of God that he would no longer keep him in the torture of suspense, but mentioned that same remedy, which he was resolved to follow, let it be ever so unpalatable. Peregrine, having thus played upon his passions of fear and hope, answered, that as the offence was committed in the habit of a woman, which was a disguise unworthy of the other sex, the French court was of opinion that the delinquent should be reduced to the neuter gender, so that there was no alternative at his own option, by which he had it in his power to regain immediate freedom. What? cried the painter, in despair, become a singer? Gadzux! And the devil and all that! I'll rather be still where I am, and let myself be devoured by vermin. Then thrusting out his throat here is my windpipe, said he, be so good my dear friend, as to give it a slice or two, if you don't, I shall one of these days be found dangling in my garters. What an unfortunate rascal I am! What a blockhead, and a beast, and a fool, was I to trust myself among such a barbarous ruffian race! Lord forgive you, Mr. Pickle, for having been the immediate cause of my disaster. If you had stood by me from the beginning, according to your promise, I should not have been teased by that coxcomb who has brought me to this pass. And why did I put on this deedy unlucky dress? Lord curse that chattering Jezebel of a landlady, who advised such a preposterous disguise exclamation mark a disguise which has not only brought me to this pass, but also rendered me abominable to myself, and frightful to others, for when I this morning signified to the turnkey that I wanted to be shaved, he looked at my beard with astonishment, and, crossing himself, muttered his paternoster, believing me, I suppose, to be a witch, or something worse. And heaven confound the loathsome banquet of the ancients, which provoked me to drink too freely, that I might wash away the taste of that accursed silly kikabi. Our young gentleman, having heard this lamentation to an end, excused himself for his conduct by representing that he could not possibly foresee the disagreeable consequences that attended it, and in the meantime strenuously counselled him to submit to the terms of his enlargement. He observed that he was now arrived at that time of life when the lusts of the flesh should be entirely mortified within him, and his greatest concern ought to be the of his soul to which nothing could more effectually contribute than the amputation which was proposed, that his body, as well as his mind, would profit by the change, because he would have no dangerous appetite to gratify, and no carnal thoughts to divert him from the duties of his profession, and his voice, which was naturally sweet, would improve to such a degree, that he would captivate the ears of all the people of fashion and taste, and in a little time be celebrated under the appellation of the English Senazino. These arguments did not fail to make impression upon the painter, who nevertheless started two objections to his compliance, namely, the disgrace of the punishment, and the dread of his wife. Pickle undertook to obviate these difficulties, by assuring him that the sentence would be executed so privately as never to transpire, and that his wife could not be so unconscionable, after so many years of cohabitation, as to take exceptions to an expedient by which she would not only enjoy the conversation of her husband, but even the fruits of those talents which the knife would so remarkably refine. Pallet shook his hand at this last remonstrance, as if he thought it would not be altogether convincing to his spouse, but yielded to the proposal, provided her consent could be obtained. Just as he signified this condescension, the jailer entered, and addressing himself to the supposed lady, expressed his satisfaction in having the honour to tell her that she was no longer a prisoner. As the painter did not understand one word of what he said, Peregrine undertook the office of interpreter and made his friend believe the jailer's speech was no other than an intimation that the ministry had sent a surgeon to execute what was proposed, and that the instruments and dressings were prepared in the next room. Alarmed and terrified at this sudden appointment, he flew to the other end of the room, and, snatching up an earthen chamber pot, which was the only offensive weapon in the place, put himself in a posture of defence, and with many oaths threatened to try the temper of the barber's skull, if he should presume to set his nose within the apartment. The jailer, who little expected such a reception, concluded that the poor gentlewoman had actually lost her wits, and retreated with precipitation, leaving the door open as he went out, upon which Pickle, gathering up the particulars of his dress with great dispatch, crammed them into Pallet's arms, and taking notice that now the coast was clear, exhorted him to follow his footsteps to the gate, where a hackney coach stood for his reception. There being no time for hesitation, the painter took his advice, and, without quitting the utensil, which in his hurry he forgot to lay down, sallied out in the rear of our hero, with all the wildness of terror and impatience which may be reasonably supposed to take possession of a man who flies from perpetual imprisonment. 
Such was the tumult of his agitation, that his faculty of thinking was for the present utterly overwhelmed, and he saw no object but his conductor, whom he followed by a sort of instinctive impulse, without regarding the keepers and sentinels, who, as he passed with his clothes under one arm, and his chamber pot brandished above his head, were confounded, and even dismayed, at the strange apparition. During the whole course of this eruption, he ceased not to cry, with great vociferation, drive, coachman, drive, in the name of God. And the carriage had proceeded the length of a whole street before he manifested the least sign of reflection, but stared like the gorgon's head, with his mouth wide open, and each particular hair crawling and twining like an animated serpent. At length, however, he began to recover the use of his senses, and asked if Peregrine thought him now out of all danger of being retaken. This unrelenting wag, not yet satisfied with the affliction he imposed upon the sufferer, answered, with an air of doubt and concern, that he hoped they would not be overtaken, and prayed to God they might not be retarded by a stop of carriages. Pallet fervently joined in this supplication, and they advanced a few yards farther, when the noise of a coach at full speed behind them invaded their ears, and Pickle, having looked out of the window, withdrew his head in seeming confusion, and exclaimed, Lord have mercy upon us. I wish that may not be a guard sent after us. Methinks I saw the muscle of a fusil sticking out of the coach. The painter, hearing these tidings, that instant thrust himself half out at the window, with his helmet still in his hand, bellowing to the coachman, as loud as he could roar, Drive, d ye, dive to the gates of Jericho and the ends of the earth. Drive, you ragamuffin, you rascalian, you hellhound. Drive us to the pit of hell, rather than we should be taken. Such a phantom could not pass without attracting the curiosity of the people, who ran to their doors and windows, in order to behold this object of admiration. With the same view, that coach, which was supposed to be in pursuit of him, stopped just as the windows of each happened to be opposite, and Pallet, looking behind, and seeing three men standing upon the footboard armed with canes, which his fear converted into fusils, never doubted that his friend's suspicion was just, but, shaking his Jordan at the imaginary guard, swore he would sooner die than part with his precious ware. The owner of the coach, who was a nobleman of the first quality, mistook him for some unhappy woman deprived of her senses, and, ordering his coachman to proceed, convinced the fugitive, to his infinite joy, that this was no more than a false alarm. He was not, for all that, freed from anxiety and trepidation, but our young gentleman, fearing his brain would not bear a repetition of the same joke, permitted him to gain his own lodgings without further molestation. His landlady, meeting him on the stair, was so affected at his appearance, that she screamed aloud, and betook herself to flight, while he, cursing her with great bitterness, rushed into the apartment to the doctor, who, instead of receiving him with cordial embraces, and congratulating him upon his deliverance, gave evident signs of umbrage and discontent, and even plainly told him. He hoped to have heard that he and Mr. Pickle had acted the glorious part of Cato, an event which would have laid the foundation of such noble struggles, as could not fail to end in happiness and freedom, and that he had already made some progress in a node that would have immortalized their names, and inspired the flame of liberty in every honest breast. There, said he, I would have proved, that great talents, and high sentiments of liberty, do reciprocally produce and assist each other, and illustrated my assertions with such notes and quotations from the Greek writers, as would have opened the eyes of the most blind and unthinking, and touched the most callous and obdurate heart. O oh, fool! To think the man, whose ample mind must grasp whatever yonder stars survey pray, Mr. Pellet, what is your opinion of that image of the minds grasping the whole universe? For my own part, I can't help thinking it the most happy conception that ever entered my imagination. The painter, who was not such a flaming enthusiast in the cause of liberty, could not brook the doctor's reflections, which he thought savoured a little too much of indifference and deficiency in point of private friendship, and therefore seized the present opportunity of mortifying his pride, by observing, that the image was, without all doubt, very grand and magnificent, but that he had been obliged for the idea to Mr. Bayes in the rehearsal, who values himself upon the same figure, conveyed in these words. But all these clouds, when by the eye of reason grasped, etc. upon any other occasion, the painter would have triumphed greatly upon this detection, but such was the flutter and confusion of his spirits, under the apprehension of being retaken, that, without further communication, he retreated to his own room, in order to resume his own dress, which he hoped would alter his appearance in such a manner as to baffle all search and examination, while the physician remained ashamed and abashed, to find himself convinced of bombast by a person of such contemptible talents. He was offended at this proof of his memory, 
and so much enraged at his presumption in exhibiting it, that he could never forgive his want of reverence, and took every opportunity of exposing his ignorance and folly in the sequel. Indeed, the ties of private affection were too weak to engage the heart of this Republican, whose zeal for the community had entirely swallowed up his concern for individuals. He looked upon particular friendship as a passion unworthy of his ample soul, and was a professed admirer of Al. Manlius, Junius Brutus, and those later patriots of the same name, who shut their ears against the cries of nature, and resisted all the dictates of gratitude and humanity. Chapter 48 Pallet conceives a hearty contempt for his fellow traveller, and attaches himself to Pickle, who, nevertheless, persecutes him with his mischievous talent upon the road to Flanders. In the meantime, his companion, having employed divers pailfuls of water in cleansing himself from the squalor of jail, submitted his face to the barber, tinged his eyebrows with a sable hue, and, being dressed in his own clothes, ventured to visit Peregrine, who was still under the hands of his valet de chamber, and who gave him to understand that his escape had been connived at, and that the condition of their deliverance was their departure from Paris in three days. The painter was transported with joy, when he learned that he ran no risk of being retaken, and, far from repining at the terms of his enlargement, would have willingly set out on his return to England that same afternoon, for the Bastille had made such an impression upon him, that he started at the sound of every coach, and turned pale at the sight of a French soldier. In the fullness of his heart, he complained of the doctor's indifference, and related what had passed at their meeting with evident marks of resentment and disrespect, which were not at all diminished, when Jolter informed him of the physician's behaviour when he sent for him, to confer about the means of abridging their confinement. Pickle himself was incensed at his want of bowels, and, perceiving how much he had sank in the opinion of his fellow traveller, resolved to encourage these sentiments of disgust, and occasionally ferment the division to a downright quarrel, which he foresaw would produce some diversion and perhaps expose the poet's character in such a light, as would effectually punish him for his arrogance and barbarity. With this view, he levelled several satirical jokes at the doctor's pedantry and want of taste, which had appeared so conspicuous in the quotation he had got by heart, from ancient authors, in his affected disdain of the best pictures of the world, which, had he been endowed with the least share of discernment, he could not have beheld with such insensibility, and, lastly, in his ridiculous banquet, which numbered an egregious coxcomb, devoid of all elegance and sense, would have prepared, or presented to rational beings. In a word, our young gentleman played the artillery of his wit against him with such success, that the painter seemed to wake from a dream, and went home with the most hearty contempt for the person he had formerly adored. Instead of using the privilege of a friend, to enter his apartment without ceremony, he sent in his servant with a message, importing, that he intended to set out from Paris the next day, in company with Mr. Pickle, and desiring to know whether or not he was, or would be, prepared for the journey. The doctor, struck with the manner as well as the matter of this intimation, went immediately to Pallet's room and demanded to know the cause of such a sudden determination without his privity or concurrence, and when he understood the necessity of their affairs, rather than travel by himself, he ordered his baggage to be packed up, and signified his readiness to conform to the emergency of the case, though he was not at all pleased with the cavalier behaviour of Pallet to whom he threw out some hints on his own importance, and the immensity of his condescension in favouring him with such marks of regard. But by this time these insinuations had lost their effect upon the painter who told him, with an arch sneer, that he did not at all question his learning and abilities, and particularly his skill in cookery, which he should never forget while his palate retained its function, but nevertheless advised him, for the sake of the degenerate eaters of these days, to spare a little of his salamoniac in the next silicicabee he should prepare, and abate somewhat of the devil's dung, which he had so plentifully crammed into the roasted fowls, unless he had a mind to convert his guests into patience, with a view of licking himself whole for the expense of the entertainment. The physician, nettled at these sarcasms, eyed him with a look of indignation and disdain, and, being, unwilling to express himself in English, lest, in the course of the altercation, Pallet should be so much irritated as to depart without him, he vented his anger in Greek. The painter, though by the sound he supposed this quotation to be Greek, complimented his friend upon his knowledge in the Welsh language, and found means to rally him quite out of temper, so that he retired to his own chamber in the utmost wrath and mortification, and left his antagonist exulting over the victory he had won. While these things passed between these originals, Peregrine waited upon the ambassador, whom he thanked for his kind interposition, acknowledging the indiscretion of his own conduct with such appearance of conviction and promises of reformation that His Excellency freely forgave him for all the trouble he had been put in on his account, 
fortified him with sensible advices and, assuring him of his continual favor and friendship, gave him at parting, letters of introduction to several persons of quality belonging to the British court. Thus distinguished, our young gentleman took leave of all his French acquaintance, and spent the evening with some of those who had enjoyed the greatest share of his intimacy and confidence, while Jolter superintended his domestic concerns, and with infinite joy bespoke a post chaise and horse, in order to convey him from a place where he lived in continual apprehension of suffering by the dangerous disposition of his pupil. Everything being adjusted according to their plan, they and their fellow travellers next day dined together, and about four in the afternoon took their departure in two chaises, escorted by the valet de chamber, pipes, and the doctor's lackey on horseback, well furnished with arms and ammunition, in case of being attacked by robbers on the road. It was about eleven o'clock at night when they arrived at Senlis, which was the place at which they proposed to lodge, and where they were obliged to knock up the people of the inn, before they could have their supper prepared. All the provision in the house was but barely sufficient to furnish one indifferent meal, however, the painter consoled himself for the quantity with the quality of the dishes, one of which was a fricassee of rabbit, a preparation that he valued above all the dainties that ever smoked upon the table of the sumptuous Heliogabalus. He had no sooner expressed himself to this effect, than our hero, who almost incessantly laying traps for diversion at his neighbor's expense, laid hold on the declaration, and, recollecting the story of Scipio and Amulet here in Gilblas, resolved to perpetrate a joke upon the stomach of Pallet, which seemed well disposed to a hearty supper. He, accordingly, digested his plan, and the company being seated at table, affected to stare with peculiar eagerness at the painter, who had helped himself to a large portion of the fricassee, and began to swallow it with infinite relish. Pallet, notwithstanding the keenness of his appetite, could not help taking notice of Pickle's demeanour, and, making a short pause in the exercise of his grinders, you are surprised, said he, to see me make so much dispatch, but I was extremely hungry, and this is one of the best fricassees I ever tasted, the French are very expert in these dishes, that I must allow, and, upon my conscience, I would never desire to eat a more delicate rabbit than this that lies upon my plate. Peregrine made no other reply to this encomium, than the repetition of the word rabbit, with a note of admiration, and such a significant shake of the head, as effectually alarmed the other, who instantly suspended the action of his jaws, and, with the morsel half chewed in his mouth, stared round him with a certain stolidity of apprehension, which is easier conceived than described, until his eyes encountered the countenance of Thomas Pipes, who, being instructed, and posted opposite to him for the occasion, exhibited an arch grin, that completed the painter's disorder. Afraid of swallowing his mouthful, and ashamed to dispose of it any other way, he sat some time in a most distressed state of suspense, and being questioned by Mr. Jolter touching his calamity, made a violent effort of the muscles of his gullet, which with difficulty performed their office, and then, with great confusion and concern, asked if Mr. Pickle suspected the rabbit's identity. The young gentleman, assuming a mysterious air, pretended ignorance of the matter, observing that he was apartment to suspect all dishes of that kind, since he had been informed of the tricks which were commonly played at inns in France, Italy, and Spain, and recounted three passage in Gilblas, which, we have hinted it above, saying, he did not pretend to be a connoisseur in animals, but the legs of the creature which composed that dart which composed the fricassee, did not, in his opinion, resemble those of the rabbits he had usually seen. This observation had an evident effect upon the features of the painter, who, with certain signs of loathing and astonishment, exclaimed, Lord Jesus, and appealed to Pipes for the discovery of the truth by asking if he knew anything of the affair. Tom very gravely replied, he did suppose the food was wholesome enough, for he had seen the skin and feet of a special lamb cat, new flayed, hanging upon the door of a small pantry adjoining to the kitchen. Before this sentence was uttered, Pallet's belly seemed to move in contact with his backbone, his colour changed, no part but the whites of his eyes were to be seen, he dropped his lower jaw, and, fixing his hands in his sides, wretched with such convulsive agonies, as amazed and disconcerted the whole company, and what augmented his disorder, was the tenacious retention of the stomach, which absolutely refused to part with its contents, notwithstanding all the energy of his abhorrence, which threw him into a cold sweat, and almost into a swoon. Pickle, alarmed at his condition, assured him it was a genuine rabbit, and that he had tutored pipes to say otherwise for the joke's sake. But this confession he considered as a friendly artifice of Pickle's compassion, and therefore it had little effect upon his constitution. By the assistance, however, of a large bumper of brandy, his spirits were recruited, and his recollection so far recovered, that he was able to declare, with divers contortions of face, that the dish had a rankness of taste, 
which he had imparted partly to the nature of the French covey, and partly to the composition of their sources, then he inveighed against the infamous practices of French publicans, attributing such imposition to their oppressive government, which kept them so necessitous, that they were tempted to exercise all manner of knavery upon their unwary guests. Jolter, who could not find in his heart to let slip any opportunity of speaking in favour of the French, told him, that he was a very great stranger to their police, else he would know, that if, upon information to the magistrate, it should appear that any traveller, native or foreigner, had been imposed upon or ill-treated by a publican, the offender would be immediately obliged to shut up his house, and, if his behaviour had been notorious, he himself would be sent to the galleys, without the least hesitation, and as for the dish which has been made the occasion of your present disorder, said he, I will take upon me to affirm it was prepared of a genuine rabbit, which was skinned in my presence, and, in confirmation of what I assert, though such fricassees are not the favourites of my taste, I will eat a part of this without scruple. So saying, he swallowed several mouthfuls of the question coney, and Pallet seemed to eye it again with inclination, nay, he even resumed his knife and fork, and being just on the point of applying them, was seized with another qualm of apprehension, that broke out in an exclamation of, after all, Mr. Jolter, if it should be a real ramcat, Lord have mercy upon me. Here is one of the claws. With these words he presented the tip of a toe, of which Pipes had snipped off five or six from a duck that was roasted, and purposely scattered them in the fricassee, and the governor could not behold this testimonial without symptoms of uneasiness and remorse, so that he and the painter sat silenced and abashed, and made faces at each other, while the physician, who hated them both, exulted over their affliction, bidding them be of good cheer, and proceed with their meal, for he was ready to demonstrate, that the flesh of a cat was as nourishing and delicious as veal or mutton, provided they could prove that the said cat was not of the boar kind, and had fed chiefly on vegetable diet, or even confined its carnivorous appetite to rats and mice, which he affirmed to be dainties of exquisite taste and flavour. He said, it was a vulgar mistake to think that all flesh-devouring creatures were unfit to be eaten, witness the consumption of swine and ducks, animals that delight in carriage as well as fish, and prey upon each other, and feed on bait and carrion together with the demand for bear, of which the best hams in the world are made. He then observed that the negroes on the coast of Guinea, who are healthy and vigorous people, prefer cats and dogs to all other fare, and mentioned, from history several sieges, during which the inhabitants, who were blocked up, lived upon these animals, and had recourse even to human flesh, which, to his certain knowledge, was in all respects preferable to pork, for, in the course of his studies, he had, for the experiment's sake, eaten a steak cut from the buttock of a person who had been hanged. This dissertation, far from composing, increased the disquiet in the stomachs of the governor and painter, who, hearing the last illustration, turned their eyes upon the orator, at the same instant, with looks of horror and disgust, and the one muttering the term cannibal, and the other pronouncing the word abomination. They rose from table in a great hurry, and, running towards another apartment, jostled with such violence in the passage, that both were overturned by the shock which also contributed to the effect of their nausea that mutually defiled them as they lay. Chapter 49. Nor is the physician sacred from his ridiculary charis, where our adventurer engages in play with two French officers, who, next morning, give the landlord an interesting proof of their importance. The doctor remained sullen and dejected during the whole journey, not but that he attempted to recover his importance by haranguing upon the Roman highways, when Mr. Jolter desired the company to take notice of the fine pavement upon which they travelled from Paris into Flanders, but Pallet, who thought he had now gained the ascendancy over the physician, exerted himself in maintaining the superiority he had acquired, by venting various sarcasms upon his self-conceit and affectation of learning, and even tittering puns and conundrums upon the remarks which the Republican retailed. When he talked of the Flaminian Way, the painter questioned if it was a better pavement than the Flaminian Way on which they travelled, and the doctor having observed, that this road was made for the convenience of drawing the French artillery into Flanders, which was often the seat of war, his competitor in wit replied, with infinite vivacity, there are more great guns than the French king knows have drawn along this causeway, doctor. Encouraged by the success of these efforts, which tickled the imagination of Jolter, and drew smiles, as he imagined, of approbation from our hero, he sported in many other requivics of the same nature, and at dinner, told the physician, that he was like the root of the tongue, as being cursedly down in the mouth. By this time, such was the animosity subsisting between these quondam friends, that they never conversed together, except with a view of exposing each other to the ridicule or contempt of their fellow travellers. The doctor was at great pains to point out the folly and ignorance of Pallet in private to Peregrine, 
He was often conjured in the same manner by the painter, to take notice of the physician's want of manners and taste. Pickle pretended to acquiesce in the truth of their mutual severity, which, indeed, was extremely just, and, by malicious insinuations blew up their contention, with a view of bringing it to open hostility. But both seemed so averse to deeds of mortal purpose, that for a long time his arts were baffled, and he could not spirit them up to any pitch of resentment higher than scurrilous repartee. Before they reached Arras, the city gates were shut, so that they were obliged to take up their lodgings at an indifferent house in the suburbs, where they found a couple of French officers, who had also rode post from Paris so far on their way to Lyle. These gentlemen were about the age of thirty, and their deportment distinguished by such an air of insolence, as disgusted our hero, who, nevertheless, accosted them politely in the yard, and proposed that they should sup together. They thanked him for the honour of his invitation, which, however, they declined upon pretence of having ordered something for themselves, but promised to wait upon him and his company immediately after their repast. This they accordingly performed, and, after having drunk a few glasses of burgundy, one of them asked, if the young gentleman would, for pastime, take a hand at quadrille. Peregrine easily divined the meaning of this proposal, which was made with no other view than that of fleecing him and his fellow travellers, for he well knew to what shifts a subaltern in the French service is reduced, in order to maintain the appearance of a gentleman, and had reason to believe that most of them were sharpers from their youth, but, as he depended a good deal upon his own penetration and address, he gratified the stranger's desire, and a party was instantly formed of the painter, the physician, the proposer, and himself, the other officer having professed himself utterly ignorant of the game, in the course of the play, he took his station at the back of Pickle's chair, which was opposite to his friend, on pretense of amusing himself with seeing his manner of conducting the cards. The youth was not such a novice but that he perceived the design of this palpable piece of behaviour, which, notwithstanding, he overlooked for the present, with a view of flattering their hopes in the beginning, that they might be the more effectually punished by their disappointment in the end. The game was scarce begun, when, by the reflection of a glass, he discerned the officer at his back making signs to his companion, who, by preconcerted gestures, was perfectly informed of the contents of Peregrine's hand, and, of consequence, fortunate in the course of play. Thus they were allowed to enjoy the fruits of their dexterity, until their money amounted to some louis, when our young gentleman, thinking it high time to do himself justice, signified in very polite terms to the gentleman who stood behind him that he could never play with ease and deliberation when he was overlooked by any bystander, and begged that he would have the goodness to be seated. As this was a remonstrance which the stranger could not, with my show of breeding, resist, he asked pardon, and retired to the chair of the physician, who frankly told him, that it was not the fashion of his country for one to submit his hand to the perusal of a spectator, and when, in consequence of this rebuff, he wanted to quarter himself upon the painter, he was refused by a wave of the hand, and shake of the head, with an exclamation of pardon es moi, which was repeated with such emphasis, as discomposed this effrontery, and he found himself obliged to sit down in a state of mortification. The odds being thus removed, fortune proceeded in her usual channel, and though the Frenchman, deprived of his ally, endeavoured to practice divers strokes of finesse, the rest of the company observed him with such vigilance and caution, as baffled all his attempts, and in a very little time he was compelled to part with his winning, but, having engaged in the match with an intention of taking all advantages, whether fair or unfair, that his superior skill should give him over the Englishman, the money was not refunded without a thousand disputes, in the course of which he essayed to intimidate his antagonist with high words, which were retorted by our hero with such interest as convinced him that he had mistaken his man, and persuaded him to make his retreat in quiet. Indeed, it was not without cause that they repined at the bad success of their enterprise, because, in all likelihood, they had nothing to depend upon for the present but their own industry, and knew not how to defray their expenses on the road, except by some acquisition of this kind. Next morning they rose at daybreak, and resolving to anticipate their fellow lodgers, bespoke post-horses as soon as they could be admitted into the city, so that, when our company appeared, their beasts were ready in the yard, and they only waited to discuss the bill, which they had ordered to be made out. The landlord of the inn presented his cart with fear and trembling to one of those ferocious cavaliers, who no sooner cast his eye upon the sum total, than he discharged a volley of dreadful oaths, and asked if the king's officers were to be treated in that manner. The poor publican protested, with great humility, that he had the utmost respect for his majesty, and everything that belonged to him, and that, far from consulting his own interest, all that he desired was, to be barely indemnified for the expense of their lodging. This condescension seemed to have no other effect than that of encouraging their arrogance. 
They swore his extortion should be explained to the commandant of the town, who would, by making him a public example, teach other innkeepers how to behave towards men of honor, and threatened with such confidence of indignation, that the wretched landlord, dreading the consequence of their wrath, implored pardon in the most abject manner, begging, with many supplications, that he might have the pleasure of lodging them at his own charge. This was a favor which he with great difficulty obtained, they chid him severely for his imposition, exhorted him to have more regard for his own conscience, as well as to the convenience of his guests, and, cautioning him in particular touching his behavior to the gentlemen of the army, mounted their horses, and rode off in great state, leaving him very thankful for having so successfully appeased the collar of two officers, who wanted either inclination or ability to pay their bill, for experience had taught him to be apprehensive of all such travelers, who commonly lay the landlord under contribution, by way of atonement for the extravagance of his demands, even after he has professed his willingness to entertain them on their own terms. Chapter 50. Peregrine moralizes upon their behavior, which is condemned by the doctor, and defended by the governor they arrive in safety at Lyle, dine at an ordinary, visit the citadel the physician quarrels with a North Briton, who is put in arrest. These honorable adventurers being gone, Peregrine, who was present during the transaction, informed himself of the particulars from the mouth of the innkeeper himself, who took heaven and the saints to witness, that he should have been a loser by their custom, even if the bill had been paid, because he was on his guard against their objections, and had charged every article at an under price. But such was the authority of officers in France, that he durst not dispute the least circumstance of their will, for, had the case come under the cognizance of the magistrate, he must, in course, have suffered by the maxims of their government, which never fail to abet the oppression of the army, and, besides, run the risk of incurring their future resentment, which would be sufficient to ruin him from top to bottom. Our hero boiled with indignation at this instance of injustice and arbitrary power, and, turning to his governor, asked, if this too was a proof of the happiness enjoyed by the French people. Jolter replied, that every human constitution must, in some things, be imperfect and owned, that in this kingdom, gentlemen were more countenanced than the vulgar, because it was to be presumed that their own sentiments of honor and superior qualifications would entitle them to this preeminence, which had also a retrospective view to the merit of their ancestors, in consideration of which they were at first ennobled, but he affirmed, that the innkeeper had misrepresented the magistracy, which, in France, never failed to punish flagrant outrages and abuse, without respect of persons. The painter approved of the wisdom of the French government, in bridling the insolence of the mob, by which, he assured them, he had often suffered in his own person, having been often bespattered by hackney coachmen, jostled by draymen and porters, and reviled in the most opprobrious terms by the watermen of London, where he had once lost his bag and a considerable quantity of hair, which had been cut off by some rascal in his passage through Ludgate, during the Lord Mayor's procession. On the other hand, the doctor with great warmth alleged, that those officers ought to suffer death, or banishment at least, for having plundered the people in this manner, which was so impudent and barefaced as plainly to prove they were certain of escaping with impunity, and that they were old offenders in the same degree of delinquency. He said, that the greatest man in Athens would have been condemned to perpetual exile, and seen his estate confiscated for public use, had he dared in such a licentious manner to violate the rights of a fellow citizen, and as for the little affronts to which a man may be subject from the petulance of the multitude, he looked upon them as glorious indications of liberty, which ought not to be repressed and would at any time rejoice to find himself overthrown in a kennel by the insolence of a son of freedom, even though the fall should cost him a limb, adding, by way of illustration, that the greatest pleasure he ever enjoyed was in seeing a dustman willfully overturn a gentleman's coach, in which two ladies were bruised, even to the danger of their lives. Pallet, shocked at the extravagance of this declaration, if that be the case, said he, I wish you may see every bone in your body broke by the first carman you meet in the streets of London. This argument being discussed, and the reckoning discharged without any deduction, although the landlord, in stating the articles, had an eye to the loss he had sustained by his own countrymen, they departed from Arras, and arrived in safety at Lyle, about two o'clock in the afternoon. They had scarce taken possession of their lodgings, in a large hotel in the Grand Place, when the innkeeper gave them to understand, that he kept an ordinary below, which was frequented by several English gentlemen who resided in town, and that dinner was then set upon the table. Peregrine, who seized all opportunities of observing new characters, persuaded his company to dine in public, and they were accordingly conducted to the place, where they found a mixture of Scotch and Dutch officers, who had come from Holland to learn their exercises at the academy, and some gentlemen in the French service, who were upon garrison duty in the citadel. 
Among these last was a person about the age of fifty, of a remarkably genteel air and polite address, dignified with a Maltese cross, and distinguished by the particular veneration of all those who knew him. When he understood that Pickle and his friends were travellers, he accosted the youth in English, which he spoke tolerably well, and, as they were strangers, offered to attend them in the afternoon to all the places worth seeing in Lyle. Our hero thanked him for his excessive politeness, which, he said, was peculiar to the French nation, and, struck with his engaging appearance, industriously courted his conversation, in the course of which he learned that this chevalier was a man of good sense and great experience, that he was perfectly well acquainted with the greatest part of Europe, had lived some years in England, and was no stranger to the constitution and genius of that people. Having dined, and drunk to the healths of the English and French kings, two fiacres were called, in one of which the knight, with one of his companions, the governor, and Peregrine seated themselves, the other being occupied by the physician, Pallet, and two Scottish officers, who proposed to accompany them in their circuit. The first place they visited was the citadel, round the ramparts of which they walked, under the conduct of the knight, who explained with great accuracy the intention of every particular fortification belonging to that seemingly impregnable fortress, and, when they had satisfied their curiosity, took coach again, in order to view the arsenal, which stands in another quarter of the town, but, just as Pickle's carriage had crossed the promenade, he heard his own name bawled aloud by the painter, and, ordering the fiacre to stop, saw Pallet, with one half of his body thrust out at the window of the other coach, crying, with a terrified look, Mr. Pickle, Mr. Pickle, the for the love of God halt, and prevent bloodshed, else here will be carnage and cutting of throats. Peregrine, surprised at this exclamation, immediately alighted, and, advancing to the other vehicle, found one of their military companions standing upon the ground, at the farther side of the coach, with his sword drawn, and fury in his countenance, and the physician, with a quivering lip, and haggard aspect, struggling with the other, who had interposed in the quarrel, and detained him in his place. Our young gentleman, upon inquiry, found that this animosity had sprung from a dispute that happened upon the ramparts, touching the strength of the fortification, which the doctor, according to custom, undervalued, because it was a modern work, saying, that by the help of the military engines used among the ancients, and a few thousands of pioneers, he would engage to take it in less than ten days after he should sit down before it. The North Briton, who was as great a pedant as the physician, having studied fortification, and made himself master of Caesar's commentaries and Polybius, with the observations of Folard, affirmed, that all the methods of besieging practiced by the ancients would be utterly ineffectual against such a plan as that of the citadel of Lyle, and began to compare the Vinae, egg ears, Ariats, Scorpioners, and catapulti of the Romans, with the trenches, mines, batteries, and mortars used in the present art of war. The Republican, finding himself attacked upon what he thought his strong side, summoned all his learning to his aid, and, describing the famous siege of Platy, happened to misquote a passage of Thucydides, in which he was corrected by the other, who, having been educated for the church, was also a connoisseur in the Greek language. The doctor, incensed at being detected in such a blunder in the presence of Pallet, who, he knew, would promulgate his shame, told the officer, with great arrogance, that his objection was frivolous, and that he must not pretend to dispute on these matters with one who had considered them with the utmost accuracy and care. His antagonist, piqued at this supercilious insinuation, replied with great heat, that for aught he knew, the doctor might be a very expert apothecary, but that in the art of war, and knowledge of the Greek tongue, he was no other than an ignorant pretender. This asseveration produced an answer full of virulence, including a national reflection upon the soldier's country, and the contention rose to mutual abuse, when it was suppressed by the admonitions of the other two, who begged they would not expose themselves in a strange place, but behave themselves like fellow subjects and friends. They accordingly ceased reviling each other, and the affair was seemingly forgot, but after they had resumed their places in the coach, the painter unfortunately asked the meaning of the word tortoise, which he had heard them mention among the Roman implements of war. This question was answered by the physician, who described the nature of this expedient so little to the satisfaction of the officer, that he contradicted him flatly in the midst of his explanation, a circumstance which provoked the Republican to such a degree, that, in the temerity of his passion, he uttered the epithet, impertinent scoundrel, which Vass no sooner pronounced than the Caledonian made manual application to his nose, and, leaping out of the coach, stood waiting for him on the plain, while he, the physician, made feeble efforts to join him, being easily retained by the other soldier, and Pallet, dreading the consequence in which he himself might be involved, 
bellowed aloud for prevention. Our hero endeavoured to quiet the commotion by representing to the Scot that he had already taken satisfaction for the injury he had received, and telling the doctor that he had deserved the chastisement which was inflicted upon him, but the officer, encouraged perhaps by the confusion of his antagonist, insisted upon his asking pardon for what he had said, and the doctor, believing himself under the protection of his friend Pickle, far from agreeing to such concession, breathed nothing but defiance and revenge, so that the chevalier, in order to prevent mischief, put the soldier under arrest, and sent him to his lodgings, under the care of the other French gentleman and his own companion, they being also accompanied by Mr. Jolter, who, having formerly seen all the curiosities of Lyle, willingly surrendered his place to the physician. Chapter 51. Pickle engages with the Knight of Malta, in a conversation upon the English stage, which is followed by a dissertation on the theatres of the ancients, by the doctor. The rest of the company proceeded to the arsenal, which having viewed, together with some remarkable churches, they, in their return, went to the comedy, and saw the Cid of Cornet tolerably well represented. In consequence of this entertainment, the discourse at supper turned upon dramatic performances, and all the objections of Monsieur Scudery to the piece they had seen acted, together with the decision of the French Academy, were canvassed and discussed. The knight was a man of letters and taste, and particularly well acquainted with the state of the English stage, so that when the painter boldly pronounced sentence against the French manner of acting, on the strength of having frequented a Covent Garden club of critics, and been often admitted, by virtue of an order, into the pit, a comparison immediately ensued, not between the authors, but the actors of both nations, to whom the Chevalier and Peregrine were no strangers. Our hero, like a good Englishman, made no scruple of giving the preference to the performers of his own country, who, he alleged, obeyed the genuine impulses of nature, in exhibiting the passions of a human mind, and entered so warmly into the spirit of their several parts, that they often fancied themselves the very heroes they represented, whereas, the action of the Parisian players, even in their most interesting characters, was generally such an extravagance in voice and gesture, as is nowhere to be observed but on the stage. To illustrate this assertion, he availed himself of his talent, and mimicked the manner and voice of all the principal performers, male and female, belonging to the French comedy, to the admiration of the Chevalier, who, having complimented him upon this surprising modulation, begged leave to dissent in some particulars from the opinion he had avowed. That you have good actors in England, said he, it would be unjust and absurd in me to deny, your theatre is adorned by one woman, whose sensibility and sweetness of voice is such as I have never observed on any other stage, she has besides, an elegance of person and expression of features, that wonderfully adapt her for the most engaging characters of your best plays, and I must freely own that I have been as highly delighted and as deeply affected by Monimia and Belvidera at London, as ever I was by Cornelia and Cleopatra at Paris. Your favourite actor is a surprising genius. You can, moreover, boast of several comic actors who are perfect masters of buffoonery and grimace, though, to be free with you, I think in these qualifications you are excelled by the players of Amsterdam. Yet one of your graciosos I cannot admire, in all the characters he assumes. His utterance is a continual sing-song, like the chanting of vespers, and his action resembles that of heaving ballast into the hold of a ship. In his outward deportment he seems to have confounded the ideas of insolence and the dignity of mean, acts the crafty cool, designing crookback, as allowed, shallow, blustering Hector, in the character of the mild patriot Brutus, loses all temper and decorum, nay, so ridiculous is the behaviour of him and Cassius at their interview, that, setting foot to foot, and grinning at each other, with the aspect of two cobblers engaged, they thrust their left sides together, with repeated shoots, that the hilts of their swords may clash for the entertainment of the audience, as if they were a couple of merry andrews, endeavouring to raise the laugh of the vulgar, on some scaffold of Bartholomew Fair. The despair of a great man, who falls a victim to the infernal practices of a subtle traitor who enjoyed his confidence, this English Aesopus represents, by beating his own forehead, and beating like a bull, and, indeed, in almost all his most interesting scenes, performs such strange shakings of the head, and other antic gesticulations, that when I first saw him act, I imagined the poor man laboured under the paralytical disorder, which is known by the name of Street Vitus's dance. In short, he seems to be a stranger to the more refined sensations of the soul, consequently his expression is of the vulgar kind, and he must often sink under the idea of the poet, so that he has recourse to such violence of affected agitation, as imposes upon the undiscerning spectator, but to the eye of taste, evinces him a mere player of that class whom your admired Shakespeare justly compares to nature's journeyman tearing a passion to rags. Yet this man, in spite of all these absurdities, 
is an admirable Falstaff, exhibits the character of the eighth Henry to the life, is reasonably applauded in The Plain Dealer, excels in the part of Sir John Brute, and would be equal to many humorous situations in low comedy, which his pride will not allow him to undertake. I should not have been so severe upon this actor, had I not seen him extolled by his partisans with the most ridiculous and fulsome manifestations of praise, even in those very circumstances wherein, as I have observed, he chiefly failed. Peregrine, not a little piqued to hear the qualifications of such a celebrated actor in England treated with such freedom and disrespect, answered, with some asperity, that the Chevalier was a true critic, more industrious in observing the blemishes than in acknowledging the excellence of those who fell under his examination. It was not to be supposed that one actor could shine equally in all characters, and though his observations were undoubtedly very judicious, he himself could not help wondering that some of them had always escaped his notice, though he had been an assiduous frequenter of the playhouse. The player in question, said he, has, in your own opinion, considerable share of merit in the characters of comic life, and as to the manners of the great personages in tragedy, and the operation of the grand passions of the soul, I apprehend they may be variously represented, according to the various complexion and cultivation of different men, a Spaniard, for example, though impelled by the same passion, will express it very differently from a Frenchman, and what is looked upon as graceful vivacity and address by the one, would be considered as impertinence and foppery by the other, nay, so opposite is your common deportment from that of some other nations, that one of our own countrymen, in the relation of his travels, observes, that the Persians even of this age, when they see any man perform unnecessary gestures, says he is either a fool or Frenchman. The standard of demeanour being thus unsettled, a Turk, a Moor, an Indian, or inhabitant of my country whose customs and dress are widely different from ours, may, in his sentiments, possess all the dignity of the human heart, and be inspired by the noblest passion that animates the soul, and yet excite the laughter rather than the respect of an European spectator. When I first beheld your famous Parisian stage heroine in one of her principal parts, her attitudes seemed so violent, and she trussed her arms around with such extravagance, that she put me in mind of a windmill under the agitation of a hard gale, while her voice and features exhibited the lively representation of an English scold. The action of your favourite male performer was, in my opinion, equally unnatural, he appeared with the affected airs of a dancing master, at the most pathetic junctures of his fate he lifted up his hands above his head, like a tumbler going to vault and spoke as if his throat had been obstructed by a hairbrush, yet, when I compared their manners with those of the people before whom they performed, and made allowance for that exaggeration which obtains on all theatres, I was insensibly reconciled to their method of performance, and I could distinguish abundance of merit beneath that oddity of appearance. The Chevalier, perceiving Peregrine a little irritated at what he had said, asked pardon for the liberty he had taken in censuring the English players, assuring him that he had an infinite veneration for the British learning, genius and taste, which were so justly distinguished in the world of letters, and that, notwithstanding the severity of his criticism, he thought the theatre of London much better supplied with actors than that of Paris. The young gentleman thanked him for his polite condescension, at which Pallet excited, saying, with a shake of the head, I believe so, too, monsieur, and the physician, impatient of the dispute in which he had borne no share, observed, with a supercilious air, that the modern stage was altogether beneath one who had an idea of ancient magnificence and execution, that plays ought to be exhibited at the expense of the state, as those of Sophocles were by the Athenians, and that proper judges should be appointed for receiving or rejecting all such performances as are offered to the public. He then described the theatre at Rome, which contained eighty thousand spectators, gave them a learned disquisition into the nature of the persona, or mask, worn by the Roman actors, which, he said, was a machine that covered the whole head, furnished on the inside with a brazen concavity, that, by reverberating, the sound, as it issued from the mouth, raised the voice, so as to render it audible to such an extended audience. He explained the difference between the saltator and declamator, one of whom acted, while the other rehearsed a part, and from thence took occasion to mention the perfection of their pantomimes, who were so amazingly distinct in the exercise of their art, that a certain prince of Pontus, being at the court of Nero, and seeing one of them represent a story, begged him of the emperor, in order to employ him as an interpreter among barbarous nations, whose language he did not understand. Nay, divers cynic philosophers, who had condemned this entertainment unseen, when they chanced to be eyewitnesses of their admirable dexterity, expressed their sorrow for having so long debarred themselves of such national enjoyment. He dissented, however, from the opinion of Peregrine, who, as a proof of their excellence, 
had advanced that some of the English actors fancied themselves the very thing they represented, and recounted a story from Lucian, of a certain celebrated pantomime, who, in, acting the part of Ajax in his frenzy, was transported into the real fit of delirium, during which he tore to pieces the clothes of that actor who stalked before him, beating the stage with iron shoes, in order to increase the noise, snatched an instrument from one of the musicians, and broke it over the head of him who represented Ulysses, and, running to the consular bench, mistook a couple of senators for the sheep which were to be slain. The audience applauded him to the skies, but so conscious was the mimic of his own extravagance when he recovered the use of his reason, that he actually fell sick with mortification, and being afterwards desired to re-act the piece, flatly refused to appear in any such character, saying that the shortest follies were the best, and that it was sufficient for him to have been a madman once in his life. Chapter 52 An Adventure Happens to Pipes in consequence of which he is dismissed from Peregrine's service the whole company set out for Ghent, in the diligence our hero is captivated by a lady in that carriage interests her spiritual director in his behalf. The doctor being fairly engaged on the subject of the ancients, would have preceded the Lord knows how far, without hesitation, had not he been interrupted by the arrival of Mr. Jolter, who, in great confusion, told them that Pipes, having affronted a soldier, was then surrounded in the street and certainly would be put to death if some person of authority did not immediately interpose in his behalf. Peregrine no sooner learned the danger of his trusty squire, than, snatching up his sword, he ran downstairs, and was followed by the chevalier, entreating him to leave the affair to his management. Within ten yards of the door they found Tom, with his back to a wall, defending himself with a mop stick against the assault of three or four soldiers, who, at sight of the Maltese cross, desisted from the attack and were taken into custody by order of the knight. One of the aggressors, being an Irishman, begged to be heard with great importunity before he should be sent to the guard, and, by the mediation of Pickle, was accordingly brought into the hotel with his companions, all three bearing upon their heads and faces evident marks of their adversary's prowess and dexterity. The spokesman, being confronted with Pipes, informed the company that, having by accident met with Mr. Pipes, whom he considered as his countryman, though fortune had disposed of them in different services, he invited him to drink a glass of wine, and accordingly carried him to a cabaret, where he introduced him to his comrades, but in the course of the conversation, which turned upon the power and greatness of the kings of France and England, Mr. Pipes had been pleased to treat his most Christian majesty with great disrespect, and when he, the entertainer, expostulated with him in a friendly manner about his impolite behavior, observing, that he, being in the French service, would be under the necessity of resenting his abuse if he did not put a stop to it before the other gentlemen of the cloth should comprehend his meaning, he had set them all three at defiance, dishonored him in particular with the opprobrious epithet of rebel to his native king and country, and even drunk, in broken French, to the perdition of Louis and all his adherents, that, compelled by this outrageous conduct, he, as the person who had recommended him to their society, had, in vindication of his own character, demanded of a delinquent, who, on pretense of fetching a sword, had gone to his lodging, from whence he all of a sudden sallied upon them with a mop stick, which he employed in the annoyance of them all without distinction, so that they were obliged to draw in their own defence. Pipes, being questioned by his master with regard to the truth of this account, owned that every circumstance was justly represented, saying, he did not value their cheese toasters a pinch of oakum, and that if the gentleman had not shot in betwixt them, he would have trimmed them to such a tune that they should not have had a whole yard to square. Peregrine reprimanded him sharply for his unmannerly behavior, and insisted upon his asking pardon of those he had injured upon the spot, but no consideration was efficacious enough to produce such concession, to this command he was both deaf and dumb, and the repeated threats of his master had no more effect than if they had been addressed to a marble statue. At length, our hero, incensed at his obstinacy, started up, and would have chastised him with manual operation, had not he been prevented by the Chevalier, who found means to moderate his indignation so far that he contented himself with dismissing the offender from his service, and after having obtained the discharge of the prisoners, gave them a louis to drink, by way of recompense for the disgrace and damage they had sustained. The knight, perceiving our young gentleman very much ruffled at this accident, and reflecting upon the extraordinary deportment and appearance of his valet, whose hair had by this time adopted a grizzled hue, imagined he was some favorite domestic who had grown grey in the service of his master's family, and that, of consequence, he was uneasy at the sacrifice he had made. Swayed by this conjecture, he earnestly solicited in his behalf, but all he could obtain, was a promise of readmitting him into favour on the terms already proposed, 
or at least on condition that he should make his acknowledgement to the Chevalier, for his want of reverence and respect for the French monarch. Upon this condescension the culprit was called upstairs, and made acquainted with the mitigation of his fate, upon which he said, he would down on his marrow bones to his own master, but would be dd before he would ask pardon of error Frenchman in Christendom. Pickle, exasperated at this blunt declaration, ordered him out of his presence, and charged him never to appear before his face again, while the officer in vain employed all his influence and address to appease his resentment, and about midnight took his leave with marks of mortification at his want of success. Next day the company agreed to travel through Flanders in the diligence, by the advice of Peregrine, who was not without hope of meeting with some adventure or amusement in that carriage, and Jolte took care to secure places for them all, it being resolved that the valet de chamber and the doctor's man should attend the vehicle on horseback, and as for the forlorn pipes, he was left to reap the fruits of his own stubborn disposition, notwithstanding the united efforts of the whole triumvirate, who endeavoured to procure his pardon. Every previous measure being thus taken, they set out from Lyle about six in the morning, and found themselves in the company of a female adventurer, a very handsome young lady, a capuchin, and a Rotterdam Jew. Our young gentleman, being the first of this society that entered, surveyed the stranger with an attentive eye, and seated himself immediately behind the beautiful unknown, who at once attracted his attention. Pallet, seeing another lady unengaged, in imitation of his friend, took possession of her neighborhood, the physician paired with the priest, and jolt to sat down by the Jew. The machine had not proceeded many furlongs, when Pickle, accosting the fair incognita, congratulated himself upon his happiness, in being the fellow traveller of so charming a lady. She, without the least reserve or affectation, thanked him for his compliment, and replied, with a sprightly air, that now they were embarked in one common bottom, they must club their endeavours to make one another as happy as the nature of their situation would permit them to be. Encouraged by this frank intimation, and captivated by her fine black eyes and easy behaviour, he attached himself to her from that moment, and, in a little time, the conversation became so particular, that the capuchin thought proper to interfere in the discourse in such a manner as gave the youth to understand that he was there on purpose to superintend her conduct. He was doubly rejoiced at this discovery, in consequence of which he hoped to profit in his addresses, not only by the young lady's restraint, that never fails to operate in behalf of the lover, but also by the corruptibility of her guardian, whom he did not doubt of rendering propitious to his cause. Flushed with these expectations, he behaved with uncommon complacency to the father, who was charmed with the affability of his carriage, and on the faith of his generosity abated of his vigilance so much, that our hero carried on his suit without further molestation, while the painter, in signs and loud bursts of laughter, conversed with his Dulcinea, who was perfectly well versed in these simple expressions of satisfaction, and had already found means to make a dangerous invasion upon his heart. Nor were the governor and physician unemployed, while their friends interested themselves in this agreeable manner. Jolter no sooner perceived the Hollander was a Jew, than he entered into an investigation of the Hebrew tongue, in which he was a connoisseur, and the doctor at the same time attacked the mendicant on the ridiculous maxims of his order, together with the impositions of priestcraft in general, which, he observed, prevailed so much among those who profess the Roman Catholic religion. Thus coupled, each committee enjoyed their own conversation apart, without any danger of encroachment, and all were so intent upon their several topics, that they scarce allowed themselves a small interval in viewing the desolation of Menon, as they passed through that ruined frontier. About twelve o'clock they arrived at Courtray, where the horses are always changed, and the company halt an hour for refreshment. Here Peregrine handed his charmer into an apartment, where she was joined by the other lady, and on pretense of seeing some of the churches in town, put himself under the direction of the capuchin, from whom he learned that the lady was wife to a French gentleman, to whom she had been married about a year, and that she was now on her journey to visit her mother, who lived in Brussels, and was at that time laboured under a lingering distemper, which, in all probability, would soon put a period to her life. He then launched out in praise of her daughter's virtue and conjugal affection, and, lastly, told him, that he was her father confessor, and pitched upon to be her conductor through Flanders, by her husband, as well as his wife, placed the utmost confidence in his prudence and integrity. Pickle easily comprehended the meaning of this insinuation, and took the hint accordingly. He tickled the priest's vanity with extraordinary encomiums upon the disinterested principles of his order, which were detached from all worldly pursuits, and altogether devoted to the eternal salvation of mankind. He applauded their patience, humility, and learning, and lavished a world of praise upon their talent in preaching, which, he said, had more than once operated so powerfully upon him, 
that had he not been restrained by certain considerations which he could not possibly waive, he should have embraced their tenets, and bade admission into their fraternity, but, as the circumstances of his fate would not permit him to take such a salutary measure for the present, he entreated the good further to accept a small token of his love and respect, for the benefit of that convent to which he belonged. So saying, he pulled out a purse of ten guineas, which the capuchin observing, turned his head another way, and, lifting up his arm, displayed a pocket almost as high as his collarbone, in which he deposited the money. This proof of affection for the order produced a sudden and surprising effect upon the friar. In the transport of his zeal he wrung this semi-convert's hand, showered a thousand benedictions upon his head, and exhorted him, with the tears flowing from his eyes, to perfect the great work which the finger of God had begun in his heart, and, as an instance of his concern for the welfare of his precious soul, the holy brother promised to recommend him strenuously to the pious admonitions of a young woman under his care, who was a perfect saint upon earth, and endowed with a peculiar gift of mollifying the hearts of obdurate sinners. Zero father! cried the hypocritical projector, who by this time perceived that his money was not thrown away, if I could be favoured but for one half hour with the private instruction of that inspired devotee, my mind presages, that I should be a strayed sheep brought back into the fold, and that I should find easy entrance at the gates of heaven. There is something supernatural in her aspect, I gaze upon her with the most bias fervour, and my whole soul is agitated with tumults of hope and despair. Having pronounced this rhapsody with transport half natural and half affected, the priest assured him, that these were the operations of the spirit, which must not be repressed, and comforted him with the hope of enjoying the blessed interview which he desired, protesting, that, as far as his influence extended, his wish should be that very evening indulged. The gracious pupil thanked him for his benevolent concern, which he swore should not be squandered upon an ungrateful object, and the rest of the company interrupting the conversation, they returned in a body to the inn, where they dined all together, and the ladies were persuaded to be our hero's guests. As the subjects on which they had been engaged before dinner were not exhausted, each brace resumed their former theme when they were replaced in the diligence. The painter's mistress finished her conquest, by exerting her skill in the art of ogling, accompanied by frequent bewitching sighs and some tender French songs, that she sang with such pathetic expression, as quite melted the resolution of Pallet, and utterly subdued his affection. And he, to convince her of the importance of her victory, gave a specimen of his own talents, by entertaining her with that celebrated English ditty, the burden of which begins with, The Pigs They Lie With Their A. S. Bear. Chapter 53 he makes some progress in her affections is interrupted by a dispute between Jolter and the Jew appeases the wrath of the Capuchin, who procures for him an interview with his fair enslaver, in which he finds himself deceived. Peregrine, meanwhile, employed all his insinuation and address in practicing upon the heart of the Capuchin's fair charge. He had long ago declared his passion, not in the superficial manner of a French gallant, but with all the ardor of an enthusiast. He had languished, vowed, flattered, kissed her hand by stealth, and had no reason to complain of his reception, though, by a man of a less sanguine disposition, her particular complaisance would have been deemed equivocal, and perhaps nothing more than the effects of French breeding and constitutional vivacity, he gave his own qualifications credit for the whole, and with these sentiments carried on the attack with such unabating vigour, that she was actually prevailed upon to accept a ring, which he presented as a token of his esteem, and everything proceeded in a most prosperous train, when they were disturbed by the governor Israelite, who, in the heat of disputation, raised their voices, and poured forth such effusions of gutturals, as set our lovers' teeth on edge. As they spoke in a language unknown to every one in the carriage but themselves, and looked at each other with mutual animosity and rancor, Peregrine desired to know the cause of their contention, upon which Jolter exclaimed, in a furious tone, This learned Levite, forsooth, has the impudence to tell me that I don't understand Hebrew, and affirms that the word Benoni signifies child of joy, whereas, I can prove, and have already said enough to convince any reasonable man, that in the Septuagint it is rightly translated into son of my sorrow. Having thus explained himself to his pupil, he turned to the priest, with intention to appeal to his determination, but the Jew pulled him by the sleeve with great eagerness, saying, For the love of God, be quiet. The Capuchin will discover who we are. Joker, offended at this conjunction, echoed, Who we are. With great emphasis, and repeating nose pomin at armus, asked ironically, to which of the tribes the Jew thought he belonged? The Levite, affronted at his comparing him to a ball of horse dung, replied, with a most significant grin, to the tribe of Issachar. His antagonist, taking the advantage of his unwillingness to be known by the friar, and prompted by revenge for the freedom he had used, 
answered, in the French language, that the judgment of God was still manifest upon their whole race, not only in their being in the state of exiles from their native land, but also in the spite of their hearts and pravity of their dispositions, which demonstrate them to be the genuine offspring of those who crucified the Saviour of the world. His expectation was, however, defeated. The priest himself was too deeply engaged to attend to the debates of other people. The physician, in the pride and insolence of his learning, had undertaken to display the absurdity of the Christian faith, having already, as he thought, confuted the Capuchin, touching the points of belief in which the Roman Catholics differ from the rest of the world. But not cemented with the imagined victory he had gained, he began to strike at the fundamentals of religion, and the Father, with incredible forbearance, suffered him to make very free with the doctrine of the Trinity, but, when he leveled the shafts of his ridicule at the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin, the good man's patience forsook him, his eyes seemed to kindle with indignation. He trembled in every joint, and uttered, with a loud voice, You are an abominable I will not call thee heretic, for thou art worse, if possible, than a Jew, you deserve to be enclosed in a furnace seven times heated, and I have a good mind to lodge an information against you with the governor of Ghent, that you may be apprehended and punished as an impious blasphemer. This menace operated like a charm upon all present. The doctor was confounded. The governor dismayed. The Levite's teeth chattered, the painter astonished at the general confusion, the cause of which he could not comprehend, and Pickle himself, not a little alarmed, was obliged to use all his interest and assiduity in appeasing this son of the church, who, at length, in consideration of the friendship he professed for the young gentleman, consented to forgive what had passed, but absolutely refused to sit in contact with such a profane wretch, whom he looked upon as a fiend of darkness, sent by the enemy of mankind to poison the minds of weak people, so that, after having crossed himself, and uttered certain exorcisms, he insisted upon the doctor's changing places with the Jew, who approached the offended ecclesiastic in an agony of fear. Matters being thus compromised, the conversation flowed in a more general channel, and without the intervention of any other accident or bone of contention, the carriage arrived at the city of Ghent about seven in the evening. Supper being bespoken for the whole company, our adventurer and his friends went out to take a superficial view of the place, leaving his new mistress to the pious exhortations of her confessor, whom, as we have already observed, he had secured in his interest. This zealous mediator spoke so warmly in his commendation, and interested her conscience so much in the affair, that she could not refuse her helping hand to the great work of his conversion, and promised to grant the interview he desired. This agreeable piece of intelligence, which the Capuchin communicated to Peregrine at his return, elevated his spirits to such a degree, that he shone at supper with uncommon brilliance, in a thousand sallies of wit and pleasantry, to the delight of all present, especially of his fair Fleming, who seemed quite captivated by his person and behaviour. The evening being thus spent to the satisfaction of all parties, the company broke up, and retired to their several apartments, where our lover, to his unspeakable mortification, learned that the two ladies were obliged to be in the same room, all the other chambers of the inn being preoccupied. When he imparted this difficulty to the priest, that charitable father, who was very fruitful in expedients, assured him that his spiritual concerns should not be obstructed by such a slender impediment, and accordingly availed himself of his prerogative, by going into his daughter's chamber when she was almost undressed, and leading her into his own, on pretense of administering salutary food for her soul. Having brought the two votaries together, he prayed for success to the operations of grace, and left them to their mutual meditations, after having conjured them in a most solemn manner to let no impure sentiments or temptations of the flesh interfere with the hallowed design of their meeting. The reverend intercessor being gone, and the door fastened on the inside, the pseudo-convert, transported with his passion, threw himself at his Amanda's feet, and begging she would spare him the tedious form of addresses, which the nature of their interview would not permit him to observe, began, with all the impetuosity of love, to make the most of the occasion. But whether she was displeased by the intrepidity and assurance of his behaviour, thinking herself entitled to more courtship and respect, or was really better fortified with chastity than he or his procurer had supposed her to be, certain it is, she expressed resentment and surprise at his boldness and presumption, and upbraided him with having imposed upon the charity of the friar. The young gentleman was really as much astonished at this rebuff, as she pretended to be at his declaration, and earnestly entreated her to consider how precious the moments were, and for one sacrifice superfluous ceremony to the happiness of one who adored her with such a flame as could not fail to consume his vitals if she would not deign to bless him with her favour. Notwithstanding all his tears, vows, and supplications, his personal accomplishments, 
and the tempting opportunity, all that he could obtain was an acknowledgement of his having made an impression upon her heart, which she hoped the dictates of her duty would enable her to erase. This confession he considered as a delicate consent, and, obeying the impulse of his love, snatched her up in his arms, with an intention of seizing that which she declined to give, when this French Lucretia, unable to defend her virtue any other way, screamed aloud, and the Capuchin, setting his shoulder to the door, forced it open, and entered in an affected ecstasy of amazement. He lifted up his hands and eyes, and pretended to be thunderstruck at the discovery he had made, then in broken exclamations, professed his horror at the wicked intention of our hero, who had covered such a damnable scheme with the mask of religion. In short, he performed his cue with such dexterity, that the lady, believing him to be in earnest, begged he would forgive the stranger on account of his youth and education, which had been tainted by the errors of heresy, and he was on these considerations content to accept the submission of our hero, who, far from renouncing his expectations, notwithstanding this mortifying repulse, confided so much in his own talents, and the confession which his mistress had made, that he resolved to make another effort, to which nothing could have prompted him but the utmost turbulence of unruly desire. Chapter 54 he makes another effort to towards the accomplishment of his wish, which is postponed by a strange accident. He directed his valet de chamber, who was a thorough-paced pimp, to kindle some straw in the yard, and then pass by the door of her apartment, crying with a loud voice that the house was on fire. This alarm brought both ladies out of their chamber in a moment, and Peregrine, taking the advantage of their running to the street door, entered the room, concealed himself under a large table that stood in an unobserved corner. The nymphs, as soon as they understood the cause of his Mercury's supposed affright, returned to their apartment, and, having said their prayers, undressed themselves, and went to bed. This scene, which fell under the observation of Pickle, did not at all contribute to the cooling of his concupiscence, but on the contrary inflamed him to such a degree, that he could scarce restrain his impatience, until, by her breathing deep, he concluded the fellow lodger of his Amanda was asleep. This welcome note no sooner saluted his ears, than he crept to his charmer's bedside, and placing himself on his knees, gently laid hold on her white hand, and pressed it to his lips. She had just begun to close her eyes, and enjoy the agreeable oppression of slumber, when she was roused by this rape, at which she started, pronouncing, in a tone of surprise and dismay, My God! Who's that? The lover, with a most insinuating humility, besought her to hear him, vowing that his intention, in approaching her thus, was not to violate the laws of decency or that indelible esteem which she had engraved on his heart, but to manifest his sorrow and contrition for the umbrage he had given, to pour forth the overflowings of his soul, and tell her that he neither could nor would survive her displeasure. These and many more pathetic protestations, accompanied with sighs and tears and other expressions of grief, which our hero had at command, could not fail to melt the tender heart of the Fleming, already prepossessed in favour of his qualifications. She sympathised so much with his affliction, as to weep in her turn, when she represented the impossibility of her rewarding his passion, and he, seizing the moment, reinforced his solicitations with such irresistible transports, that her resolution gave way, she began to breathe quick, expressed her fear of being overheard by the other lady, with an ejaculation of oh heavens. I'm undone, suffered him, after a faint struggle, to make a lodgment upon the covered way of her bed. Her honour, however, was secured for the present, by a strange sort of knocking upon the wainscot, at the other end of the room hard by the bed in which the female adventurer lay. Surprised at this circumstance, the lady begged him for heaven's sake to retreat, or her reputation would be ruined for ever, but when he represented to her, that her character would run a much greater risk if he should be detected in withdrawing, she consented, with great trepidation, to his stay, and they listened in silence to the sequel of the noise that alarmed them. This was no other than an expedient of the painter to awaken his dulcinea, with whom he had made an assignation, or at least interchanged such signals as he thought amounted to a firm appointment. His nymph, being disturbed in her first sleep, immediately understood the sound, and, true to the agreement, rose, and, unbolting the door, as softly as possible, gave him admittance, leaving it open for his more commodious retreat. While this happy gallant was employed in disengaging himself from the dishabil in which he had entered, the capuchin, suspecting that Peregrine would make another attempt upon his charge, had crept silently to the apartment in order to reconnoitre, lest the adventure should be achieved without his knowledge, a circumstance that would deprive him of the profits he might expect from his privity and concurrence. Finding the door unlatched, his suspicion was confirmed, and he made no scruple of creeping into the chamber on all four, so that the painter, having stripped himself to the shirt, in groping about for his dulcinea's bed, 
chanced to lay his hand upon the shaven crown of the father's head, which, by a circular motion, the priest began to turn round in his grasp, like a ball in a socket, to the surprise and consternation of poor Pallet, who, neither having penetration to comprehend the case, nor resolution to withdraw his fingers from this strange object of his touch, stood sweating in the dark, and venting ejaculations with great devotion. The friar, tired with this exercise, and the painful posture in which he stooped, raised himself gradually upon his feet, heaving up at the same time the hand of the painter, whose terror and amazement increased to such a degree at this unaccountable elevation, that his faculties began to fail, and his palm, in the confusion of his fright, sliding over the priest's forehead, one of his fingers happened to slip into his mouth, and was immediately secured between the capuchin's teeth with as firm a fixture as if it had been screwed in a blacksmith's vice. The painter was so much disordered by this sudden snap, which tortured him to the bone, that, forgetting all other considerations, he roared aloud, Murder! A fire! A trap! A trap! Help! Christians! For the love of God! Help! Our hero, confounded by these exclamation, which he knew would soon fill the room with spectators, and incensed at his own mortifying disappointment, was obliged to quit the untasted banquet, and, approaching the cause of his misfortune, just as his tormentor had thought proper to release his finger, discharged such a hearty slap between his shoulders, as brought him to the ground with hideous bellowing, then, retiring unperceived to his own chamber, was one of the first who returned with a light, on pretense of having been alarmed with his cries. The capuchin had taken the same precaution, and followed Peregrine into the room, pronouncing Ben at this sight, and crossing himself with many marks of astonishment. The physician and Jolter appearing at the same time, the unfortunate painter was found lying naked on the floor, in all the agony of horror and dismay, blowing upon his left hand, that hung dangling from the elbow. The circumstance of his being found in that apartment, and the attitude of his affliction, which was extremely ridiculous, provoked the doctor to a smile, and produced a small relaxation in the severity of the governor's countenance, while Pickle, testifying his surprise and concern, lifted him from the ground, and inquired into the cause of his present situation. Having, after some recollection, and fruitless endeavours to speak, recovered the use of his tongue, he told them that the house was certainly haunted by evil spirits, by which he had been conveyed, he knew not how, into the department, and afflicted with all the tortures of hell, that one of them had made itself sensible to his feeling, in the shape of a round ball of smooth flesh, which turned round under his hand, like an astronomer's globe, and then, rising up to a surprising height, was converted into a machine that laid hold on his finger, by a snap and having pinned him to the spot, he continued for some moments in unspeakable agony. At last, he said, the engine seemed to melt away from his finger, and he received a sudden thwack upon his shoulders, as if discharged by the arm of a giant, which overthrew him in an instant upon the floor. The priest, hearing this strange account, pulled out of one of his pouches a piece of consecrated candle, which he lighted immediately, and muttered certain mysterious conjurations. Jolter, imagining that Pallet was drunk, shook his head, saying, he believed the spirit was nowhere but in his own brain. The physician for once condescended to be a wag, and, looking towards one of the beds, observed, that, in his opinion, the painter had been misled by the flesh, and not by the spirit. The fair Fleming lay in silent astonishment and affright, and her fellow in order to acquit herself of all suspicion, exclaimed with incredible volubility against the author of this uproar, who, she did not doubt, had concealed himself in the apartment with a view of perpetuating some wicked attempt upon her precious virtue, and was punished and prevented by the immediate interposition of heaven. At her desire, therefore, and at the earnest solicitation of the other lady, he was conducted to his own bed, and the chamber being evacuated, they locked their door, fully resolved to admit no more visitants for that night, while Peregrine, mad with seeing the delicious morsel snatched, as it were, from his very lip, stalked through the passage like a ghost in hope of finding some opportunity of re-entering, till the day beginning to break, he was obliged to retire, cursing the idiotical conduct of the painter, which had so unluckily interfered with his delight. Chapter 55 They depart from Ghent our hero engages in a political dispute with his mistress, whom he offends, and pacifies with submission he practices an expedient to detain the carriage at a lost, and confirms the priest in his interest. Next day, about one o'clock, after having seen everything remarkable in town, and been present at the execution of two youths, who were hanged ravishing a W. They took their departure from Ghent in the same carriage which had brought them thither, and the conversation turning upon the punishment they had seen inflicted, the Flemish beauty expressed great sympathy and compassion for the unhappy sufferers, who, as she had been informed, 
had fallen victims to the malice of the accuser. Her sentiments were espoused by all the company, except the French lady of pleasure, who, thinking the credit of the sisterhood concerned in the affair, bitterly inveighed against the profligacy of the age, and particularly the base and villainous attempts of man upon the chastity of the weaker sex, saying, with a look of indignation directed to the painter, that for her own part she should never be able to manifest the acknowledgment she owed to Providence, for having protected her last night from the wicked aims of unbridled lust. This observation introduced a series of jokes at the expense of Pallet, who hung his ears, and sat with a silent air of dejection, fearing that, through the malevolence of the physician, his adventure might reach the ears of his wife. Indeed, though we have made shift to explain the whole transaction to the reader, it was an inextricable mystery to every individual in the diligence, because the part which was acted by the Capuchin was known to himself alone, and even he was utterly ignorant of Pickles being concerned in the affair, so that the greatest share of the painter's sufferings were supposed to be the exaggerations of his own extravagant imagination. In the midst of their discourse on this extraordinary subject, the driver told them that they were now on the very spot where a detachment of the Allied army had been intercepted and cut off by the French, and, stopping the vehicle, entertained them with a local description of the Battle of Mel. Upon this occasion, the Flemish lady, who, since her marriage, has become a keen partisan for the French, gave a minute detail of all the circumstances, as they had been represented to her by her husband's brother, who was in the action. This account, which sunk the number of the French to sixteen, and raised that of the Allies to twenty thousand men, was so disagreeable to truth, as well as to the laudable partiality or peregrine, that he ventured to contradict her assertions, and a fierce dispute commenced, that not only regarded the present question, but also comprehended all the battles in which the Duke of Marlborough had commanded against Louis the Fourteenth. In the course of these debates, she divested the great general of all the glory he had acquired, by affirming, that every victory he gained was purposely lost by the French in order to bring the schemes of Madame de Maintenon into discredit, and, as a particular instance, alleged, that while the citadel of Lille was besieged, Louis said, in presence of the Dauphin, that if the Allies should be obliged to raise the siege, he would immediately declare his marriage with that lady, upon which, the son sent private orders to Marshal Bufflers to surrender the place. This strange allegation was supported by the asseveration of the priest and the courtesan, and admitted as truth by the governor, who pretended to have heard it from good authority, while the doctor sat neutral, as one who thought it scandalous to know the history of such modern events. The Israelite, being a true Dutchman, himself under the banners of our hero, who, in attempting to demonstrate the absurdity and improbability of what they had advanced, raised such a hue and cry against himself, and, being insensibly heated in the altercation, irritated his Amanda to such a degree, that her charming eyes kindled with fury, and he saw great reason to think, that if he did not fall upon some method to deprecate her wrath, she would, in a twinkling, sacrifice all her esteem for him to her own zeal for the glory of the French nation. Moved by this apprehension, his ardour cooled by degrees, and he insensibly detached himself from the argument, leaving the whole care of supporting it to the Jew, who, finding himself deserted, was faint to yield at discretion, so that the French remained masters of the field, and their young heroine resumed her good humour. Our hero having prudently submitted to the superior intelligence of his fair enslaver, began to be harassed with the fears of losing her for ever, and set his invention at work, to contrive some means of indemnifying himself for his assiduities, presence, and the disappointment he had already undergone. On pretense of enjoying a free air, he mounted the box, and employed his elocution and generosity with such success, that the driver undertook to disable the diligence from proceeding beyond the town ever lost for that day, and, in consequence of his promise, gently overturned it when they were but a mile short of that baiting place. He had taken his measures so discreetly, that this accident was attended with no other inconvenience than a fit of fear that took possession of the ladies, and the necessity to which they were reduced by the declaration of the coachman, who, upon examining the carriage, assured the company that the axle tree had given way, and advised them to walk forward to the inn, while he would jog after them at a slow pace, and do his endeavour the damage should be immediately repaired. Peregrine pretended to be very much concerned at what had happened, and even cursed the driver for his inadvertency, expressing infinite impatience to be at Brussels, and wishing that this misfortune might not detain them another night upon the road, but when his understrapper, according to his instructions, came afterwards to the inn, and gave them to understand that the workmen he had employed could not possibly refit the machine in less than six hours, the crafty youth affected to lose all temper, stormed at his emissary, whom he reviled in the most opprobrious terms, and threatened to cane for his misconduct. The fellow protested, with great humility, 
that their being overturned was owing to the failure of the axle tree, and not to his want of care or dexterity in driving, though rather than be thought the cause of incommoding him, he would inquire for a post chaise, in which he might depart for Brussels immediately. This expedient Pickle rejected, unless the whole company could be accommodated in the same manner, and he had been previously informed by the driver that the town could not furnish more than one vehicle of that sort. His governor, who was quite ignorant of his scheme, represented that one night would soon be passed, and exhorted him to bear this small disappointment with a good grace, especially as the house seemed to be well provided for their entertainment, and the company so much disposed to be sociable. The capuchin, who had found his account in cultivating the acquaintance of the young stranger, was not ill pleased at this event, which might, by protracting the term of their intercourse, yield him some opportunity of profiting still further by his liberality. He therefore joined Mr. Jolter in his admonitions, congratulating himself upon the prospect of enjoying his conversation a little longer than he had expected. Our young gentleman received a compliment to the same purpose from the Hebrew, who had that day exercised his gallantry upon the French coquette, and was not without hope of reaping the fruit of his attention. His rival, the painter, being quite disgraced and dejected by the adventure of last night, as for the doctor, he was too much engrossed in the contemplation of his own importance to interest himself in the affair or its consequences, further than by observing, that the European powers ought to establish public games, like those that were celebrated of old in Greece, in which case, every state would be supplied with such dexterous charioteers as would drive a machine, at full speed, within a hair's breadth of a precipice, without any danger of its being overturned. Peregrine could not help yielding to their remonstrances and united complaisance, for which he thanked them in very polite terms, and his passion seeming to subside proposed that they should amuse themselves in walking round the ramparts. He hoped to enjoy some private conversation with his admired Fleming, who had the whole day behaved with remarkable reserve. The proposal being embraced, he, as usual, handed her into the street, and took all opportunities of promoting his suit, but they were attended so closely by her father confessor, that he foresaw it would be impracticable to accomplish his aim without the connivance of that ecclesiastic. This he was obliged to purchase with another purse, which he offered, and was accepted, as a charitable atonement for his criminal behaviour during the interview which the frail had procured for the good of his soul. The benefaction was no sooner made, than the mendicant edged off by little and little, till he joined the rest of the company, leaving his generous patron at full liberty to prosecute his purpose. It is not to be doubted that our adventurer made a good use of this occasion, he practised a thousand flowers of rhetoric, and actually exhausted his whole address, in persuading her to have compassion upon his misery and indulge him with another private audience, without which he should run distracted, and be guilty of extravagancies which, in the humanity of her disposition, she would weep to see. But, instead of complying with his request, she chid him severely for his presumption in persecuting her with his vicious addresses, she assured him, that although she had secured a chamber for herself in this place, because she had no ambition to be better acquainted with the other lady, he would be in the wrong to disturb her with another nocturnal visit, for she was determined to deny him admittance. The lover was comforted by this hint, which he understood in the true acceptation, and his passion being inflamed by the obstacles he had met with, his heart beat high with the prospect of possession. These raptures of expectation produced an inquietude, which disabled him from bearing that share of the conversation for which he used to be distinguished. His behaviour at supper was a vicissitude of startings and reveries. The capuchin, imputing the disorder to a second repulse from his charge, began to be invaded with the apprehension of being obliged to refund and in a whisper forbade a hero to despair. Chapter 56. The French coquette entraps the heart of the Jew, against whom Pallet enters into a conspiracy, by which Peregrine is again disappointed, and the Hebrew's incontinence exposed. Meanwhile the French siren, balked in her design upon her English cully, who was so easily disheartened, and hung his ears in manifest despondence, rather than rather than run the risk of making a voyage that should be altogether unprofitable, resolved to practice her charms upon the Dutch merchant, she had already made such innovation upon his heart, that he cultivated her with peculiar complacency, gazed upon her with a most libidinous stare, and unbended his aspect into a grin that was truly as well itish. The painter saw and was offended at this correspondence, which he considered as an insult upon his misfortune, as well as an evident preference of his rival, and, conscious of his own timidity, swallowed an extraordinary glass, that his invention might be stimulated and his resolution raised to the contrivance and execution of some scheme of revenge. The wine failed in the expected effect, and, without inspiring him with a plan, served only to quicken his desire of vengeance, so that he communicated his purpose to his friend Peregrine, and begged his assistance, 
but our young gentleman was too intent upon his own affair to mind the concerns of any other person, and he declining to be engaged in the project, Pallet had recourse to the genius of Pickle's valet de chamber, who readily embarked in the undertaking, and invented a plan, which was executed accordingly. The evening being pretty far advanced, and the company separated into their respective apartments, Pickle repaired, in all the impatience of youth and desire, to the chamber of his charmer, and, finding the door unbolted, entered in a transport of joy. By the light of the room, which shone through the window, he was conducted to her bed, which he approached in the utmost agitation, and perceiving her to all appearance asleep, essayed to wake her with a gentle kiss, but this method proved ineffectual, because she was determined to save herself the confusion of being an accomplice in his guilt. He repeated the application, murmured a most passionate salutation in her ear, and took such other gentle methods of signifying his presence, as persuaded him that she was resolved to sleep, in spite of all his endeavours. Flushed with this supposition, he locked the door, in order to prevent interruption, and, stealing himself under the clothes, set fortune a defiance, while he held the fair creature circled in his arms. Nevertheless, near as he seemed to be to the happy accomplishment of his desire, his hope was again frustrated with a fearful noise, which in a moment awaked his Amanda in a fright, and for the present engaged all his attention. His valet de chamber, whom Pallet had consulted as a confederate in his revenge against the Lady of Pleasure and her gallant, had hired of certain bohemians, who chanced to lodge at the inn, a jackass adorned with bells, which, when everybody was retired to rest, and the Hebrew supposed to be bedded with his mistress, they led upstairs into a long thoroughfare, from which the chambers were detached on each side. The painter, perceiving the lady's door ajar, according to his expectation, mounted this animal, with intention to ride into the room, and disturb the lovers in the midst of their mutual endearments, but the ass, true to its kind, finding himself bestrid by an unknown rider, instead of advancing in obedience to his conductor, retreated backward to the other end of the passage, in spite of all the efforts of the painter, who spurred, and kicked, and pummeled to no purpose. It was the noise of this contention between Pallet and the ass which invaded the ears of Peregrine and his mistress, neither of whom could form the least rational conjecture about the cause of such strange disturbance, which increased as the animal approached their apartment. At length the Burik's retrograde motion was obstructed by the door, which it forced open in a twinkling, with one kick, and entered with such complication of sound as terrified the lady almost into a fit, and threw her lover into the utmost perplexity and confusion. The painter, finding himself thus violently intruded into the bedchamber of he knew not whom, and dreading the resentment of the possessor, who might discharge a pistol at him as a robber who had broken into his apartment, was overwhelmed with consternation, and redoubled his exertion to accomplish a speedy retreat, sweating all the time with fear, and putting up petition to heaven for his safety, but his obstinate companion, regardless of his situation, instead of submitting to his conduct, began to turn round like a millstone, the united sound of his feet and bells producing a most surprising concert. The unfortunate rider, whirling about in this manner, would have quitted his seat, and left the beast to his own amusement, but the rotation was so rapid, that the terror of a severe fall hindered him from attempting to dismount, and, in the desperation of his heart, he seized one of his ears, which he pinched so unmercifully, that the creature set up his throat, and brayed aloud. This hideous exclamation was no sooner heard by the fair Fleming, already chilled with panic, and prepared with superstition, than, believing herself visited by the devil, who was permitted to punish her for her infidelity to the marriage bed, she uttered a scream, and began to repeat her paternoster with a loud voice. Her lover, finding himself under the necessity of retiring, started up, and, stung with the most violent pangs of rage and disappointment, ran directly to the spot from whence this diabolical noise seemed to proceed. There encountering the ass he discharged such a volley of blows at him and his rider, that the creature carried him off at a round trot, and they roared in unison all the way. Having thus cleared the room of such disagreeable company, he went back to his mistress, and assuring her that this was only some foolish blank of pallet, took his leave, with a promise of returning after the quiet of the inn should be re-established. In the meantime, the noise of the Borik, the cries of the painter, and the lady's scream, had alarmed the whole house, and the ass, in the precipitation of his retreat, seeing people with lights before him, took shelter in the apartment for which he was at first designed, just as the Levite, aroused at the uproar, had quitted his little and was attempting to recover his own chamber unperceived. Seeing himself opposed by such an animal, mounted by a tall, meager, lantern-jawed figure, half-naked, with a white nightcap upon his head which added to the natural paleness of his complexion, the Jew was sorely troubled in mind and believing it to be an apparition of Balaam and his ass, 
flew backward with a nimble pace, and crept under the bed, where he lay, concealed. Mr. Jolter and the priest, who were the foremost of those who had been aroused by the noise, were not unmoved when they saw such a spectacle rushing into the chamber, whence the lady of pleasure began to shriek. The governor made a full halt, and the capuchin discovered no inclination to proceed. They were, however, by the pressure of the crowd that followed them, thrust forward to the door, through which the vision entered, and the jolter, with great ceremony, complimented his reverence with the pa, beseeching him to walk in. The mendicant was too courteous and humble to accept this preeminence, and a very earnest dispute ensued, during which, the ass, in the course of his circuit, showed himself and rider, and in a trice decided the contest, for, struck with the second glimpse, both at one instant sprang backward with such force, as overturned their next men, who communicated the impulse to those that stood behind them, and these again to others, so that the whole passage was strewed with a long file of people, that lay in a line, like the sequel and dependence of a pack of cards. In the midst of this havoc, our hero returned from his own room with an air of astonishment, asking the cause of this uproar. Receiving such hints of intelligence as Jolter's consternation would permit him to give, he snatched the candle out of his hand, and advanced into the haunted chamber without hesitation, being followed by all present, who broke forth into a long and loud peal of laughter, when they perceived the ludicrous source of their disquiet. The painter himself made an effort to join their mirth, but he had been so harrowed by fear, and smarted so much with the pain of the discipline he had received from Pickle, that they could not, with all his endeavours, vanquish the ruefulness of his countenance. His attempt served only to increase the awkwardness of his situation, which was not at all mended by the behaviour of the coquette, who, furious with her disappointment, slipped on a petticoat and bedgown, and springing upon him, like Mother Hecuba, with her nails deprived all one side of his nose of the skin, and would not have left him a night to see through, if some of the company had not rescued him from her unmerciful talons. Provoked at this outrage, as well as by her behaviour to him in the diligence, he publicly explained his intention in entering her chamber in this equipage, and missing the Hebrew among the spectators, assured them that he must have absconded somewhere in the apartment. In pursuance of this intimation, the room was immediately searched, and the mortified Levite pulled up by the heels from his lurking place, so that Pallet had the good fortune, at last, to transfer the laugh from himself to his rival and the French inamorata, who accordingly underwent the ridicule of the whole audience. Chapter 57 Pallet endeavouring to unravel the mystery of the treatment he had received, falls out of the frying pan into the fire. Nevertheless, Pallet was still confounded and chagrined by one consideration, which was no other than that of his having been so roughly handled in the chamber, belonging, as he found upon inquiry, to the handsome young lady who was under the capuchin's direction. He recollected that the door was fast locked when his beast burst it open, and he had no reason to believe that any person followed him in his interruption. On the other hand, he could not imagine that such a gentle creature would either attempt to commit, or be able to execute, such a desperate assault as that which his body had sustained, and her demeanour was so modest and circumspect, that he durst not harbour the least suspicion of her virtue. These reflections bewildered him in the labyrinth of thought, he rummaged his whole imagination, endeavouring to account for what had happened. At length, he concluded, that either Peregrine, or the devil, or both must have been at the bottom of the whole affair, and determined, for the satisfaction of his curiosity, to watch our hero's motions, during the remaining part of the night, so narrowly, that his conduct, mysterious as it was, should not be able to elude his penetration. With these sentiments he retired to his own room, after the ass had been restored to the right owners, and the priest had visited and comforted his fair ward, who had been almost distracted with fear. Silence no sooner prevailed again, than he crawled darkling towards her door, and huddled himself up in an obscure corner, from whence he might observe the ingress or egress of any human creature. He had not long remained in this posture, when, fatigued with this adventure and that of the preceding night, his faculties were gradually overpowered with slumber, and, falling fast asleep, he began to snore like a whole congregation of Presbyterians. The Flemish beauty, hearing this discordant noise in the passage, began to be afraid of some new alarm, and very prudently bolted her door, so that when her lover wanted to repeat his visit he was not only surprised and incensed at this disagreeable serenade, the author of which he did not know, but when compelled by his passion, which was by this time wound to the highest pitch, he ventured to approach the entrance, he had the extreme mortification to find himself shut out. He durst not knock or signify his presence in any other manner, on account of the lady's reputation, which would have greatly suffered had the snore been waked by his endeavours. 
Had he known that the person who thus thwarted his views was the painter, he would have taken some effectual step to remove him, but he could not conceive what should induce Pallet to take up his residence in that corner, nor could he use the assistance of a light to distinguish him, because there was not a candle burning in the house. It is impossible to describe the rage and vexation of our hero, while he continued thus tantalized upon the brink of bliss, after his desire had been exasperated by the circumstances of his former disappointments. He ejaculated a thousand execrations against his own fortune, cursed all his fellow travellers without exception, vowed revenge against the painter, who had twice confounded his most interesting scheme, and was tempted to execute immediate vengeance upon the unknown cause of his present miscarriage. In this agony of distraction did he sweat two whole hours in the passage, though not without some faint hope of being delivered from his tormentor, who, he imagined, upon waking, would undoubtedly shift his quarters, and leave the field free to his designs, but when he heard the cock repeat his salutation to the morn, which began to open on the rear of night, he could no longer restrain his indignation. Going to his own chamber, he filled a basin with cold water, and, standing at some distance, discharged it full in the face of the gaping snorer, who, over and above the surprise occasioned by the application, was almost suffocated by the liquor that entered his mouth, and ran down into his windpipe. While he gasped like a person half-drowned, without knowing the nature of his disaster, or remembering the situation in which he fell asleep, Peregrine retired to his own door, and, to his no small astonishment, from a long howl that invaded his ears, learned that the patient was no other than Pallet, who had now, for the third time, balked his good fortune. Enraged at the complicated trespasses of this unfortunate offender, he rushed from his apartment with a horsewhip, and, encountering the painter in his flight, overturned him in the passage. There he exercised the instrument of his wrath with great severity on pretense of mistaking him for some presumptuous cur, which had disturbed the repose of the inn, nay, when he called aloud for mercy in a supplicating tone, and his chastiser could no longer pretend to treat him as a quadruped, such was the virulence of the young gentleman's indignation that he could not help declaring his satisfaction, by telling Pallet he had richly deserved the punishment he had undergone, for his madness, folly, and impertinence, in contriving and executing such idle schemes, as had no other tendency than that of plaguing his neighbours. Pallet protested, with great vehemence, that he was innocent as the child unborn of an intention to give umbrage to any person whatever, except the Israelite and his doxy, who he knew had incurred his displeasure. But as God is my saviour, said he, I believe I am persecuted with witchcraft, and begin to think that D.D. Priest is an agent of the devil, for he has been but two nights in our company, during which I have not closed an eye, but, on the contrary, have been tormented by all the fiends of hell. Pickle peevishly replied, that his torments had been occasioned by his own foolish imagination, and asked how he came to howl in that corner. The painter, who did not think proper to own the truth, said, that he had been transported thither by some preternatural conveyance and soused in water by an invisible hand. The youth, in hope of profiting by his absence, advised him to retire immediately to his bed, and by sleep strive to comfort his brain, which seemed to be not a little disordered by the want of that refreshment. Pallet himself began to be very much of the same way of thinking, and, in compliance with such wholesome counsel, betook himself to rest, muttering prayers all the way for the recovery of his own understanding. Pickle attended him to his chamber, and, locking him up, put the key in his own pocket, that he might not have it in his power to interrupt him again, but in his return he was met by Mr. Jolter and the doctor, who had been a second time alarmed by the painter's cries, and came to inquire about this new adventure. Half frantic with such a series of disappointments, he cursed them in his heart for their unseasonable appearance. When they questioned him about Pallet, he told them he had found him stark staring mad, howling in a corner, and wet to the skin, and conducted him to his room, where he was now abed. The physician, hearing this circumstance, made a merit of his vanity, and, under pretense of concern for the patient's welfare, desired he might have an opportunity of examining the symptoms of his disorder, without loss of time, alleging that many diseases might have been stifled in the birth, which afterwards baffled all the endeavours of the medical art. The young gentleman accordingly delivered the key, and once more withdrew into his own chamber, with a view of seizing the first occasion that should present itself of renewing his application to his Amanda's door, while the doctor, in his way to Pellet's apartment, hinted to the governor his suspicion that the patient laboured under that dreadful symptom called the hydrophobia, which he observed had sometimes appeared in persons who were not previously bit by a mad dog. This conjecture he founded upon the howl he uttered when he was soused with water, and began to recollect certain circumstances of the painter's behaviour for some days past, which now he could plainly perceive had prognosticated some such calamity. 
He then ascribed the distemper to the violent frights he had lately undergone, affirming that the affair of the Bastille had made such a violent encroachment upon his understanding, that his manner of thinking and speaking was entirely altered. By a theory of his own invention, he explained the effects of fear upon a loose system of nerves, and demonstrated the modus in which the animal spirits operate upon the ideas and power of imagination. This disquisition, which was communicated at the painter's door, might have lasted till breakfast, had not Jolt reminded him of his own maxim, venienti acarite morbo, upon which he put the key to immediate use, and they walked softly towards the bed, where the patient lay extended at full length in the arms of sleep. The physician took notice of his breathing hard, and his mouth being open, and from these diagnostics declared, that the liquidum nervosum was intimately affected, and a saliva impregnated with the speculated particles of the virus, howsoever contracted. This sentence was still farther confirmed by the state of his pulse, which, being full and slow, indicated an oppressed circulation, from a loss of elasticity in the propelling arteries. He proposed that he should immediately suffer a second aspersion of water, which would not only contribute to the cure, but also certify them, beyond all possibility of doubt, with regard to the state of the disease, for it would evidently appear, from the manner in which he would bear the application, whether or not his horror of water amounted to a confirmed hydrophobia. Mr. Jolter, in compliance with his proposal, began to empty a bottle of water, which he found in the room in a basin, when he was interrupted by the prescriber, who advised him to use the contents of the chamber pot, which, being impregnated with salt, would operate more effectually than pure element. Thus directed, the governor lifted up the vessel, which was replete with medicine, and with one turn of his hand, discharged the whole healing inundation upon the ill omened patient, who, waking in the utmost distraction of horror, yelled most hideously, just at the time when Peregrine had brought his mistress to a parley, and entertained hopes of being admitted into her chamber. Terrified at this exclamation, she instantly broke off the treaty, beseeching him to retire from the door, that her honour might receive no injury from his being found in that place, and he had just enough of recollection left to see the necessity of obeying the order, in conformity to which he retreated well nigh deprived of his senses, and almost persuaded that so many unaccountable disappointments must have proceeded from some supernatural cause, of which the idiot palate was no more than the involuntary instrument. Meanwhile, the doctor having ascertained the malady of the patient, whose cries, interrupted by frequent sobs and sighs, he interpreted into the barking of a dog, and having no more salt water at hand, resolved to renew the bath with such materials as chance would afford. He actually laid hold of the bottle and basin, but by this time the painter had recovered the use of his senses so well as to perceive his drift, and, starting up like a frantic bedlamite, ran directly to his sword, swearing, with many horrid imprecations, that he would murder them both immediately, if he should be hanged before dinner. They did not choose to wait the issue of his threat, but retired with such precipitation that the physician had almost dislocated his shoulder by running against one side of the entry. Jolter, having pulled the door after him and turned the key, betook himself to flight, roaring aloud for assistance. His colleague, seeing the door secured, valued himself upon his resolution, and exhorted him to return, declaring that, for his own part, he was more afraid of the madman's teeth than of his weapon, and admonishing the governor to re-enter and execute what they had left undone. Go in, said he, without fear or apprehension, and if any accident shall happen to you, either from his slaver or his sword, I will assist you with my advice, which from this station I can more coolly and distinctly administer, than I should be able to supply if my ideas were disturbed, or my attention engaged in any personal concern. Jolter, who could make no objection to the justness of the conclusion, frankly owned that he had no inclination to try the experiment, observing, that self-preservation was the first law of nature, that his connections with the unhappy lunatic were but slight, and that it could not be reasonably expected that he would run such risks for his service as were declined by one who had set out with him from England on the footing of a companion. This insinuation introduced a dispute upon the nature of benevolence, and the moral sense, which, the Republican argued, existed independent of any private consideration, and could never be affected by any contingent circumstance of time and fortune, while the other, who abhorred his principles, asserted the duties and excellence of private friendship with infinite rancor of altercation. During the hottest of the argument, they were joined by the Capuchin, who being astonished to see them thus virulently engaged at the door, and to hear the painter bellowing within the chamber, conjured them, in the name of God, to tell him the cause of that confusion which had kept the whole house in continual alarm during the best part of the night, and seemed to be the immediate work of the devil and his angels. When the governor gave him to understand that Pallet was visited with an evil spirit, 
he muttered a prayer of Street Antonio de Padua, and undertook to cure Painter, provided he could be secured so as that he might, without danger to himself, burn part of a certain relic under his nose, which he assured them was equal to the miraculous power of Elazar's ring. They expressed great curiosity to know what this treasure was, and the priest was prevailed upon to tell them in confidence, that it was a collection of the bearings of the nails belonging to those two madmen, whom Jesus purged of the legion of devils that afterwards entered the swine. So saying, he pulled from one of his pockets a small box, containing about an ounce of the bearings of a horse's hoof, at sight of which the governor could not help smiling, on account of the grossness of the imposition. The doctor asked, with a supercilious smile, whether those maniacs whom Jesus cured were of the sorrel complexion, or dapple grey, for, from the texture of these pairings, he could prove that the original owners were of the quadruped order, and even distinguish that their feet had been fortified with shoes of iron. The mendicant, who bore an inveterate grudge against the son of Esculapius ever since he had made so free with the Catholic religion, replied, with great bitterness, that he was a wretch with whom no Christian ought to communicate, that the vengeance of heaven would one day overtake him, on account of his profanity, and that his heart was shod with a metal much harder than iron, which nothing but hell fire would be able to melt. It was now broad day, and all the servants of the inn were afoot. Peregrine, seeing it would be impossible to obtain any sort of indemnification for the time he had lost, and the perturbation of his spirits hindering him from enjoying repose, which was moreover obstructed by the noise of Pallet and his attendants, put on his clothes at once, and, in exceeding ill-humour, arrived at the spot where this triumvirate stood debating about the means of overpowering the furious painter, who still continued his song of oaths and execrations, and made sundry efforts to break open the door. Chagrined as our hero was, he could not help laughing when he heard how the patient had been treated, and his indignation changing into compassion. He called to him through the keyhole, desiring to know the reason of his distracted behavior. Pallet no sooner recognized his voice than, lowering his own to a whimpering tone, My dear friend, said he, I have at last detected the ruffians who have persecuted me so much. I caught them in the fact of suffocating me with cold water, and by the Lord, I will be revenged, or may I never live to finish my Cleopatra. For the love of God, open the door, and I will make that conceited pagan, that pretender to taste, that false devotee of the ancients, who poisons people with silica garbies and devil's dung eyes say, I will make him a monument of my wrath, and an example to all the cheats and impostors of the faculty, and as for that thick-headed insolent pedant, his confederate, who emptied my own Jordan upon me while I slept, he had better have been in his beloved Paris, watching schemes for his friend the pretender, than incur the effects of my resentment. Gads Bodikins. I won't leave him a windpipe for the hangman to stop, at the end of another rebellion. Pickle told him his conduct had been so extravagant as to confirm the whole company in the belief that he was actually deprived of his senses, on which supposition, Mr. Jolter and the doctor had acted the part of friends, in doing that which they thought most conducive to his recovery, so that their concern merited his thankful acknowledgement, instead of his frantic menaces, that, for his own part, he would be the first to condemn him, as one utterly bereft of his wits, and give orders for his being secured as a madman unless he would immediately give a proof of his sanity by laying aside his sword, composing his spirits, and thanking his injured friends for their care of his person. This alternative quieted his transports in a moment, he was terrified at the apprehension of being treated like a bedlamite, being dubious of the state of his own brain, and, on the other hand, had conceived such a horror and antipathy for his tormentors, that, far from believing himself obliged by what they had done, he could not even think of them without the utmost rage and detestation. He, therefore, in the most tranquil voice he could assume, protested that he never was less out of his senses than at present, though he did not know how long he might retain them, if he should be considered in the light of a lunatic, that, in order to prove his being compass mentis, he was willing to sacrifice the resentment he so justly harboured against those who, by their malice, had brought him to this pass, but, as he apprehended it would be the greatest sign of madness he could exhibit to thank them for the mischiefs they had brought upon him, he desired to be excused from making any such concession, and swore he would endure everything rather than be guilty of such mean absurdity. Peregrine held a consultation upon this reply, when the governor and physician strenuously argued against any capitulation with a maniac, and proposed that some method might be taken to seize, fetter, and convey him into a dark room, where he might be treated according to the rules of art, but the capuchin, understanding the circumstances of the case, undertook to restore him to his former state without having recourse to such violent measures. Pickle, who was a better judge of the affair than any person present, opened the door without further hesitation, and displayed the poor painter standing with a woeful countenance, 
shivering in his shirt, which was as wet as if he had been dragged through the Dender Colon a spectacle which gave such offence to the chaste eyes of a Hebrew's mistress, who was by this time one of the spectators, that she turned her head another way, and withdrew to her own room, exclaiming against the indecent practices of men. Pallet, seeing the young gentleman enter, ran to him, and, taking him by the hands, called him his best friend, and said he had rescued him from those who had a design against his life. The priest would have produced his pairings and applied them to his nose, but was hindered by Pickle, who advised the patient to shift himself, and put on his clothes. This being done with great order and deliberation, Mr. Joltu who, with the doctor, had kept a wary distance, in expectation of seeing some storage effects of his distraction, began to believe that he had been guilty of a mistake, and accused the physician of having misled him by his false diagnostic. The doctor still insisted upon his former declaration assuring him, that although Pallet enjoyed a short interval for the present, the delirium would soon recur, unless they would profit by this momentary calm, and order him to be blooded, blistered, and purged with all imaginable dispatch. The governor, however, notwithstanding this caution, advanced to the injured party, and begged pardon for the share he had in giving him such disturbance. He declared, in the most solemn manner, that he had no other intention than that of contributing towards his welfare, and that his behaviour was the result of a physician's prescription, which he affirmed was absolutely necessary for the recovery of his health. The painter, who had very little gall in his disposition, was satisfied with this apology, but his resentment, which was before divided, now glowed with double fire against his first fellow-traveller, whom he looked upon as the author of all the mischances he had undergone, and marked out for his vengeance accordingly. Yet the doors of reconciliation were not shut against the doctor, who, with great justice, might have transferred this load of offence from himself to Peregrine, who was, without doubt, the source of the painter's misfortune, but, in that case, he must have owned himself mistaken in his medical capacity, and he did not think the friendship of Pallet important enough to be retrieved by such condescension, so that he resolved to neglect him entirely, and gradually forget the former correspondence he had maintained with a person whom he deemed so unworthy of his notice. Chapter 58. Peregrine, almost distracted with his disappointment, conjures the fair Fleming to permit his visits at Brussels she withdraws from his pursuit. Things being thus adjusted, and all the company dressed, they went to breakfast about five in the morning, and in less than an hour after were seated in the diligence, where a profound silence prevailed. Peregrine, who used to be the life of the society, was extremely pensive and melancholy on account of his mishap. The Israelite and his Elsinia dejected in consequence of their disgrace, the poet absorbed in lofty meditation, the painter in schemes of revenge, while Jolta, rocked by the motion of the carriage, made himself amends for the want of rest he had sustained, and the mendicant, with his fair charge, were infected by the cloudy aspect of our youth, in whose disappointment each of them, for different reasons, bore no inconsiderable share. This general languor and recess from all bodily exercise disposed them all to receive the gentle yoke of slumber, and in half an hour after they had embarked, there was not one of them awake, except our hero and his mistress, unless the capuchin was pleased to counterfeit sleep, in order to indulge our young gentleman with an opportunity of enjoying some private conversation with his beauteous ward. Peregrine did not neglect the occasion, but, on the contrary, seized the first minute, and, in gentle murmurs, lamented his hard hap in being thus the sport of fortune. He assured her, and that with great sincerity, that all the cross accidents of his life had not cost him one half of the vexation and keenness of chagrin which he had suffered last night, and that now he was on the brink of parting from her, he should be overwhelmed with the blackest despair, if she would not extend her compassion so far as to give him an opportunity of sighing at her feet in Brussels, during the few days his affairs would permit him to spend in that city. This young lady, with an air of mortification, expressed her sorrow for being the innocent cause of his anxiety, said she hoped last night's adventure would be a salutary warning to both their souls, for she was persuaded, that her virtue was protected by the intervention of heaven, that whatever impression it might have made upon him, she was enabled by it to adhere to that duty from which her passion had begun to swerve, and, beseeching him to forget her for his own peace, gave him to understand, that neither the plan she had laid down for her own conduct, nor the dictates of her honour, would allow her to receive his visits, or carry on any other correspondence with him, while she was restricted by the articles of her marriage vow. This explanation produced such a violent effect upon her admirer, that he was for some minutes deprived of the faculty of speech, which he no sooner recovered, than he gave vent to the most unbridled transports of passion. He taxed her with barbarity and indifference, told her, that she had robbed him of his reason and internal peace, that he would follow her to the ends of the earth, and cease to live sooner than cease to love her 
that he would sacrifice the innocent fool who had been the occasion of all this disquiet, and murder every man whom he considered as an obstruction to his views. In a word, his passions, which had continued so long in a state of the highest fermentation, together with the want of the repose which calms and quiets the perturbation of the spirits, had wrought him up to a pitch of real distraction. While he uttered these delirious expressions, the tears ran down his cheeks, and he underwent such agitation that the tender heart of the fair Fleming was affected with his condition, and, while her own face was bedewed with the streams of sympathy, she bade him, for heaven's sake, to be composed, and promised, for his satisfaction, to abate somewhat of the rigour of her purpose. Consoled by this kind declaration, he recollected himself, and, taking out his pencil, gave her his address, when she had assured him, that he should hear from her in four and twenty hours, at farthest, after their separation. Thus soothed, he regained the empire of himself, and, by degrees, recovered his serenity. But this was not the case with his Amanda, who, from this sample of his disposition, dreaded the impetuosity of his youth, and was effectually deterred from entering into any engagements that might subject her peace and reputation to the rash effects of such a violent spirit. Though she was captivated by his person and accomplishments, she had reflection enough to foresee, that the longer she countenanced his passion, her own heart would be more and more irretrievably engaged, and the quiet of her life the more exposed to continual interruption. She therefore profited by these considerations, and a sense of religious honour, which helped her to withstand the suggestions of inclination, and resolved to amuse her lover with false hopes, until she should have it in her power to relinquish his conversation, without running any risk of suffering by the inconsiderate sallies of his love. It was with this view that she desired he would not insist upon attending her to her mother's house, when they arrived at Brussels, and he, cajoled by her artifice, took a formal leave of her, together with the other strangers, fixing his habitation at the inn to which he and his fellow travellers had been directed, in the impatient expectation of receiving a kind summons from her within the limited time. Meanwhile, in order to divert his imagination, he went to see the Stadthouse, Park, and Arsenal, took a superficial view of the bookseller's cabinet of curiosities, and spent the evening at the Italian Opera, which was at that time exhibited for the entertainment of Prince Charles of Lorraine, then Governor of the Low Countries. In short, the stated period was almost lapsed when Peregrine received a letter to this purport colon. Sir Connor if you knew what violence I do my own heart, in declaring, that I have withdrawn myself for ever from your addresses, you would surely applaud the sacrifice I make to virtue, and strive to imitate this example of self-denial. Yes, sir, heaven hath lent me grace to struggle with my guilty passion, and henceforth to avoid the dangerous sight of him, who inspired it. I therefore conjure you, by the regard you ought to have to the eternal welfare of us both, as well as by the esteem and affection you profess, to war with your unruly inclination, and desist from all attempts of frustrating the laudable resolution I have made. Seek not to invade the peace of one who loves you, to disturb the quiet of a family that never did you wrong, and to alienate the thoughts of a weak woman from a deserving man, who, by the most sacred claim, ought to have the full possession of her heart. This billet, without either date or subscription, banished all remains of discretion from the mind of our hero, who ran instantly to the landlord in all the ecstasy of madness and demanded to see the messenger who brought the letter on pain of putting his whole family to the sword. The innkeeper, terrified by his looks and menaces, fell upon his knees, protesting in the face of heaven that he was utterly ignorant and innocent of anything that could give him offence, and that the billet was brought by a person whom he did not know, and who retired immediately, saying it required no answer. He then gave utterance to his fury in a thousand imprecations and invectives against the writer, whom he dishonoured with the appellations of a coquette, a jilt, an adventurer, who, by means of a pimping priest, had defrauded him of his money. He denounced vengeance against the mendicant, whom he swore he would destroy if ever he should set eyes on him again. The painter unluckily appearing during this paroxysm of rage, he seized him by the throat, saying he was ruined by his accursed folly, and in all likelihood poor Pallet would have been strangled had not Jolter interposed in his behalf, beseeching his pupil to have mercy upon the sufferer, and, with infinite anxiety, desiring to know the cause of this violent assault. He received no answer but a string of incoherent curses. When the painter, with unspeakable astonishment, took God to witness that he had done nothing to disoblige him, the governor began to think, in sad earnest, that Peregrine's vivacity had at length risen to the transports of actual madness, and was himself almost distracted with this supposition. That he might the better judge what remedy ought to be applied, he used his whole influence, and practised all his eloquence upon the youth in order to learn the immediate cause of his delirium. He employed the most pathetic entreaties, and even shed tears in the course of his supplication, 
so that Pickle, the first violence of the hurricane being blown over, was ashamed of his own imprudence, and retired to his chamber in order to recollect his dissipated thoughts. There he shut himself up, and for the second time perusing the fatal epistle, began to waver in his opinion of the author's character and intention. He sometimes considered her as one of those nymphs, who, under the mask of innocence and simplicity, practice upon the hearts and purses of unwary and inexperienced youths, this was the suggestion of his wrath inflamed by disappointment, but when he reflected upon the circumstances of her behavior, and recalled her particular charms to his imagination, the severity of his censure gave way and his heart declared in favor of her sincerity. Yet even this consideration aggravated the sense of his loss, and he was in danger of relapsing into his former distraction, when his passion was a little becalmed by the hope of seeing her again, either by accident or in the course of a diligent and minute inquiry, which he forthwith resolved to set on foot. He had reason to believe that her own heart would espouse his cause in spite of her virtue's determination, and did not despair of meeting with the Capuchin, whose good offices he knew he could at any time command. Comforted with these reflections, the tempest of his soul subsided. In less than two hours he joined his company with an air of composure, and asked the painter's forgiveness for the freedom he had taken, the cause of which he promised hereafter to explain. Pallet was glad of being reconciled on any terms to one whose countenance supported him in equilibria with his antagonist the doctor, and Mr. Jolter was rejoiced beyond measure at his pupil's recovery. Chapter 59. Peregrine meets with Mrs. Hornbeck, and is consoled for his loss his valet de chamber is embroiled with her duenna, whom, however, he finds means to appease. Everything having thus resumed its natural channel, they dined together in great tranquillity. In the afternoon, Peregrine, on pretense of staying at home to write letters, while his companions were at the coffee-house, ordered a coach to be called, and, with his valet de chamber, who was the only person acquainted with the present state of his thoughts, set out for the promenade, to which all the ladies of fashion resort in the evening during the summer season, in hopes of seeing his fugitive among the rest. Having made a circuit round the walk, and narrowly observed every female in the place, he perceived at some distance the livery of Hornbeck upon a lackey that stood at the back of a coach, upon which he ordered his man to reconnoitre the said carriage while he pulled up his glasses, that he might not be discovered before he should have received some intelligence by which he might conduct himself on this unexpected occasion, that already began to interfere with the purpose of his coming they there, though it could not dispute his attention with the idea of his charming unknown. His Mercury, having made his observations, reported that there was nobody in the coach but Mrs. Hornbeck and an elderly woman, who had all the air of a duenna, and that the servant was not the same footman who had attended them in France. Encouraged by this information, our hero ordered himself to be driven close up to that side of their convenience on which his old mistress sat, and accosted her with the usual salutation. This lady no sooner beheld her gallant than her cheeks reddened with a double glow, and she exclaimed, Dear brother, I am overjoyed to see you. Pray come into our coach. He took the hint immediately, and, complying with her request, embraced this new sister with great affection. Perceiving that her attendant was very much surprised and alarmed at this unexpected meeting, she, in order to banish her suspicion, and at the same time give her lover his cue, told him that his brother, meaning her husband, was gone to the spa for a few weeks, by the advice of physicians, on account of his ill state of health, and that, from his last letter, she had the pleasure to tell him he was in a fair way of doing well. The young gentleman expressed his satisfaction at this piece of news, observing, with an air of fraternal concern, that if his brother had not made too free with his constitution, his friends in England would have had no occasion to repine at his absence and want of health, by which he was banished from his own country and connections. He then asked, with an affectation of surprise, why she had not accompanied her spouse, and was given to understand that his tenderness of affection would not suffer him to expose her to the fatigues of the journey, which lay among rocks that were almost inaccessible. The duenna's doubts being eased by this preamble of conversation, he changed the subject to the pleasures of the place, and, among other such questions, inquired if she had as yet visited Versailles. This is a public house, situated upon the canal, at the distance of about two miles from town, and accommodated with tolerable gardens, for the entertainment of company. When she replied in the negative, he proposed to accompany her thither immediately, but the governante, who had hitherto sat silent, objected to this proposal, telling them, in broken English, that as the lady was under her care, she could not answer to Mr. Hornbeck for allowing her to visit such a suspicious place. As for that matter, Madame, said the confident gallant, give yourself no trouble, the consequences shall be at my peril, and I will undertake to ensure you against my brother's resentment. So saying, 
he directed the coachman to the place, and ordered his own to follow, under the auspices of his valet de chamber, while the old gentlewoman, overruled by his assurance, quietly submitted to his authority. Being arrived at the place, he handed the ladies from the coach, and then, for the first time, observed that the duenna was lame, a circumstance of which he did not scruple to take the advantage, for they had scarce alighted, and drunk a glass of wine, when he advised his sister to enjoy a walk in the garden, and although the attendant made shift to keep them almost always in view, they enjoyed a detached conversation, in which Peregrine learned that the true cause of her being left behind at Brussels, whilst her husband proceeded to spar, was his dread of the company and familiarities of that place, to which his jealousy durst not expose her, and that she had lived three weeks in a convent at Lyle, from which she was delivered by his own free motion, because indeed he could no longer exist without her company, and, lastly, our lover understood that her governante was a mere dragon, who had been recommended to him by a Spanish merchant, whose wife she attended to her dying day, but she very much questioned whether or not her fidelity was proof enough against money and strong waters. Peregrine assured her the experiment should be tried before parting, and they agreed to pass the night at Versailles, provided his endeavours should succeed. Having exercised themselves in this manner, until his duenna's spirits were pretty much exhausted, that she might be the be the better disposed to recruit them with a glass of liqueur, they returned to their apartment, and the cordial was recommended and received in a bumper, but as it did not produce such a visible alteration as the sanguine hopes of Pickle had made him expect, and the old gentlewoman observed that it began to be late, and that the gates would be shut in a little time, he filled up a parting glass, and pledged her in equal quantity. Her blood was too much chilled to be warmed even by this extraordinary dose, which made immediate innovation in the brain of our youth, who, in the gaiety of his imagination, overwhelmed this she Argus with such profusion of gallantry, that she was more intoxicated with his expressions than with the spirits she had drunk. When in the course of toying he dropped a purse into her bosom, she seemed to forget how the night wore, and, with the approbation of her charge, assented to his proposal of having something for supper. This was a great point which our adventurer had gained, and yet he plainly perceived that the governant he mistook his meaning, by giving herself credit for all the passion he had professed. As this error could be rectified by no other means than those applying her with a bottle, until her distinguishing faculties should be overpowered, he promoted a quick circulation. She did him justice, without any manifest signs of inebriation, so long, that his own eyes began to reel in the sockets, and he found that before his scheme could be accomplished, he should be effectually unfitted for all the purposes of love. He therefore had recourse to his valet de chamber, who understood the hint as soon as it was given, and readily undertook to perform the part of which his master had played the prelude. This affair being settled to his satisfaction, and the night at odds with morning, he took an opportunity of imparting to the ear of this aged Dulcinea a kind whisper, importing a promise of visiting her when his sister should be retired to her own chamber, and an earnest desire of leaving her door unlocked. This agreeable information being communicated, he conveyed a caution of the same nature to Mrs. Hornbeck, as he led her to her apartment, and darkness and silence no sooner prevailed in the house, than he and his trusted squire set out on their different voyages. Everything would have succeeded according to their wish, had not the valet de chamber suffered himself to fall asleep at the side of his inamorata, and, in the agitation of a violent dream, exclaimed in a voice so unlike that of her supposed adorer, that she distinguished the difference at once. Waking him with a pinch and a loud shriek, she threatened to prosecute him for a rape, and reviled him with all the epithets her rage and disappointment could suggest. The Frenchman, finding himself detected, behaved with great temper and address. He begged she would compose herself, on account of her own reputation, which was extremely dear to him, protesting that he had a most inviolable esteem for her person. His representations had weight with the duenna, who, upon recollection, comprehended the whole affair, and thought it would be her interest to bring matters to an accommodation. She therefore admitted the apologies of her bedfellow, provided he would promise to atone by marriage for the injury she had sustained, and in this particular he set her heart at ease by repeated vows, which he uttered with surprising volubility, though without any intention to perform the least title of their contents. Peregrine, who had been alarmed by her exclamation, and ran to the door with a view of interposing according to the emergency of the case, overhearing the affair thus compromised, returned to his mistress, who was highly entertained with an account of what had passed, foreseeing that for the future she should be under no difficulty or restriction from the severity of her guard. Chapter 60 Hornbeck is informed of his wife's adventure with Peregrine, for whom he prepares a stratagem, which is rendered ineffectual by the information of Pipes the husband is ducked for his intention, and our hero apprehended by the patrol. There was another person, however, still ungained, and that was no other than her footman, 
whose secrecy our hero attempted to secure in the morning by a handsome present, which he received with many professions of gratitude and devotion to his service, yet this complaisance was nothing but a cloak used to disguise the design he harbored of making his master acquainted with the whole transaction. Indeed this lackey had been hired, not only as a spy upon his mistress, but also as a check on the conduct of the governantee, with promise of ample reward if ever he should discover any sinister or suspicious practices in the course of her behavior. As for the footman whom they had brought from England, he was retained in attendance upon the person of his master, whose confidence he had lost by advising him to gentle methods of reclaiming his lady, when her irregularities had subjected her to his wrath. The Flemish valley, in consequence of the office he had undertaken, wrote to Hornbeck by the first post, giving an exact detail of the adventure at Versailles, with such a description of the pretended brother as left the husband no room to think he could be any other person than his first dishonorer, and exasperated him to such a degree, that he resolved to lay an ambush for this invader, and at once disqualify him from disturbing his repose, by maintaining further correspondence with his wife. Meanwhile the lovers enjoyed themselves without restraint, and Peregrine's plan of inquiry after his dear unknown was for the present postponed. His fellow travellers were confounded at his mysterious motions, which filled the heart of Jolter with anxiety and terror. This careful conductor was fraught with such experience of his pupil's disposition, that he trembled with the apprehension of some sudden accident, and lived in continual alarm, like a man that walks under the wall of a nodding tower. Nor did he enjoy any alleviations of his fears, when, upon telling the young gentleman that the rest of the company were desirous of departing for Antwerp, he answered, they were at liberty to consult their own inclinations, but, for his own part, he was resolved to stay in Brussels a few days longer. By this declaration the governor was confirmed in the opinion of his having some intrigue upon the anvil. In the bitterness of his vexation, he took the liberty of signifying his suspicion, and reminding him of the dangerous dilemmas to which he had been reduced by his former precipitation. Peregrine took his caution in good part, and promised to behave with such circumspection as would screen him from any troublesome consequences for the future, but, nevertheless, behaved that same evening in such a manner as plainly showed that his prudence was nothing else than vain speculation. He had made an appointment to spend the night, as usual, with Mrs. Hornbeck, and about nine o'clock hastened to her lodgings, when he was accosted in the street by his old discarded friend Thomas Pipes, who, without any other preamble, told him, that for all he had turned him adrift, he did not choose to see him run full sail into his enemy's harbour, without giving him timely notice of the danger. I'll tell you what, said he, mayhap you think I want to curry favour, that I may be taken in tow again, if you do, you have made a mistake in your reckoning. I am old enough to be laid up, and have to keep my planks from the weather. But this here is the affair, I have known you since you were no higher than a mile in spike, and shouldn't care to see you deprived of your rigging at these years, whereby I am informed by Hornbeck's man, whom I this afternoon fell in with by chance, as how his master has got intelligence of your boarding his wife, and has steered privately into this port with a large complement of hands, in order, G.C., to secure you while you are under the hatches. Now, if so be as how you have a mind to give him a salt deal for his supper, here am I, without hope of fee or reward, ready to stand by you as long as my timbers will stick together, and if I expect any recompense, may I be bound to eat towicum and drink bilge water for life. Startled at this information, Peregrine examined him upon the particulars of his discourse with a lackey, and when he understood that Hornbeck's intelligence flowed from the canal of his Flemish footman, he believed every circumstance of Tom's report, thanked him for his warning, and, after having reprimanded him for his misbehavior at Lyle, assured him that it should be his own fault if ever they should part again. He then deliberated with himself whether or not he should retort the purpose upon his adversary, but when he considered that Hornbeck was not the aggressor, and made that unhappy husband's case his own, he could not help quitting his intention of revenge, though, in his opinion, it ought to have been executed in a more honorable manner, and therefore he determined to chastise him for his want of spirit. Nothing surely can be more insolent and unjust than this determination, which induced him to punish a person for his want of courage to redress the injury which he himself had done to his reputation and peace, and yet of his barbarity of decision is authorized by the opinion and practice of mankind. With these sentiments he returned to the inn, and, putting a pair of pistols in his pocket, ordered his valet de chamber and pipes to follow him at a small distance, so as that they should be within call in case of necessity and then posted himself within thirty yards of his Elsinier's door. There he had not been above half an hour, when he perceived four men take their station on the other side, with a view, as he guessed, to watch for his going in, that he might be taken unaware. But when they had tarried a considerable time in that corner, without reaping the fruits of their expectation, 
Their leader, persuaded that the gallant had gained admittance by some secret means, approached the door with his followers, who, according to the instructions they had received, no sooner saw it opened, than they rushed in, leaving their employer in the street, where he thought his person would be least endangered. Our adventurer, seeing him all alone, advanced with speed, and clapping a pistol to his breast, commanded him to follow his footsteps, without noise, on pain of immediate death. Terrified at this sudden apparition, Hornbeck obeyed in silence, and, in a few minutes, they arrived at the quay, where Pickle, halting, gave him to understand that he was no stranger to his villainous design, told him, that if he conceived himself injured by any circumstance of his conduct, he would now give him an opportunity of resenting the wrong in a manner becoming a man of honor. You have a sword about you, said he, or, if you don't choose to put the affair on that issue, here is a brace of pistols, take which you please. Such an address could not fail to disconcert a man of his character. After some hesitation, he, in a faltering accent, denied that his design was to mutilate Mr. Pickle, but that he thought himself entitled to the benefit of the law, by which he would have obtained a divorce, if he could have procured evidence of his wife's infidelity, and, with that view, he had employed people to take advantage of the information he had received. With regard to this alternative, he declined it entirely, because he could not see what satisfaction he should enjoy in being shot through the head, or run through the lungs, by a person who had already wronged him in an irreparable manner. Lastly, his fear made him propose that the affair should be left to the arbitration of two creditable men, altogether unconcerned in the dispute. To these remonstrances Peregrine replied, in the style of a hot-headed young man, conscious of his own unjustifiable behavior, that every gentleman ought to be a judge of his own honor and therefore he would submit to the decision of no umpire whatsoever, that he would forgive his want of courage, which might be a natural infirmity, but his mean dissimulation he could not pardon. That, as he was certified of the rascally intent of his ambuscade by undoubted intelligence, he would treat him, not with a retaliation of his own treachery, but with such indignity as a scoundrel deserves to suffer, unless he would make one effort to maintain the character he assumed in life. So saying, he again presented his pistols, which being rejected as before, he called his two ministers, and ordered them to duck him in the canal. This command was pronounced and executed almost in the same breath, to the unspeakable terror and disorder of the poor shivering patient, who, having undergone the immersion, ran about like a drowned rat, squeaking for assistance and revenge. His cries were overheard by the patrol, who, chancing to pass that way, took him under their protection, and, in consequence of his complaint and information, went in pursuit of our adventurer and his attendants, who were soon overtaken and surrounded. Rash and inconsiderate as the young gentleman was, he did not pretend to stand upon the defensive against a file of musketeers, although Pipes had drawn his cutlass at their approach, but surrendered himself without opposition, and was conveyed to the main guard, where the commanding officer, engaged by his appearance and address, treated him with all imaginable respect. Hearing the particulars of his adventure, he assured him that the prince would consider the whole as a tour de Junus, and order him to be released without delay. Next morning, when this gentleman gave in his report, he made such a favorable representation of the prisoner, that our hero was on the point of being discharged, when Hornbeck preferred a complaint, accusing him of a purpose to assassination and praying that such punishment should be inflicted upon him as his highness should think adequate to the nature of the crime. The prince, perplexed with this petition, in consequence of which he foresaw that he must disoblige a British subject, sent for the plaintiff, of whom he had some knowledge, and, in person, exhorted him to drop the prosecution, which would only serve to propagate his own shame. But Hornbeck was too much incensed to listen to any proposal of that kind, and peremptorily demanded justice against the prisoner, whom he represented as an obscure adventurer, who had made repeated attempts upon his honor and his life. Prince Charles told him, that what he had advised was in the capacity of a friend, but, since he insisted upon his acting as a magistrate, the affair should be examined, and determined according to the dictates of justice and truth. The petitioner being dismissed with this promise, the defendant was, in his turn, brought before the judge, whose prepossession in his favor was in a great measure weakened by what his antagonist had said to the prejudice of his birth and reputation. Chapter 61. Peregrine is released jolter confounded at his mysterious conduct a contest happens between the poet and painter, who are reconciled by the mediation of their fellow travelers. Our hero, understanding from some expressions which escaped the prince, that he was considered in the light of a sharper and assassin, begged that he might have the liberty of sending for some vouchers, that would probably vindicate his character from the malicious aspersions of his adversary. This permission being granted, he wrote a letter to his governor, 
desiring that he would bring to him the letters of recommendation which he had received from the British ambassador at Paris, and such other papers as he thought conducive to evince the importance of his situation. The billet was given in charge to one of the subaltern officers on duty, who carried it to the inn, and demanded to speak with Mr. Jolter. Pallet, who happened to be at the door when this messenger arrived, and heard him inquire for the tutor, ran directly to that gentleman's apartment, and in manifest disorder, told him that a huge fellow of a soldier, with a monstrous pair of whiskers, and fur cap as big as a bushel, was asking for him at the door. The poor governor began to shake at this intimation, though he was not conscious of having committed anything that could attract the attention of the state. When the officer appeared at his chamber door, his confusion increased to such a degree, that his perception seemed to vanish, and the subaltern repeated the purport of his errand three times, before he could comprehend his meaning, or venture to receive the letter which he presented. At length he summoned all his fortitude, and having perused the epistle, his terror sank into anxiety. His ingenuous fear immediately suggested, that Peregrine was confined in a dungeon, for some outrage he had committed. He ran with great agitation to a trunk, and, taking out a bundle of papers, followed his conductor, being attended by the painter, to whom he had hinted his apprehension. When they passed through the guard, which was under arms, the hearts of both died within them, and when they came into the presence, there was such an expression of awful horror on the countenance of Jolter, that the prince, observing his dismay, was pleased to encourage him with an assurance that he had nothing to fear. Thus comforted, he recollected himself so well as to understand his pupil, when he desired him to produce the ambassador's letters, some of which being open, were immediately read by his highness, who was personally acquainted with the writer, and knew several of the noblemen to whom they were addressed. These recommendations were so warm, and represented the young gentleman in such an advantageous light, that the prince, convinced of the injustice his character had suffered by the misrepresentation of Hornbeck, took our hero by the hand, asked pardon for the doubts he had entertained of his honour, declared him from that moment at liberty, ordered his domestics to be enlarged, and offered him his countenance and protection as long as he should remain in the Austrian Netherlands. At the same time, he cautioned him against indiscretion in the course of his gallantries, and took his word of honour, that he should drop all measures of resentment against the person of Hornbeck during his residence in that place. The delinquent, thus honourably acquitted, thanked the prince in a most respectful manner for his generosity and candour, and retired with his two friends, who were amazed and bewildered in their thoughts at what they had seen and heard, the whole adventure still remaining without the sphere of their comprehension, which was not at all enlarged by the unaccountable appearance of Pipes, who, with the valet de chamber, joined them at the castle gate. Had Jolt had been a man of a luxuriant imagination, his brain would undoubtedly have suffered in the investigation of his pupil's mysterious conduct, which he strove in vain to unravel, but his intellects were too solid to be affected by the miscarriage of his invention, and, as Peregrine did not think proper to make him acquainted with the cause of his being apprehended, he contented himself with supposing that there was a lady in the case. The painter, whose imagination was of a more flimsy texture, formed a thousand chimerical conjectures, which he communicated to Pickle, in imperfect insinuations, hoping, by his answers and behaviour, to discover the truth. But the youth, in order to tantalise him, eluded all his inquiries, with such appearance of industry and art, as heightened his curiosity, while it disappointed his aim, and inflamed him to such a degree of impatience, that his wits began to be unsettled, then Peregrine was fain to recompose his brain, by telling him in confidence, that he had been arrested as a spy. This secret he found more intolerable than his former uncertainty. He ran from one apartment to another, like a goose in the agonies of a glaying, with intention of disburdening this important load, which Alter being engaged with a pupil, and all the people of the house ignorant of the only language he could speak, he was compelled, with infinite reluctance, to address himself to the doctor, who was at that time shut up in his own chamber. Having knocked at the door to no purpose, he peeped through the keyhole, and saw the physician sitting at a table, with a pen in one hand, and paper before him, his head reclined upon his other hand, and his eyes fixed upon the ceiling, as if he had been entranced. Pallet, concluding that he was under the power of some convulsion, endeavoured to force the door open, and the noise of his efforts recalled the doctor from his reverie. This poetical republican, being so disagreeably disturbed, started up in a passion, and, opening the door, no sooner perceived who had interrupted him, than he flung it in his face with great fury, and cursed him for his impertinent intrusion, which had deprived him of the most delightful vision that ever regaled the human fancy. He imagined, as he afterwards imparted to Peregrine, that, as he enjoyed himself in walking through the flowery plain that borders on Parnassus, he was met by a venerable sage, whom, by a certain divine vivacity that lightened from his eyes, 
he instantly knew to be the immortal Pinder. He was immediately struck with reverence and awe, and prostrated himself before the apparition, which, taking him by the hand, lifted him gently from the ground and, with words more sweet than the honey of the Hybla bees, told him, that, of all the moderns, he alone was visited by that celestial impulse by which he himself had been inspired, when he produced his most applauded odes. So saying, he led him up the sacred hill, persuaded him to drink a copious draught of the waters of the Hippocene, and then presented him to the harmonious nine, who crowned his temples with a laurel wreath. No wonder that he was enraged to find himself cut off from such sublime society. He raved in Greek against the invader, who was so big with his own purpose, that, unmindful of the disgrace he had sustained, and disregarding all the symptoms of the physician's displeasure, he applied his mouth to the door, in an eager tone. I'll hold you any wager, said he, that I guess the true cause of Mr. Pickle's imprisonment. To this challenge he received no reply, and therefore repeated it, adding, I suppose you imagine he was taken up for fighting a duel, or affronting a nobleman, or lying with some man's wife, or some such matter, but, egad, you was never more mistaken in your life, and I'll lay my Cleopatra against your Homer's head, that in four and twenty hours you shan't light on the true reason. The favorite of the muses, exasperated at this vexatious perseverance of the painter, who he imagined had come to tease and insult him, I would, said he, sacrifice a cock to Esculapius, were I assured that any person had been taken up for extirpating such a troublesome goth as you are from the face of the earth. As for your boasted Cleopatra, which you say was drawn from your own wife, I believe the copy has as much of the Tecalon as the original, but, were it mine, it should be hung up in the temple of Closena, as the picture of that goddess, for any other apartment would be disgraced by its appearance. Hark ye, sir, replied Pallet, enraged in his turn at the contemptuous mention of his darling performance, you may make as free with my wife as you think proper, but where my works, those are the children of my fancy, conceived by the glowing imagination, and formed by the art of my own hands, and you yourself are a Goth, and a Turk, and a Tartar, and an impudent pretending Jack and Apes, to treat with such disrespect a production which, in the opinion of all the connoisseurs of the age, will, when finished, be a masterpiece in its kind, and do honor to human genius and skill. So I say again and again, and I care not though your friend Plato heard me, that you have no more taste than a drayman's horse, and that those foolish notions of the ancients sought to be drubbed out of you with a pod cudgel, that you might learn to treat men of parts with more veneration. Perhaps you may not always be in the company of one who will halloo for assistance when you are on the brink of being chastised for your insolence, as I did, when you brought upon yourself the resentment of that Scot, who, by the Lord, would have paid you both Scot in blot, as Falstaff says, if the French officer had not put him in arrest. The physician, to this declamation, which was conveyed through the keyhole, answered, that he, the painter, was a fellow so infinitely below his consideration, that his conscience upbraided him with no action of his life except that of choosing such a wretch for his companion and fellow-traveller, that he had viewed his character through the medium of good-nature and compassion, which had prompted him to give Pallet an opportunity of acquiring some new ideas under his immediate instruction, but he had abused his goodness and condescension in such a flagrant manner, that he was now determined to discard him entirely from his acquaintance, and desired him, for the present, to take himself away, on pain of being kicked for his presumption. Pallet was too much incensed to be intimidated by this threat which he retorted with great virulence, defying him to come forth, that it might appear which of them was best skilled in that pedestrian exercise, which he immediately began to practice against the door with such thundering application, as reached the ears of Pickle and his governor, who coming out into the passage, and seeing him thus employed, asked if he had forgot the chamber pots of a lost, that he ventured to behave in such a manner as entitled him to a second prescription of the same nature. The doctor, understanding that there was company at hand, opened the door in a twinkling, and, springing upon his antagonist like a tiger, a fierce contention would have ensued, to the infinite satisfaction of our hero, had not Jolter, to the manifest peril of his own person, interposed, and partly by force, and partly by exhortations, put a stop to the engagement before it was fairly begun. After having demonstrated the indecency of such a vulgar encounter, betwixt two fellow citizens in a foreign land, he begged to know the cause of their dissension, and offered his good offices towards an accommodation. Peregrine also, seeing the fray was finished, expressed himself to the same purpose, and the painter, for obvious reasons, declining an explanation, his antagonist told the youth what a mortifying interruption he had suffered by the impertinent intrusion of Pallet, and gave him a detail of the particulars of his vision, as above recited. The arbiter owned the provocation was not to be endured, 
and decreed that the offender should make some atonement for his transgression. Upon which the painter observed, that, however he might have been disposed to make acknowledgments, if the physician had signified his displeasure like a gentleman, the complainant had now forfeited all claim to any such concessions, by the vulgar manner in which he had reviled him and his productions, observing, that, if he, the painter, had been inclined to retort his slanderous insinuations, the Republican's own works would have afforded ample subject for his ridicule and censure. After divers disputes and representations, peace was at length concluded, on condition, that, for the future, the doctor should never mention Cleopatra, unless he could say something in her praise, and that Pallet, in consideration of his having been the first aggressor, should make a sketch of the physician's vision, to be engraved and prefixed to the next edition of his odes. Chapter 62. The Travellers Depart for Antwerp at which place the painter gives a loose to his enthusiasm. Our adventurer, baffled in all his efforts to retrieve his last manda, yielded at length to the remonstrances of his governor and fellow travellers, who, out of pure complaisance to him, had exceeded their intended stay by six days at least, and a couple of post chaises, with three riding horses, being hired, they departed from Brussels in the morning, dined at Mechelin, and arrived about eight in the evening at the venerable city of Antwerp. During this day's journey Pallet was elevated to an uncommon flow of spirits, with the prospect of seeing the birthplace of Rubens, for whom he professed an enthusiastic admiration. He swore, that the pleasure he felt was equal to that of a Mussulman, on the last day of his pilgrimage to Mecca, and that he already considered himself a native of Antwerp, being so intimately acquainted with their so justly boasted citizen, from whom, at certain junctures, he could not help believing himself derived because his own pencil adopted the manner of that great man with surprising facility, and his face wanted nothing but a pair of whiskers and a beard, to exhibit the express image of the Fleming's countenance. He told them he was so proud of this resemblance, that, in order to render it more striking, he had, at one time of his life, resolved to keep his face sacred from the razor, and in that purpose had persevered, notwithstanding the continual reprehensions of Mrs. Pallet, who, being then with child, said, his aspect was so hideous, that she dreaded a miscarriage every hour, until she threatened in plain terms, to dispute the sanity of his intellects, and applied to the Chancellor for a committee. The doctor, on this occasion, observed, that a man who is not proof against the solicitations of a woman, can never expect to make a great figure in life, that painters and poets ought to cultivate no wives but the muses, or, if they are by the accidents of fortune encumbered with families, they should carefully guard against that pernicious weakness, falsely honoured with the appellation of natural affection, and pay no manner of regard to the impertinent customs of the world. Granting that you had been for a short time deemed a lunatic, said he, you might have acquitted yourself honourably of that imputation, by some performance that would have raised your character above all censure. Sophocles himself, that celebrated tragic poet, who, for the sweetness of his versification, was styled Melita, or the bee, in his old age, suffered the same accusation from his own children, who, seeing him neglect his family affairs, and devote himself entirely to poetry, carried him before the magistrate, as a man whose intellects were so much impaired by the infirmities of age, that he was no longer fit to manage his domestic concerns, upon which the reverend bard produced his tragedy of Oedipus Epicolono, as a work he had just finished, which being perused, instead of being declared unsound of understanding, he was dismissed with admiration and applause. I wish your beard and whiskers had been sanctioned by the like authority, though I am afraid you would have been in the predicament of those disciples of a certain philosopher, who drank decoctions of common seeds, that their faces might adopt the paleness of their master's complexion, hoping that, in being as one, they would be as learned as their teacher. The painter, stung by this sarcasm, replied, or like those virtuosi, who, by repeating Greek, eating silicicobi, and pretending to see visions, think they equal the ancients in taste and genius. The physician retorted, Pallet rejoined, and the altercation continued until they entered the gates of Antwerp, when the admirer of Rubens broke forth into a rapturous exclamation, which put an end to the dispute and attracted the notice of the inhabitants, many of whom by shrugging up their shoulders and pointing to their foreheads, gave shrewd indications that they believed him a poor gentleman disordered in his brain. They had no sooner alighted at the inn, than the pseudo-enthusiast proposed to visit the great church, in which he had been informed some of his master's pieces were to be seen, and was remarkably chagrined, when he understood that he could not be admitted till next day. He rose next morning by daybreak, and disturbed his fellow travellers in such a noisy and clamorous manner, that Peregrine determined to punish him with some new infliction, and, while he put on his clothes, actually formed the plan of promoting a duel between him and the doctor, 
in the management of which, he promised himself store of entertainment, from the behavior of both, being provided with one of those domestics who are always in waiting to offer their services to strangers on their first arrival, they were conducted to the house of a gentleman who had an excellent collection of pictures, and though the greatest part of them were painted by his favorite artist, Pallet condemned them all by the lump, because Pickle had told him beforehand that there was not one performance of Rubens among the number. The next place they visited was what is called the Academy of Painting, furnished with a number of paltry pieces, in which our painter recognized the style of Peter Paul, with many expressions of admiration, on the same sort of previous intelligence. From this repository, they went to the great church, and being led to the tomb of Rubens, the whimsical painter fell upon his knees, and worshipped with such appearance of devotion, that the attendant, scandalized at his superstition, pulled him up, observing, with great warmth, that the person buried in that place was no saint, but as great a sinner as himself, and that, if he was spiritually disposed, there was a chapel of the Blessed Virgin, at the distance of three yards on the right hand, to which he might retire. He thought it was incumbent upon him to manifest some extraordinary inspiration, while he resided on the spot where Rubens was born, and, therefore, his whole behavior was an affectation of rapture, expressed in distracted exclamations, convulsive starts, and uncouth gesticulations. In the midst of this frantic behavior, he saw an old capuchin, with a white beard, mount the pulpit, and hold forth to the congregation with such violence of emphasis and gesture, as captivated his fancy, and, bawling aloud, zounds! What an excellent Paul preaching at Athens! He pulled a pencil and a small memorandum book from his pocket, and began to take a sketch of the orator, with great eagerness and agitation, saying agad, Friend Raphael, we shall see whether you or I have got the best knack at trumping up an apostle. This appearance of disrespect gave offence to the audience, who began to murmur against this heretic libertine, when one of the priests belonging to the choir, in order to prevent any ill consequence from their displeasure, came and told him in the French language, that such liberties were not permitted in their religion, and advised him to lay aside his implements, lest the people should take umbrage at his design, and be provoked to punish him as a profane scoffer at their worship. The painter, seeing himself addressed by a friar, who, while he spoke, bowed with great complaisance, imagined that he was a begging brother come to supplicate his charity, and his attention being quite engrossed by the design he was making, he patted the priest's shaven crown with his hand, saying, O to Thames, O to Thames, and then resumed his pencil with great earnestness. The ecclesiastic, perceiving that the stranger did not comprehend his meaning, pulled him by the sleeve, and explained himself in the Latin tongue, upon which Pallet, provoked at his intrusion, cursed him aloud for an impudent beggarly son of a W, and, taking out a shilling, flung it upon the pavement, with manifest signs of indignation. Some of the common people, enraged to see their religion contempt, and their priests insulted at the very altar, rose from their seats, and, surrounding the astonished painter, one of the number snatched his book from his hand, and tore it into a thousand pieces. Frightened as he was, he could not help crying fire and forgets. All my favorite ideas are gone to wreck, and was in danger of being very roughly handled by the crowd, had not Peregrine stepped in, and assured them, that he was a poor unhappy gentleman, who labored under a transport of the brain. Those who understood the French language communicated this information to the rest, so that he escaped without any other chastisement than being obliged to retire. And as they could not see the famous descent from the cross till after the service was finished, they were conducted by their domestic to the house of a painter, where they found a beggar standing for his picture, and the artist actually employed in representing a huge louse that crawled upon his shoulder. Pallet was wonderfully pleased with this circumstance, which he said was altogether a new thought, and an excellent hint, of which he would make his advantage, and, in the course of his survey of this Fleming's performances, perceiving a piece in which two flies were engaged upon the carcass of a dog half devoured, he ran to his brother Brush, and swore he was worthy of being a fellow citizen of the immortal Rubens. He then lamented, with many expressions of grief and resentment, that he had lost his commonplace book, in which he had preserved a thousand conceptions of the same sort, formed by the accidental objects of his senses and imagination, and took an opportunity of telling his fellow travellers, that in execution he had equalled, if not excelled, the two ancient painters who had vied with each other in the representation of a curtain and a bunch of grapes, for he had exhibited the image of a certain object so like to nature, that the bare sight of it set a whole hog's tie in an uproar. When he had examined and applauded all the productions of this minute artist, they returned to the great church, and were entertained with a view of that celebrated masterpiece of Rubens, in which he has introduced the portraits of himself and his whole family.
The doors that conceal this capital performance were no sooner unfolded, than our enthusiast, debarred the use of speech, by a previous covenant with his friend Pickle, lifted up his hands and eyes, and putting himself in the attitude of Hamlet, when his father's ghost appears, adored in silent ecstasy and awe. He even made a merit of necessity, and, when they had withdrawn from the place, protested that his whole faculties were swallowed up in love and admiration. He now professed himself more than ever enamoured of the Flemish school, raved in extravagant encomiums, and proposed that the whole company should pay homage to the memory of the divine Rubens, by repairing forthwith to the house in which he lived, and prostrating themselves on the floor of his painting room. As there was nothing remarkable in the tenement, which had been rebuilt more than once since the death of the great man, Peregrine excused himself from complying with the proposal, on pretense of being fatigued with the circuit they had already performed. Jolter declined it for the same reason, and the question being put to the doctor, he refused his company with an air of disdain. Pallet, piqued at his contemptuous manner, asked, if he would not go and see the habitation of Pindor, provided he was in the city where the poet lived. And when the physician observed, that there was an infinite difference between the men, that I'll allow, replied the painter, for the devil a poet ever lived in Greece or Troy, that was worthy to clean the pencils of our beloved Rubens. The physician could not, with any degree of temper and forbearance, hear this outrageous blasphemy, for which, he said, Pallet's eyes ought to be picked out by owls, and the dispute arose, as usual, to such scurrilities of language, and indecency of behavior, that passengers began to take notice of their animosity, and Peregrine was obliged to interpose for his own credit. Chapter 63 Peregrine artfully ferments a quarrel between Pallet and the physician, who fight a duel on the ramparts. The painter betook himself to the house of the Flemish Raphael, and the rest of the company went back to their lodgings, where the young gentleman, taking the advantage of being alone with the physician, recapitulated all the affronts he had sustained from the painter's petulance, aggravating every circumstance of the disgrace, and advising him, in the capacity of a friend, to take care of his honor, which could not fail to suffer in the opinion of the world, if he allowed himself to be insulted with impunity, by one so much his inferior in every degree of consideration. The physician assured him, that Pallet had hitherto escaped chastisement, by being deemed an object unworthy his resentment, and in consideration of the wretch's family, for which his compassion was interested, but that repeated injuries would inflame the most benevolent disposition. And, though he could find no precedent of dueling among the Greeks and Romans, whom he considered as the patterns of demeanor, Pallet should no longer avail himself of his veneration for the ancients, but be punished for the very next offense he should commit. Having thus spirited up the doctor to a resolution from which he could not decently swerve, our adventurer acted the incendiary with the other party also, giving him to understand, that the physician treated his character with such contempt, and behaved to him with such insolence, as no gentleman ought to bear, that, for his own part, he was every day put out of countenance by their mutual animosity, which appeared in nothing but vulgar expressions, more becoming she boys and oyster to women than men of honor and education, and therefore he should be obliged, contrary to his inclination, to break off all correspondence with them both, if they would not fall upon some method to retrieve the dignity of their characters. These representations would have had little effect upon the timidity of the painter, who was likewise too much of a Grecian to approve of single combat, in any other way than that of boxing, an exercise in which he was well skilled, had they not been accompanied with an insinuation, that his antagonist was no Hector, and that he might humble him into any concession, without running the least personal risk. Animated by this assurance, our second Reuben set the trumpet of defiance to his mouth, swore he valued not his life a rush, when his honor was concerned, and entreated Mr. Pickle to be the bearer of a challenge, which he would instantly commit to writing. The mischievous fermenter highly applauded this manifestation of courage, by which he was at liberty to cultivate his friendship and society, but declined the office of carrying the billet, that his tenderness of Pallet's reputation might not be misinterpreted into an officious desire of promoting quarrels. At the same time, he recommended Tom Pipes, not only as a very proper messenger on this occasion, but also as a trusty second in the field. The magnanimous painter took his advice, and, retiring to his chamber, penned a challenge in these terms colon. Sir Connor when I am heartily provoked, I fear not the devil himself, much less I will not call you a pedantic coxcomb, nor an unmannerly fellow, because these are the epithets of the vulgar, but, remember, such as you are, I neither love you nor fear you, but, on the contrary, expect satisfaction for your audacious behavior to me on divers occasions, and will, this evening, in the twilight, meet you on the ramparts with sword and pistol, where the Lord have mercy on the soul of one of us, for your body shall find no favor with your incensed defier till death. 
name and palette. This resolute defiance, after having been submitted to the perusal, and honoured with the approbation of our youth, was committed to the charge of Pipes, who, according to his orders, delivered it in the afternoon, and brought for answer, that the physician would attend him at the appointed time and place. The challenger was evidently discomposed at the unexpected news of this acceptance, and ran about the house in great disorder, in quest of Peregrine, to beg his further advice and assistance. But understanding that a youth was engaged in private with his adversary, he began to suspect some collusion, and cursed himself for his folly and precipitation. He even entertained some thoughts of retracting his invitation, and submitting to the triumph of his antagonist, but before he would stoop to this opprobrious condescension, he resolved to try another expedient, which might be the means of saving both his character and person. In this hope he visited Mr. Jolter, and very gravely desired he would be so good as to undertake the office of his second in a duel which he was to fight that evening with a physician. The governor, instead of answering his expectation, in expressing fear and concern, and breaking forth into exclamations of good God. Gentlemen, what do you mean? You shall not murder one another while it is in my power to prevent your purpose. I will go directly to the governor of the place, who shall interpose his authority. I say, instead of these and other friendly menaces of prevention, Jolter heard the proposal with the most phlegmatic tranquillity, and excused himself from accepting the honor he intended for him, on account of his character and situation, which would not permit him to be concerned in any such rencontres. Indeed, this mortifying reception was owing to a previous hint from Peregrine, who, dreading some sort of interruption from his governor, had made him acquainted with his design, and assured him, that the affair should not be brought to any dangerous issue. Thus disappointed, the dejected challenger was overwhelmed with perplexity and dismay, and, in the terrors of death or mutilation, resolved to deprecate the wrath of his enemy, and conform to any submission he should propose, when he was accidentally encountered by our adventurer, who, with demonstrations of infinite satisfaction, told him in confidence, that the billet had thrown the doctor into an agony of consternation, that his acceptance of his challenge was a mere effort of despair, calculated to confound the ferocity of the centre, and dispose him to listen to terms of accommodation, that he had imparted the letter to him with fear and trembling, on pretence of engaging him as a second, but, in reality, with a view of obtaining his good offices in promoting a reconciliation, but, perceiving the situation of his mind, added our hero, I thought it would be more for your honour to baffle his expectation, and therefore I readily undertook the task of attending him to the field, in full assurance that he will the humble himself before you, even to prostration. In this security, you may go and prepare your arms, and bespeak the assistance of Pipes, who will squire you in the field, while I keep myself up, that our correspondence may not be suspected by the physician. Pallet's spirits, that were sunk to dejection, rose at this encouragement to all the insolence of triumph, he again declared his contempt of danger, and his pistols being loaded and accommodated with new flints, by his trusty armor-bearer. He waited, without flinching, for the hour of battle. On the first approach of twilight, somebody knocked at his door, and Pipes having opened it at his desire, he heard the voice of his antagonist pronounce, Tell Mr. Pallet that I am going to the place of appointment. The painter was not a little surprised at this anticipation, which so agreed with the information he had received from Pickle, and his concern beginning to recur, he fortified himself with a large bumper of brandy, which, however, did not overcome the anxiety of his thoughts. Nevertheless, he set out on the expedition with his second, betwixt whom and himself the following dialogue passed, in their way to the ramparts. Mr. Pipes, said the painter, with disordered accent, methinks the doctor was in a pestilent hurry with that message of his. E, E, answered Tom, I do suppose he longs to be foul of you. What? replied the other, do you think he thirsts after my blood, to be sure it does, said Pipes, thrusting a large quid of tobacco in his check, with great deliberation. If that be the case, cried Pallet, beginning to shake, he is no better than a cannibal, and no Christian ought to fight him on equal footing. Tom observing his emotion, eyed him with a frown of indignation, saying, you aren't afraid, are you, God forbid, replied the challenger, stammering with fear, what should I be afraid of? The worst he can do is to take my life, and then he'll be answerable both to God and man for the murder. Don't you think he will? I think no such matter, answered the second, if so be as how he puts a brace of bullets through your bows, and kills you fairly, it is no more murder than if I was to bring down a noddy from the main top sail yard. By this time Pallet's teeth chattered with such violence, that he could scarce pronounce this reply, Mr. Thomas, you seem to make very light of a man's life, but I trust in the Almighty. I shall not be so easily brought down. 
so many a man has fought a duel without losing his life. Do you imagine that I run such a hazard of falling by the hand of my adversary, you may or you may not, said the unconcerned Pipes, just as it happens. What then? Death is a debt that every man owes, according to the song, and if you set foot to foot, I think one of you must go to pot. Foot to foot! exclaimed the terrified painter, that's downright butchery, and I'll be due before I fight any man on earth in such a barbarous way. What? Do ye take me to be a savage beast? This declaration he made while they ascended the ramparts. His attendant perceiving the physician and his second at the distance of a hundred paces before them, gave him notice of their appearance, and advised him to make ready, and behave like a man. Pallet in vain endeavoured to conceal his panic, which discovered itself in a universal trepidation of body, and the lamentable tone in which he answered this exhortation of pipes, saying, I do behave like a man, but you would have me act the part of a brute. Are they coming this way? When Tom told him that they had faced about, and admonished him to advance, the nerves of his arm refused their office, he could not hold out his pistol, and instead of going forward, retreated with an insensibility of motion, till Pipes, placing himself in the rear, set his own back to that of his principal, and swore he should not budge an inch farther in that direction. While the valet thus tutored the painter, his master enjoyed the terrors of the physician, which were more ridiculous than those of Pallet, because he was more intent upon disguising them. His declaration to Pickle in the morning would not suffer him to start any objections when he received the challenge, and finding that the young gentleman made no offer of mediating the affair, but rather congratulated him on the occasion, when he communicated the painter's billet, all his efforts consisted in oblique hints, and general reflections upon the absurdity of dueling, which was first introduced among civilized nations by the barbarous Huns and Lunabids. He likewise pretended to ridicule the use of firearms, which confounded all the distinctions of skill and address, and deprived the combatant of the opportunity of signalizing his personal prowess. Pickle assented to the justness of his observations, but, at the same time, represented the necessity of complying with the customs of this world, ridiculous as they were, on which a man's honor and reputation depend, so that, seeing no hopes of profiting by that artifice, the Republican's agitation became more and more remarkable, and he proposed, in plain terms, that they should contend in armor, like the combatants of ancient days, for it was but reasonable that they should practice the manner of fighting, since they adopted the disposition of those iron times. Nothing could have afforded more diversion to our hero than the sight of two such duelists cased in iron, and he wished that he had promoted the quarrel in Brussels, where he could have hired the armor of Charles V, and the valiant Duke of Parma, for their accommodation, but as there was no possibility of furnishing them cap a pie at Antwerp, he persuaded him to conform to the modern use of the sword, and meet the painter on his own terms, and suspecting that his fear would supply him with other excuses for declining the combat, he comforted him with some distant insinuations, to the prejudice of his adversary's courage, which would, in all probability, evaporate before any mischief could happen. Notwithstanding this encouragement, he could not suppress the reluctance with which he went to the field, and cast many a wishful look over his left shoulder, to see whether or not his adversary was at his heels. When, by the advice of his second, he took possession of the ground, and turned about with his face to the enemy, it was not so dark, but that Peregrine could perceive the unusual paleness of his countenance, and the sweat standing in large drops upon his forehead, nay, there was a manifest disorder in his speech, when he regretted his want of the peeler and palmer, with which he would have made a rattling noise, to astonish his foe, in springing forward, and singing the hymn to battle, in the manner of the ancients. In the meantime, observing the hesitation of his antagonist, who, far from advancing, seemed to recoil, and even struggle with his second, he guessed the situation of the painter's thoughts, and, collecting all the manhood that he possessed, seized the opportunity of profiting by his enemy's consternation. Striking his sword and pistol together, he advanced in a sort of trot, raising a loud howl, in which he repeated, in lieu of the Spartan song, part of this trophy from one of Pindar's Pythia, beginning with ek the ongar make noi passi bruti is eretis, etc. This imitation of the Greeks had all the desired effect upon the painter, who seeing the physician running towards him like a fury, with a pistol in his right hand, which was extended, and hearing the dreadful yell he uttered, and the outlandish words he pronounced, was seized with a universal palsy of his limbs. He would have dropped down upon the ground, had not Pipes supported and encouraged him to stand upon his defence. The doctor, contrary to his expectation, finding that he had not flinched from the spot, though he had now performed one half of his career, put in practice his last effort, by firing his pistol, the noise of which no sooner reached the ears of the affrighted painter, than he recommended his soul to God, and roared for mercy with great vociferation. 
The Republican, overjoyed at this exclamation, commanded him to yield, and surrender his arms, on pain of immediate death, upon which he threw away his pistols and sword, in spite of all the admonitions and even threats of his second, who left him to his fate, and went up to his master, stopping his nose with signs of loathing and abhorrence. The victor, having won the Spoliopima, granted him his life, on condition that he would on his knees supplicate his pardon, acknowledge himself inferior to his conqueror in every virtue and qualification, and promise for the future to merit his favor by submission and respect. These insolent terms were readily embraced by the unfortunate challenger, who fairly owned, that he was not at all calculated for the purposes of war, and that henceforth he would contend with no weapon but his pencil. He begged with great humility, that Mr. Pickle would not think the worse of his morals for this defect of courage, which was a natural infirmity inherited from his father, and suspend his opinion of his talents, until he should have an opportunity of contemplating the charms of his Cleopatra, which would be finished in less than three months. Our hero observed, with an affected air of displeasure, that no man could be justly condemned for being subject to the impressions of fear, and therefore his cowardice might easily be forgiven, but there was something so presumptuous, dishonest, and disingenuous, in arrogating a quality to which he knew he had not the smallest pretension, that he could not forget his misbehavior all at once, though he would condescend to communicate with him as formerly, in hopes of seeking a reformation in his conduct. Pallet protested, that there was no dissimulation in the case, for he was ignorant of his own weakness, until his resolution was put to the trial. He faithfully promised to demean himself, during the remaining part of the tour, with that conscious modesty and penitence which became a person in his condition, and, for the present, implored the assistance of Mr. Pipes, in disembarrassing him from the disagreeable consequence of his fear. Chapter 64 The doctor exults in his victory they set out for Rotterdam, where they are entertained by two Dutch gentlemen in a yacht, which is overturned in the mass, to the manifest hazard of the painter's life they spend the evening with their entertainers, and next day visit a cabinet of curiosities. Tom was accordingly ordered to administer to his occasions, and the conqueror, elated with his success, which he in a great measure attributed to his manner of attack, and the hymn which he howled, told Peregrine, that he was now convinced of the truth of what Pindar sung in these words, Osidemi Pefelix Usatus and Tiberan Peridone Ianta, for he had no sooner begun to repeat the malefluent strains of that divine poet, than the wretch his antagonist was confounded, and his nerves unstrung. On their return to the inn, he expatiated on the prudence and tranquillity of his own behavior, and ascribed the consternation of Pallet to the remembrance of some crime that lay heavy upon his conscience, for, in his opinion, a man of virtue and common sense could not possibly be afraid of death, which is not only the peaceful harbor that receives him shattered on the tempestuous sea of life, but also the eternal seal of his fame and glory, which it is no longer in his power to forfeit and forego. He lamented his fate, in being doomed to live in such degenerate days, when war is become a mercenary trade, and ardently wished, that the day would come, when he should have such an opportunity of signalizing his courage in the cause of liberty, as that of Marathon, where a handful of Athenians, fighting for their freedom, defeated the whole strength of the Persian Empire. Would to heaven! said he, my muse were blessed with an occasion to emulate that glorious testimony on the trophy in Cyprus, erected by Simon, for two great victories gained on the same day over the Persians by sea and land, in which it is very remarkable, that the greatness of the occasion has raised the manner of expression above the usual simplicity and modesty of all other ancient inscriptions. He then repeated it with all the pomp of declamation, and signified his hope, that the French would one day invade us with such an army as that which Xerxes led into Greece that it might be in his power to devote himself, like Leonidas, to the freedom of his country. This memorable combat being thus determined, and everything that was remarkable in Antwerp surveyed, they sent their baggage down the Celt to Rotterdam, and set out for the same place in a post-wagon, which that same evening brought them in safety to the banks of the Maas. They put up at an English house of entertainment, remarkable for the modesty and moderation of the landlord, and next morning the doctor went in person to deliver letters of recommendation to two Dutch gentlemen from one of his acquaintance at Paris. Neither of them happened to be at home when he called, so that he left a message at their lodgings, with his address, and in the afternoon, they waited upon the company, and, after many hospitable professions, one of the two invited them to spend the evening at his house. Meanwhile they had provided a pleasure yacht, in which they proposed to treat them with an excursion upon the Maas. This being almost the only diversion that place affords, our young gentleman relished the proposal, and, notwithstanding the remonstrances of Mr. Jolter, who declined the voyage on account of the roughness of the weather, they went on board without hesitation, and found a collation prepared in the cabin. While they tacked to and fro in the river, 
Under the impulse of a mackerel breeze, the physician expressed his satisfaction, and Pallet was ravished with the entertainment. But the wind increasing, to the unspeakable joy of the Dutchmen, who had now an opportunity of showing their dexterity in the management of the vessel, the guests found it inconvenient to stand upon deck, and impossible to sit below, on account of the clouds of tobacco smoke which rolled from the pipes of their entertainers, in such volumes as annoyed them even to the hazard of suffocation. This fumigation, together with the extraordinary motion of the ship, began to affect the head and stomach of the painter, who begged earnestly to be set on shore. But the Dutch gentleman, who had no idea of his sufferings, insisted, with surprising obstinacy of regard, upon his staying until he should see an instance of the skill of the mariners, and, bringing him on deck, commanded the men to carry the vessel's lee gunwale under water. This nicety of navigation they instantly performed, to the admiration of Pickle, the discomposure of the doctor, and terror of Pallet, who blessed himself from the courtesy of a Dutchman, and prayed to heaven for his deliverance. While the Hollanders enjoyed the reputation of this feat, and the distress of the painter, at the same time, the yacht was overtaken by a sudden squall, that overset her in a moment, and flung every man overboard into the mass, before they could have the least warning of their fate, much less time to provide against the accident. Peregrine, who was an expert swimmer, reached the shore in safety, the physician, in the agonies of despair, laid fast hold on the trunk breeches of one of the men, who dragged him to the other side. The entertainers landed at the bronchies, smoking their pipes all the way with great deliberation, and the poor painter must have gone to the bottom, had not he been encountered by the cable of a ship that lay at anchor near the scene of their disaster. Though his senses had forsaken him, his hands fastened by instinct on this providential occurrence, which he held with such a convulsive grasp, that, when a boat was sent out to bring him on shore, it was with the utmost difficulty that his fingers were disengaged. He was carried into a house, deprived of the use of speech, and bereft of all sensation, and, being suspended by the heels, a vast quantity of water ran out of his mouth. This evacuation being made, he began to utter dreadful groans, which gradually increased to a continued roar, and, after he had regained the use of his senses, he underwent a delirium that lasted several hours. As for the treaters, they never dreamed of expressing the least concern to Pickle or the physician for what had happened, because it was an accident so common as to pass without notice. Leaving the care of their vessel to the seamen, the company retired to their respective lodgings, in order to shift their clothes, and in the evening our travellers were conducted to the house of their new friend, who, with a view of making his invitation a more agreeable, had assembled, to the number of twenty or thirty Englishmen, of all ranks and degrees, from the merchant to the bearwig maker's apprentice. In the midst of this congregation stood a chafing dish with live coals, for the convenience of lighting their pipes, and every individual was accommodated with a spitting box. There was not a mouth in the apartment unfurnished with a tube, so that they resembled a congregation of chimeras breathing fire and smoke, and our gentlemen were fain to imitate their example in their own defence. It is not to be supposed that the conversation was either very sprightly or polite, that the whole entertainment was of the Dutch cast frowsy and phlegmatic, and our adventurer, as he returned to his lodging, tortured with a headache, and disgusted with every circumstance of his treatment, cursed the hour in which the doctor had saddled them with such troublesome companions. Next morning by eight o'clock, these polite Hollanders returned the visit, and, after breakfast, attended their English friends to the house of a person that possessed a very curious cabinet of curiosities, to which they had secured our company's admission. The owner of this collection was a cheesemonger, who received them in a woolen nightcap, with straps buttoned under his chin. As he understood no language but his own, he told them, by the canal of one of their conductors, that he did not make a practice of showing his curiosities, but understanding that they were Englishmen, and recommended to his friends, he was content to submit them to their perusal. So saying, he led them up a dark stair, into a small room, decorated with a few paltry figures in plaster of Paris, two or three miserable landscapes, the skins of an otter, seal, and some fishes stuffed, and in one corner stood a glass case, furnished with newts, frogs, lizards, and serpents, preserved in spirits, a human fetus, a calf with two heads, and about two dozen of butterflies pinned upon paper. The virtuoso having exhibited these particulars, eyed the strangers with a look soliciting admiration and applause, and as he could not perceive any symptom of either in their gestures or countenances, withdrew a curtain, and displayed a wainscot chest of drawers, in which, he gave them to understand, was something that would agreeably amuse the imagination. Our travellers, regaled with this notice, imagined that they would be entertained with the sight of some curious medals, or other productions of antiquity, but how were they disappointed, when they saw nothing but a variety of shells, 
disposed in whimsical figures, in each drawer. After he had detained them full two hours with a tedious commentary upon the shape, size, and color of each department, he, with a supercilious simper, desired that the English gentleman would frankly and candidly declare, whether his cabinet, or that of Mynheer Sloan, at London, was the most valuable. When this request was signified in English to the company, the painter instantly exclaimed, by the lard, they are not to be named of a day. And as for that matter, I would not give one corner of Soltero's coffee house at Chelsea for all the trash he hath shown. Peregrine, unwilling to mortify any person who had done his endeavour to please him, observed, that what he had seen was very curious and entertaining, but that no private collection in Europe was equal to that of Sir Hans Sloane, which, exclusive of presents, had cost an hundred thousand pounds. The two conductors were confounded at this asseveration, which, being communicated to the cheesemonger, he shook his head with a significant grin, and, though he did not choose to express his incredulity in words, gave our hero to understand, that he did not much depend upon his veracity. From the house of this Dutch naturalist, they were draggled all round the city by the painful civility of their attendants, who did not quit them till the evening was well advanced, and then not till after they had promised to be with them before ten o'clock next day, in order to conduct them to a country house, situated in a pleasant village on the other side of the river. Pickle was already so much fatigued with their hospitality, that, for the first time of his life, he suffered a dejection of spirits, and resolved, at any rate, to avoid the threatened persecution of tomorrow. With this view, he ordered his servants to pack up some clothes and linen in a portmanteau, and in the morning embarked, with his governor, in the Trexcut, for The Hague, whither he pretended to be called by some urgent occasion, leaving his fellow travellers to make his apology to their friends, and assuring them, that he would not proceed for Amsterdam without their society. He arrived at The Hague in the forenoon, and dined at an ordinary frequented by officers and people of fashion, where being informed that the princess would see company in the evening, he dressed himself in a rich suit of the Parisian cut, and went to court, without any introduction. A person of his appearance could not fail to attract the notice of such a small circle. The prince himself, understanding he was an Englishman and a stranger, went up to him without ceremony, and, having welcomed him to the place, conversed with him for some minutes on the common topics of discourse. Chapter 65. They proceed to The Hague, from whence they depart for Amsterdam, where they see a Dutch tragedy visit the music house, in which Peregrine quarrels with the captain of a man of war they pass through Hay Erlem, in their way to Leiden and return to Rotterdam where the company separates, and our hero, with his attendants, arrive in safety at Harwich. Being joined by their fellow travellers in the morning, they made it to all the remarkable places in this celebrated village, saw the foundry, the stadthouse, the Spinhuis, Vauxhall, and Count Bentinck's gardens, and in the evening went to the French comedy, which was directed by a noted harlequin, who had found means to flatter the Dutch taste so effectually, that they extolled him as the greatest actor that ever appeared in the province of Holland. This famous company did not represent regular theatrical pieces, but only a sort of impromptus, in which this noted player always performed the greatest part of the entertainment. Among other sallies of wit that escaped him, there was one circumstance so remarkably adapted to the disposition and genius of his audience, that it were a pity to pass it over in silence. A windmill being exhibited on the scene, Harlequin, after having surveyed it with curiosity and admiration, asks one of the millers the use of that machine, and being told that it was a windmill, observes, with some concern, that as there was not the least breath of wind, he could not have the pleasure of seeing it turn round. Urged by this consideration, he puts himself into the attitude of a person wrapped in profound meditation, and, having continued a few seconds in this posture, runs to the miller with great eagerness and joy, and, telling him that he had found an expedient to make his mill work, very fairly unbuttons his breeches. Then presenting his posteriors to the sails of the machine, certain explosions are immediately heard, and the arms of the mill begin to turn round, to the infinite satisfaction of the spectators, who approve the joke with loud peals of applause. Our travellers stayed a few days at The Hague, during which the young gentleman waited on the British ambassador, to whom he was recommended by His Excellency at Paris, and lost about thirty guineas at billiards to a French adventurer, who decoyed him into the snare by keeping up his game. Then they departed in a post-wagon for Amsterdam, being provided with letters of introduction to an English merchant residing in that city, under whose auspices they visited everything worth seeing, and, among other excursions, went to see a Dutch tragedy acted, an entertainment which, of all others, had the strangest effect upon the organs of our hero, the dress of their chief personages was so antic, their manner so awkwardly absurd, 
and their language so ridiculously unfit for conveying the sentiment of love and honor, that Peregrine's nerves were deuritically affected with the complicated absurdity, and he was compelled to withdraw twenty times before the catastrophe of the piece. The subject of this performance was the famous story of Scipio's continence and virtue, in restoring the fair captive to her lover. The young Roman hero was represented by a broad-faced Batavian, in a burgomaster's gown and a fur cap, sitting smoking his pipe at a table furnished with a can of beer, a drinking glass, and a plate of tobacco. The lady was such a person as Scipio might well be supposed to give away, without any great effort of generosity, and indeed the Celtiberian prince seemed to be of that opinion, for, upon receiving her from the hand of the victor, he discovered none of those transports of gratitude and joy which Livy describes in recounting this event. The Dutch Scipio, however, was complacent enough in his way, for he desired her to sit at his right hand, by the appellation of Jaffrau, and with his own fingers filling a clean pipe, presented it to Minhera Lucio, the lover. The rest of the economy of the piece was in the same taste, which was so agreeable to the audience, that they seemed to have shaken off their natural phlegm, in order to applaud the performance. From the play our company adjourned to the house of their friend, where they spent the evening, and the conversation turning upon poetry, a Dutchman who was present, and understood the English language. Having listened very attentively to the discourse, lifted up with both hands the greatest part of a Cheshire cheese that lay upon the table, saying, I do know that is Boetra. Mine brought to be a great poet, and Ave brought a book as thick as all dat. Pickle, diverted with this method of estimating an author according to the quantity of his works, inquired about the subjects of this bard's writings, but of these his brother could give no account, or other information, but that there was little market for the commodity which hung heavy upon his hands, and induced him to wish he had applied himself to another trade. The only remarkable scene in Amsterdam, which our company bad not seen, was the Spalor music houses, which, by the connivance of the magistrates, are maintained for the recreation of those who might attempt the chastity of creditable women, if they were not provided with such conveniences. To one of these night houses did our travellers repair, under the conduct of the English merchant, and were introduced into such another place as the ever-memorable coffee-house of Molk King with this difference, that the company here were not so riotous as the bucks of Covent Garden, but formed themselves into a circle, within which some of the number danced to the music of a scurvy organ and a few other instruments, that uttered tunes very suitable to the disposition of the hearers, while the whole apartment was shrouded with clouds of smoke impervious to the view. When our gentlemen entered, the floor was occupied by two females and their gallants, who, in the performance of their exercise, lifted their legs like so many oxen at plough and the pipe of one of those hoppers happening to be exhausted, in the midst of his saraband, he very deliberately drew forth his tobacco box, filling and lighting it again, without any interruption to the dance. Peregrine being unchecked by the presence of his governor, who was too tender of his own reputation to attend them in this expedition, made up to a sprightly French girl who sat in seeming expectation of a customer, and prevailing upon her to be his partner, led her into the circle, and in his turn took the opportunity of dancing a minuet, to the admiration of all present. He intended to have exhibited another specimen of his ability in this art, when a captain of a Dutch man of war chancing to come in, and seeing a stranger engaged with a lady whom, it seems, he had bespoke for his bedfellow, he advanced without any ceremony, and seizing her by the arm, pulled her to the other side of the room. Our adventurer, who was not a man to put up with such a brutal affront, followed the ravisher with indignation in his eyes, and pushing him on one side, we took the subject of their contest, and led her back to the place from whence she had been dragged. The Dutchman, enraged at the youth's presumption, obeyed the first dictates of his collar, and lent his rival a hearty box on the ear, which was immediately repaid with interest, before our hero could recollect himself sufficiently to lay his hand upon his sword, and beckon the aggressor to the door. Notwithstanding the confusion and disorder which this affair produced in the room, and the endeavours of Pickle's company, who interposed, in order to prevent bloodshed, the antagonists reached the street, and Peregrine drawing, was surprised to see the captain advance against him with a long knife, which he preferred to the sword that hung by his side. The youth, confounded at this preposterous behaviour, desired him, in the French tongue, to lay aside the vulgar implement, and approach like a gentleman. But the Hollander, who neither understood the proposal, nor would have complied with this demand, had he been made acquainted with his meaning, rushed forward like a desperado, before his adversary could put himself on his guard, and if the young gentleman had not been endued with surprising agility, his nose would have fallen a sacrifice to the fury of the assailant. Finding himself in such imminent jeopardy, he leapt to one side, and the Dutchman passing him, in the force of his career, 
he with one nimble kick made such application to his enemy's heels, that he flew like lightning into the canal, where he had almost perished by pitching upon one of the posts with which it is faced. Peregrine having performed this exploit, did not stay for the captain's coming on shore, but retreated with all dispatch, by the advice of his conductor, and next day embarked, with his companions, in the scut, for Hay Erlem, where they dined, and in the evening arrived at the ancient city of Leiden, where they met with some English students, who treated them with great hospitality. Not but that the harmony of the conversation was that same night interrupted by a dispute that arose between one of those young gentlemen and the physician, about the cold and hot methods of prescription in the gout and rheumatism, and proceeded to such a degree of mutual reviling, that Pickle, ashamed and incensed at his fellow traveller's want of urbanity, espoused the other's cause, and openly rebuked him for his unmannerly petulance, which, he said, rendered him unfit for the purposes, and unworthy of the benefit, of society. This unexpected declaration overwhelmed the doctor with amazement and confusion, he was instantaneously deprived of his speech, and, during the remaining part of the party, sat in silent mortification. In all probability, he deliberated with himself, whether or not he should expostulate with the young gentleman on the freedom he had taken with his character in a company of strangers, but as he knew he had not a palate to deal with, he very prudently suppressed that suggestion, and, in secret, chewed the cud of resentment. After they had visited the physic garden, the university, the anatomical hall, and every other thing that was recommended to their view, they returned to Rotterdam, and held a consultation upon the method of transporting themselves to England. The doctor, whose grudge against Peregrine was rather inflamed than allayed by our hero's indifference and neglect, had tampered with the simplicity of the painter, who was proud of his advances towards a perfect reconciliation, and now took the opportunity of parting with our adventurer, by declaring that he and his friend Mr. Pallet were resolved to take their passage in a trading sloop, after he had heard Peregrine object against that tedious, disagreeable, and uncertain method of conveyance. Pickle immediately saw his intention, and, without using the least argument to dissuade them from their design, or expressing the smallest degree of concern at their separation, very coolly wished them a prosperous voyage, and ordered his baggage to be sent to Helvo Eslaiz. There he himself, and his retinue, went on board of the packet next day, and, by the favour of a fair wind, in eighteen hours arrived at Harwich. Chapter 66. Peregrine delivers his letters of recommendation at London, and returns to the garrison, to the unspeakable joy of the Commodore and his whole family. Now that our hero found himself on English ground, his heart dilated with the proud recollection of his own improvement since he left his native soil. He began to recognize the interest and ideas of his tender years, he enjoyed, by anticipation, the pleasure of seeing his friends in the garrison, after an absence of eighteen months, and the image of his charming Emily, which other less worthy considerations had depressed, resumed the full possession of his breast. He remembered, with shame, that he had neglected the correspondence with her brother, which he himself had solicited, and in consequence of which he had received a letter from that young gentleman, while he lived at Paris. In spite of these conscientious reflections, he was too self-sufficient to think he should find any difficulty in obtaining forgiveness for such sins of omission, and began to imagine that his passion would be prejudicial to the dignity of his situation, if it should not be gratified upon terms which formerly his imagination durst not conceive. Sorry I am, that the task I have undertaken, lays me under the necessity of divulging this degeneracy in the sentiment of our imperious youth, who was now in the heyday of his blood, flushed with the consciousness of his own qualifications, vain of his fortune, and elated on the wings of imaginary expectation. Though he was deeply enamoured of Miss Gauntlet, he was far from proposing her heart as the ultimate aim of his gallantry, which, he did not doubt, would triumph over the most illustrious females of the land, and at once regale his appetite and ambition. Meanwhile, being willing to make his appearance at the garrison equally surprising and agreeable, he cautioned Mr. Jolter against writing to the Commodore, who had not heard of them since their departure from Paris, and hired a post chaise and horses, for London. The Governor, going out to give orders about the carriage, inadvertently left a paper book open upon the table, and his pupil, casting his eyes upon the page, chanced to read these words, September 15th. Arrived in safety, by the blessing of God, in this unhappy kingdom of England, and thus concludes the journal of my last peregrination. Peregrine's curiosity being inflamed by this extraordinary conclusion he turned to the beginning, and perused several sheets of a diary such as is commonly kept by that class of people known by the denomination of travelling governors, for the satisfaction of themselves and the parents or guardians of their pupils, and for the edification and entertainment of their friends. 
that the reader may have a clear idea of Mr. Jolter's performance, we shall transcribe the transactions of one day, as he had recorded them, and that abstract will be a sufficient specimen of the whole plan and execution of the work. May 3rd. At 8 o'clock, set out from Boulogne in a post chaise, the morning hazy and cold. Fortified my stomach with a cordial. Recommended ditto to Mr. P. As an antidote against the fog. Mum. He refused it. The hither horse greased in the off paston of the hind leg. Arrived at Samers. Mum. This last was a post and a half, that is three leagues, or nine English miles. The day clears up. A fine champagne country, well stored with corn. The postillion says his prayers in passing by a wooden crucifix upon the road. Mum. The horses staled in a small brook that runs in a bottom, betwixt two hills. Arrived at Cormont. A common post. A dispute with my pupil, who is obstinate, and swayed by an unlucky prejudice. Proceed to Montreal, where we dine on choice pigeons. A very moderate charge. No chamber pot in the room, owing to the negligence of the maid. This is an ordinary post. Set out again for Nampont. Troubled with flatulences and indigestion. Mr. P. Is sullen, and seems to mistake an irritation for the breaking of wind backwards. From Nampont depart for Bernay, at which place we arrive in the evening, and propose to stay all night. And be the two last to lay double posts, and our cattle very willing, though not strong. Sup on a delicate ragout and excellent partridges, in company with Mr. H. And his spouse. Mum. The said H. Trod upon my corn by mistake. Discharge the bill, which is not very reasonable. Dispute with Mr. P. About giving money to the servant. He insists upon my giving a twenty-four souls piece, which is too much by two-thirds, in all conscience. N.B. She was a pert baggage, and did not deserve a lead. Our hero was so much disobliged with certain circumstances of this amusing and instructing journal, that, by way of punishing the author, he interlined these words betwixt two paragraphs, in a manner that exactly resembled the tutor's handwriting, them. Had the pleasure of drinking myself into a sweet intoxication, by toasting our lawful king, and his royal family, among some worthy English fathers of the Society of Jesus. Having taken this revenge, he set out for London, where he waited upon those noblemen to whom he had letters of recommendation from Paris, and was not only graciously received, but even loaded with caresses and proffers of service, because they understood he was a young gentleman of fortune, who, far from standing in need of their countenance or assistance, would make a useful and creditable addition to the number of their adherents. He had the honour of dining at their tables, in consequence of pressing invitations, and of spending several evenings with the ladies, to whom he was particularly agreeable, on account of his person, address, and bleeding freely at play. Being thus initiated in the Beaumont, he thought it was high time to pay his respects to his generous benefactor, the Commodore, and, accordingly, departed one morning, with his train, for the garrison, at which he arrived in safety the same night. When he entered the gate, which was opened by a new servant that did not know him, he found his old friend, Hatchway, stalking in the yard, with a nightcap on his head, and a pipe in his mouth, and, advancing to him, took him by the hand before he had any intimation of his approach. The lieutenant, thus saluted by a stranger, stared at him in silent astonishment, till he recollected his features, which were no sooner known, than, dashing his pipe upon the pavement, he exclaimed, Smite my cross trees! Th art welcome to port! and hugged him in his arms with great affection. He then, by a cordial squeeze, expressed his satisfaction at seeing his old shipmate, Tom, who, applying his whistle to his mouth, the whole castle echoed with his performance. The servants, hearing the well-known sound, poured out in a tumult of joy, and, understanding that their young master was returned, raised such a peal of acclamation, as astonished the Commodore and his lady, and inspired Julia with such an interesting presage that her heart began to throb with violence. Running out in the hurry and perturbation of her hope, she was so much overwhelmed at sight of her brother, that she actually fainted in his arms. But from this trance she soon awaked, and Peregrine, having testified his pleasure and affection, went upstairs, and presented himself before his godfather and aunt. Mrs. Trunnion rose and received him with a gracious embrace, blessing God for his happy return from a land of impiety and vice, in which she hoped his morals had not been corrupted nor his principles of religion altered or impaired. The old gentleman being confined to his chair, was struck dumb with pleasure at his appearance, and, having made divers ineffectual efforts to get up, at length discharged a volley of curses against his own limbs, and held out his hand to his godson, who kissed it with great respect. 
After he had finished his apostrophe to the gout, which was the daily and hourly subject of his execrations, Well, my lad, said he, I care not how soon I go to the bottom, now I behold thee safe in harbour again, and yet I tell a dee dee lie, I would I could keep afloat until I should see a lusty boy of thy begetting. Odds my timbers. I love thee so well, that I believe thou art the spawn of my own body, though I can give no account of thy being put upon the stocks. Then, turning his eyes upon Pipes, who by this time had penetrated into his apartment, and addressed him with the usual salutation of what cheer. Ah! cried he, are you there, you herring-faced son of a sea calf? What a slippery trick you played your old commander! But come, you dog, there's my fist, I forgive you, for the love you bear to my godson. Go, man your tackle, and hoist a cask of strong beer into the yard, knock out the bung, and put a pump in it, for the use of all my servants and neighbours, and, do you hear, let the patereros be fired, and the garrison illuminated, as rejoicings for the safe arrival of your master. By the Lord! If I had the use of these dd shambling shanks, I would dance a hornpipe with the best of you. The next object of his attention was Mr. Jolter, who was honoured with particular marks of distinction, and the repeated promise of enjoying the living in his gift, as an acknowledgement of the care and discretion with which he had superintended the education and morals of our hero. The governor was so affected by the generosity of his patron, that the tears ran down his cheeks, while he expressed his gratitude, and the infinite satisfaction he felt in contemplating the accomplishments of his pupil. Meanwhile, Pipes did not neglect the orders he had received. The beer was produced, the gates were thrown open for the admission of all comers, the whole house was lighted up, and the patereros were discharged in repeated volleys. Such phenomena could not fail to attract the notice of the neighbourhood. The club at Tanley's were astonished at the report of the guns, which produced various conjectures among the members of that sagacious society. The landlord observed, that, in all likelihood, the Commodore was visited by hobgoblins, and ordered the guns to be fired in token of distress, as he had acted twenty years before, when he was annoyed by the same grievance. The exciseman, with a waggish sneer, expressed his apprehension of Trunnion's death, in consequence of which the Pateroes might be discharged with an equivocal intent, either as signals of his lady's sorrow or rejoicing. The attorney signified a suspicion of Hatchway's being married to Miss Pickle, and that the firing and illuminations were in honour of the nuptials, upon which Gimli Eel discovered some faint signs of emotion, and, taking the pipe from his mouth, gave it as his opinion, that his sister was brought to bed. While they were thus bewildered in the maze of their own imaginations, a company of countrymen, who sat drinking in the kitchen, and whose legs were more ready than their invention, sallied out to know the meaning of these exhibitions. Understanding that there was a butt of strong beer abroach in the yard, to which they were invited by the servants, they saved themselves the trouble and expense of returning to spend the evening at the public house, and listed themselves under the banner of Tom Pipes, who presided as director of this festival. The news of Peregrine's return being communicated to the parish, the parson, and three or four neighbouring gentlemen, who were well-wishers to our hero, immediately repaired to the garrison, in order to pay their compliments on this happy event, and were detained to supper. An elegant entertainment was prepared by the direction of Miss Julia, who was an excellent housewife, and the Commodore was so invigorated with joy, that he seemed to have renewed his age. Among those who honoured the occasion with their presence, was Mr. Clover, the young gentleman that made his addresses to Peregrine's sister. His heart was so big with his passion, that, while the rest of the company were engrossed by their cups, he seized an opportunity of our hero's being detached from the conversation, and, in the impatience of his love, conjured him to consent to his happiness, protesting, that he would comply with any terms of settlement that a man of his fortune could embrace, in favour of a young lady who was absolute mistress of his affection. Our youth thanked him very politely for his favourable sentiments and honourable intention towards his sister, and told him, that at present he saw no reason to obstruct his desire, that he would consult Julia's own inclinations, and confer with him about the means of gratifying his wish, but, in the meantime, begged to be excused from discussing any point of such importance to them both reminding him of the jovial purpose on which they were happily met. He promoted such a quick circulation of the bottle, that their mirth grew noisy and obstreperous, they broke forth into repeated peals of laughter, without any previous incitement except that of claret. These explosions were succeeded by bacchanalian songs, in which the old gentleman himself attempted to bear a share, the sedate governor snapped time with his fingers, and the parish priest assisted in the chorus with a most expressive nakedness of countenance. Before midnight they were almost all pinned to their chairs, as if they had been fixed by the power of enchantment, and, what rendered the confinement still more unfortunate, every servant in the house was in the same situation, 
so that they were fain to take their repose as they sat, and nodded at each other like a congregation of Anabaptists. Next day Peregrine communed with his sister on the subject of her match with Mr. Clover, who, she told him, had offered to settle a jointure of four hundred pounds, and take her to wife without any expectation of a dowry. She moreover gave him to understand, that, in his absence, she had received several messages from her mother, commanding her to return to her father's house, but that she had refused to obey these orders. By the advice and injunction of her aunt and the Commodore, which were indeed seconded by her own inclination, because she had all the reason in the world to believe, that her mother only wanted an opportunity of treating her with severity and rancor. The resentment of that lady had been carried to such indecent lengths, that, seeing her daughter at church one day, she rose up, before the parson entered, and reviled her with great bitterness, in the face of the whole congregation. Chapter 67. Sees his sister happily married visits Emilia, who receives him according to his deserts. Her brother being of opinion, that Mr. Clover's proposal was not to be neglected, especially as Julia's heart was engaged in his favor, communicated the affair to his uncle, who, with the approbation of Mrs. Trunnion, declared himself well satisfied with the young man's addresses, and desired that they might be buckled with all expedition, without the knowledge or concurrence of her parents, to whom, on account of their unnatural barbarity, she was not bound to pay the least regard. Though our adventurer entertained the same sentiments of the matter, and the lover, dreading some obstruction, earnestly begged the immediate condescension of his mistress, she could not be prevailed upon to take such a material step, without having first solicited the permission of her father, resolved, nevertheless, to comply with the dictates of her own heart, should his objections be frivolous or unjust. Urged by this determination, her admirer waited upon Mr. Grimaliel at the public house, and, with the appearance of great deference and respect, made him acquainted with his affection for his daughter, communicated the particulars of his fortune, with the terms of settlement he was ready to make, and in conclusion told him, that he would marry her without a portion. This last offer seemed to have some weight with the father, who received it with civility, and promised in a day or two to favor him with a final answer to his demand. He, accordingly, that same evening consulted his wife, who, being exasperated at the prospect of her daughter's independency, argued with the most virulent expostulation against the match, as an impudent scheme of her own planning, with a view of insulting her parents, towards whom she had already been guilty of the most vicious disobedience. In short, she used such remonstrances, as not only averted this weak husband's inclination from the proposal which he had relished before, but even instigated him to apply for a warrant to apprehend his daughter, on the supposition that she was about to bestow herself in marriage without his privity or consent. The justice of peace to whom this application was made, though he could not refuse the order, yet, being no stranger to the malevolence of the mother, which, together with Gamaliel's simplicity, was notorious in the county, he sent an intimation of what had happened to the garrison, upon which a couple of sentinels were placed on the gate, and at the pressing solicitation of the lover, as well as the desire of the commodore, her brother, and aunt, Julia was wedded without further delay, the ceremony being performed by Mr. Jolter, because the parish priest prudently declined any occasion of giving offence, and the curate was too much in the interest of their enemies to be employed in that office. This domestic concern being settled to the satisfaction of our hero, he escorted her next day to the house of her husband, who immediately wrote a letter to her father, declaring his reasons for having thus superseded his authority, and Mrs. Pickle's mortification was unspeakable. That the new married couple might be guarded against all insult, our young gentleman and his friend Hatchway, with their adherents, lodged in Mr. Clover's house for some weeks, during which they visited their acquaintance in the neighborhood, according to custom. When the tranquility of their family was perfectly established, and the contract of the marriage executed in the presence of the old Commodore and his lady, who gave her niece five hundred pounds to purchase jewels and clothes, Mr. Peregrine could no longer restrain his impatience to see his dear Emily, and told his uncle, the next day he proposed to ride across the country, in order to visit his friend Gauntlet, whom he had not heard of for a long time. The old gentleman, looking steadfastly in his face, Ah! D. N. your cunning! said he, I find the anchor holds fast. I did suppose as how you would have slipped your cable, and changed your berth, but, I see, when a young fellow is once brought up by a pretty wench, he may man his capstans and vile block, if he will, but he'll as soon heave up the pike of Tenerife, as bring his anchor away. Odds heart lickens. Had I known the young woman was Ned Gauntlet's daughter, I shouldn't have thrown out signal for leaving off chase. Our adventurer was not a little surprised to hear the Commodore talk in this style and immediately conjectured that his friend Godfrey had informed him of the whole affair. 
instead of listening to this approbation of his flame, with those transports of joy which he would have felt, had he retained his former sentiments, he was chagrined at Trunnion's declaration, and offended at the presumption of the young soldier, in presuming to disclose the secret with which he had entrusted him. Reddening with these reflections, he assured the Commodore that he never had serious thoughts of matrimony, so that if any person had told him he was under any engagement of that kind, he had abused his ear, for he protested that he would never contract such attachments without his knowledge and express permission. Trunnion commended him for his prudent resolution, and observed, that, though no person mentioned to him what promises had passed betwixt him and his sweetheart, it was very plain that he had made love to her, and therefore it was to be supposed that his intentions were honourable, for he could not believe he was such a rogue in his heart, as to endeavour to debauch the daughter of a brave officer, who had served his country with credit and reputation. Notwithstanding this remonstrance, which Pickle imputed to the Commodore's ignorance of the world, he set out for the habitation of Mrs. Gauntlet, with the unjustifiable sentiments of a man of pleasure, who sacrifices every consideration to the desire of his ruling appetite, and, as Winchester lay in his way, resolved to visit some of his friends who lived in that place. It was in the house of one of these that he was informed of Emilia's being then in town with her mother, upon which he excused himself from staying to drink tea, and immediately repaired to their lodgings, according to the directions he had received. When he arrived at the door, instead of undergoing that perturbation of spirits, which a lover in his interesting situation might be supposed to feel, he suffered no emotion but that of vanity and pride, favoured with an opportunity of self-gratification, and entered his Emilia's apartment with the air of a conceited petty maitre, rather than that of a respectful admirer, when he visits the object of his passion, after an absence of seventeen months, the young lady, having been very much disobliged at his mortifying neglect of her brother's letter, had summoned all her own pride and resolution to her aid, and, by means of a happy disposition, so far overcame her chagrin at his indifference, that she was able to behave in his presence with apparent tranquillity and ease. She was even pleased to find he had, by accident, chosen a time for his visit when she was surrounded by two or three young gentlemen, who professed themselves her admirers. Our gallant was no sooner announced, than she collected all her coquetry, put on the guest air she could assume, and contrived to giggle just as he appeared at the room door. The compliments or salutation being performed, she welcomed him to England in a careless manner, asked the news of Paris, and, before he could make any reply, desired one of the other gentlemen to proceed with the sequel of that comical adventure, in the relation of which he had been interrupted. Peregrine smiled within himself at this behaviour, which, without all doubt, he believed she had affected to punish him for his unkind silence while he was abroad, being fully persuaded that her heart was absolutely at his devotion. On this supposition, he practised his Parisian improvements on the art of conversation, and uttered a thousand prettinesses in the way of compliment, with such incredible rotation of tongue, that his rivals were struck dumb with astonishment, and Demelia fretted out of all temper, at seeing herself deprived of the prerogative of the sex. He persisted, however, in this surprising loquacity, until the rest of the company thought proper to withdraw, and then contracted his discourse into the focus of love, which now put on a very different appearance from that which it had formerly worn. Instead of awful veneration, which her presence used to inspire, the chastity of sentiment, and delicacy of expression, he now gazed upon her with the aise of a libertine, he glowed with the impatience of desire, talked in a strain that barely kept within the bounds of decency, and attempted to snatch such favours, as she, in the tenderness of mutual acknowledgments, had once vouchsafed to bestow. Grieved and offended as she was, at this palpable alteration in his carriage, she disdained to remind him of his former deportment, and, with dissembled good humour, rallied him on the progress he had made in gallantry and address. But, far from submitting to the liberties he would have taken, she kept her person sacred from his touch, and would not even suffer him to ravish a kiss of her fair hand, so that he reaped no other advantage from the exercise of his talents, during this interview, which lasted a whole hour, than that of knowing he had overrated his own importance, and that Emily's heart was not a garrison likely to surrender at discretion. At length his addresses were interrupted by the arrival of the mother, who had gone abroad to visit by herself, and the conversation becoming more general. He understood that Godfrey was at London, soliciting for a lieutenancy that had fallen vacant in the regiment to which he belonged, and that Miss Sophie was at home with her father. Though our adventurer had not met with all the success he expected by his first visit, he did not despair of reducing the fortress, believing that in time there would be a mutiny in his favour, and accordingly carried on the siege for several days, without profiting by his perseverance, till, at length, having attended the ladies to their own house in the country, 
he began to look upon this adventure as time misspent, and resolved to discontinue his attack, in hopes of meeting with a more favorable occasion, being, in the meantime, ambitious of displaying in a higher sphere, those qualifications which his vanity told him were at present misapplied. Chapter 68 he attends his uncle with great affection during a fit of illness sets out again for London meets with his friend Godfrey, who is prevailed upon to accompany him to Bath, on the road to which place they chance to dine with a person who entertains them with a curious account of a certain company of adventurers. Thus determined, he took leave of Emilia and her mother, on pretense of going to London upon some urgent business, and returned to the garrison, leaving the good old lady very much concerned, and the daughter incensed at his behaviour, which was the more unexpected because Godfrey had told them that the Commodore approved of his nephew's passion. Our adventurer found his uncle so ill of a gout, which, for the first time, had taken possession of his stomach, that his life was in imminent danger, and the whole family in disorder. He therefore took the reins of government in his own hands, sent for all the physicians in the neighborhood, and attended him in person with the most affectionate care, during the whole fit, which lasted a fortnight, and then retired before the strength of his constitution. When the old gentleman recovered his health, he was so penetrated with Peregrine's behavior, that he actually would have made over to him his whole fortune, and depended upon him for his own subsistence, had not our youth opposed the execution of the deed with all his influence and might, and even persuaded him to make a will, in which his friend Hatchway, and all his other adherents, were liberally remembered, and his aunt provided for on her own terms. This material point being settled, he, with his uncle's permission, departed for London, after having seen the family affairs established under the direction and administration of Mr. Jolter and the lieutenant, for, by this time, Mrs. Trunnion was wholly occupied with her spiritual concern. On his first arrival at London, he sent a card to the lodgings of Gauntlet, in consequence of a direction from his mother, and that young gentleman waited on him next morning, though not with that alacrity of countenance and warmth of friendship which might have been expected from the intimacy of their former connection. Nor was Peregrine himself actuated by the same unreserved affection for the soldier which he had formerly entertained. Godfrey, over and above the offence he had taken at Pickle's omission in point of corresponding with him, had been informed, by a letter from his mother, of the youth's cavalier behaviour to Emilia, during his last residence at Winchester, and our young gentleman, as we have already observed, was disgusted at the supposed discovery which the soldier had made in his absence to the Commodore. They, perceived their mutual umbrage at meeting, and received each other with that civility of reserve which commonly happens between two persons whose friendship is in the wane. Gauntlet at once divined the cause of the other's displeasure, and, in order to vindicate his own character, after the first compliments were passed, took the opportunity, on inquiring after the health of the Commodore, to tell Peregrine, that, while he tarried at the garrison, on his return from Dover, the subject of the conversation, one night, happening to turn on our hero's passion, the old gentleman had expressed his concern about that affair, and, among other observations, said, he supposed the object of his love was some paltry hussy, whom he had picked up when he was a boy at school. Upon which, Mr. Hatchway assured him, that she was a young woman of as good a family as any in the county, and, after having prepossessed him in her favour, ventured, out of the zeal of his friendship, to tell who she was. Wherefore, the discovery was not to be imputed to any other cause, and he hoped Mr. Pickle would acquit him of ale share in the transaction. Peregrine was very well pleased to be thus undeceived, his countenance immediately cleared up. The formality of his behavior relaxed into his usual familiarity. He asked pardon for his unmannerly neglect of Godfrey's letter, which he protested, was not owing to any disregard, or abatement of friendship, but to a hurry of youthful engagements, in consequence of which he bad procrastinated his answer from time to time, until he was ready to return in person. The young soldier was contented with this apology and, as Pickle's intention, with respect to his sister, was still dubious and undeclared, he did not think it was incumbent upon him, as yet, to express any resentment on that score, but was wise enough to foresee, that the renewal of his intimacy with our young gentleman might be the means of reviving that flame which had been dissipated by a variety of new ideas. With those sentiments, he laid aside all reserve, and their communication resumed its former channel. Peregrine made him acquainted with all the adventures in which he had been engaged since their parting, and he, with the same confidence, related the remarkable incidents of his own fate, among other things, giving him to understand, that, upon obtaining a commission in the army, the father of his dear Sophie, without once inquiring about the occasion of his promotion, had not only favoured him with his countenance in a much greater degree than heretofore, but also contributed his interest, and even promised the assistance of his purse, in procuring for him a lieutenancy, 
which he was then soliciting with all his power, whereas, if he had not been enabled, by a most accidental piece of good fortune, to lift himself into the sphere of an officer, he had all the reason in the world to believe that this gentleman, and all the rest of his wealthy relations, would have suffered him to languish in obscurity and distress, and by turning his misfortune into reproach, made it a plea for their want of generosity and friendship. Peregrine, understanding the situation of his friend's affairs, would have accommodated him upon the instant with a sum to accelerate the passage of his commission through the offices, but, being too well acquainted with his scrupulous disposition, to manifest his benevolence in that manner, he found means to introduce himself to one of the gentlemen of the war office, who was so well satisfied with the arguments used in behalf of his friend, that Godfrey's business was transacted in a very few days, though he himself knew nothing of his interest being thus reinforced. By this time, the season at Bath was begun, and our hero, panting with a desire of distinguishing himself at that resort of the fashionable world, communicated his design of going thither to his friend Godfrey, whom he importuned to accompany him in the excursion, and leave of absence from his regiment being obtained by the influence of Peregrine's new quality friends, the two companions departed from London in a post-chaise, attended, as usual, by the valet de chamber and pipes, who were become almost as necessary to our adventurer as any two of his own organs. At the inn, when they alighted for dinner, Godfrey perceived a person walking by himself in the yard, with a very pensive air, and, upon observing him more narrowly, recognized him to be a professed gamester, whom he had formerly known at Tunbridge. On the strength of this acquaintance, he accosted the peripatetic, who knew him immediately, and, in the fullness of his grief and vexation, told him, that he was now on his return from Bath, where he had been stripped by a company of sharpers, who resented that he should presume to trade upon his own bottom. Peregrine, who was extremely curious in his inquiries, imagining that he might learn some entertaining and useful anecdotes from this artist, invited him to dinner, and was accordingly fully informed of all the political systems at Bath. He understood that there was at London one great company of adventurers, who employed agents in all the different branches of imposition throughout the whole kingdom of England, allowing these ministers a certain proportion of the profits accruing from their industry and skill, and reserving the greatest share for the benefit of the common stock, which was chargeable with the expense of fitting out individuals in their various pursuits, as well as with the loss sustained in the course of their adventures. Some whose persons and qualifications are by the company judged adequate to the task, exert their talents in making love to ladies of fortune, being accommodated with money and accoutrements for that purpose, after having given their bonds payable to one or other of the directors, on the day of marriage, for certain sums, proportioned to the dowries they are to receive. Others versed in the doctrine of chances, and certain secret expediences, frequent all those places where games of hazard are allowed, and such as our masters in the arts of billiards, tennis, and bowls, are continually lying in wait, in all the scenes of these diversions, for the ignorant and unwary. A fourth class attend horse races, being skilled in those mysterious practices by which the knowing ones are taken in. Nor is this community unfurnished with those who lay wanton wives and old rich widows under contribution, and extort money, by prostituting themselves to the embraces of their own sex, and then threatening their admirers with prosecution. But their most important returns are made by that body of their undertakers who exercise their understandings in the innumerable stratagems of the card table, at which no sharper can be too infamous to be received, and even caressed by persons of the highest rank and distinction. Among other articles of intelligence, our young gentlemen learned, that those agents, by whom their guest was broke, and expelled from Bath, had constituted a bank against all sporters, and monopolized the advantage in all sorts of play. He then told Gauntlet, that, if he would put himself under his direction, he would return with them, and lay such a scheme as would infallibly ruin the whole society at billiards, as he knew that Godfrey excelled them all in his knowledge of that game. The soldier excused himself from engaging in any party of that kind, and after dinner the travellers parted, but, as the conversation between the two friends turned upon the information they had received, Peregrine projected a plan for punishing those villainous pests of society, who prey upon their fellow creatures, and it was put in execution by Gauntlet in the following manner. Chapter 69. Godfrey executes a scheme at Bath, by which a whole company of sharpers is ruined. On the evening after their arrival at Bath, Godfrey, who had kept himself up all day for that purpose, went in boots to the billiard table, and, two gentlemen being at play, began to bet with so little appearance of judgment, that one of the adventurers then present was inflamed with a desire of profiting by his inexperience, and, when the table was vacant, invited him to take a game for amusement. The soldier, assuming the air of a self-conceited dupe, answered, 
that he did not choose to throw away his time for nothing, but, if he pleased, would piddle for a crown again. This declaration was very agreeable to the other, who wanted to be further confirmed in the opinion he had conceived of the stranger, before he would play for anything of consequence. The party being accepted, Gauntlet put off his coat, and, beginning with seeming eagerness, won the first game, because his antagonist kept up his play with a view of encouraging him to wager a greater sum. The soldier purposely bit at the hook, the stakes were doubled, and he was again victorious, by the permission of his competitor. He now began to yawn, and observing, that it was not worth his while to proceed in such a childish manner, the other swore, in an affected passion, that he would play him for twenty guineas. The proposal being embraced, through the connivance of Godfrey, the money was won by the sharper, who exerted his dexterity to the utmost, fearing that otherwise his adversary would decline continuing the game. Godfrey thus conquered, pretended to lose his temper, cursed his own ill luck, swore that the table had a cast, and that the balls did not run true, changed his mast, and with great warmth, challenged his enemy to double the sum. The gamester, who feigned reluctance, complied with his desire, and having got the two first hazards, offered to lay one hundred guineas to fifty on the game. The odds were taken, and Godfrey having allowed himself to be overcome, began to rage with great violence, broke the mast to pieces, threw the balls out of the window, and, in the fury of his indignation, defied his antagonist to meet him tomorrow, when he should be refreshed from the fatigue of travelling. This was a very welcome invitation to the gamester, who, imagining that the soldier would turn out a most beneficial prize, assured him, that he would not fail to be the next forenoon, in order to give him his revenge. Gauntlet went home to his lodgings, fully certified of his own superiority, and took his measures with Peregrine, touching the prosecution of their scheme, while his opponent made a report of his success to the brethren of the gang, who resolved to be present at the decision of the match, with a view of taking advantage of the stranger's passionate disposition. Affairs being thus concerted on both sides, the players met, according to appointment, and the room was immediately filled with spectators, who either came thither by accident, curiosity, or design. The match was fixed for one hundred pounds a game, the principals chose their instruments, and laid aside their coats, and one of the knights of the order proffered to lay another hundred on the head of his associate. Godfrey took him upon the instant. A second worthy of the same class, seeing him so eager, challenged him to treble the sum, and his proposal met with the same reception, to the astonishment of the company, whose expectation was raised to a very interesting pitch. The game was begun, and the soldier having lost the first hazard, the odds were offered by the Confederacy with great vociferation, that nobody would run such a risk in favour of a person who was utterly unknown. The sharper having gained the second also, the noise increased to a surprising clamour, not only of the gang, but likewise of almost all the spectators, who desired to lay two to one against the brother of Emilia. Peregrine, who was present, perceiving the cupidity of the association sufficiently inflamed, all of a sudden opened his mouth, and answered their bets, to the amount of twelve hundred pounds which were immediately deposited, on both sides, in money and notes, so that this was, perhaps, the most important game that ever was played at billiards. Gauntlet seeing the agreement settled, struck his antagonist's ball into the pocket in a twinkling, though it was in one of those situations which are supposed to be against the striker. The betters were a little discomposed at this event, for which, however, they consoled themselves by imputing the success to accident, but when, at the very next stroke, he sprung it over the table, their countenances underwent an instantaneous distraction of feature, and they waited, in the most dreadful suspense, for the next hazard, which being likewise taken with infinite ease by the soldier, the blood forsook their cheeks, and the interjection zounds, pronounced with a look of consternation, and in a tone of despair, proceeded from every mouth at the same instant of time. They were overwhelmed with horror and astonishment at seeing three hazards taken in as many strokes, from a person of their friend's dexterity, and shrewdly suspected that the whole was a scheme preconcerted for their destruction. On this supposition, they changed the note, and attempted to hedge for their own indemnification, by proposing to lay the odds in favour of Gauntlet, but so much was the opinion of the company altered by that young gentleman's success, that no one would venture to espouse the cause of his competitor, who, chancing to improve his game by the addition of another lucky hit, diminished the concern, and revived the hopes of his adherents. But this gleam of fortune did not long continue. Godfrey collected his whole art and capacity, and, augmenting his score to number ten, indulged himself with a view of the whole fraternity. The visages of these professors had adopted different shades of complexion at every hazard he had taken, from their natural colour they had shifted into a sallow hue, from thence into pale, from pale into yellow, 
which degenerated into a mahogany tint, and now they saw seventeen hundred pounds of their stock depending upon a single stroke, they stood like so many swarthy moors, jaundiced with terror and vexation. The fire which naturally glowed in the cheeks and nose of the player, seemed utterly extinct, and his carbuncles exhibited a livid appearance, as if a gangrene had already made some progress in his face, his hand began to shake, and his whole frame was seized with such trepidation, that he was fain to swallow a bumper of brandy, in order to re-establish the tranquillity of his nerves. This expedient, however, did not produce the desired effect, for he aimed the ball at the lead with such discomposure, that it struck on the wrong side, and came off at an angle which directed it full in the middle hole. This fatal accident was attended with a universal groan, as if the whole universe had gone to wreck, and notwithstanding the tranquillity for which adventurers are so remarkable, this loss made such an impression upon the mall, that each in particular manifested his chagrin, by the most violent emotions. One turned up his eyes to heaven, and bit his nether lip, another gnawed his fingers, while he stalked across the room, a third blasphemed with horrid imprecations, and he who played the party sneaked off, grinding his teeth together, with a look that baffles all description, and as he crossed the threshold, exclaiming, a d d bite, by g. The victors, after having insulted them, by asking, if they were disposed for another chance, carried off their winning, with the appearance of great composure, though in their hearts they were transported with unspeakable joy, not so much on account of the booty they had gained, as in consideration of having so effectually destroyed such a nest of pernicious miscreants. Peregrine, believing that now he had found an opportunity of serving his friend, without giving offence to the delicacy of his honour, told him, upon their arrival at their lodgings, that fortune had at length enabled him to become in a manner independent, or at least make himself easy in his circumstances, by purchasing a company with the money he had won. So saying, he put his share of the success in Gauntlet's hand, as a sum that of right belonged to him, and promised to write in his behalf to a nobleman, who had interest enough to promote such a quick rise in the service. Godfrey thanked him for his obliging intention, but absolutely refused, with great loftiness of demeanour, to appropriate to his own use any part of the money which Pickle had gained, and seemed affronted at the others entertaining a sentiment so unworthy of his character. He would not even accept, in the way of loan, such an addition to his own stock, as would amount to the price of a company of foot, but expressed great confidence in the future exertion of that talent which had been blessed with such a prosperous beginning. Our hero finding him thus obstinately deaf to the voice of his own interest, resolved to govern himself in his next endeavours of friendship by his experience of this ticklish punctilio, and, in the meantime, gave a handsome benefaction to the hospital, out of these first fruits of the success in play, and reserved two hundred pounds for a set of diamond earrings and solitaire, which he intended for a present to Miss Emily. Chapter 70 The two friends eclipse all their competitors in gallantry, and practice a pleasant project of revenge upon the physicians of the place. The fame of their exploit against the sharpers was immediately diffused through all the companies at Bath, so that, when our adventurers appeared in public, they were pointed out by an hundred extended fingers, and considered as consummate artists in all the different species of finesse, which they would not fail to practice with the first opportunity. Nor was this opinion of their characters any obstacle to their reception into the fashionable parties in the place, but, on the contrary, such a recommendation, which, as I have already hinted, never fails to operate for the advantage of the possessor. This first adventure, therefore, served them as an introduction to the company at Bath, who were not a little surprised to find their expectations baffled by the conduct of the two companions, because, far from engaging deeply at play, they rather shunned all occasions of gaming, and directed their attention to gallantry, in which our hero shone unrivalled. His external qualifications, exclusive of any other merit, were strong enough to captivate the common run of the female sex, and these, reinforced with a sprightliness of conversation, and a most insinuating address, became irresistible, even by those who were fortified with pride, caution, or indifference. But, among all the nymphs of this gay place, he did not meet with one object that disputed the empire of his heart with Emilia, and therefore he divided his attachment according to the suggestions of vanity and whim, so that, before he had resided a fortnight at Bath, he had set all the ladies by the ears, and furnished all the hundred tongues of scandal with full employment. The splendour of his appearance excited the inquiries of envy, which, instead of discovering any circumstances to his prejudice, was cursed with the information of his being a young gentleman of a good family, and heir to an immense fortune. The countenance of some of his quality friends, who arrived at Bath, confirmed this piece of intelligence. 
upon which his acquaintance was courted and cultivated with great assiduity, and he met with such advances from some of the fair sex, as rendered him extremely fortunate in his amours. Nor was his friend Godfrey a stranger to favours of the same kind, his accomplishments were exactly calculated for the meridian of female taste, and, with certain individuals of that sex, his muscular frame, and the robust connection of his limbs, were more attractive than the delicate proportions of his companion. He accordingly reigned paramount among those inimiratas who were turned of thirty, without being under the necessity or proceeding by tedious addresses, and was thought to have cooperated with the waters in removing the sterility of certain ladies, who had long undergone the reproach and disgust of their husbands, while Peregrine set up his throne among those who laboured under the disease of celibacy, from the pert miss of fifteen, who, with a flattering heart, tosses her head, bridles up, and giggles involuntarily at sight of a handsome young man, to the staid maid of twenty-eight, who, with a demure aspect, moralizes on the vanity of beauty, the folly of youth, and simplicity of woman, and expatiates on friendship, benevolence, and good sense, in the style of a platonic philosopher. In such a diversity of dispositions, his conquests were attended with all the heart-burnings, animosities, and turmoils of jealousy and spite. The younger class took all opportunities of mortifying their seniors in public, by treating them with that indignity which, contrary to the general privilege of age, is, by the consent and connivance of mankind, levelled against those who have the misfortune to come under the denomination of old maids, and these last retorted their hostilities in the private machinations of slander, supported by experience and subtlety of invention. Not one day passed in which some new story did not circulate, to the prejudice of one or other of those rivals. If our hero, in a long room, chanced to quit one of the moralists, with whom he had been engaged in conversation, he was immediately accosted by a number of the opposite faction, who, with ironical smiles, upbraided him with cruelty to the poor lady he had left, exhorted him to have compassion on her sufferings, and, turning their eyes towards the object of their intercession, broke forth into a universal peal of laughter. On the other hand, when Peregrine, in consequence of having danced with one of the miners overnight, visited her in the morning, the Platonists immediately laid hold on the occasion, tasked their imaginations, associated ideas, and, with sage insinuations, retailed a thousand circumstances of the interview, which never had any foundation in truth. They observed, that, if girls are determined to behave with such indiscretion, they must lay their accounts with incurring the censure of the world, that she in question was old enough to act more circumspectly, and wondered that her mother would permit any young fellow to approach the chamber while her daughter was naked in bed. As for the servants peeping through the keyhole, to be sure it was an unlucky accident, but people ought to be upon their guard against such curiosity, and give their domestics no cause to employ their penetration. These and other such reflections were occasionally whispered as secrets among those who were known to be communicative, so that, in a few hours, it became the general topic of discourse, and, as it had been divulged under injunctions of secrecy, it was almost impossible to trace the scandal to its origin, because every person concerned must have promulgated her own breach of trust in discovering her author of the report. Peregrine, instead of allaying, rather exasperated this contention, by an artful distribution of his attention among the competitors, well knowing, that, should his regard be converged into one point, he would soon forfeit the pleasure he enjoyed in seeing the matter variance, for both parties would join against the common enemy, and his favourite would be persecuted by the whole coalition. He perceived, that, among the secret agents of scandal, none were so busy as the physicians, a class of animals who live in this place, like so many ravens hovering about a carcass, and even ply for employment, like scholars at Hungerford Stairs. The greatest part of them have correspondents in London, who make it their business to inquire into the history, character, and distemper of every one that repairs to Bath, for the benefit of the waters, and if they cannot procure interest to recommend their medical friends to these patients before they set out, they at least furnish them with a previous account of what they could collect that their correspondents may use this intelligence for their own advantage. By these means, and the assistance of flattery and assurance, they often insinuate themselves into the acquaintance of strangers, and, by consulting their dispositions, become necessary and subservient to their prevailing passions. By their connection with apothecaries and nurses, they are informed of all the private occurrences in each family, and therefore enabled to gratify the rancor of malice, amuse the spleen of peevish indisposition and entertain the eagerness of impertinent curiosity. In the course of these occupations, which frequently affected the reputation of our two adventurers, this whole body fell under the displeasure of our hero, who, after divers consultations with his friend, concerted a stratagem, which was practiced upon the faculty in this manner. 
among those who frequented the pump room, was an old officer, whose temper, naturally impatient, was, by repeated attacks of the gout, which had almost deprived him of the use of his limbs, sublimated into the remarkable degree of virulence and perverseness. He imputed the inveteracy of his distemper to the malpractice of a surgeon who had administered to him, while he labored under the consequences of an unfortunate amour, and this supposition had inspired him with an insurmountable antipathy to all the professors of the medical art, which was more and more confirmed by the information of a friend at London, who had told him, that it was the common practice among the physicians at Bath to dissuade their patients from drinking the water, that the cure, and in consequence their attendance, might be longer protracted. Thus prepossessed, he had come to Bath, and, conformable to a few general instructions he had received, used the waters without any farther direction, taking all occasions of manifesting his hatred and contempt of the sons of Aesculapius, both by speech and gesticulations, and even by pursuing a regimen quite contrary to that which he knew they prescribed to others who seemed to be exactly in his condition. But he did not find his account in this method, how successful soever it may have been in other cases. His complaints, instead of vanishing, were every day more and more enraged, and at length he was confined to his bed, where he lay blaspheming from morn to night, and from night to morn, though still more determined than ever to adhere to his former maxims. In the midst of his torture, which was become the common joke of the town, being circulated through the industry of the physicians, who triumphed in his disaster, Peregrine, by means of Mr. Pipes, employed a country fellow, who had come to market, to run with great haste, early one morning, to the lodgings of all the doctors in town, and desire them to attend the colonel with all imaginable dispatch. In consequence of this summons, the whole faculty put themselves in motion, and three of the foremost arriving at the same instant of time, far from complimenting one another with the door, each separately essayed to enter, and the whole triumvirate stuck in the passage. While they remained thus wedged together, they described two of their brethren posting towards the same goal, with all the speed that God had enabled them to exert, upon which they came to a parley, and agreed to stand by one another. This covenant being made, they disentangled themselves, and, inquiring about the patient, were told by the servant that he had just fallen asleep. Having received this intelligence, they took possession of his antechamber, and shut the door, while the rest of the tribe posted themselves on the outside as they arrived, so that the whole passage was filled, from the top of the staircase to the street door, and the people of the house, together with the colonel's servant, struck down with astonishment. The three leaders of this learned gang had no sooner made their lodgment good, than they began to consult about the patient's malady, which every one of them pretended to have considered with great care and assiduity. The first who gave his opinion, said, the distemper was an obstinate arthritis, the second affirmed, that it was no other than a confirmed pox, and the third swore, it was an inveterate scurvy. This diversity of opinions was supported by a variety of quotations from medical authors, ancient as well as modern, but these were not of sufficient authority, or, at least, not explicit enough to decide the dispute, for there are many schisms in medicine, as well as in religion, and each sect can quote the fathers in support of the tenets they profess. In short, the contention rose to such a pitch of clamor, as not only alarmed the brethren on the stair, but also awaked the patient from the first nap he had enjoyed in the space of ten whole days. Had it been simply waking, he would have been obliged to them for the noise that disturbed him, for, in that case, he would have been relieved from the tortures of hellfire, to which, in his dreams, he fancied himself exposed. But this dreadful vision had been the result of an impression which was made upon his brain by the intolerable anguish of his joints, so that, when he awaked, the pain, instead of being allayed, was rather aggravated by a great acuteness of sensation, and the confused vociferation in the next room invading his ears at the same time. He began to think his dream was realized, and, in the pangs of despair, applied himself to a bell that stood by his bedside, which he rung with great violence and perseverance. This alarm put an immediate stop to the disputation of the three doctors, who, upon this notice of his being awake, rushed into his chamber, without ceremony, and two of them seizing his arms, the third made the like application to one of his temples. Before the patient could recollect himself from the amazement which had laid hold on him at this unexpected eruption, the room was filled by the rest of the faculty, who followed the servant that entered in obedience to his master's call, and the bed was in a moment surrounded by these gaunt ministers of death. The colonel seeing himself beset with such an assemblage of solemn visages and figures, which he had always considered with the utmost detestation and abhorrence, was incensed to a most inexpressible degree of indignation, and so inspirited by his rage, that though his tongue denied its office, his other limbs performed their functions. He disengaged himself from the triumvirate, 
who had taken possession of his body, sprung out of bed with incredible agility, and, seizing one of his crutches, applied it so effectually to one of the three, just as he stooped to examine the patient's water, that his type error would drop into the pot, while he himself fell motionless on the floor. This significant explanation disconcerted the whole fraternity, every man turned his face, as if it were by instinct, towards the door, and the retreat of the community being obstructed by the efforts of individuals, confusion and tumultuous uproar ensued. For the colonel, far from limiting his prowess to the first exploit, handled his weapon with astonishing vigor and dexterity, without respect of persons, so that few or none of them had escaped without marks of his displeasure, when his spirits failed, and he sank down again quite exhausted on his bed. Favored by this respite, the discomforted faculty collected their hats and wigs, which had fallen off in the fray, and perceiving the assailant too much enfeebled to renew the attack, set up their throats together, and loudly threatened to prosecute him severely for such an outrageous assault. By this time the landlord had interposed, and, inquiring into the cause of the disturbance, was informed of what had happened by the complainants, who, at the same time, giving him to understand that they had been severally summoned to attend the colonel that morning, he assured them that they had been imposed upon by some wag, for his lodger had never dreamed of consulting any one of their profession. Thunderstruck at this declaration, the general clamor instantaneously ceased, and each, in particular, at once comprehending the nature of the joke, they sneaked silently off with the loss they had sustained, in unutterable shame and mortification, while Peregrine and his friend, who took care to be passing that way by accident, made a full stop at sight of such an extraordinary efflux, and enjoyed the countenance and condition of every one as he appeared, nay, even made up to some of those who seemed most affected with their situation, and mischievously tormented them with questions, touching this unusual congregation, then, in consequence of the information they received from the landlord and the colonel's valley, subjected the sufferers to the ridicule of all the company in town. As it would have been impossible for the authors of this farce to keep themselves concealed from the indefatigable inquiries of the physicians, they made no secret of their having directed the whole, though they took care to own it in such an ambiguous manner, as afforded no handle of prosecution. Chapter 71. Peregrine humbles a noted Hector, and meets with a strange character at the house of a certain lady. Among those who never fail to reside at Bath during the season, was a certain person, who, from the most abject misery, had, by his industry and art at play, amassed about fifteen thousand pounds, and though his character was notorious, insinuated himself so far into the favour of what is called the best company, that very few private parties of pleasure took place in which he was not principally concerned. He was of a gigantic stature, a most intrepid countenance, and his disposition, naturally overbearing, had, in the course of his adventures and success, acquired a most intolerable degree of insolence and vanity. By the ferocity of his features, and audacity of his behavior, he had obtained a reputation for the most undaunted courage, which had been confirmed by divers adventures, in which he had humbled the most assuming heroes of his own fraternity, so that he now reigned chief Hector of the place with unquestioned authority. With this son of fortune was Peregrine one evening engaged at play, and so successful, that he could not help informing his friend of his good luck. Godfrey, hearing the description of the loser, immediately recognized the person, whom he had known at Tunbridge, and, assuring Pickle that he was a sharper of the first water, cautioned him against any further connection with such a dangerous companion, who, he affirmed, had suffered him to win a small sum, that he might be encouraged to lose a much greater sum upon some other occasion. Our young gentleman treasured up this advice, and though he did not scruple to give the gamester an opportunity of retrieving his loss, when he next day demanded his revenge, he absolutely refused to proceed after he had refunded his winning. The other, who considered him as a hot-headed unthinking youth, endeavoured to inflame his pride to a continuance of the game, by treating his skill with scorn and contempt, and, among other sarcastic expressions, advised him to go to school again, before he pretended to engage with masters of the art. Our hero, incensed at his arrogance, replied with great warmth, that he knew himself sufficiently qualified for playing with men of honour, who deal upon the square, and hoped he should always deem it infamous either to learn or practice the tricks of a professed gamester. Blood and thunder! Meaning me, sir? cried this artist, raising his voice, and curling his visage into a most intimidating frown. Zounds! I'll cut the throat of any scoundrel who has the presumption to suppose that I don't play as honorably as e'er a nobleman in the kingdom, and I insist upon an explanation from you, sir, or, by hell and brimstone, I shall expect other sort of satisfaction. Peregrine, whose blood by this time boiled within him, answered without hesitation, far from thinking your demand unreasonable, 
I will immediately explain myself without reserve, and tell you, that, upon unquestionable authority, I believe you to be an impudent rascal and common cheat. The Hector was so amazed and confounded at the freedom of this declaration, which he thought no man on earth would venture to make in his presence, that, for some minutes, he could not recollect himself, but at length whispered the challenge in the ear of our hero, which was accordingly accepted. When they arrived next morning upon the field, the gamester, arming his countenance with all its terrors, advanced with a sword of a monstrous length, and, putting himself in a posture, called out aloud in a most terrific voice, Draw, dien ye, draw, I will this instant send you to your father's. The youth was not slow in complying with his desire, his weapon was unsheathed in a moment, and he began the attack with such unexpected spirit and address, that his adversary, having made shift with great difficulty to parry the first pass, retreated a few paces, and demanded a parley, in which he endeavoured to persuade the young man, that to lay a man of his character under the necessity of chastising his insolence, was the most rash and inconsiderate step that he could possibly have taken, but that he had compassion upon his youth, and was willing to spare him if he would surrender his sword, and promise to ask pardon in public for the offence he had given. Pickle was so much exasperated at this unparalleled effrontery, that, without deigning to make the least reply, he flung his own hat in the proposer's face, and renewed the charge with such undaunted agility, that the gamester, finding himself in manifest hazard of his life, betook himself to his heels, and fled homewards with incredible speed, being closely pursued by Peregrine, who, having sheathed his sword, pelted him with stones as he ran, and compelled him to go, that same day, into banishment from Bath, where he had domineered so long. By this achievement, which was the subject of astonishment to all the company, who had looked upon the fugitive as a person of heroic courage, our adventurer's reputation was rendered formidable in all its circumstances, although he thereby disobliged a good many people of fashion, who had contracted an intimacy of friendship with the exile, and who resented his disgrace, as if it had been the misfortune of a worthy man. These generous patrons, however, bore a very small proportion to those who were pleased with the event of the duel, because, in the course of their residence at Bath, they had either been insulted or defrauded by the challenger. Nor was this instance of our hero's courage unacceptable to the ladies, few of whom could now resist the united force of such accomplishments. Indeed, neither he nor his friend Godfrey would have found much difficulty in picking up an agreeable companion for life, but Gauntlet's heart was pre-engaged to Sophie, and Pickle, exclusive of his attachment to Emily, which was stronger than he himself imagined, possessed such a share of ambition as could not be satisfied with the conquest of any female he beheld at Bath. His visits were, therefore, promiscuous, without any other view than that amusement, and though his pride was flattered by the advances of the fair, whom he had captivated, he never harboured one thought of proceeding beyond the limits of common gallantry, and carefully avoided all particular explanations. But, what above all other enjoyments yielded him the most agreeable entertainment, was the secret history of characters, which he learned from a very extraordinary person, with whom he became acquainted in this manner. Being at the house of a certain lady on a visiting day, he was struck with the appearance of an old man, who no sooner entered the room than the mistress of the house very kindly desired one of the wits present to roast the old put. This petty maitre, proud of the employment, went up to the senior, who had something extremely peculiar and significant in his countenance, and saluting him with divers fashionable congees, accosted him in these words, Your servant, you old rascal. I hope to have the honour of seeing you hanged. I vow to gad. You look extremely shocking, with these gummy eyes, lanthorn jaws, and toothless chaps. What? You squint at the ladies, you old rotten meddler? Yes, yes, we understand your ogling, but you must content yourself with a cook maid, sink me. I see you want to sit. These withered shanks of yours tremble under their burden, but you must have a little patience, old Herco. Indeed you must. I intend to mortify you a little longer, curse me. The company was so tickled with this address, which was delivered with much grimace and gesticulation, that they burst out into a loud fit of laughter, which they fathered upon a monkey that was chained in the room, and, when the peal was over, the wit renewed the attack in these words, I suppose you are fool enough to think this mirth was occasioned by Pug. Eh, there he is, you had best survey him. He is of your own family, switch me. But the laugh was at your expense, and you ought to thank heaven for making you so ridiculous. While he uttered these ingenious ejaculations, the old gentleman bowed alternately to him and the monkey, that seemed to grin and chatter in imitation of a bull, and, with an arch solemnity of visage, pronounced, Gentlemen, as I have not the honour to understand your compliments, they will be much better bestowed on each other. So saying, 
he seated himself, and had the satisfaction to see the laugh returned upon the aggressor, who remained confounded and abashed, and in a few minutes left the room, muttering, as he retired, the old fellow grows scurrilous, stab my breath. While Peregrine wondered in silence at this extraordinary scene, the lady of the house perceiving his surprise, gave him to understand, that the ancient visitant was utterly bereft of the sense of hearing, that his name was Cadwallader de Crabtree, his disposition altogether misanthropical, and that he was admitted into company on account of entertainment he afforded by his sarcastic observations, and the pleasant mistakes to which he was subject from his infirmity. Nor did our hero wait a long time for an illustration of this odd character. Every sentence he spoke was replete with gall, nor did his satire consist in general reflections, but a series of remarks, which had been made through the medium of a most whimsical peculiarity of opinion. Among those who were present at this assembly was a young officer, who having, by dint of interest, obtained a seat in the lower house, thought it incumbent upon him to talk of affairs of state, and accordingly regaled the company with an account of a secret expedition which the French were busied in preparing, assuring them that he had it from the mouth of the minister, to whom it had been transmitted by one of his agents abroad. In discounting upon the particulars of the armament, he observed that they had twenty ships of the line ready manned and victualled at Brest, which were destined for Toulon, where they would be joined by as many more, and from thence proceed to the execution of their scheme, which he imparted as a secret not fit to be divulged. This piece of intelligence being communicated to all the company except Mr. Crabtree, who suffered by his loss of hearing, that cynic was soon after accosted by a lady, who, by means of an artificial alphabet, formed by a certain conjunction and disposition of the fingers, asked if he had heard any extraordinary news of late. Cadwallader, with his usual complaisance, replied, that he supposed she took him for a courier or spy, by teasing him eternally with that question. He then expatiated upon the foolish curiosity of mankind, which, he said, must either proceed from idleness or want of ideas, and repeated almost verbatim the officer's information, a vague ridiculous report invented by some ignorant coxcomb, who wanted to give himself airs of importance, and believed only by those who were utterly unacquainted with the politics and strength of the French nation. In confirmation of what he had advanced, he endeavoured to demonstrate how impossible it must be for the people to fit out even the third part of such a navy, so soon after the losses they had sustained during the war, and confirmed his proof by asserting, that to his certain knowledge, the harbours of Brest and Toulon could not at that time produce a squadron of eight ships of the line. The member, who was an utter stranger to this misanthrope, hearing his own asseverations treated with such contempt, glowed with confusion and resentment, and, raising his voice, began to defend his own veracity, with great eagerness and trepidation, mingling with his arguments many blustering invectives, against the insolence and ill manners of his supposed contradictor, who sat with a most mortifying composure of countenance, till the officer's patience was quite exhausted, and then, to the manifest increase of his vexation, he was informed, that his antagonist was so deaf, that in all probability, the last trumpet would make no impression upon him, without a previous renovation of his organs. Chapter 72. He cultivates an acquaintance with a misanthrope, who favours him with a short sketch of his own history. Peregrine was extremely well pleased with this occasional rebuke, which occurred so seasonably, that he could scarce believe it accidental. He looked upon Cadwallader as the greatest curiosity he had ever known, and cultivated the old man's acquaintance with such insinuating address, that in less than a fortnight he obtained his confidence. As they one day walked into the fields together, the man-hater disclosed himself in these words, Colon though the term of our communication has been but short, you must have perceived, that I treat you with uncommon marks of regard, which, I assure you, is not owing to your personal accomplishments, nor the pains you take to oblige me, for the first I overlook, and the last I see through. But there is something in your disposition which indicates a routed contempt for the world, and I understand you have made some successful efforts in exposing one part of it to the ridicule of the other. It is upon this assurance that I offer you my advice and assistance, in prosecuting other schemes of the same nature, and to convince you that such an alliance is not to be rejected, I will now give you a short sketch of my history, which will be published after my death, in forty-seven volumes of my own compiling. I was born about forty miles from this place, of parents who, having a very old family name to support, bestowed their whole fortune on my elder brother, so that I inherited of my father little else than a large share of collar, to which I am indebted for a great many adventures that did not always end to my satisfaction. At the age of eighteen I was sent up to town, with a recommendation to a certain peer, who found means to amuse me with the promise of a commission for seven whole years, and tis odds but I should have made my fortune by my perseverance, had not I been arrested, and thrown into the Marshalsea by my landlord 
on whose credit I had subsisted three years, after my father had renounced me as an idle vagabond. There I remained six months, among those prisoners who have no other support than chance charity, and contracted a very valuable acquaintance, which was of great service to me in the future emergencies of my life. I was no sooner discharged, in consequence of an act of Parliament for the relief of insolvent debtors, than I went to the house of my creditor, whom I cudgelled without mercy, and, that I might leave nothing undone of those things which I ought to have done, my next stage was to Westminster Hall, where I waited until my patron came forth from the house and saluted him with a blow that laid him senseless on the pavement. But my retreat was not so fortunate as I could have wished. The chairman and lacqueys in waiting having surrounded and disarmed me in a trice, I was committed to Newgate, and loaded with chains, and a very sagacious gentleman, who was afterwards hanged, having sat in judgment upon my case, pronounced me guilty of a capital crime, and foretold my condemnation at the Old Bailey. His prognostic, however, was disappointed for nobody appearing to prosecute me at the next session, I was discharged by order of the court. It would be impossible for me to recount, in the compass of one day's conversation, all the particular exploits of which I bore considerable share. Suffice it to say, I have been, at different times, prisoner in all the jails within the bills of mortality. I have broken from every round house on this side Temple Bar. No bailiff, in the days of my youth and desperation, durst execute a writ upon me without a dozen of followers and the justices themselves trembled when I was brought before them. I was once maimed by a carman, with whom I quarrelled, because he ridiculed my leek on St. David's Day, my skull was fractured by a butcher's cleaver on the like occasion. I have been run through the body five times, and lost the tip of my left ear by a pistol bullet. In a rencontre of this kind, having left my antagonist for dead, I was wise enough to make my retreat into France and a few days after my arrival at Paris, entering into conversation with some officers on the subject of politics, a dispute arose, in which I lost my temper, and spoke so irreverently of the Grand Monarch, that next morning I was sent to the Bastille, by virtue of a lettre de cachet. There I remained for some months, deprived of all intercourse with rational creatures, a circumstance for which I was not sorry, as I had the more time to project schemes of revenge against the tyrant who confined me, and the wretch who had betrayed my private conversation. But tired, at length, with these fruitless suggestions, I was faint and unbend the severity of my thoughts by a correspondence with some industrious spiders, who had hung my dungeon with their ingenious labours. I considered their work with such attention that I soon became an adept in the mystery of weaving, and furnished myself with as many useful observations and reflections on that art, as will compose a very curious treatise, which I intend to bequeath to the Royal Society, for the benefit of our woollen manufacture, and this with a view to perpetuate my own name rather than befriend my country, for, thank heaven, I am weaned from all attachments of that kind, and look upon myself as one very little obliged to any society whatsoever. Although I presided with absolute power over this long-legged community, and distributed punishments and rewards to each, according to his deserts, I grew impatient of my situation, and my natural disposition one day prevailing, like a fire which had long been smothered, I wreaked the fury of my indignation upon my innocent subjects and in a twinkling destroyed the whole race. While I was employed in this general massacre, the turnkey, who brought me food, opened the door, and perceiving my transport, shrugged up his shoulders, and leaving my allowance, went out, pronouncing, Le pauvre diable, la tete l'uiturne. My passion no sooner subsided than I resolved to profit by this opinion of the jailer, and from that day counterfeited lunacy with such success, that in less than three months I was delivered from the Bastille, and sent to the galleys, in which they thought my bodily vigour might be a service, although the faculties of my mind were decayed. Before I was chained to the oar, I received three hundred stripes by way of welcome, that I might thereby be rendered more tractable, notwithstanding I used all the arguments in my power to persuade them I was only mad north-northwest, and, when the wind was southerly, knew a hawk from a handsaw. In our second cruise we had the good fortune to be overtaken by a tempest, during which the slaves were unbound, that they might contribute the more to the preservation of the galley, and have a chance for their lives, in case of shipwreck. We were no sooner at liberty, than, making ourselves masters of the vessel, we robbed the officers, and ran her on shore among rocks on the coast of Portugal, from whence I hastened to Lisbon, with a view of obtaining my passage in some ship bound for England, where, by this time, I hoped my affair was forgotten. But, before this scheme could be accomplished, my evil genius led me into company, and, being intoxicated, I began to broach doctrines on the subject of religion, at which some of the party were scandalized and incensed, 
and I was next day dragged out of bed by the officers of the Inquisition, and conveyed to a cell in a prison belonging to that tribunal. At my first examination, my resentment was strong enough to support me under the torture, which I endured without flinching, but my resolution abated, and my zeal immediately cooled, when I understood from a fellow prisoner, who groaned on the other side of the partition, that in a short time there would be an auto de fe, in consequence of which I should, in all probability, be doomed to the flames, if I would not renounce my heretical errors, and submit to such penance as the church should think fit to prescribe. This miserable wretch was convicted of Judaism, which he had privately practiced by connivance for many years, until he had amassed a fortune sufficient to attract the regard of the church. To this he fell a sacrifice, and accordingly prepared himself for the stake, while I, not at all ambitious of the crown of martyrdom, resolved to temporize, so that, when I was brought to the question the second time, I made a solemn recantation. As I had no worldly fortune to obstruct my salvation, I was received into the bosom of the church, and, by way of penance, enjoined to walk barefoot to Rome in the habit of a pilgrim. During my peregrination through Spain, I was detained as a spy, until I could procure credentials from the Inquisition at Lisbon, and behaved with such resolution and reserve, that, after being released, I was deemed a proper person to be employed in quality of a secret intelligencer at a certain court. This office I undertook without hesitation, and being furnished with money and bills of credit, crossed the Pyrenees, with intention to revenge myself upon the Spaniards for the severities I had undergone during my captivity. Having therefore effectually disguised myself by a change of dress, and a large patch on one eye, I hired an equipage, and appeared at the lonely and quality of an itinerant physician, in which capacity I succeeded tolerably well, till my servants decamped in the night with my baggage, and left me in the condition of Adam. In short, I have travelled over the greatest part of Europe, as a beggar, pilgrim, priest, soldier, gamester, and quack, and felt the extremes of indigence and opulence, with the inclemency of weather in all its vicissitudes. I have learned that the characters of mankind are everywhere the same, that common sense and honesty bear an infinitely small proportion to folly and vice, and that life is at best a paltry province. After having suffered innumerable hardships, dangers, and disgraces, I returned to London, where I lived some years in a garret, and picked up a subsistence, such as it was, by vending purges in the streets, from the back of a pied horse, in which situation I used to harangue the mob in broken English, under pretense of being an high German doctor. At last an uncle died, by whom I inherited an estate of three hundred pounds per annum, though, in his lifetime, he would not have parted with a sixpence to save my soul and body from perdition. I now appear in the world, not as a member of any community, or what is called a social creature, but merely as a spectator, who entertains himself with the grimaces of a jack pudding, and banquets his spleen in beholding his enemies at loggerheads. That I may enjoy this disposition, abstracted from all interruption, danger, and participation, I feign myself deaf, an expedient by which I not only avoid all disputes and their consequences, but also become master of a thousand little secrets, which are every day whispered in my presence, without any suspicion of their being overheard. You saw how I handled that shallow politician at my lady plausibles the other day. The same method I practice upon the crazed Tory, the bigot Whig, the sour, supercilious pedant, the petulant critic, the blustering coward, the fawning fool, the pert imp, sly sharper, and every other species of knaves and fools, with which this kingdom abounds. In consequence of my rank and character, I obtain free admission to the ladies, among whom I have acquired the appellation of the scandalous chronicle. As I am considered, while silent, in no other light than that of a footstool or elbow chair, they divest their conversation of all restraint before me, and gratify my sense of hearing with strange things, which, if I could prevail upon myself to give the world that satisfaction, would compose a curious piece of secret history, and exhibit a quite different idea of characters from what is commonly entertained. By this time, young gentlemen, you may perceive that I have it in my power to be a valuable correspondent, and that it will be to your interest to deserve my confidence. Here the misanthrope left off speaking, desirous to know the sentiments of our hero, who embraced the proffered alliance in a transport of joy and surprise, and the treaty was no sooner concluded, than Mr. Crabtree began to perform articles, by imparting to him a thousand delicious secrets, from the possession of which he promised himself innumerable scenes of mirth and enjoyment. By means of this associate, whom he considered as the ring of judges, he foresaw, that he should be enabled to penetrate, not only into the chambers, but even to the inmost thoughts of the female sex. In order to ward off suspicion, they agreed to revile each other in public, and meet at a certain private rendezvous, 
to communicate their mutual discoveries, and concert their future operations. But, soon after this agreement, our adventurer was summoned to the garrison by an express from his friend Hatchway, representing that the Commodore lay at the point of death, and, in less than an hour after the receipt of this melancholy piece of news, he set out post for his uncle's habitation, having previously taken leave of Crabtree, who promised to meet him in two months in London, and settled a correspondence with Gauntlet, who proposed to remain at Bath during the rest of the season. Chapter 73 Peregrine arrives at the garrison, where he receives the last admonitions of Commodore Trunnion, who next day resigns his breath, and is buried according to his own direction. Some gentlemen in the country make a fruitless attempt to accommodate matters betwixt Mr. Gamaliel Pickle and his eldest son. About four o'clock in the morning our hero arrived at the garrison, where he found his generous uncle in extremity, supported in bed by Julia on one side, and Lieutenant Hatchway on the other, while Mr. Jolter administered spiritual consolation to his soul, and between whiles comforted Mrs. Trunnion, who, with her maid, sat by the fire, weeping with great decorum, the physician having just taken his last fee, and retired, after pronouncing the fatal prognostic, in which he anxiously wished he might be mistaken. Though the Commodore's speech was interrupted by a violent hiccup, he still retained the use of his senses, and, when Peregrine approached, stretched out his hand with manifest signs of satisfaction. The young gentleman, whose heart overflowed with gratitude and affection, could not behold such a spectacle unmoved. He endeavoured to conceal his tenderness, which, in the wildness of his youth, and the pride of his disposition, he considered as a derogation from his manhood, but, in spite of all his endeavours, the tears gushed from his eyes, while he kissed the old man's hand, and he was so utterly disconcerted by his grief, that, when he attempted to speak, his tongue denied its office, so that the Commodore, perceiving his disorder, made a last effort of strength, and consoled him in these words, Colon swab the spray from your bowsprit, my good lad, and coil up your spirits. You must not let the top lifts of your heart give way, because you see me ready to go down at these years. Many a better man has foundered before he has made half my way, for I trust, by the mercy of God, I shall be sure in port in a very few glasses, and fast moored in a most blessed riding, for my good friend Jolter hath overhauled the journal of my sins, and, by the observation he hath taken of the state of my soul, I hope I shall happily conclude my voyage, and be brought up in the latitude of heaven. Here has been a doctor that wanted to stow me chock full of physic, but, when a man's hour is come, what signifies his taking his departure with apothecary's shop in his hold? Those fellows come alongside a dying man, like the messengers of the Admiralty with sailing orders, but I told him as how I could slip my cable without his direction or assistance, and so he hauled off in dudgeon. This cursed hiccup makes such rippling in the current of my speech, that mayhap you don't understand what I say. Now, while the sucker of my wind pump will go, I would willingly mention a few things, which I hope you will set down in the logbook of your remembrance, when I am stiff, d.c. There's your aunt sitting whimpering by the fire. I desire you will keep her tight, warm, and easy in her old age, she's an honest heart in her own way, and, thof she goes a little crank and humorsome, by being often overstowed with nance and religion, she has been a faithful shipmate to me, and I dare say she never turned in with another man since we first embarked in the same bottom. Jack Hatchway, you know the trim of her as well as e'er a man in England, and I believe she has a kindness for you, whereby, if you two will grapple in the way of matrimony, when I am gone, I do suppose that my godson, for love of me, will allow you to live in the garrison all the days of your life. Peregrine assured him, he would with pleasure comply with any request he should make in behalf of two persons whom he esteemed so much. The lieutenant, with a waggish sneer, which even the gravity of the situation could not prevent, thanked them both for their good will, telling the Commodore, he was obliged to him for his friendship, in seeking to promote him to the command of a vessel which he himself had worn out in the service, but that, notwithstanding, he should be content to take charge of her though he could not help being shy of coming after such an able navigator. Trunnion, exhausted as he was, smiled at this sally, and, after some pause, resumed his admonitions in this manner, colon I need not talk of pipes, because I know you'll do for him without any recommendation, the fellow has sailed with me in many a hard gale, and I'll warrant him as stout a seaman as ever set face to the weather. But I hope you'll take care of the rest of my crew, and not disrate them after I am dead, in favour of new followers. As for that young woman, Ned Gauntlet's daughter, I'm informed as how she's an excellent wench, and has a respect for you, whereby, if you run her on board in an unlawful way, I leave my curse upon you, and trust you will never prosper in the voyage of life. But I believe you are more of an honest man, than to behave so much like a pirate. 
I beg, of all love, you will take care of your constitution, and beware of running foul of harlots, who are no better than so many mermaids, that sit upon rocks in the sea, and hang out a fair face for the destruction of passengers, for I must say, for my own part, I never met with any of those sweet singers, and yet I have gone to sea for the space of thirty years. But howsomever, steer your course clear of all such brimstone b.s. Shun going to law, as you would shun the devil, and look upon all attorneys as devouring sharks, or ravenous fish of prey. As soon as the breath is out of my body, let minute guns be fired, till I am safe underground. I would also be buried in the red jacket I had on when I boarded and took the Rinami. Let my pistols, cutlass, and pocket compass be laid in the coffin along with me. Let me be carried to the grave by my own men, rigged in the black caps and white shirts which my barge's crew are wont to wear, and they must keep a good look out, that none of your pilfering rascallions may come and heave me up again, for the lucre of what they can get, until the carcass is belayed by a tombstone. As for the motto, or what you call it, I leave that to you and Mr. Jolter, who are scholars but I do desire, that it may not be engraved in the Greek or Latin lingos, and much less in the French, which I abominate, but in plain English, that, when the angel comes to pipe all hands, at the great day, he may know that I am a British man, and speak to me in my mother tongue. And now I have no more to say, but God in heaven have mercy upon my soul, and send you all fair weather, wheresoever you are bound. So saying, he regarded every individual around him with a look of complacency, and closing his eye, composed himself to rest, while the whole audience, Pipes himself not excepted, were melted with sorrow, and Mrs. Trunnion consented to quit the room, that she might not be exposed to the unspeakable anguish of seeing him expire. His last moments, however, were not so near as they imagined. He began to doze, and enjoyed small intervals of ease, till next day in the afternoon, during which remissions, he was heard to pour forth many pious ejaculations, expressing his hope, that, for all the heavy cargo of his sins, he should be able to surmount the puttock shrouds of despair, and get aloft to the cross trees of God's good favour. At last his voice sunk so low as not to be distinguished, and, having lain about an hour, almost without any perceptible signs of life, he gave up the ghost with a groan which announced his decease. Julia was no sooner certified of this melancholy event, than she ran to her aunt's chamber, weeping aloud, and immediately a very decent concert was performed by the good widow and her attendants. Peregrine and Hatchway retired till the corpse should be laid out, and Pipes having surveyed the body, with a face of rueful attention, comma, welfare thy soul. Old Moser Trunnion, said he, man and boy I have known thee these five and thirty years, and sure a truer heart never broke a biscuit. Many a hard gale hast thou weathered, but now thy spells are all over, and thy hull fairly laid up. A better commander I've never desired to serve, and who knows but I may help to set up thy standing rigging in another world. All the servants of the house were affected with the loss of their old master, and the poor people in the neighborhood assembled at the gate, and, by repeated howlings, expressed their sorrow for the death of their charitable benefactor. Peregrine, though he felt everything which love and gratitude could inspire on this occasion, was not so much overwhelmed with affliction as to be incapable of taking the management of the family into his own hands. He gave directions about the funeral with great discretion, after having paid the compliments of condolence to his aunt whom he consoled with the assurance of his inviolable esteem and affection. He ordered a suit of mourning to be made for every person in the garrison, and invited all the neighbouring gentlemen to the burial, not even excepting his father and brother Gan, who did not, however, honour the ceremony with their presence, nor was his mother humane enough to visit her sister-in-law in her distress. In the method of interment, the Commodore's injunctions were obeyed to a title, and at the same time our hero made a donation of fifty pounds to the poor of the parish, as a benefaction which his uncle had forgot to bequeath. Having performed these obsequies with the most pious punctuality, he examined the will, to which there was no addition since it had first been executed, adjusted the payment of all the legacies, and, being sole executor, took an account of the estate to which he had succeeded, which, after all deductions, amounted to thirty thousand pounds. The possession of such a fortune, of which he was absolute master, did not at all contribute to the humiliation of his spirit, but inspired him with new ideas of grandeur and magnificence, and elevated his hope to the highest pinnacle of expectation. His domestic affairs being settled, he was visited by almost all the gentlemen of the county, who came to pay their compliments of congratulation on his accession to the estate, and some of them offered their good offices towards a reconciliation betwixt his further and him, induced by the general detestation which was entertained for his brother Gan, who was by this time looked upon by his neighbours as a prodigy of insolence and malice. Our young squire thanked them for their kind proposal, which he accepted, 
and old Gamaliel, at their entreaties, seemed very well disposed to any accommodation, but as he would not venture to declare himself before he had consulted his wife, his favorable disposition was rendered altogether ineffectual, by the instigations of that implacable woman, and our hero resigned all expectation of being reunited to his father's house. His brother, as usual, took all opportunities of injuring his character, by false aspersions, and stories misrepresented, in order to prejudice his reputation, nor was his sister Julia suffered to enjoy her good fortune in peace. Had he undergone such persecution from an alien to his blood, the world would have heard of his revenge, but, notwithstanding his indignation, he was too much tinctured by the prejudices of consanguinity, to lift his arm in judgment against the son of his own parents, and this consideration abridged the term of his residence at the garrison, where he had proposed to stay for some months. Chapter 74. The young gentleman, having settled his domestic affairs, arrives in London, and sets up a gay equipage he meets with Emilia, and is introduced to her uncle. His aunt, at the earnest solicitations of Julia and her husband, took up her quarters at the house of that affectionate kinswoman, who made it her chief study to comfort and cherish the disconsolate widow, and Jolter, in expectation of the living, which was not yet vacant, remained in garrison, in quality of land steward upon our hero's country estate. As for the lieutenant, our young gentleman communed with him in a serious manner, about the Commodore's proposal of taking Mrs. Trunnion to wife, and Jack, being quite tired of the solitary situation of a bachelor, which nothing but the company of his old commander could have enabled him to support so long, far from discovering aversion from the match, observed with an arch smile, that it was not the first time he had commanded a vessel in the absence of Captain Trunnion, and therefore, if the widow was willing, he would cheerfully stand by her helm, and, as he hoped the duty would not be of long continuance, do his endeavour to steer her safe into port, where the Commodore might come on board, and take charge of her again. In consequence of this declaration, it was determined that Mr. Hatchway should make his addresses to Mrs. Trunnion as soon as decency would permit her to receive them, and Mr. Clover and his wife promised to exert their influence on his behalf. Meanwhile, Jack was desired to live at the castle as usual, and assured, that it should be put wholly in his possession, as soon as he should be able to accomplish this matrimonial scheme. When Peregrine had settled all these points to his own satisfaction, he took leave of all his friends, and, repairing to the great city, purchased a new chariot and horses, put pipes and another lackey into rich liveries, took elegant lodgings in Pall Mall, and made a most remarkable appearance among the people of fashion. It was owing to this equipage, and the gaiety of his personal deportment, that common fame, which is always a common liar, represented him as a young gentleman who had just succeeded to an estate of five thousand pounds per annum, by the death of an uncle, that he was entitled to an equal fortune at the decease of his own father, exclusive of two considerable jointures, which would devolve upon him at the demise of his mother and aunt. This report, false and ridiculous as it was, he could not find in his heart to contradict. Not but that he was sorry to find himself so misrepresented, but as vanity would not allow him to take any step that might diminish his importance in the opinion of those who courted his acquaintance, on the supposition that his circumstances were actually as affluent as they were said to be. Nay, so much was he infatuated by this weakness, that he resolved to encourage the deception, by living up to the report, and accordingly engaged in the most expensive parties of pleasure, believing that, before his present finances should be exhausted, his fortune would be effectually made, by the personal accomplishments he should have occasion to display to the Beaumont in the course of his extravagance. In a word, vanity and pride were the ruling foibles of our adventurer, who imagined himself sufficiently qualified to retrieve his fortune in various shapes, long before he could have any idea of want or difficulty. He thought he should have it in his power, at any time, to make a prize of a rich heiress, or opulent widow, his ambition had already aspired to the heart of a young handsome duchess dowager, to whose acquaintance he had found means to be introduced, or, should matrimony chance to be unsuitable to his inclinations, he never doubted, that, by the interest he might acquire among the nobility, he should be favoured with some lucrative post, that would amply recompense him for the liberality of his disposition. There are many younger men who entertain the same expectations, with half the reason he had to be so presumptuous. In the midst of these chimerical calculations, his passion for Emilia did not subside, but, on the contrary, began to rage with such an inflammation of desire, that her idea interfered with every other reflection, and absolutely disabled him from prosecuting the other lofty schemes which his imagination had projected. He therefore laid down the honest resolution of visiting her in all the splendour of his situation, in order to practise upon her virtue with all his art and address, to the utmost extent of his affluence and fortune. Nay, 
so effectually had his guilty passion absorbed his principles of honor, conscience, humanity, and regard for the Commodore's last words, that he was base enough to rejoice at the absence of his friend Godfrey, who, being then with his regiment in Ireland, could not dive into his purpose, or take measures for frustrating his vicious design. Fought with these heroic sentiments, he determined to set out for Sussex in his chariot and six, attended by his valet de chamber and two footmen, and as he was now sensible that in his last essay he had mistaken his cue, he determined to change his battery, and sap the fortress, by the most submissive, soft, and insinuating behavior. On the evening that preceded this proposed expedition, he went into one of the boxes at the playhouse, as usual, to show himself to the ladies, and reconnoitering the company through a glass, for no other reason but because it was fashionable to be purblind, perceived his mistress very plainly dressed, in one of the seats above the stage, talking to another young woman of a very homely appearance. Though his heart beat the alarm with the utmost impatience at sight of his emilier, he was for some minutes deterred from obeying the impulse of his love, by the presence of some ladies of fashion, who, he feared, would think the worse of him, should they see him make his compliment in public to a person of her figure. Nor would the violence of his inclination have so far prevailed over his pride, as to lead him thither, had he not recollected, that his quality friends would look upon her as some handsome Abigail, with whom he had an affair of gallantry, and of consequence give him credit for the intrigue. Encouraged by this suggestion, he complied with the dictates of love, and flew to the place where his charmer sat. His air and dress were so remarkable, that it was almost impossible he should have escaped the eyes of a curious observer, especially as he had chosen a time for coming in, when his entrance could not fail to attract the notice of the spectators, I mean, when the whole house was hushed in attention to the performance on the stage. Emilia, therefore, perceived him at his first approach, she found herself discovered by the direction of his glass, and, guessing his intention by his abrupt retreat from the box, summoned all her fortitude to her aid, and prepared for his reception. He advanced to her with an air of eagerness and joy, tempered with modesty and respect, and expressed his satisfaction at seeing her, with a seeming reverence of regard. Though she was extremely well pleased at this unexpected behavior, she suppressed the emotions of her heart, and answered his compliments with affected ease and unconcern, such as might denote the good humor of a person who meets by accident with an indifferent acquaintance. After having certified himself of her own good health, he very kindly inquired about her mother and Miss Sophie, gave her to understand that he had lately been favored with a letter from Godfrey, that he had actually intended to set out next morning on a visit to Mrs. Gauntlet, which, now that he was so happy as to meet with her, he would postpone, until he should have the pleasure of attending her to the country. After having thanked him for his polite intention, she told him, that her mother was expected in town in a few days, and that she herself had come to London some weeks ago, to give attendance upon her aunt, who had been dangerously ill, but was now pretty well recovered. Although the conversation of course turned upon general topics, during the entertainment he took all opportunities of being particular with his eyes, through which he conveyed a thousand tender protestations. She saw and inwardly rejoiced at the humility of his looks, but, far from rewarding it with one approving glance, she industriously avoided this ocular intercourse, and rather coquetted with a young gentleman that ogled her from the opposite box. Peregrine's penetration easily detected her sentiments, and he was nettled at her dissimulation, which served to confirm him in his unwarrantable designs upon her person. He persisted in his assiduities with indefatigable perseverance, when the play was concluded, handed her and her companion into a hackney coach, and with difficulty was permitted to escort them to the house of Emilia's uncle, to whom our hero was introduced by the young lady, as an intimate friend of her brother Godfrey. The old gentleman, who was no stranger to the nature of Peregrine's connection with his sister's family, prevailed upon him to stay supper, and seemed particularly well pleased with his conversation and deportment, which, by the help of his natural sagacity, he wonderfully adapted to the humor of his entertainer. After supper, when the ladies were withdrawn, and the citizen called for his pipe, our sly adventurer followed his example. Though he abhorred the plant, he smoked with an air of infinite satisfaction, and expatiated upon the virtues of tobacco, as if he had been deeply concerned in the Virginia trade. In the progress of the discourse, he consulted the merchant's disposition, and the national debt coming upon the carpet, held forth upon the funds like a professed broker. When the alderman complained of the restrictions and discouragements of trade, his guest inveighed against exorbitant duties, with the nature of which he seemed as well acquainted as any commissioner of the customs, so that the uncle was astonished at the extent of his knowledge, and expressed his surprise that a gay young gentleman like him should have found either leisure or inclination to consider subjects so foreign to the fashionable amusements of youth. Pickle laid hold on this opportunity to tell him, 
that he was descended from a race of merchants, and that, early in life, he had made it his business to instruct himself in the different branches of trade, which he not only studied as his family profession, but also as the source of all our national riches and power. He then launched out in praise of commerce, and the promoters thereof, and, by way of contrast, employed all his ridicule in drawing such ludicrous pictures of the manners and education of what is called high life, that the traders' sides were shaken by laughter, even to the danger of his life, and he looked upon our adventurer as a miracle of sobriety and good sense. Having thus ingratiated himself with the uncle, Peregrine took his leave, and next day, in the forenoon, visited the niece in his chariot, after she had been admonished by her kinsman to behave with circumspection, and cautioned against neglecting or discouraging the addresses of such a valuable admirer. Chapter 75 He prosecutes his design upon Emilia with great art and perseverance. Our adventurer, having by his hypocrisy obtained free access to his mistress, began the siege by professing the most sincere contrition for his former levity, and imploring her forgiveness with such earnest supplication, that, guarded as she was against his flattering arts, she began to believe his protestations, which were even accompanied with tears, and abated a good deal of that severity and distance she had proposed to maintain during this interview. She would not, however, favor him with the least acknowledgment of a mutual passion, because, in the midst of his vows of eternal constancy and truth, he did not mention one syllable of wedlock, though he was now entirely master of his own conduct, and this consideration created a doubt, which fortified her against all his attacks. Yet, what her discretion would have concealed, was discovered by her eyes, which, in spite of all her endeavors, breathed forth complacency and love, for her inclination was flattered by her own self-sufficiency, which imputed her admirer's silence in that particular to the hurry and perturbation of his spirits, and persuaded her that he could not possibly regard her with any other than honorable intentions. The insidious lover exulted in the tenderness of her looks, from which he presaged a complete victory, but, that he might not overshoot himself by his own precipitation, he would not run the risk of declaring himself, until her heart should be so far entangled within his snares, as that neither the suggestions of honor, prudence, nor pride, should be able to disengage it. Armed with this resolution, he restrained the impatience of his temper within the limits of the most delicate deportment. After having solicited and obtained permission to attend her to the next opera, he took her by the hand, and, pressing it to his lips, in the most respectful manner, went away, leaving her in a most whimsical state of suspense checkered with an interesting vicissitude of hope and fear. On the appointed day, he appeared again about five o'clock in the afternoon, and found her native charms so much improved by the advantages of dress, that he was transported with admiration and delight, and, while he conducted her to the haymarket, could scarce bridle the impetuosity of his passion, so as to observe the forbearing maxims he had adopted. When she entered the pit, he had abundance of food for the gratification of his vanity, for, in a moment, she eclipsed all the female part of the audience, each individual allowing in her own heart that the stranger was by far the handsomest woman the present, except herself. Here it was that our hero enjoyed a double triumph. He was vain of this opportunity to enhance his reputation for gallantry among the ladies of fashion who knew him, and proud of an occasion to display his quality acquaintance to Emilia, that she might entertain a greater idea of the conquest she had made, and pay the more deference to his importance in the sequel of his addresses that he might profit as much as possible by this situation, he went up and accosted every person in the pit, with whom he ever had least communication, whispered and laughed with an affected air of familiarity, and even bowed at a distance to some of the nobility, on the slender foundation of having stood near them at court, or presented them with a pinch of rapee at White's Chocolate House. This ridiculous ostentation, though now practiced with a view of promoting his design, was a weakness that, in some degree, infected the whole of his behavior, for nothing gave him so much joy in conversation, as an opportunity of giving the company to understand how well he was with persons of distinguished rank and character. He would often, for example, observe, as it were occasionally, that the Duke of G was one of the best-natured men in the world, and illustrate this assertion by some instance of his affability, in which he himself was concerned. Then, by an abrupt transition, he would repeat some repartee of Lady T., and mention a certain bon mot of the Earl of C., which was uttered in his hearing. Abundance of young men in this manner make free with the names, though they have never had access to the persons of the nobility, but this was not the case with Peregrine, who, in consideration of his appearance and supposed fortune, together with the advantage of his introduction, was, by this time, freely admitted to the tables of the great. In his return with Emilia from the opera, 
Though he still maintained the most scrupulous decorum in his behavior, he plied her with the most passionate expressions of love, squeezed her hand with great fervency, protested that his whole soul was engrossed by her idea, and that he could not exist independent of her favor. Pleased as she was with his warm and pathetic addresses, together with the respectful manner of his making love, she yet had prudence and resolution sufficient to contain her tenderness, which was ready to run over, being fortified against his arts, by reflecting, that, if his aim was honorable, it was now his business to declare it. On this consideration, she refused to make any serious reply to his earnest expostulations, but affected to receive them as the undetermined effusions of gallantry and good breeding. This fictitious gaiety and good humor, though it baffled his hope of extorting from her an acknowledgment of which he might have taken immediate advantage, nevertheless encouraged him to observe, as the chariot passed along the strand, that the night was far advanced, that supper would certainly be over before they could reach her uncle's house, and to propose that he should wait upon her to some place, where they might be accommodated with a slight refreshment. She was offended at the freedom of this proposal, which, however, she treated as a joke, thanking him for his courteous offer, and assuring him, that when she should be disposed for a tavern treat, he alone would have the honor of bestowing it. Her kinsman being engaged with company abroad, and her aunt retired to rest, he had the good fortune to enjoy a tete-a-tete -tete with her during a whole hour, which he employed with such consummate skill, that her caution was almost overcome. He not only assailed her with the artillery of sighs, vows, prayers, and tears, but even pawned his honor in behalf of his love. He swore, with many imprecations, that although her heart was surrendered to him at discretion, there was a principle within him, which would never allow him to injure such innocence and beauty, and the transports of his passion had, upon this occasion so far overshot his purpose, that if she had demanded an explanation while he was thus agitated, he would have engaged himself to her wish by such ties as he could not break with any regard to his reputation. But from such expostulation she was deterred, partly by pride, and partly by the dread of finding herself mistaken in such an interesting conjecture. She therefore enjoyed the present flattering appearance of her fate, was prevailed upon to accept the jewels which he purchased with part of his winning at Bath, and, with the most enchanting condescension, submitted to a warm embrace when he took his leave, after having obtained permission to visit her as often as his inclination and convenience would permit. In his return to his own lodgings, he was buoyed up with his success to an extravagance of hope, already congratulated himself upon his triumph over Emilia's virtue, and began to project future conquests among the most dignified characters of the female sex. But his attention was not at all dissipated by these vain reflections, he resolved to concentrate the whole exertion of his soul upon the execution of his present plan, desisted, in the meantime, from all other schemes of pleasure, interest, and ambition, and took lodgings in the city, for the more commodious accomplishment of his purpose. While our lover's imagination was thus agreeably regaled, his mistress did not enjoy her expectations without the intervention of doubts and anxiety. His silence, touching the final aim of his addresses, was a mystery on which she was afraid of exercising her sagacity, and her uncle tormented her with inquiries into the circumstances of Peregrine's professions and deportment. Rather than give this relation the least cause for suspicion, which must have cut off all intercourse betwixt her and her admirer, she said everything which she thought would satisfy his care and concern for her welfare, and, in consequence of such representation, she enjoyed, without reserve, the company of our adventurer, who prosecuted his plan with surprising eagerness and perseverance. Chapter 76 He prevails upon Emilia to accompany him to a masquerade, makes a treacherous attempt upon her affection, and meets with a deserved repulse. Scarce a night elapsed in which he did not conduct her to some public entertainment. When, by the dint of his insidious carriage, he thought himself in full possession of her confidence and affection, he lay in wait for an opportunity, and, hearing her observe in conversation, that she had never been at a masquerade, begged leave to attend her to the next ball at the same time extending his invitation to the young lady in whose company he had found her at the play, she being present when this subject of discourse was introduced. He had flattered himself, that this gentlewoman would decline the proposal, as she was a person seemingly of a demure disposition, who had been born and bred in the city, where such diversions are looked upon as scenes of lewdness and debauchery. For once, however, he reckoned without his host, curiosity is as prevalent in the city as at the court end of the town. Emily no sooner signified her assent to his proposal, than her friend, with an air of satisfaction, agreed to make one of the party, and he was obliged to thank her for that complaisance, which laid him under infinite mortification. He set his genius at work to invent some scheme for preventing her unseasonable intrusion. Had an opportunity offered, 
he would have acted as her physician, and administered a medicine that would have laid her under the necessity of staying at home. But his acquaintance with her being too slight to furnish him with a means of executing this expedient, he devised another, which was practiced with all imaginable success. Understanding that her grandmother had left her a sum of money independent of her parents, he conveyed a letter to her mother, intimating, that her daughter, on pretense of going to the masquerade, intended to bestow herself in marriage to a certain person, and that in a few days she would be informed of the circumstances of the whole intrigue, provided she would keep this information secret, and contrive some excuse for detaining the young lady at home, without giving her cause to believe she was apprised of her intention. This billet, subscribed your well-wisher, and unknown humble servant, had the desired effect upon the careful matron, who, on the ball day, feigned herself so extremely ill, that Miss could not with any decency quit her mamma's apartment, and therefore sent her apology to Emilia in the afternoon, immediately after the arrival of Peregrine, who pretended to be very much afflicted with a disappointment, while his heart throbbed with a transport of joy. About ten o'clock the lovers set out for the hay market, he being dressed in the habit of pantaloon, and she in that of columbine, and they had scarce entered the house when the music struck up. The curtain was withdrawn, and the whole scene displayed at once, to the admiration of Vemelier, whose expectation was infinitely surpassed by this exhibition. Our gallant having conducted her through all the different departments, and described the economy of the place, led her into the circle, and, in their turn, they danced several minuets, then going to the sideboard, he prevailed upon her to eat some sweetmeats and drink a glass of champagne. After a second review of the company, they engaged in country dances, at which exercise they continued until our adventurer concluded that his partner's blood was sufficiently warm for the prosecution of his design. On this supposition, which was built upon her declaring that she was thirsty and fatigued, he persuaded her to take a little refreshment and repose, and, for that purpose, handed her downstairs into the eating room, where, having seated her on the floor, he presented her with a glass of wine and water, and, as she complained of being faint, enriched the draught with some drops of a certain elixir, which he recommended as a most excellent restorative, though it was no other than a stimulating tincture, which he had treacherously provided for the occasion. Having swallowed this potion, by which her spirits were manifestly exhilarated, she ate a slice of ham, with a wing of a cold pullet, and concluded the meal with a glass of burgundy, which she drank at the earnest entreaty of her admirer. These extraordinary cordials cooperating with the ferment of her blood, which was heated by violent motion, could not fail to affect the constitution of a delicate young creature, who was naturally sprightly and volatile. Her eyes began to sparkle with unusual fire and vivacity, a thousand brilliant sallies of wit escaped her, and every mask that accosted her underwent some smarting repartee. Peregrine, overjoyed at the success of his administration, proposed that they should resume their places at the country dances, with a view to promote and assist the efficacy of his elixir, and, when he thought her disposition was properly adapted for the theme, began to ply her with all the elocution of love. In order to elevate his own spirits to that pitch of resolution which his scheme required, he drank two whole bottles of burgundy, which inflamed his passion to such a degree, that he found himself capable of undertaking and perpetrating any scheme for the gratification of his desire. Emilia, warmed by so many concurring incentives, in favor of the man she loved, abated considerably of her wounded reserve, listened to his protestations with undissembled pleasure, and, in the confidence of her satisfaction, even owned him absolute master of her affections. Ravished with this confession, he now deemed himself on the brink of reaping the delicious fruits of his art and assiduity, and the morning being already pretty far advanced, assented with rapture to the first proposal she made of retiring to her lodgings. The blinds of the chariot being pulled up, he took advantage of the favorable situation of her thoughts, and, on pretense of being whimsical, in consequence of the wine he had swallowed, clasped her in his arms, and imprinted a thousand kisses on her pouting lips a freedom which he pardoned as the privilege of intoxication. While he thus indulged himself with impunity, the carriage halted, and pipes opening the door, his master handed her into the passage, before she perceived that it was not her uncle's house at which they had alighted. Alarmed at this discovery, she, with some confusion, desired to know his reason for conducting her to a strange place at these hours. But he made no reply, until he had led her into an apartment, when he gave her to understand, that, as her uncle's family must be disturbed by her going thither so late in the night, and the streets near Temple Bar were infested by a multitude of robbers and cutthroats, he had ordered his coachman to halt at this house, which was kept by a relation of his, a mighty good sort of a gentlewoman, who would be proud of an opportunity to accommodate a person for whom he was known to entertain such tenderness and esteem. 
Emilia had too much penetration to be imposed upon by this plausible pretext. In spite of her partiality for Peregrine, which had never been inflamed to such a pitch of complacency before, she comprehended his whole plan in a twinkling. Though her blood boiled with indignation, she thanked him with an affected air of serenity for his kind concern, and expressed her obligation to his cousin, but, at the same time, insisted upon going home, lest her absence should terrify her uncle and aunt, who, she knew, would not retire to rest till her return. He urged her, with a thousand remonstrances, to consult her own ease and safety, promising to send pipes into the city, for the satisfaction of her relations. But, finding her obstinately deaf to his entreaties, he assured her, that he would, in a few minutes, comply with her request, and, in the meantime, begged she would fortify herself against the cold with a cordial, which he poured out in her presence, and which, now that her suspicion was aroused, she refused to taste, notwithstanding all his importunities. He then fell on his knees before her, and the tears gushing from his eyes, swore that his passion was wound up to such a pitch of impatience, that he could no longer live upon the unsubstantial food of expectation, and that, if she would not vouchsafe to crown his happiness, he would forthwith sacrifice himself to her disdain. Such an abrupt address, accompanied with all the symptoms of frantic agitation, could not fail to perplex and affright the gentle Emiliere, who, after some recollection, replied with a resolute tone, that she could not see what reason he had to complain of her reserve, which she was not at liberty to lay entirely aside, until he should have avowed his intentions in form, and obtained the sanction of those whom it was her duty to obey. Divine creature! cried he, seizing her hand, and pressing it to his lips, it is from you alone I hope for that condescension, which would overwhelm me with the transports of celestial bliss. The sentiments of parents are sordid, silly, and confined. I mean not then to subject my passion to such low restrictions as were calculated for the purposes of common life. My love is too delicate and refined to wear those vulgar fetters, which serve only to destroy the merit of voluntary affection, and to upbraid a man incessantly with the articles of compulsion, under which he lies. My dear angel! Spare me the mortification of being compelled to love you, and reign so lampress of my heart and fortune. I will not affront you so much as to talk of settlements, my all is at your disposal. In this pocket-book I notes to the amount of two thousand pounds, do me the pleasure to accept of them. Tomorrow I will lay ten thousand more in your lap. In a word, you shall be mistress of my whole estate, and I shall think myself happy in living dependent on your bounty. Heavens! What were the emotions of the virtuous, the sensible, the delicate, the tender Remelia's heart, when she heard this insolent declaration from the mouth of a man whom she had honoured with her affection and esteem? It was not simply horror, grief, or indignation, that she felt, in consequence of this unworthy treatment, but the united pangs of all together, which produced a sort of hysteric laughter, while she told him that she could not help admiring his generosity. Deceived by this convulsion, and the ironical compliment that attended it, the lover thought he had already made great progress in his operations, and that it was now his business to storm the fort by a vigorous assault, that he might spare her the confusion of yielding without resistance. Possessed by this vain suggestion, he started up, and, folding her in his arms, began to obey the furious dictates of his unruly and ungenerous desire. With an air of cool determination, she demanded a parley, and when, upon her repeated request, he granted it, addressed herself to him in these words, while her eyes gleamed with all the dignity of the most awful resentment colon. Sir, I scorn to upbraid you with a repetition of your former vows and protestations, nor will I recapitulate the little arts you have practised to ensnare my heart, because, though by dint of the most perfidious dissimulation you have found means to deceive my opinion, your utmost efforts have never been able to lull the vigilance of my conduct, or to engage my affection beyond the power of discarding you without a tear, whenever my honour should demand such a sacrifice. Sir, you are unworthy of my concern or regret, and the sigh that now struggles from my breast is the result of sorrow, for my own want of discernment. As for your present attempt upon my chastity, I despise your power, as I detest your intention. Though, under the mask of the most delicate respect, you have decoyed me from the immediate protection of my friends, and contrived other impious stratagems to ruin my peace and reputation, I confide too much in my own innocence, and the authority of the law, to admit one thought of fear much less to sink under the horror of this shocking situation, into which I have been seduced. Sir, your behaviour on this occasion is, in all respects, low and contemptible. For, ruffian as you are, you durst not harbour the thought of executing your execrable scheme, while you knew my brother was near enough to prevent or revenge the insult, so that you must not only be a treacherous villain, but also a most despicable coward. 
Having expressed herself in this manner, with a most majestic severity of aspect, she opened the door, and walking downstairs with surprising resolution, committed herself to the care of a watchman, who accommodated her with a hackney chair, in which she was safely conveyed to her uncle's house. Meanwhile, the lover was so confounded and overawed by these cutting reproaches, and her animated behaviour, that all his resolution forsook him, and he found himself not only incapable of obstructing her retreat, but even of uttering one syllable to deprecate her wrath, or extenuate the guilt of his own conduct. The nature of his disappointment, and the keen remorse that seized him, when he reflected upon the dishonourable footing on which his character stood with Emilia, raised such perturbation in his mind, that his silence was succeeded by a violent fit of distraction, during which he raved like a bedlamite, and acted a thousand extravagancies, which convinced the people of the house, a certain Bagnio, that he had actually lost his wits. Pipes, with great concern, adopted the same opinion, and, being assisted by the waiters, hindered him, by main force, from running out and pursuing the fair fugitive, whom, in his delirium, he alternately cursed and commended with horrid imprecations and lavish applause. His faithful valet, having waited two whole hours, in hopes of seeing this gust of passion overblown, and perceiving that the paroxysm seemed rather to increase, very prudently sent for a physician of his master's acquaintance, who, having considered the circumstances and symptoms of the disorder, directed that he should be plentifully blooded, without loss of time, and prescribed a draught to compose the tumult of his spirits. These orders being punctually performed, he grew more calm and tractable, recovered his reflection so far as to be ashamed of the ecstasy he had undergone, and suffered himself quietly to be undressed and put to bed, where the fatigue occasioned by his exercise at the masquerade cooperated with the present dissipation of his spirits to lull him into a profound sleep, which greatly tended to the preservation of his intellects. Not that he found himself in a state of perfect tranquillity when he waked about noon. The remembrance of what had passed overwhelmed him with mortification. Emilia's invectives still sounded in his ears. And, while he deeply resented her disdain, he could not help admiring her spirit, and his heart did homage to her charms. Chapter 77 He endeavours to reconcile himself to his mistress, and expostulates with the uncle, who forbids him the house. In this state of division, he went home to his own lodgings in a chair, and while he deliberated with himself whether he should relinquish the pursuit, and endeavour to banish her idea from his breast, or go immediately and humble himself before his exasperated mistress, and offer his hand as an atonement for his crime, his servant put in his hand a packet, which had been delivered by a ticket porter at the door. He no sooner perceived that the superscription was in Emilia's handwriting, than he guessed the nature of the contents, and, opening the seal with disordered eagerness, found the jewels he had given to her enclosed in a billet, couched in these words colon, that I may have no cause to reproach myself with having retained the least memorial of a wretch whom I equally despise and abhor, I take this opportunity of restoring these ineffectual instruments of his infamous design upon the honour of Emilia. His chagrin was so much galled and inflamed at the bitterness of this contemptuous message, that he gnawed his fingers till the blood ran over his nails, and even wept with vexation. Sometimes he vowed revenge against her haughty virtue, and reviled himself for his precipitate declaration, before his scheme was brought to maturity, then he would consider her behaviour with reverence and regard, and bow before the irresistible power of her attractions. In short, his breast was torn by conflicting passions, love, shame, and remorse, contended with vanity, ambition, and revenge, and the superiority was still doubtful when a headstrong desire interposed, and decided in favour of an attempt towards a reconciliation with the offended fair. Impelled by this motive, he set out in the afternoon for the house of her uncle, not without hopes of that tender enjoyment, which never fails to attend an accommodation betwixt two lovers of taste and sensibility. Though the consciousness of his trespass encumbered him with an air of awkward confusion, he was too confident of his own qualifications and address to despair of forgiveness, and, by that time he arrived at the citizen's gate, he had conned a very artful and pathetic harangue, which he proposed to utter in his own behalf, laying the blame of his conduct on the impetuosity of his passion, increased by the burgundy which he had too liberally drunk, but he did not meet with an opportunity to avail himself of this preparation. Emilia, suspecting that he would take some step of this kind to retrieve her favour, had gone abroad on pretence of visiting after having signified to her kinsman her resolution to avoid the company of Peregrine, on account of some ambiguities which, she said, were last night remarkable in his demeanour at the masquerade. She chose to insinuate her suspicion in these hints, rather than give an explicit detail of the young man's dishonourable contrivance, which might have kindled the resentment of the family to some dangerous pitch of animosity and revenge. Our adventurer, 
finding himself baffled in his expectation of seeing her, inquired for the old gentleman, with whom he thought he had influence enough to make his apology good, in case he should find him prepossessed by the young lady's information. But here too he was disappointed, the uncle having gone to dine in the country, and his wife was indisposed, so that he had no pretext for staying in the house till the return of his charmer. Being, however, fruitful of expedients, he dismissed his chariot, and took possession of a room in a tavern, the windows of which fronted the merchant's gate, and there he proposed to watch until he should see her approach. This scheme he put in practice with indefatigable patience, though it was not attended with the expected success. Emilia, whose caution was equally vigilant and commendable, foreseeing that she might be exposed to the fertility of his invention, came home by a private passage, and entered by a postern, which was altogether unknown to her admirer, and her uncle did not arrive until it was so late that he could not, with any decency, demand a conference. Next morning, he did not fail to present himself at the door, and his mistress being denied by her own express direction, insisted upon seeing the master of the house, who received him with such coldness of civility, as plainly gave him to understand that he was acquainted with the displeasure of his niece. He, therefore, with an air of candour, told the citizen, he could easily perceive by his behaviour that he was the confidant of Miss Emily, of whom he was come to ask pardon for the offence he had given, and did not doubt, if he could be admitted to her presence, that he should be able to convince her that he had not erred intentionally, or at least propose such reparation as would effectually atone for his fault. To this remonstrance the merchant, without any ceremony or circumlocution, answered, that though he was ignorant of the nature of his offence, he was very certain, that it must have been something very flagrant that could irritate his niece to such a degree, against a person for whom she had formerly a most particular regard. He owned, she had declared her intention to renounce his acquaintance for ever, and, doubtless, she had good reason for so doing, neither would he undertake to promote an accommodation, unless he would give him full power to treat on the score of matrimony, which he supposed would be the only means of evincing his own sincerity, and obtaining Emilia's forgiveness. Peregrine's pride was kindled by this blunt declaration, which he could not help considering as the result of a scheme concerted betwixt the young lady and her uncle, in order to take advantage of his heat. He therefore replied, with manifest signs of disgust, that he did not apprehend there was any occasion for a mediator to reconcile the difference betwixt Emilia and him, and that all he desired was an opportunity of pleading in his own behalf. The citizen frankly told him, that, as his niece had expressed an earnest desire of avoiding his company, he would not put the least constraint upon her inclination, and, in the meantime, gave him to know, that he was particularly engaged. Our hero, glowing with indignation at this supercilious treatment, I was in the wrong, said he, to look for good manners so far on this side of Temple Bar, but you must give me leave to tell you, sir, that unless I am favoured with an interview with Miss Gauntlet, I shall conclude that you have actually laid a constraint upon her inclination, for some sinister purposes of your own. Sir, replied the old gentleman, you are welcome to make what conclusions shall seem good unto your own imagination, but pray be so good as to allow me the privilege of being master in my own house. So saying, he very complacently showed him to the door, and our lover being diffident of his own temper, as well as afraid of being used with greater indignity, in a place where his personal prowess would only serve to heighten his disgrace, quitted the house in a transport of rage, which he could not wholly suppress, telling the landlord, that if his age did not protect him, he would have chastised him for his insolent behaviour. Chapter 78. He projects a violent scheme, in consequence of which he is involved in a most fatiguing adventure, which greatly tends towards the augmentation of his chagrin. Thus debarred of personal communication with his mistress, he essayed to retrieve her good graces by the most submissive and pathetic letters, which he conveyed by divers artifices to her perusal, but, reaping no manner of benefit from these endeavours, his passion acquired a degree of impatience little inferior to downright frenzy, and he determined to run every risk of life, fortune, and reputation, rather than desist from his unjustifiable pursuit. Indeed, his resentment was now as deeply concerned as his love, and each of these passions equally turbulent and loud in demanding gratification. He kept sentinels continually in pay, to give him notice of her outgoings, in expectation of finding some opportunity to carry her off, but her circumspection entirely frustrated this design, for she suspected everything of that sort from a disposition like his, and regulated her motions accordingly. Baffled by her prudence and penetration, he altered his plan. On pretense of being called to his country house by some affair of importance, he departed from London, and, taking lodgings at a farmer's house that stood near the road through which she must have necessarily passed in her return to her mother, 
concealed himself from all intercourse, except with his valet de chamber and pipes, who had orders to scour the country, and reconnoitre every horse, coach, or carriage, that should appear on that highway, with a view of intercepting his Emilia in her passage. He had waited in this ambuscade a whole week, when his valet gave him notice, that he and his fellow scout had discovered a chaise and six, driving at full speed towards them, upon which they had flapped their hats over their eyes, so as they might not be known, in case they should be seen, and concealed themselves behind a hedge, from whence they could perceive in the carriage, as it passed, a young man plainly dressed, with a lady in a mask, of the exact size, shape, and air of Emilier, and that pipes followed them at a distance, while he rode back to communicate this piece of intelligence. Peregrine would scarce allow him time to conclude his information. He ran down to the stable, where his horse was kept ready saddled for the purpose, and, never doubting that the lady in question was his mistress, attended by one of her uncle's clerks, mounted immediately, and rode full gallop after the chaise, which, when he had proceeded about two miles, he understood from pipes, had put up at a neighbouring inn. Though his inclination prompted him to enter her apartment without further delay, he suffered himself to be dissuaded from taking such a precipitate step, by his privy counsellor, who observed, that it would be impracticable to execute his purpose of conveying her against her will from a public inn, that stood in the midst of a populous village, which would infallibly rise in her defence. He advised him therefore to be in wait for the chaise, in some remote and private part of the road, where they might accomplish their reign without difficulty or danger. In consequence of this admonition our adventurer ordered Pipes to reconnoitre the inn, that he might not escape another way, while he and the valley, in order to avoid being seen, took a circuit by an unfrequented path, and placed themselves in ambush, on a spot which they chose for the scene of their achievement. Here they tarried a full hour, without seeing the carriage, or hearing from their sentinel. So that the youth, unable to exert his patience one moment longer, left the foreigner in his station, and rode back to his faithful lackey, who assured him, that the travellers had not yet hove up their anchor, or proceeded on their voyage. Notwithstanding this information, Pickle began to entertain such alarming suspicions, that he could not refrain from advancing to the gate, and inquire for the company which had lately arrived in a chaise and six. The innkeeper, who was not at all pleased with the behaviour of those passengers, did not think proper to observe the instructions he had received, on the contrary. He plainly told him, that the chaise did not halt, but only entered at one door, and went out at the other, with a view to deceive those who pursued it, as he guessed from the words of the gentleman, who had earnestly desired that his route might be concealed from any person who should inquire about their motions. As for my own part, Meester, continued this charitable publican, I believes as how they are no better than they should be, else they wouldn't be in such a deadly fear of being overtaken. Methinks, said I, when I saw them in such a woundy pother to be gone, odd shartlikins. This must be some London prentice running away with his meester's daughter, as sure as I'm a living soul. But, be he who he will, certain it is, a has nothing of the gentleman about hen, for, Thoffa asked such a favour, and never once put hand in pocket, or said, Dog, will you drink? Howsomever, that don't argue for in reverence of his being in a hurry, and a man may be sometimes a little too judgmatical in his conjectures. In all probability, this loquacious landlord would have served the travellers effectually, had Peregrine heard him to an end, but this impetuous youth, far from listening to the sequel of his observations, interrupted him in the beginning of his career, by asking eagerly which road they followed, and, having received the innkeeper's directions, clapped spurs to his horse, commanding pipes to make the valley acquainted with the course, that they might attend him with all imaginable dispatch. By the publican's account of their conduct, his former opinion was fully confirmed. He plied his steed to the height of his mettle, and so much was his imagination engrossed by the prospect of having Emilia in his power, that he did not perceive the road on which he travelled was quite different from that which led to the habitation of Mrs. Gauntlet. The valet de chamber was an utter stranger to that part of the country, and, as for Mr. Pipes, such considerations were altogether foreign to the economy of his reflection. Ten long miles had our hero rode, when his eyes were blessed with the sight of the chaise ascending an hill, at the distance of a good league, upon which he doubled his diligence in such a manner, that he gained upon the carriage every minute, and at length approached so near to it, that he could discern the lady and her conductor, with their heads thrust out at the windows, looking back, and speaking to the driver alternately, as if they earnestly besought him to augment the speed of his cattle. Being thus, as it were, in sight of port, while he crossed the road, his horse happened to plunge into a cart rat with such violence, that he was thrown several yards over his head, and, the beast's shoulder being slipped by the fall, he found himself disabled from plucking the fruit, which was almost within his reach, 
for he had left his servants at a considerable distance behind him, and although they had been at his back, and supplied him with another horse, they were so indifferently mounted, that he could not reasonably expect to overtake the flyers, who profited so much by this disaster that the chaise vanished in a moment. It may be easily conceived how a young man of his disposition passed his time, in this tantalizing situation. He ejaculated with great fervency, but his prayers were not the effects of resignation. He ran back on foot, with incredible speed, in order to meet his valet, whom he unhorsed in a twinkling, and, taking his seat, began to exercise his whip and spurs, after having ordered the Swiss to follow him on the other gelding, and committed the lame hunter to the care of pipes. Matters being adjusted in this manner, our adventurer prosecuted the race with all his might, and, having made some progress, was informed by a countryman, that the chaise had struck off into another road, and, according to his judgment, was by that time about three miles ahead, though, in all probability, the horses would not be able to hold out much longer, because they seemed to be quite spent when they passed his door. Encouraged by this intimation, Peregrine pushed on with great alacrity, though he could not regain sight of the desired object, till the clouds of night began to deepen, and even then he enjoyed nothing more than a transient glimpse, for the carriage was no sooner seen, than shrouded again from his view. These vexatious circumstances animated his endeavours, while they irritated his chagrin. In short, he continued his pursuit, till the night was far advanced, and himself so uncertain about the object of his care, that he entered a solitary inn, with a view of obtaining some intelligence, when, to his infinite joy, he perceived the chaise standing by itself, and the horses panting in the yard. In full confidence of his having arrived at last at the goal of all his wishes, he alighted instantaneously, and, running up to the coachman, with a pistol in his hand, commanded him, in an imperious tone, to conduct him to the lady's chamber, on pain of death. The driver, affrighted at this menacing address, protested, with great humility, that he did not know whether his fare had retired, for that he himself was paid and dismissed from the service, because he would not undertake to drive them all night across the country without stopping to refresh his horses. But he promised to go in quest of the waiter, who would show him to their apartment. He was accordingly detached on that errand, while our hero stood sentinel at the gate, till the arrival of his valet de chamber, who, joining him by accident, before the coachman returned, relieved him in his watch, and then the young gentleman, exasperated at his messenger's delay, rushed, with fury in his eyes, from room to room, denouncing vengeance upon a whole family, but he did not meet with one living soul, until he entered the garret, where he found the landlord and his wife in bed. This chicken-hearted couple, by the light of a rush candle that burned on the hearth, seeing a stranger burst into the chamber, in such a terrible attitude, were seized with consternation, and, exalting their voices, in a most lamentable strain, begged, for the passion of Christ, that he would spare their lives, and take all they had. Peregrine guessing, from this exclamation, and the circumstance of their being abed, that they mistook him for a robber, and were ignorant of that which he wanted to know, dispelled their terror, by making them acquainted with the cause of his visit, and desired the husband to get up with all possible dispatch, in order to assist and attend him in his search. Thus reinforced, he rummaged every corner of the inn, and at last, finding the ostler in the stable, was by him informed, to his unspeakable mortification, that the gentleman and lady who arrived in the chaise, had immediately hired post horses for a certain village at the distance of fifteen miles, and departed without halting for the least refreshment. Our adventurer, mad with his disappointment, mounted his horse in an instant, and, with his attendant, took the same road, with full determination to die, rather than desist from the prosecution of his design. He had, by this time, rode upwards of thirty miles, since three o'clock in the afternoon, so that the horses were almost quite jaded, and travelled this stage so slowly, that it was morning before they reached the place of their destination, where, far from finding the fugitives, he understood that no such persons as he described had passed that way, and that, in all likelihood, they had taken a quite contrary direction, while in order to mislead him in his pursuit, they had amused the ostler with a false route. This conjecture was strengthened by his perceiving, now for the first time, that he had deviated a considerable way from the road, through which they must have journeyed, in order to arrive at the place of her mother's residence, and these suggestions utterly deprived him of the small remains of recollection which he had hitherto retained. His eyes rolled about, witnessing rage and distraction, he foamed at the mouth, stamped upon the ground with great violence, uttered incoherent imprecations against himself and all mankind, and would have sallied forth again, he knew not whither, upon the same horse which he had already almost killed with fatigue, had not his confidant found means to quiet the tumult of his thoughts, and recall his reflection, 
by representing the condition of the poor animals, and advising him to hire fresh horses, and ride post across the country, to the village in the neighborhood of Mrs. Gauntlet's habitation, where they should infallibly intercept the daughter, provided they could get the start of her upon the road. Peregrine not only relished, but forthwith acted in conformity with this good counsel. His own horses were committed to the charge of the landlord, with directions for pipes, in case he should come in quest of his master, and, a couple of stout geldings being prepared, he and his valet took the road again, steering their course according to the motions of the postboy, who undertook to be their guide. They had almost finished the first stage, when they descried a post-chaise just halting at the inn where they proposed to change horses, upon which our adventurer, glowing with a most interesting presage, put his beast to the full speed, and approached near enough to distinguish, as the travellers quitted the carriage, that he had at last come up with the very individual persons whom he had pursued so long. Flushed with this discovery, he galloped into the yard so suddenly, that the lady and her conductor scarce had time to shut themselves up in a chamber, to which they retreated with great precipitation, so that the pursuer was now certain of having housed his prey. That he might, however, leave nothing to fortune. He placed himself upon the stair by which they had ascended to the apartment, and sent up his compliments to the young lady, desiring the favour of being admitted to her presence, otherwise he should be obliged to waive all ceremony, and take that liberty which she would not give. The servant, having conveyed his message through the keyhole, returned with an answer, importing that she would adhere to the resolution she had taken, and perish, rather than comply with his will. Our adventurer, without staying to make any rejoinder to this reply, ran upstairs, and, thundering at the door for entrance, was given to understand by the nymph's attendant, that a blunderbuss was ready prime for his reception, and that he would do well to spare him the necessity of shedding blood in defence of a person who had put herself under his protection. All the laws of the land, said he, cannot now untie the knots by which we are bound together, and therefore I will guard her as my own property, so that you had better desist from your fruitless attempt, and thereby consult your own safety, for, by the God that made me, I will discharge my peace upon you, as soon as you set your nose within the door, and your blood be upon your own head. These menaces, from a citizen's clerk, would have been sufficient motives for Pickle to storm the breach, although they had not been reinforced by that declaration, which informed him of Emily's having bestowed herself in marriage upon such a contemptible rival. This sole consideration added wings to his impetuosity, and he applied his foot to the door with such irresistible force as burst it open in an instant, entering at the same time with a pistol ready cocked in his hand. His antagonist, instead of firing his blunderbuss, when he saw him approach, started back with evident signs of surprise and consternation, exclaiming, Lord Jesus! Sir, you are not the man! And, without doubt, are under some mistake with regard to us! Before Peregrine had time to answer this salutation, the lady, hearing it, advanced to him, and, pulling off a mask, discovered a face which he had never seen before. The Gorgon's head, according to the fables of antiquity, never had a more instantaneous or petrifying effect, than that which this countenance produced upon the astonished youth. His eyes were fixed upon this unknown object, as if they had been attracted by the power of enchantment, his feet seemed riveted to the ground, and, after having stood motionless for the space of a few minutes, he dropped down in an apoplexy of disappointment and despair. The Swiss, who had followed him, seeing his master in this condition, lifted him up, and, laying him upon a bed in the next room, let him blood immediately, without hesitation, being always provided with a case of lancets, against all accidents on the road. To this foresight our hero, in all probability, was indebted for his life. By virtue of a very copious evacuation, he recovered the use of his senses, but the complication of fatigues and violent transports, which he had undergone, brewed up a dangerous fever in his blood, and, a physician being called from the next market town, several days elapsed before he would answer for his life. Chapter 79. Peregrine sends a message to Mrs. Gauntlet, who rejects his proposal he repairs to the garrison. At length, however, his constitution overcame his disease, though not before it had in a great measure tamed the fury of his disposition, and brought him to a serious consideration of his conduct. In this humiliation of his spirits, he reflected with shame and remorse upon his treachery to the fair, the innocent Emilier. He remembered his former sentiments in her favour, as well as the injunctions of his dying uncle. He recollected his intimacy with her brother, against which he had so basely sinned, and, revolving all the circumstances of her conduct, found it so commendable, spirited, and noble, that he deemed her an object of sufficient dignity to merit his honourable addresses, even though his duty had not been concerned in this decision. But, 
obligated as he was to make reparation to a worthy family, which he had so grossly injured. He thought he could not manifest his reformation too soon, and, whenever he found himself able to hold a pen, wrote a letter to Mrs. Gauntlet, wherein he acknowledged, with many expressions of sorrow and contrition, that he had acted apart altogether unbecoming a man of honour, and should never enjoy the least tranquillity of mind, until he should have merited her forgiveness. He protested, that, although his happiness entirely depended upon the determination of Vermeulier, he would even renounce all hope of being blessed with her favour, if she could point out any other method of making reparation to that amiable young lady, but by laying his heart and fortune at her feet, and submitting himself to her pleasure during the remaining part of his life. He conjured her, therefore, in the most pathetic manner, to pardon him, in consideration of his sincere repentance, and to use her maternal influence with her daughter, so as that he might be permitted to wait upon her with a wedding ring, as soon as his health would allow him to undertake the journey. This explanation being dispatched by Pipes, who had, by this time, found his master, the young gentleman inquired about the couple whom he had so unfortunately pursued, and understood from his valet de chamber, who learned the story from their own mouths, that the lady was the only daughter of a rich Jew, and her attendant no other than his apprentice, who had converted her to Christianity, and married her at the same time, that this secret having taken air, the old Israelite had contrived a scheme to separate them for ever, and they being apprised of his intention, had found means to elope from his house, with a view of sheltering themselves in France, until the affair could be made up, that, seeing three men ride after them with such eagerness, they never doubted that the pursuers were her father, and some friends, or domestics, and on that supposition had fled with the utmost dispatch and trepidation, until they had found themselves happily undeceived, at that very instant when they expected nothing but mischief and misfortune. Lastly, the Swiss gave him to understand, that, after having professed some concern for his deplorable situation, and enjoyed a slight refreshment, they had taken their departure for Dover, and, in all likelihood, were safely arrived at Paris. In four and twenty hours after Pipes was charged with his commission, he brought back an answer from the mother of Emilia, couched in these words colon. Sir, comma, I received the favour of yours, and am glad, for your own sake, that you have attained a due sense and conviction of your unkind and unchristian behaviour to poor Emmy. I thank God, none of my children were ever so insulted before. Give me leave to tell you, sir, my daughter was no upstart, without friends or education, but a young lady, as well bred, and better born, than most private gentlewomen in the kingdom, and therefore, though you had no esteem for her person, you ought to have paid some regard to her family, which, no disparagement to you, sir, is more honourable than your own. As for your proposal, Miss Gauntlet will not hear of it, being that she thinks her honour will not allow her to listen to any terms of reconciliation, and she is not yet so destitute as to embrace an offer to which she has the least objection. In the meantime, she is so much indisposed, that she cannot possibly see company, so I beg you will not take the trouble of making a fruitless journey to this place. Perhaps your future conduct may deserve her forgiveness, and really, as I am concerned for your happiness, which usually depends upon her condescension, I wish with all my heart it may, and am, notwithstanding all that has happened, your sincere well-wisher, Cecilia Gauntlet. From this epistle, and the information of his messenger, our hero learned, that his mistress had actually profited by his wild goose chase, so as to make a safe retreat to her mother's house. Though sorry to hear of her indisposition, he was also piqued at her implacability, as well as at some stately paragraphs of the letter, in which, he thought, the good lady had consulted her own vanity, rather than her good sense. These motives of resentment helped him to bear his disappointment like a philosopher, especially as he had now quieted his conscience, in proffering to redress the injury he had done, and, moreover, found himself, with regard to his love, in a calm state of hope and resignation. A seasonable fit of illness is an excellent medicine for the turbulence of passion. Such a reformation had the fever produced on the economy of his thoughts, that he moralized like an apostle, and projected several prudential schemes for his future conduct. In the meantime, as soon as his health was sufficiently re-established, he took a trip to the garrison, in order to visit his friends, and learn from Hatchway's own mouth, that he had broke the ice of courtship to his aunt and that his addresses were now fairly afloat, though, when he first declared himself to the widows, after she had been duly prepared for the occasion, by her niece and the rest of her friends, she had received his proposal with a becoming reserve, and piously wept at the remembrance of her husband, observing, that she should never meet with his fellow. Peregrine promoted the lieutenant's suit with all his influence, and all Mrs. Trunnion's objections to the match being surmounted, it was determined, that the day of marriage should be put off for three months 
that her reputation might not suffer by a precipitate engagement. His next care was to give orders for erecting a plain marble monument to the memory of his uncle, on which the following inscription, composed by the bridegroom, actually appeared in golden letters. Here lies, founded in a fathom and half, the shell, of, Thorza Trunnion, Esquire, formerly commander of a squadron, in His Majesty's service, who broached to, at 5 p.m. October 10th, in the year of his age three score and nineteen, he kept his guns always loaded, and his tackle ready manned, and never showed his poop to the enemy, except when he took her in tow. But, his shot being expended, his match burnt out, and his upper works decayed. He was sunk by death's superior weight of metal, nevertheless, he will be weighed again at the great day. His rigging refitted, and his timbers repaired, and, with one broadside, make his adversary strike in his turn, chapter 80. He returns to London, and meets with Cadwallader, who entertains him with many curious particulars Grabtree sounds the Duchess, and undeceives Pickle, who, by an extraordinary accident, becomes acquainted with another lady of quality. The young gentleman having performed these last offices in honour of his deceased benefactor, and presented Mr. Jolty to the long-expected living, which at this time happened to be vacant, returned to London, and resumed his former gaiety, not that he was able to shake Emilia from his thought, or even to remember her without violent emotions, for, as he recovered his vigour, his former impatience recurred, and therefore he resolved to plunge himself headlong into some intrigue, that might engage his passions and amuse his imagination. A man of his accomplishments could not fail to meet with a variety of subjects on which his gallantry would have been properly exercised, and this abundance distracted his choice, which at any time was apartment to be influenced by caprice and whim. I have already observed, that he had lifted his view, through a matrimonial perspective, as high as a lady of the first quality and distinction, and now, that he was refused by Miss Gauntlet, and enjoyed a little respite from the agonies of that flame which her charms had kindled in his heart, he renewed his assiduities to her grace. Though he durst not yet risk an explanation, he enjoyed the pleasure of seeing himself so well received in quality of a particular acquaintance, that he flattered himself with the belief of his having made some progress in her heart, and was confirmed in this conceited notion by the assurances of her woman, whom, by liberal largesses, he retained in his interest, because she found means to persuade him that she was in the confidence of her lady. But, notwithstanding this encouragement, and the sanguine suggestions of his own vanity, he dreaded the thoughts of exposing himself to her ridicule and resentment by a premature declaration, and determined to postpone his addresses, until he should be more certified of the probability of succeeding in his attempt. While he remained in this hesitation and suspense, he was one morning very agreeably surprised with the appearance of his friend Crabtree, who, by the permission of Pipes, to whom he was well known, entered his chamber before he was awake, and, by a violent shake of the shoulder, disengaged him from the arms of sleep. The first compliments having mutually passed, Cadwallader gave him to understand, that he had arrived in town overnight in a stagecoach from Bath, and entertained him with such a ludicrous account of his fellow travellers, that Peregrine, for the first time since their parting, indulged himself in mirth, even to the hazard of suffocation. Crabtree, having rehearsed these adventures, in such a peculiarity of manner as added infinite ridicule to every circumstance, and repeated every scandalous report which had circulated at Bath, after Peregrine's departure, was informed by the youth, that he harboured a design upon the person of such a duchess, and in all appearance had no reason to complain of his reception, but that he would not venture to declare himself, until he should be more ascertained of her sentiments, and therefore he begged leave to depend upon the intelligence of his friend Cadwallader, who, he knew, was admitted to her parties. The misanthrope, before he would promise his assistance, asked if his prospect verged towards matrimony, and our adventurer, who guessed the meaning of his question, replying in the negative, he undertook the office of reconnoitring her inclination, protesting at the same time, that he would never concern himself in any scheme that did not tend to the disgrace and deception of all the sex. On these conditions he espoused the interest of our hero, and a plan was immediately concerted, in consequence of which they met by accident at her grace's table. Pickle having stayed all the forepart of the evening, and sat out all the company, except the misanthrope and a certain widow lady who was said to be in the secrets of my lady duchess, went away on pretence of an indispensable engagement, that Crabtree might have a proper opportunity of making him the subject of conversation. Accordingly, he had scarce quitted the apartment, when this cynic, attending him to the door with a look of morose disdain, were I an absolute prince, said he, and that fellow one of my subjects, I would order him to be clothed in sackcloth, 
and he should drive my asses to water, that his lofty spirit might be lowered to the level of his deserts. The pride of a peacock is downright self-denial, when compared with the vanity of that coxcomb, which was naturally arrogant, but is now rendered altogether intolerable, by the reputation he acquired at Bath, for kicking a bully, outwitting a club of raw sharpers, and divers other pranks, in the execution of which he was more lucky than wise. But nothing has contributed so much to the increase of his insolence and self-conceit, as the favour he found among the ladies, eh, the ladies, Madame, I care not who knows it, the ladies, who, to their honour be it spoken, never fail to patronise foppery and folly, provided they solicit their encouragement. And yet this dog was not on the footing of those hermaphroditical animals, who may be reckoned among the number of waiting women, who air your shifts, comb your lap dogs, examine your noses with magnifying glasses, in order to squeeze out the worms, clean your toothbrushes, sweeten your handkerchiefs, and soften waste paper for your occasions. This fellow pickle was entertained for more important purposes, his turn of duty never came till all those lap wings were gone to roost, then he scaled windows, leapt over garden walls, and was let in by Mrs. Betty in the dark. Nay, the magistrates of Bath complimented him with the freedom of the corporation, merely because, through his means, the waters had gained extraordinary credit, for every female of a tolerable appearance, that went thither on account of her sterility, got the better of her complaint, during his residence at Bath and now the fellow thinks no woman can withstand his addresses. He had not been here three minutes, when I could perceive, with half an eye, that he had marked out your grace for a conquest, comma, I mean in an honourable way, though the rascal has impudence enough to attempt anything. So saying, he fixed his eyes upon the duchess, who, while her face glowed with indignation, turning to her confidant, expressed herself in these words, upon my life. I believe there is actually some truth in what this old ruffian says, I have myself observed that young fellow eyeing me with a very particular stare. It is not to be at all wondered at, said her friend, that a youth of his complexion should be sensible to the charms of your grace. But I dare say he would not presume to entertain any but the most honourable and respectful sentiments. Respectful sentiments! cried my lady, with a look of ineffable disdain, if I thought the fellow had assurance enough to think of me in any shape, I protest I would forbid him my house. Upon my honour, such instances of audacity should induce persons of quality to keep your small gentry at a greater distance, for they are very apartment to grow impudent, upon the least countenance or encouragement. Cadwallader, satisfied with this declaration, changed the subject of discourse, and next day communicated his discovery to his friend Pickle, who upon this occasion felt the most stinging sensations of mortified pride, and resolved to quit his prospect with a good grace nor did the execution of this self-denying scheme cost him one moment's uneasiness, for his heart had never been interested in the pursuit, and his vanity triumphed in the thoughts of manifesting his indifference. Accordingly, the very next time he visited her grace, his behaviour was remarkably frank, sprightly and disengaged, and the subject of love being artfully introduced by the widows, who had been directed to sound his inclinations, he rallied the passion with great ease and severity and made no scruple of declaring himself heart whole. Though the Duchess had resented his supposed affection, she was now offended at his insensibility, and even signified her disgust, by observing, that perhaps his attention to his own qualifications screened him from the impression of all other objects. While he enjoyed this sarcasm, the meaning of which he could plainly discern, the company was joined by a certain virtuoso, who had gained free access to all the great families of the land, by his noble talent of gossiping and buffoonery. He was now in the seventy-fifth year of his age. His birth was so obscure, that he scarce knew his father's name, his education suitable to the dignity of his descent, his character publicly branded with homicide, profligacy, and breach of trust, yet this man, by the happy inheritance of impregnable affrontery, and a lucky prostitution of all principle in rendering himself subservient to the appetites of the great, had attained to an independency of fortune, as well as to such a particular share of favour among the quality, that, although he was well known to have pimped for three generations of the nobility, there was not a lady of fashion in the kingdom who scrupled to admit him to her toilette, or even to be squired by him in any place of public entertainment. Not but that this sage was occasionally useful to his fellow creatures, by these connections with people of fortune, for he often undertook to solicit charity in behalf of distressed objects, with a view of embezzling one half of the benefactions. It was an errand of this kind that now brought him to the house of her grace. After having sat a few minutes, he told the company that he would favour them with a very proper opportunity to extend their benevolence, for the relief of a poor gentlewoman, who was reduced to the most abject misery, by the death of her husband, 
and just delivered of a couple of fine boys, they, moreover, understood from his information, that this object was daughter of a good family, who had renounced her in consequence of her marrying an ensign without a fortune, and even obstructed his promotion with all their influence and power, a circumstance of barbarity which had made such an impression upon his mind, as disordered his brain, and drove him to despair, in a fit of which he had made away with himself, leaving his wife, then big with child, to all the horrors of indigence and grief. Various were the criticisms on this pathetic picture, which the old man drew with great expression. My lady duchess concluded that she must be a creature void of all feeling and reflection, who could survive such aggravated misery, therefore did not deserve to be relieved, except in the character of a common beggar, and was generous enough to offer a recommendation, by which she would be admitted into an infirmary, to which her grace was a subscriber, at the same time advising the solicitor to send the twins to the foundling hospital, where they could be carefully nursed and brought up, so as to become useful members to the commonwealth. Another lady, with all due deference to the opinion of the duchess, was free enough to blame the generosity of her grace, which would only serve to encourage children in disobedience to their parents, and might be the means not only of prolonging the distress of the wretched creature, but also of ruining the constitution of some young heir, perhaps the hope of a great family, for she did suppose that madam, when her months should be up, and her brats disposed of, would spread her attractions to the public, provided she could profit by her person, and, in the usual way, make a regular progress from St. James's to Drury Lane. She apprehended, for these reasons, that their compassion would be most effectually shown, in leaving her to perish in her present necessity, and that the old gentleman would be unpardonable, should he persist in his endeavours to relieve her. A third member of this tender-hearted society, after having asked if the young woman was handsome, and being answered in the negative, allowed that there was a great deal of reason in what had been said by the honourable person who had spoke last, nevertheless, she humbly conceived her sentence would admit of some mitigation. Let the bantlings, said she, be sent to the hospital, according to the advice of her grace, and a small collection be made for the present support of the mother, and, when her health is recovered, I will take her into my family, in quality of an upper servant, or medium between me and my woman, for, upon my life, I can't injure a child or give directions to a creature, who is, in point of birth and education, but one degree above the vulgar. This proposal met with universal approbation. The Duchess, to her immortal honour, began the contribution with a crown, so that the rest of the company were obliged to restrict their liberality to half the sum, that her grace might not be affronted. And the proposer, demanding the poor woman's name and place of abode, the old mediator could not help giving her ladyship a verbal direction, though he was extremely mortified, on more accounts than one, to find such an issue to his solicitation. Peregrine, who, though humorous as winter, had a tear for pity, and a hand open as day for melting charity, was shocked at the nature and result of this ungenerous consultation. He contributed his half-crown, however, and, retiring from the company, betook himself to the lodgings of the forlorn lady in the straw, according to the direction he had heard. Upon inquiry, he understood that she was then visited by some charitable gentlewoman, who had sent for a nurse, and waited the return of the messenger, and he sent up his respects, desiring he might be permitted to see her, on pretense of having been intimate with her late husband. Though the poor woman had never heard of his name, she did not think proper to deny his request, and he was conducted to a paltry chamber in the third story, where he found this unhappy widow sitting upon a truckle bed, and suckling one of her infants with the most piteous expression of anguish in her features, which were naturally regular and sweet, while the other was fondled on the knee of a person, whose attention was so much engrossed by her little charge, that, for the present, she could mind nothing else, and it was not till after the first compliments passed betwixt the hapless mother and our adventurer, that he perceived the stranger's countenance, which inspired him with the highest esteem and admiration. He beheld all the graces of elegance and beauty, breathing sentiment and beneficence, and softened into the most enchanting tenderness of weeping sympathy. When he declared the cause of his visit, which was no other than the desire of befriending the distressed lady, to whom he presented a bank note for twenty pounds, he was favoured with such a look of complacency by this amiable phantom, who might have been justly taken for an angel ministering to the necessities of mortals, that his whole soul was transported with love and veneration. Nor was this prepossession diminished by the information of the widows, who, after having manifested her gratitude in a flood of tears, told him, that the unknown object of his esteem was a person of honour, who having heard by accident of her deplorable situation, had immediately obeyed the dictates of her humanity, and come in person to relieve her distress, that she had not only generously supplied her with money for present sustenance, but also undertaken to provide a nurse for her babes, 
and even promised to favor her with protection, should she survive her present melancholy situation. To these articles of intelligence she added, that the name of her benefactress was the celebrated lady, to whose character the youth was no stranger, though he had never seen her person before. The killing edge of her charms was a little blunted by the accidents of time and fortune, but no man of taste and imagination, whose nerves were not quite chilled with the frost of age, could, even at that time, look upon her with impunity. And as Peregrine saw her attractions heightened by the tender office in which she was engaged, he was smitten with her beauty, and so ravished with her compassion, that he could not suppress his emotions, but applauded her benevolence with all the warmth of enthusiasm. Her ladyship received his compliments with great politeness and affability, and the occasion on which they met being equally interesting to both, an acquaintance commenced between them, and they concerted measures for the benefit of the widow and her two children, one of whom our hero bespoke for his own godson, for Pickle was not so obscure in the Beaumont, but that his fame had reached the ears of this lady, who, therefore, did not discourage his advances towards her friendship and esteem. All the particulars relating to their charge being adjusted, he attended her ladyship to her own house, and, by her conversation, had the pleasure of finding her understanding suitable to her other accomplishments. Nor had she any reason to think that our hero's qualifications had been exaggerated by common report. One of their adopted children died before it was baptized, so that their care consented in the other, for whom they stood sponsors. Understanding that the old agent was becoming troublesome in his visits to the mother, to whom he now began to administer such counsel as shocked the delicacy of her virtue, they removed her into another lodging, where she would not be exposed to his machinations. In less than a month, our hero learned from a nobleman of his acquaintance, that the hoary panda had actually engaged to procure for him this poor afflicted gentlewoman, and, being frustrated in his intention, substituted in her room an imp from the purlieus of Covent Garden, that made his lordship smart severely for the favours she bestowed. Meanwhile, Peregrine cultivated his new acquaintance with all his art and assiduity, presuming, from the circumstances of her reputation and fate, as well as on the strength of his own merit, that, in time, he should be able to indulge that passion which had begun to glow within his breast. As her ladyship had undergone a vast variety of fortune and adventure, which he had heard indistinctly related, with numberless errors and misrepresentations, he was no sooner entitled, by the familiarity of communication, to ask such a favour, than he earnestly entreated her to entertain him with the particulars of her story, and, by dint of importunity, she was at length prevailed upon, in a select party, to gratify his curiosity, by the account given in the following chapter. Chapter 81. The Memoirs of a Lady of Quality. By the circumstances of the story which I am going to relate, you will be convinced of my candour, while you are informed of my indiscretion. You will be enabled, I hope, to perceive, that, howsoever my head may have erred, my heart hath always been uncorrupted, and that I have been unhappy, because I loved, and was a woman. I believe I need not observe, that I was the only child of a man of good fortune, who indulged me in my infancy with all the tenderness of paternal affection, and, when I was six years old, sent me to a private school, where I stayed till my age was doubled, and became such a favourite, that I was, even in those early days, carried to all the places of public diversion, the court itself not accepted, an indulgence that flattered my love of pleasure, to which I was naturally addicted, and encouraged those ideas of vanity and ambition which spring up so early in the human mind. I was lively and good-natured, my imagination apartment to run riot, my heart liberal and disinterested, though I was so obstinately attached to my own opinions, that I could not well brook contradiction, and, in the whole of my disposition, resemble that of Henry V., as described by Shakespeare. In my thirteenth year one went to Bath, where I was first introduced into the world as a woman, having been entitled to that privilege by my person, which was remarkably tall for my years, and then my fancy was quite captivated by the variety of diversions in which I was continually engaged. Not that the parties were altogether new to me, but because I now found myself considered as a person of consequence, and surrounded by a crowd of admirers, who courted my acquaintance, and fed my vanity with praise and adulation. In short, whether or not I deserve their encomiums, I leave the world to judge, but my person was commended, and my talent in dancing met with universal applause. No wonder, then, that everything appeared joyous to a young creature, who was so void of experience and dissimulation, that she believed everybody's heart as sincere as her own, and every object such as it appeared to be. Among the swains who sighed, or pretended to sigh for me, were two that bore a pretty equal share of my favour, it was too superficial to deserve the name of love. One of these was a forward youth of sixteen, extremely handsome, lively, and impudent. 
He attended in quality of page upon the Princess Amelia, who spent that season at Bath. The other was a Scotch nobleman turned of thirty, who was graced with a red ribbon, and danced particularly well, two qualifications of great weight with a girl of my age, whose heart was not deeply interested in the cause. Nevertheless, the page prevailed over this formidable rival, though Aramore went no farther than a little flirting, and ceased entirely when I left the place. Next year, however, I revisited this agreeable scene, and passed my time in the same circle of amusements, in which, indeed, each season at Bath is exactly resembled by that which succeeds, allowing for the difference of company, which is continually varying. There I met with the same incense, and again had my favourite, who was a North Briton, and captain of foot, near forty years of age, and a little lame, an impediment which I did not discover, until it was pointed out by some of my companions, who rallied me upon my choice. He was always cheerful, and very amorous, had a good countenance, and an excellent understanding, possessed a great deal of art, and would have persuaded me to marry him, had I not been restrained by the authority of my father, whose consent was not to be obtained in favour of a man of his fortune. At the same time, many proposals of marriage were made to my parents, but as they came from people whom I did not like, I rejected them all, being determined to refuse every man who did not make his addresses to myself in person, because I had no notion of marrying for anything but love. Among these formal proposers was a Scottish earl, whose pretensions were broke off by some difference about settlements, and the son of an English baron, with whom my father was in treaty, when he carried me to town, on a visit to a young lady, with whom I had been intimate from my infancy. She was just delivered of her first son, for whom we stood sponsors, so that this occasion detained us a whole month, during which I went to a ball at court, on the Queen's birthday, and there, for the first time, felt what love and beauty were. The second son of Duke H., who had just returned from his travels, was dancing with the Princess Royal, when a young lady came and desired me to go and see a stranger, whom all the world admired. Upon which I followed her into the circle, and observed this object of admiration. He was dressed in a coat of white cloth, faced with blue satin, embroidered with silver, of the same piece with his waistcoat, his fine hair hung down his back in ringlets below his waist, his hat was laced with silver, and garnished with a white feather, but his person beggared description. He was tall and graceful, neither corpulent nor meagre, his limbs finely proportioned, his countenance open and majestic, his eyes full of sweetness and vivacity, his teeth regular, and his pouting lips of the complexion of the damask rose. In short, he was formed for love, and inspired it wherever he appeared, nor was he a niggard of his talents, but liberally returned it, at least, what passed for such, for he had a flow of gallantry, for which many ladies of this land can vouch from their own experience. But he exclaimed against marriage, because he had, as yet, met with no woman to whose charms he would surrender his liberty, though a princess of France, and lady of the same rank in, was said to be, at that time, enamoured of his person. I went home, totally engrossed by his idea, flattering myself that he had observed me with some attention, for I was young and new, and had the good fortune to attract the notice and approbation of the Queen herself. Next day, being at the opera, I was agreeably surprised with the appearance of this amiable stranger, who no sooner saw me enter, than he approached so near to the place where I sat, that I overheard what he said to his companions, and was so happy as to find myself the object of his discourse, which abounded with rapturous expressions of love and admiration. I could not listen to these transports without emotion, my colour changed, my heart throbbed with unusual violence, and my eyes betrayed my inclination in sundry favourable glances, which he seemed to interpret aright, though he could not then avail himself of his success, so far as to communicate his sentiments by speech, because we were strangers to each other. I passed the night in the most anxious suspense, and several days elapsed before I saw him again. At length, however, being at court on a ball night, and determined against dancing, I perceived him among the crowd, and, to my unspeakable joy, saw him advance, with my Lord P., who introduced him to my acquaintance. He soon found means to alter my resolution, and I condescended to be his partner all the evening, during which he declared his passion in the most tender and persuasive terms that real love could dictate, or fruitful imagination invent. I believed his protestations, because I wished them true, and was an unexperienced girl of fifteen. I complied with his earnest request of being permitted to visit me, and even invited him to breakfast next morning, so that you may imagine, I speak to those that feel, I did not, that night, enjoy much repose. Such was the hurry and flutter of my spirits, that I rose at six to receive him at ten. I dressed myself in a new pink satin gown, and my best lace night clothes, 
and was so animated by the occasion that, if ever I deserved a compliment upon my looks, it was my due at this meeting. The wished-for moment came that brought my lover to my view. I was overwhelmed with joy, modesty, and fear of I knew not what. We sat down to breakfast, but did not eat. He renewed his addresses with irresistible eloquence, and pressed me to accept of his hand without further hesitation. But to such a precipitate step I objected, as a measure repugnant to my decency, as well as to that duty which I owed to my father, whom I tenderly loved. Though I withstood this premature proposal, I did not attempt to disguise the situation of my thoughts, and thus commenced a tender correspondence, which was maintained by letters while I remained in the country, and carried on, when I was in town, by private interviews twice or thrice a week at the house of my milliner, where such endearments passed as refined and happy lovers know, and others can only guess. Truth and innocence prevailed on my side, while his heart was fraught with sincerity and love. Such frequent intercourse created an intimacy which I began to think dangerous, and therefore yielded to his repeated desire that we might be united forever. Nay, I resolved to avoid him, until the day should be fixed, and very innocently, though not very wisely, told him my reason for this determination, which was no other than a consciousness of my incapacity to refuse him anything he should demand as a testimony of my love. The time was accordingly appointed, at the distance of a few days, during which I intended to have implored my father's consent, though I had but faint hopes of obtaining it. But he was by some means or other apprised of our design, before I could prevail upon myself to make him acquainted with our purpose. I had danced with my lover at the Widotto on the preceding evening, and there perhaps our eyes betrayed us. Certain it is, several of Lord W.S. relations, who disapproved of the match, came up and rallied him on his passion, Lord S.K., in particular, used this remarkable expression, nephew, as much love as you please, but no matrimony. Next day, the priest being prepared, and the bridegroom waiting for me at the appointed place, in all the transports of impatient expectation, I was, without any previous warning, carried into the country by my father, who took no notice of the intelligence he had received, but decoyed me into the coach on pretense of taking the air, and, when we had proceeded as far as Turnham Green, gave me to understand, that he would dine in that place. There was no remedy. I was obliged to bear my disappointment, though with an aching heart, and followed him upstairs into an apartment, where he told me he was minutely informed of my matrimonial scheme. I did not attempt to disguise the truth, but assured him, while the tears gushed from my eyes, that my want of courage alone had hindered me from making him privy to my passion, though I owned, I should have married Lord W., even though he had disapproved of my choice. I reminded him of the uneasy life I led at home, and frankly acknowledged, that I loved my admirer too well to live without him, though, if he would favour me with his consent, I would defer my intention, and punctually observe any day he would fix for our nuptials. Meanwhile I begged he would permit me to send a message to Lord W., who was waiting in expectation of my coming, and might, without such notice, imagine I was playing the jilt. He granted this last request, in consequence of which I sent a letter to my lover, who, when he received it, had almost fainted away, believing I should be locked up in the country and snatched for ever from his arms. Tortured with these apprehensions, he changed clothes immediately, and, taking horse, resolved to follow me whithersoever we should go. After dinner, we proceeded as far as Brentford, where we lay, intending to be at my father's country house next night, and my admirer putting up at the same inn, practised every expedient his invention could suggest to procure an interview, but all his endeavours were unsuccessful, because I, who little dreamed of his being so near, had gone to bed upon our first arrival, overwhelmed with affliction and tears. In the morning I threw myself at my father's feet, and conjured him, by all the ties of paternal affection, to indulge me with an opportunity of seeing my admirer once more, before I should be conveyed from his wishes. The melancholy condition in which I preferred this supplication, melted the tender heart of my parent, who yielded to my supplications, and carried me back to town for that purpose. Lord W., who had watched our motions, and arrived at his own lodgings before we arrived at my father's house, obeyed my summons on the instant, and appeared before me like an angel. Our faculties were for some minutes suspended by a conflict of grief and joy. At length I recovered the use of speech, and gave him to understand, that I was come to town in order to take my leave of him, by the permission of my father, whom I had promised to attend into the country next day, before he would consent to my return, the chief cause and pretense of which was my earnest desire to convince him, that I was not to blame for the disappointment he had suffered, and that I should see him again in a month, when the nuptial knot should be tied in spite of all opposition. My lover, who was better acquainted with the world, 
had well nigh run distracted with this information. He swore he would not leave me, until I should promise to meet and marry him next day, or, if I refused to grant that request, he would immediately leave the kingdom, to which he would never more return, and, before his departure, sacrifice Lord H. B., son to the Duke of S. A., who was the only person upon earth who could have betrayed us to my father, because he alone was trusted with the secret of our intended marriage, and had actually undertaken to give me away, an office which he afterwards declined. Lord W. also affirmed, that my father decoyed me into the country with a view of cooping me up, and sequestering me entirely from his view and correspondence. In vain I pleaded my father's well-known tenderness, and used all the arguments I could recollect to divert him from his revenge upon Lord H. He was deaf to all my representations, and nothing, I found, would prevail upon him to suppress his resentment, but a positive promise to comply with his former desire. I told him I would hazard everything to make him happy, but could not, with any regard to my duty, take such a step without the knowledge of my parent, or, if I were so inclined, it would be impracticable to elude his vigilance and suspicion. However, he employed such pathetic remonstrances, and retained such a powerful advocate within my own breast, that, before we parted, I assured him my whole power should be exerted for his satisfaction, and he signified his resolution of sitting up all night, in expectation of seeing me at his lodgings. He had no sooner retired, than I went into the next room, and desired my father to fix a day for the marriage, in which case I would cheerfully wait upon him into the country, whereas, should he deny my request, on pretense of staying for the consent of my mother's relations, which was very uncertain, I would seize the first opportunity of marrying Lord W., cost what it would. He consented to the match, but would not appoint a day for the ceremony, which he proposed to defer until all parties should be agreed, and such a favourable crisis, I feared, would never happen. I therefore resolved within myself to gratify my lover's expectation, by eloping, if possible, that very night, though the execution of this plan was extremely difficult, because my father was upon the alarm, and my own maid, who was my bedfellow, altogether in his interest. Notwithstanding these considerations, I found means to engage own of the housemaids in my behalf, who bespoke a hackney coach, to be kept in waiting all night, and to bed I went with my Abigail, whom, as I had not closed an eye, I waked about five in the morning, and sent to pack up some things for our intended journey. While she was thus employed, I got up, and huddled on my clothes, standing upon my pillow, lest my father, who lay in the chamber below, should hear me afoot, and suspect my design. Having dressed myself with great dispatch and disorder, I flounced downstairs, stalking as heavily as I could tread, that he might mistake me for one of the servants, and my confederate opening the door, I sallied out into the street, though I knew not which way to turn, and, to my unspeakable mortification, neither coach nor chair appeared. Having travelled on foot a good way, in hope of finding a convenience, and being not only disappointed in that particular, but also bewildered in my peregrination, I began to be exceedingly alarmed with the apprehension of being met by some person who might know me, because in that case, my design would undoubtedly have been discovered, from every circumstance of my appearance at that time of day, for I had put on the very clothes which I had pulled off overnight, so that my dress was altogether odd and peculiar. My shoes were very fine, and over a large hoop I wore a pink satin quilted petticoat trimmed with silver, which was partly covered by a white dimity nightgown, a full quarter of a yard too short, my handkerchief and apron were hurried on without pinning, my nightcap could not contain my hair, which hung about my ears in great disorder, and my countenance denoted a mixture of hope and fear, joy and shame. In this dilemma, I made my addresses to that honourable member of society, a shoe black, whom I earnestly entreated to provide me with a coach or chair, promising to reward him liberally for his trouble, but he, having the misfortune to be lame, was unable to keep up with my pace, so that by his advice and direction, I went into the first public house I found open, where I stayed some time, in the utmost consternation, among a crew of wretches whom I thought proper to bribe for their civility, not without the terror of being stripped. At length, however, my messenger returned with a chair, of which I took immediate possession, and fearing that, by this time, my family would be alarmed, and sent directly to Lord W.S. lodgings, I ordered myself to be carried thither backwards, that so I might pass undiscovered. This stratagem succeeded according to my wish, I ran upstairs, in a state of trepidation, to my faithful lover, who waited for me with the most impatient and fearful suspense. At sight of me his eyes lightened with transport, he caught me in his arms, as the richest present heaven could bestow, gave me to understand that my father had already sent to his lodgings in quest of me, then applauding my love and resolution in the most rapturous terms. 
he ordered a hackney coach to be called, and, that we might run no risk of separation, attended me to church, where we were lawfully joined in the sight of heaven. His fears were then all over. But mine recurred with double aggravation, I dreaded the sight of my father, and shared all the sorrow he suffered on account of my undutiful behavior, for I loved him with such piety of affection, that I would have endured every other species of distress, rather than given him the least uneasiness, but love, where he reigns in full empire, is altogether irresistible, surmounts every difficulty, and swallows up all other considerations. This was the case with me, and now the irrevocable step was taken, my first care was to avoid his sight. With this view, I begged that Lord W. would think of some remote place in the country, to which we might retire for the present, and he forthwith conducted me to a house on Blackheath, where we were very civilly received by a laughter-loving dame, who seemed to mistake me for one of her own sisterhood. I no sooner perceived her opinion, than I desired Lord W. to undeceive her, upon which she was made acquainted with the nature of my situation, and showed us into a private room, where I called for pen and paper, and wrote an apology to my father for having acted contrary to his will in so important a concern. This task being performed, the bridegroom gave me to understand, that there was a necessity for our being bedded immediately, in order to render the marriage binding, lest my father should discover and part us before consummation. I pleaded hard for a respite till the evening, objecting to the indecency of going to bed before noon, but he found means to invalidate all my arguments, and to convince me that it was now my duty to obey rather than hazard the imputation of being obstinate and refractory on the first day of my probation, I suffered myself to be led into a chamber, which was darkened by my express stipulation, that my shame and confusion might be the better concealed, and yielded to the privilege of a dear husband, who loved me to adoration. About five o'clock in the afternoon we were called to dinner, which we had ordered to be ready at four, but such a paltry care had been forgot amidst the transports of our mutual bliss. We got up, however, and when he came downstairs, I was ashamed to see the light of day, or meet the eyes of my beloved Lord. I ate little, said less, was happy, though overwhelmed with confusion, underwent a thousand agitations, some of which were painful, but by far the greater part belonged to rapture and delight, we were imparadised in the gratification of our mutual wishes, and felt all that love can bestow, and sensibility enjoy. In the twilight we returned to Lord W.S. lodgings in town, where I received a letter from my father, importing that he would never see me again. But there was one circumstance in his manner of writing, from which I conceived a happy presage of his future indulgence. He had begun with his usual appellation of dear Fanny, which, though it was expunged to make way for the word madam, encouraged me to hope that his paternal fondness was not yet extinguished. At supper we were visited by Lord W.S. younger sister, who laughed at us for our inconsiderate match, though she owned she envied our happiness, and offered me the use of her clothes until I could retrieve my own. She was a woman of a great deal of humour, plain but genteel, civil, friendly, and perfectly well-bred. She favoured us with her company till the night was pretty far advanced, and did not take her leave till we retired to our apartment. As our lodgings were not spacious or magnificent, we resolved to see little company, but this resolution was frustrated by the numerous acquaintance of Lord W., who let in half the town, so that I ran the gauntlet for a whole week among a set of wits, who always delight in teasing a young creature of any note when she happens to make such a stolen match. Among those that visited us upon this occasion was my lord's younger brother, who was at that time in keeping with a rich heiress of masculine memory, and took that opportunity of making a parade with his equipage, which was indeed very magnificent, but altogether disregarded by us, whose happiness consisted in the opulence of mutual love. This ceremony of receiving visits being performed, we went to wait on his mother, the Duchess of H., who, hearing I was an heiress, readily forgave her son for marrying without her knowledge and consent, and favoured us with a very cordial reception, insomuch, that for several months, we dined almost constantly at her table, and I must own, I always found her unaltered in her civility and affection, contrary to her general character, which was haughty and capricious. She was undoubtedly a woman of great spirit and understanding, but subject to an infirmity which very much impairs and disguises every other qualification. In about three weeks after our marriage, I was so happy as to obtain the forgiveness of my father, to whose house we repaired, in order to pay our respects and submission. At sight of me he wept, nor did I behold his tears unmoved. My heart was overcharged with tenderness and sorrow, for having offended such an indulgent parent, so that I mingled my tears with his, while my dear husband, whose soul was of the softest and gentlest mould, melted with sympathy at the affecting scene. Being thus reconciled to my father, we attended him into the country, where we were received by my mother 
who was a sensible good woman, though not susceptible to love, and therefore less apartment to excuse a weakness to which she was an utter stranger. This was likewise the case with an uncle, from whom I had great expectations. He was a plain good-natured man, and treated us with great courtesy, though his notions, in point of love, were not exactly conformable to ours. Nevertheless, I was, and seemed to be so happy in my choice, that my family not only became satisfied with the match, but exceedingly fond of Lord W. After a short stay with them in the country, we returned to London, in order to be introduced at court, and then set out for the north, on a visit to my brother-in-law the Duke of H., who had, by a letter to Lord W., invited us to his habitation. My father accordingly equipped us with horses and money, for our own finances were extremely slender, consisting only of a small pension, allowed by his grace, upon whom the brothers were entirely dependent, the father having died suddenly, before suitable provision could be made for his younger children. When I took leave of my relations, bidding adieu to my paternal home, and found myself launching into a world of care and trouble, though the voyage on which I embarked was altogether voluntary, and my companion the person on whom I doted to distraction, comma, I could not help feeling some melancholy sensations, which, however, in a little time, gave way to a train of more agreeable ideas. I was visited in town by almost all the women of fashion, many of whom, I perceived, envied me the possession of a man who had made strange havoc among their hearts, and some of them knew the value of his favour. One in particular endeavoured to cultivate my friendship with singular marks of regard, but I thought proper to discourage her advances, by keeping within the bounds of bare civility, and, indeed, to none of them was I lavish of my complaisance, for I dedicated my whole time to the object of my affection, who engrossed my wishes to such a degree, that, although I was never jealous, because I had no reason to be so, I envied the happiness of every woman whom he chanced at any time to hand into a coach. The Duchess of, who was newly married to the Earl of P., a particular friend of Lord W.S., carried me to court, and presented me to the Queen, who expressed her approbation of my person in very particular terms, and, observing the satisfaction that appeared in my countenance, with marks of admiration, desired her ladies to take notice, how little happiness depended upon wealth, since there was more joy in my face than in all her court besides. Such a declaration could not fail to overwhelm me with blushes, which Her Majesty seemed to behold with pleasure, for she frequently repeated the remark, and showed me to all the foreigners of distinction, with many gracious expressions of favour. She wished Lord W. happiness instead of joy, and was pleased to promise, that she would provide for her pretty beggars. And poor enough we certainly were in every article but love. Nevertheless, we felt no necessities, but passed the summer in a variety of pleasures and parties, the greatest part of which were planned by Lord W.S. sister and another lady, who was at that time mistress to the Prime Minister. The first was a wit, but homely in person the other a woman of great beauty and masculine understanding, and a particular friendship subsisted between them, though they were both lovers of power and admiration. This lady, who sat at the helm, was extremely elegant, as well as expensive in her diversions, in many of which we bore a share, particularly in her parties upon the water, which were contrived in all the magnificence of taste. In the course of these amusements, a trifling circumstance occurred, which I shall relate as an instance of that jealous sensibility which characterized Lord W.S. disposition. A large company of ladies and gentlemen having agreed to dine at Vauxhall, and sup at Marble Hall, where we proposed to conclude the evening with a dance, one barge being insufficient to contain the whole company, we were divided by lots, in consequence of which, my husband and I were parted. This separation was equally mortifying to us both, who, though married, were still lovers, and my chagrin increased when I perceived that I was doomed to sit by Sir W. Why, a man of professed gallantry, for, although Lord W. had, before his marriage, made his addresses to every woman he saw, I knew very well he did not desire that any person should make love to his wife. That I might not, therefore, give umbrage, by talking to this gallant, I conversed with a Scotch nobleman, who, according to common report, had formerly sighed among my admirers. By these means, in seeking to avoid one error, I unwittingly plunged myself into a greater, and disobliged Lord W. so much, that he could not conceal his displeasure, nay, so deeply was he offended at my conduct, that, in the evening, when the ball began, he would scarce deign to take me by the hand in the course of dancing, and darted such unkind looks, as pierced me to the very soul. What augmented my concern, was my ignorance of the trespass I had committed. I was tortured with a thousand uneasy reflections, 
I began to fear that I had mistaken his temper, and given my heart to a man who was tired of possession, though I resolved to bear without complaining the misfortune I had entailed upon myself. I seized the first opportunity of speaking to him, and thereby discovered the cause of his chagrin, but, as there was no time for expostulation, the misunderstanding continued on his side, with such evident marks of uneasiness, that every individual of the company made up to me, and inquired about the cause of his disorder, so that I was fain to amuse their concern, by saying, that he had been ill the day before, and dancing did not agree with his constitution. So much was he incensed by this unhappy circumstance of my conduct, which was void of all intention to offend him, that he determined to be revenged on me for my indiscretion, and at supper, chancing to sit between two very handsome ladies, one of whom is lately dead, and the other, at present, my neighbour in the country, he affected an air of gaiety, and openly coquetted with them both. This was not the only punishment he inflicted on his innocent wife. In the course of our entertainment, we engaged in some simple diversion, in consequence of which the gentlemen were ordered to salute the ladies, when Lord W., in performing this command, unkindly neglected me in my turn, I had occasion for all my discretion and pride, to conceal from the company the agonies I felt at this mark of indifference and disrespect. However, I obtained the victory over myself, and pretended to laugh at his husband-like behaviour, while the tears stood in my eyes and my heart swelled even to bursting. We broke up about five, after having spent the most tedious evening I had ever known, and this offended lover went to bed in a state of sullen silence and disgust. Whatever desire I had to come to an explanation, I thought myself so much aggrieved by his unreasonable prejudice, that I could not prevail upon myself to demand a conference, till after his first nap, when my pride giving way to my tenderness, I clasped him in my arms, though he pretended to discourage these advances of my love. I asked how he could be so unjust as to take umbrage at my civility to a man whom he knew I had refused for his sake, I chid him for his barbarous endeavours to awake my jealousy, and used such irresistible arguments in my own vindication, that he was convinced of my innocence, scaled my acquittal with a kind embrace and we mutually enjoyed the soft transports of a fond reconciliation. Never was passion more eager, delicate, or unreserved, than that which glowed within our breasts. Far from being cloyed with the possession of each other, our raptures seemed to increase with the term of our union. When we were separated, though but for a few hours, by the necessary avocations of life, we were unhappy during that brief separation, and met again like lovers, who knew no joy but in one another's presence. How many delicious evenings did we spend together, in our little apartment, after we had ordered the candles to be taken away, that we might enjoy the agreeable reflection of the moon in a fine summer's evening. Such a mild and solemn scene naturally disposes the mind to peace and benevolence, but when improved with conversation of the man one loves, it fills the imagination with ideas of ineffable delight. For my own part, I can safely say, my heart was so wholly engrossed by my husband, that I never took pleasure in any diversion where he was not personally concerned nor was I ever guilty of one thought repugnant to my duty and my love. In the autumn, we set out for the north, and were met on the road by the Duke and twenty gentlemen, who conducted us to H.N., where we lived in all imaginable splendour. His grace, at that time, maintained above a hundred servants, with a band of music, which always performed at dinner, kept open table, and was visited by a great deal of company. The economy of his house was superintended by his eldest sister, a beautiful young lady of an amiable temper with whom I soon contracted an intimate friendship. She and the Duke used to rally me upon my fondness for Lord W., who was a sort of humorist, and apartment to be in a pet, in which case he would leave the company and go to bed by seven o'clock in the evening. On these occasions, I always disappeared, giving up every consideration to that of pleasing my husband, notwithstanding the ridicule of his relations, who taxed me with having spoiled him with too much indulgence. But how could I express too much tenderness and condescension for a man, who doted upon me to such excess, that, when business obliged him to leave me, he always snatched the first opportunity to return, and often rode through darkness, storms, and tempests to my arms. Having stayed about seven months in this place, I found myself in a fair way of being a mother, and that I might be near my own relations in such an interesting situation, I and my dear companion departed from H.N., not without great reluctance, for I was fond of the Scots in general who treated me with great hospitality and respect, and to this day, they paid me the compliment of saying, I was one of the best wives in that country which is so justly celebrated for good women. Lord W. having attended me to my father's house, was obliged to return to Scotland, to support his interest in being elected Member of Parliament, so that he took his leave of me, with a full resolution of seeing me again before the time of my lying in, 
and all the comfort I enjoyed in his absence, was the perusal of his letters, which I punctually received, together with those of his sister, who, from time to time, favoured me with assurances of his constancy and devotion. Indeed, these testimonials were necessary to one of my disposition, for I was none of those who could be contented with half a heart. I could not even spare one complacent look to any other woman, but expected the undivided homage of his love. Had I been disappointed in this expectation, I should, though a wife, have rebelled or died. Meanwhile my parents treated me with great tenderness, intending that Lord W. should be settled in a house of his own, and accommodated with my fortune, and his expectations from the Queen were very sanguine, when I was taken ill, and delivered of a dead child, an event which affected me extremely. When I understood the extent of my misfortune, my heart throbbed with such violence, that my breast could scarce contain it, and my anxiety, being aggravated by the absence of my lord, produced a dangerous fever, of which he was no sooner apprised by letter, than he came post from Scotland, but, before his arrival, I was supposed to be in a fair way. During this journey, he was tortured with all that terrible suspense which prevails in the minds of those who are in danger of losing that which is most dear to them, and, when he entered the house, was so much overwhelmed with apprehension, that he durst not inquire about the state of my health. As for my part, I never closed an eye from the time on which I expected his return, and, when I heard his voice, I threw open my curtains, and sat up in the bed to receive him, though at the hazard of my life. He ran towards me with all the eagerness of passion, and clasped me in his arms. He kneeled by the bedside, and kissed my hand a thousand times, and wept with transports of tenderness and joy. In short, this meeting was so pathetic as to overcome my enfeebled constitution, and we were parted by those who were wiser than ourselves, and saw that nothing was so proper for us as a little repose. But how shall I relate the deplorable transition from envied happiness to excess of misery which I now sustained? My month was hardly up, when my dear husband was taken ill, perhaps the fatigue of body, as well as mind, which he had undergone on my account, occasioned the fatal ferment in his blood, and his health fell a sacrifice to his love. Physicians were called from London, but alas! They brought no hopes of his recovery. By their advice, he was removed to town, for the convenience of being punctually attended. Every moment was too precious to be thrown away, he was therefore immediately put into the coach, though the day was far spent, and I, though exceedingly weak, accompanied him in the journey, which was performed by the light of flambs, and rendered unspeakingly shocking by the dismal apprehension of losing him every moment. At length, however, we arrived at our lodgings in Paul Mall, where I lay by him on the floor, and attended the issue of his distemper in all the agonies of horror and despair. In a little time his malady settled upon his brain, and, in his delirium, he uttered such dreadful exclamations, as were sufficient to pierce the most savage heart. What effect then must they have had on mine, which was fraught with every sentiment of the most melting affection? It was not a common grief that took possession of my soul, I felt all the aggravation of the most acute distress. I sometimes ran down the street in a fit of distraction, I sent for the doctors every minute, I wearied heaven with my prayers, even now my heart aches at the remembrance of what I suffered, and I cannot, without trembling, proceed with a woeful story. After having lain insensible some days, he recovered the use of speech, and called upon my name, which he had a thousand times repeated while he was bereft of reason. All hopes of his life were now relinquished, and I was led to his bedside to receive his last adieus, being directed to summon all my fortitude, and suppress my sorrow that he might not be disturbed by my agitation. I collected all my resolution to support me in this affecting scene. I saw my dear lord in extremity. The beauties of his youth were all decayed, yet his eyes, though languid, retained unspeakable sweetness and expression. He felt his end approaching, put forth his hand, and, with a look full of complacency and benevolence, uttered such a tender tale good heaven. How had I deserved such accumulated affliction, the bare remembrance of which now melts me into tears? human nature could not undergo my situation without suffering an ecstasy of grief. I clasped him in my arms, and kissed him a thousand times, with the most violent emotions of woe, but I was torn from his embrace, and in a little time he was ravished for ever from my view. On that fatal morning, which put a period to his life, I saw the Duchess of L approach my bed, and, from her appearance, concluded that he was no more, yet I begged she would not confirm the unhappy presage by announcing his death and she accordingly preserved the most emphatic silence. I got up, and trod softly over his head, as if I had been afraid of interrupting his repose. Alas! He was no longer sensible of such disturbance. I was seized with a stupefaction of sorrow, I threw up the window and, looking around, 
thought the sun shone with the most dismal aspect, everything was solitary, cheerless, and replete with horror. In this condition I was, by the direction of my friend, conveyed to her house, where my faculties were so overpowered by the load of anguish which oppressed me, that I know not what passed during the first days of my unhappy widowhood, this only I know. The kind duchess treated me with all imaginable care and compassion, and carried me to her country house, where I stayed some months, during which, she endeavoured to comfort me with all the amusements she could invent, and laid me under such obligations as shall never be erased from my remembrance. Yet, notwithstanding all her care and concern, I was, by my excess of grief, plunged into a languishing distemper, for which my physicians advised me to drink the bath waters. In compliance with this prescription, I went thither towards the end of summer, and found some benefit by adhering to their directions. Though I seldom went abroad, except when I visited my sister-in-law, who was there with the princess, and, upon these occasions, I never failed to attract the notice of the company, who were struck with the appearance of such a young creature in weeds. Nor was I free from the persecution of professed admirers, but, being dead to all joy, I was deaf to the voice of adulation. About Christmas I repaired to my father's house, where my sorrows were revived by every object that recalled the idea of my dear lamented lord. But these melancholy reflections I was obliged to bear, because I had no other home or habitation, being left an unprovided widow, altogether dependent on the affection of my own family. During this winter, divers overtures were made to my father by people who demanded me in marriage, but my heart was not yet sufficiently weaned from my former passion to admit the thoughts of another master. Among those that presented their proposals was a certain young nobleman, who, upon the first news of Lord W.S. death, came post from Paris, in order to declare his passion. He made his first appearance in a hired chariot and six accompanied by a big fat fellow, whom, as I afterwards learned, he had engaged to sound his praises, with a promise of a thousand pounds, in lieu of which he paid him forty. Whether it was with a view of screening himself from the cold, or of making a comfortable medium in case of being overturned, and falling under his weighty companion, I know not, but, certain it is, the carriage was stuffed with hay, in such a manner, that, when he arrived, the servants were at some pains in rummaging and removing it before they could come at their master, or help him to alight. When he was lifted out of the chariot, he exhibited a very ludicrous figure to the view. He was a thin, meagre, shivering creature, of a low stature, with little black eyes, a long nose, sallow complexion, and pitted with a smallpox, dressed in a coat of light brown frieze, lined with pink-coloured shag, a monstrous solitaire and bag, and, if I remember right, a pair of huge jack boots. In a word, his whole appearance was so little calculated for inspiring love, that I had, on the strength of seeing him once before at Oxford, set him down as the last man on earth whom I would choose to wed, and I will venture to affirm, that he was in every particular the reverse of my late husband. As my father was not at home, he stayed but one evening, and left his errand with my mother, to whom he was as disagreeable as to myself, so that his proposal was absolutely rejected, and I heard no more of him during the space of three whole months, at the expiration of which I went to town, where this mortifying figure presented itself again, and renewed his suit, offering such advantageous terms of settlement, that my father began to relish the match, and warmly recommended it to my consideration. Lord W.S. relations advised me to embrace the opportunity of making myself independent. All my acquaintance plied me with arguments to the same purpose. I was uneasy at home, and indifferent to all mankind. I weighed the motives with the objections, and with reluctance yielded to the importunity of my friends. In consequence of this determination, the little gentleman was permitted to visit me, and the manner of his address did not alter the opinion I had conceived of his character and understanding. I was even shocked at the prospect of marrying a man whom I could not love, and, in order to disburden my own conscience, took an opportunity of telling him, one evening, as we sat opposite to each other, that it was not in my power to command my affection and therefore he could not expect the possession of my heart, Lord W.S. indulgence having spoiled me for a wife, nevertheless, I would endeavour to contract a friendship for him, which would entirely depend upon his own behaviour. To this declaration he replied, to my great surprise, that he did not desire me to love him, my friendship was sufficient, and the next day repeated this strange instance of moderation in a letter, which I communicated to my sister, who laughed heartily at the contents, and persuaded me, that since I could love no man, he was the properest person to be my husband. Accordingly, the wedding clothes and equipage being prepared, the day the fatal day was fixed, on the morning of which I went to the house of my brother-in-law, Duke H., who loved me tenderly, and took my leave of the family, 
a family which I shall always remember with love, honor, and esteem. His Grace received me in the most affectionate manner, saying at parting, Lady W., if he does not use you well, I will take you back again. The bridegroom and I met at Ox Chapel, where the ceremony was performed by the Bishop of W., in presence of his Lordship's mother, my father, and another lady. The nuptial not being tied, we set out for my father's house in the country, and proceeded full twenty miles on our journey before my lord opened his mouth, my thoughts having been all that time employed on something quite foreign to my present situation, for I was then but a giddy girl of eighteen. At length my father broke silence, and clapping his lordship on the shoulder, told him he was but a dull bridegroom, upon which my lord gave him to understand that he was out of spirits. This dejection continued all the day, notwithstanding the refreshment of a plentiful dinner which he ate upon the road, and in the evening we arrived at the place of our destination, where we were kindly received by my mother, though she had no liking to the match, and, after supper, we retired to our apartment. It was here that I had occasion to perceive the most disagreeable contrast between my present helpmate and my former lord. Instead of flying to my arms with all the eagerness of love and rapture, this manly representative sat moping in a corner, like a criminal on execution day and owned he was ashamed to bed with a woman whose hand he had scarce ever touched. I could not help being affected with this pusillanimous behavior. I remembered Lord W., while I surveyed the object before me, and made such a comparison as filled me with horror and disgust, nay, to such a degree did my aversion to this phantom prevail, that I began to sweat with anguish at the thought of being subjected to his pleasure, and when, after a long hesitation, he ventured to approach me, I trembled as if I had been exposed to the embraces of a rattlesnake, nor did the efforts of his love diminish this antipathy. His attempts were like the pawings of an imp, sent from hell to seize and torment some guilty wretch, such as are exhibited in some dramatic performance, which I have never seen acted without remembering my wedding night. By such shadowy, unsubstantial, vexatious behavior was I tantalized, and robbed of my repose, and early next morning I got up, with a most sovereign contempt for my bedfellow, who indulged himself in bed till eleven. Having passed a few days in this place, I went home with him to his house at Twickenham, and soon after we were presented at court, when the Queen was pleased to say to my lord's mother, she did not doubt that we should be a happy couple, for I had been a good wife to my former husband. Whatever deficiencies I had to complain of in my new spouse, he was not wanting in point of liberality. I was presented with a very fine chariot, studded with silver nails, and such a profusion of jewels as furnished a joke to some of my acquaintance, who observed, that I was formerly Queen of Hearts but now metamorphosed into the Queen of Diamonds. I now also had an opportunity, which I did not let slip, of paying Lord W.S. debts from my privy purse, and on that score received the thanks of his elder brother, who, though he had undertaken to discharge them, delayed the execution of his purpose longer than I thought they should remain unpaid. This uncommon splendor attracted the eyes and envy of my competitors, who were the more implacable in their resentments, because, notwithstanding my marriage, I was as much as ever followed by the men of gallantry and pleasure, among whom it is a constant maxim, that a woman never withholds her affections from her husband, without an intention to bestow them somewhere else. I never appeared without a train of admirers, and my house in the country was always crowded with gay young men of quality. Among those who cultivated my good graces with the greatest skill and assiduity, were the Earl C. and Mr. S., brother to Lord F., the former of whom, in the course of his addresses, treated me with an entertainment of surprising magnificence, disposed into a dinner, supper, and ball, to which I, at his desire, invited eleven ladies, whom he paired with a like number of his own sex, so that the whole company amounted to twenty-four. We were regaled with a most elegant dinner, in an apartment which was altogether superb, and served by gentlemen only, no livery servant being permitted to come within the door. In the afternoon we embarked in two splendid barges, being attended by a band of music in a third, and enjoyed a delightful evening upon the river till the twilight, when we returned and began the ball, which was conducted with such order and taste, that mirth and good humor prevailed. No dissatisfaction appeared, except in the countenance of one old maid, since married to a son of the Duke of, who though she would not refuse to partake of such an agreeable entertainment, was displeased that I should have the honor of inviting her. O baleful envy! Thou self-tormenting fiend! How dost thou predominate in all assemblies, from the grand gala of a court, to the meeting of simple peasants at their harvest home. Nor is the prevalence of this sordid passion to be wondered at, if we consider the weakness, pride, and vanity of our sex. The presence of one favorite man shall poison the enjoyment of a whole company, and produce the most rancorous enmity betwixt the closest friends. I danced with the master of a ball, 
who employed all the artillery of his eloquence in making love, yet I did not listen to his addresses, for he was not to my taste, though he possessed an agreeable person, and a good acquired understanding, but he was utterly ignorant of that gentle prevailing art which I afterwards experienced in Mr. S., and which was the only method he could have successfully practiced in seducing a young woman like me, born with sentiments of honor, and trained up in the paths of religion and virtue. This young gentleman was indeed absolutely master of those insinuating qualifications which few women of passion and sensibility can resist, and had a person every way adapted for profiting by these insidious talents. He was well acquainted with the human heart, conscious of his own power and capacity, and exercised these endowments with unwearied perseverance. He was tall and thin, of a shape and size perfectly agreeable to my taste, with large blue eloquent A's, good teeth, and a long head turned to gallantry. His behavior was the standard of politeness, and all his advances were conducted with the most profound respect, which is the most effectual expedient a man can use against us, if he can find means to persuade us that it proceeds from the excess and delicacy of his passion. It is no other than a silent compliment, by which our accomplishments are continually flattered, and pleases in proportion to the supposed understanding of him who pays it. By these arts and advantages this consummate politician in love began by degrees to sap the foundation of my conjugal faith, he stole imperceptibly into my affection, and by dint of opportunity, which he well knew how to improve, triumphed at last over all his rivals. Nor was he the only person that disputed my heart with Earl C. The nobleman was also rivaled by Lord C. H., a Scotchman, who had been an intimate and relation of my former husband. Him I would have preferred to most of his competitors, and actually coquetted with him for some time, but the amour was interrupted by his going to Ireland, upon which occasion, understanding that he was but indifferently provided with money, I made him a present of a gold snuff-box, in which was enclosed a bank-note, a trifling mark of my esteem, which he afterwards justified by the most grateful, friendly, and genteel behaviour, and as we corresponded by letters, I frankly told him, that mistress had stepped in, and won the palm from all the rest of my admirers. This new favourite's mother and sister, who lived in the neighbourhood, were my constant companions, and, in consequence of this intimacy, he never let a day pass without paying his respects to me in person, nay, so ingenious was he in contriving the means of promoting his suit, that whether I rode or walked, went abroad or stayed at home, he was always of course one of the party, so that his design seemed to engross his whole vigilance and attention. Thus he studied my disposition, and established himself in my good opinion at the same time. He found my heart was susceptible of every tender impression, and saw that I was not free from the vanity of youth. He had already acquired my friendship and esteem, from which he knew there was a short and easy transition to love. By his penetration choosing proper seasons for the theme, he urged it with such pathetic vows and artful adulation, as well might captivate a young woman of my complexion and experience, and circumstanced as I was, with a husband whom I had such reason to despise. Though he thus made an insensible progress in my heart, he did not find my virtue an easy conquest, and I myself was ignorant of the advantage he had gained with regard to my inclinations, until I was convinced of his success by an alarm of jealousy which I one day felt, at seeing him engaged in conversation with another lady. I forthwith recognized this symptom of love, with which I had been formerly acquainted, and trembled at the discovery of my own weakness. I underwent a strange agitation and a mixture of contrary sensations. I was pleased with a passion, yet ashamed of avowing it even to my own mind. The rights of a husband, though mine was but a nominal one, occurred to my reflection, and virtue, modesty, and honour, forbade me to cherish the guilty flame, when I encouraged these laudable scruples, and resolved to sacrifice my love to duty and reputation, my lord was almost every day employed in riding post to my father, with complaints of my conduct, which was hitherto irreproachable, though the greatest grievance which he pretended to have suffered was my refusing to comply with his desire, when he entreated me to lie, a whole hour every morning, with my neck uncovered, that, by gazing, he might quiet the perturbation of his spirits. From this request you may judge of the man, as well as of the regard I must entertain for his character and disposition. During the whole summer I was besieged by my artful undoer, and in the autumn set out with my lord for Bath, where, by reason of the intimacy that subsisted between our families, we lived in the same house with my lover and his sister, who, with another agreeable young lady, accompanied us in this expedition. By this time Mr. S. had extorted from me a confession of a mutual flame, though I assured him that it should never induce me to give up the valuable possession of an unspotted character, and a conscience void of offence. I offered him all the enjoyment he could reap from an unreserved intercourse of souls, abstracted from any sensual consideration. 
He eagerly embraced the platonic proposal, because he had sagacity enough to foresee the issue of such chimerical contracts, and knew me too well to think he could accomplish his purpose without seeming to acquiesce in my own terms, and cultivating my tenderness under the specious pretext. In consequence of this agreement, we took all opportunities of seeing each other in private, and these interviews were spent in mutual protestations of disinterested love. This correspondence, though dangerous, was, on my side, equally innocent and endearing, and many happy hours we passed, before my sentiments were discovered. At length my lover was taken ill, and then my passion burst out beyond the power of concealment, my grief and anxiety became so conspicuous in my countenance, and my behavior was so indiscreet, that everybody in the house perceived the situation of my thoughts, and blamed my conduct accordingly. Certain it is, I was extremely imprudent, though intentionally innocent. I have lain whole nights by my lord, who teased and tormented me for that which neither I could give nor he could take, and ruminated on the fatal consequences of this unhappy flame, until I was worked into a fever of disquiet. I saw there was no safety but in flight, and often determined to banish myself forever from the sight of this dangerous intruder. But my resolution always failed at the approach of day, and my desire of seeing him as constantly recurred. So far was I from persisting in such commendable determinations, that, on the eve of our departure from Bath, I felt the keenest pangs of sorrow at our approaching separation, and, as we could not enjoy our private interviews at my house in town, I promised to visit him at his own apartments, after he had sworn by all that's sacred, that he would take no sinister advantage of my condescension, by presuming upon the opportunities I should give. He kept his word, for he saw I trusted to it with fear and trembling, and perceived that my apprehension was not affected, but the natural concern of a young creature, distracted between love and duty, whom, had he alarmed, he would never had seen within his doors again. Instead of pressing me with solicitations in favor of his passion, he was more than ever respectful and complaisant, so that I found myself disengaged of all restraint, conducted the conversation, shortened and repeated my visits at my own pleasure, till at last I became so accustomed to this communication, that his house was as familiar to me as my own. Having in this manner secured himself in my confidence, he resumed the favorite topic of love, and, warming my imagination by gradual advances on the subject, my heart began to pant, when he saw me thus moved. He snatched the favorable occasion to practice all his eloquence and art. I could not resist his energy nor even fly from the temptation that assailed me, until he had obtained a promise that he should, at our next meeting, reap the fruits of his tedious expectation. Upon this condition, I was permitted to retire and blessed heaven for my escape, fully determined to continue in the path of virtue I had hitherto trod, and stifle the criminal flame by which my peace and reputation were endangered. But his idea, which reigned in my heart without control, soon baffled all these prudent suggestions. I saw him again, and he reminded me of my promise, which I endeavored to evade with affected pleasantry, upon which he manifested the utmost displeasure and chagrin, shedding some crocodile tears, and upbraided me with levity and indifference. He observed, that he had solicited my favor for ten long months without intermission, and imagined I had held out so long on virtuous motives only, but now he could plainly perceive that his want of success has been owing to my want of affection, and that all my professions were insincere. In a word, he persuaded me that his remonstrances were just and reasonable. I could not see the affliction of a man I loved, when I knew it was in my power to remove it, and, rather than forfeit his opinion of my sincerity and love, I consented to his wish. My heart now flutters at the remembrance of the dear though fatal indiscretion, yet I reflect without remorse, and even remember it with pleasure. If I could not avoid the censure of the world, I was resolved to bear it without repining, and sure the guilt, if there was any in my conduct, was but venial, for I considered myself as a person absolved of all matrimonial ties, by the insignificance of Lord, who, though a nominal husband, was in fact a mere non-entity. I therefore contracted a new engagement with my lover, to which I resolved to adhere with the most scrupulous fidelity, without the least intention of injuring my lord or his relations, for, had our mutual passion produced any visible effects, I would immediately have renounced and abandoned my husband for ever, that the fruit of my love for mistress might not have inherited, to the detriment of the right heir. This was my determination, which I thought just, if not prudent, and for which I have incurred the imputation of folly, in the opinion of this wise and honest generation, by whose example and advice I have, since that time, been a little reformed in point of prudentials, though I still retain a strong tendency to return to my primitive way of thinking. When I quitted Mr. S., after the sacrifice I had made, and returned to my own bed, it may, perhaps, 
be supposed that I slept but little. True, I was kept awake by the joyful impatience of revisiting my lover. Indeed I neglected no opportunity of flying to his arms. When Lord was in the country, we enjoyed each other's company without interruption, but when he resided in town, our correspondence was limited to stolen interviews, which were unspeakably delicious, as genuine love presided at the entertainment. Such was my happiness in the course of this tender communication, that to this day I remember it with pleasure, though it has cost me dear in the sequel, and was at that time enjoyed at a considerable expense, for I devoted myself so entirely to my lover, who was desirous of engrossing my time and thoughts, that my acquaintance, which was very numerous, justly accused me of neglect, and of consequence cooled in their friendships, but I was all for love, or the world well lost, and with the same opportunity to offer, I would act the same conduct over again. Some there are who possibly may wonder how I could love twice with such violence of affection. But all such observers must be unacquainted with the human heart. Mine was naturally adapted for the tender passions, and had been so fortunate, so cherished in its first impressions, that it felt with joy the same sensations revive, when influenced by the same engaging qualifications. Certain it is, I loved the second time as well as the first, and better was impossible. I gave up my all for both fortune and my father's favour for the one, reputation, friends, and fortune for the other. Yet, notwithstanding this intimate connection, I did not relinquish the world all at once, on the contrary, I still appeared at court, and attracted the notice and approbation of my royal patroness, I danced with the P of W, a circumstance which so nearly affected Mr. S, who was present, that, in order to manifest his resentment, he chose the ugliest woman in the ball for his partner, and I no sooner perceived his uneasiness, then I gave over, with a view of appeasing his displeasure. Without repeating particular circumstances, let it suffice to say, our mutual passion was a perfect copy of that which had subsisted between me and my dear Lord W. It was jealous, melting and delicate, and checkered with little accident, which served to animate and maintain the flame, in its first ardency of rapture. When my love I was sick, I attended and nursed him with indefatigable tenderness and care, and during an indisposition which I caught in the performance of this agreeable office, he discharged the obligation with all the warmth of sympathy and love. It was, however, judged necessary by the physicians, that I should use the bath waters for the recovery of my health, and I set out for that place, glad of a pretense to be absent from Lord, with whom I lived on very unhappy terms. He had, about nine months after our marriage, desired that we might sleep in separate beds, and gave a very whimsical reason for this proposal. He said, the immensity of his love deprived him of the power of gratification, and that some commerce with an object, to which his heart was not attached, might, by diminishing the transports of his spirits, recompose his nerves, and enable him to enjoy the fruits of his good fortune. You may be sure I made no objection to this plan, which was immediately put into execution. He made his addresses to an imp of Drury Lane, whose name, as he told me, was Mrs. Rock. She made shift to extract some money from her patient but his infirmity was beyond the power of her art, though she made some mischief between us, and I communicated my suspicion to the Duke of H., who intended to have expostulated with her upon the subject, but she got intimation of his design, and saved him the trouble by a precipitate retreat. After my return from Bath, where Mr. S. and I had lived happily, until we were interrupted by the arrival of my husband, his lordship expressed an inclination to be my bedfellow again. In this particular I desired to be excused, I would not be the first to propose the separation, which, though usual in other countries, is contrary to the custom of England, being unwilling to furnish the least handle for censure, as my character was still unblemished, yet, when the proposal came from him, I thought myself entitled to refuse a reunion, to which I accordingly objected. This opposition produced a quarrel, which rose to a state of perpetual animosity, so that we began to talk of parting. My lord relished the expedient, agreeing to add three hundred pounds a year to my pin money, which, by the by, was never paid, and I renounced all state and grandeur, to live in a small house that I hired at Carshalton, where I passed my time for two months, in the most agreeable retirement, with my dear lover. At length I was disturbed by the intrusion of my lord, who molested me with visits and solicitations to return, pretending that he had changed his mind, and insisting upon my compliance with his desire. I exhausted my invention in endeavours to evade his request, but he persecuted me without ceasing so that I was fain to capitulate, on condition that he should immediately set out for France, and that he should not presume to approach my bed till our arrival at Calais. We accordingly departed for that kingdom, and, far from infringing the least article of our treaty, 
His lordship did not insist upon his privilege before we reached the capital of France. Meanwhile, I began to feel the effect of my passion in a very interesting manner, and communicated my discovery to the dear author of it, who would not leave me in such an affecting situation, but took the first opportunity of following us to France. In our road to Paris, we stopped to visit Chantilly, a magnificent chateau belonging to the Prince of Kent, and the met by accident with some English noblemen, to whom I was known. The prince and his sisters invited me very politely into the gallery where they sat. They complimented me on my person, and seemed to admire my dress, which was altogether new to them, being a blue English riding habit, trimmed with gold, and a hat with a feather. They were particularly well pleased with my hair which hung down to my waist, and pressed me to stay a fortnight at their house, an invitation which I was very much mortified at being obliged to refuse, because my lord did not understand the French language. I was enchanted with the place and the company, the women being amiable, and the men polite, nor were they strangers to my name and story, for Mr. S. calling at the same place a few days after, they rallied him on my account. When we arrived at Paris, the first thing I did was to metamorphose myself into a French woman. I cut off my hair, hid a very good complexion of my own with rouge, reconciled myself to powder, which I had never used before, put on a robe with a large hoop, and went to the Tuileries, full of spirits and joy, for, at that time, everything conspired to make me happy. I had health, youth, and beauty, love, vanity, and affluence, and found myself surrounded with diversions which were gay, new, and agreeable. My appearance drew upon me the eyes of the whole company, who considered me a stranger, but not a foreigner, so completely was I equipped in the fashion of the French, and when they understood who I was, they applauded my person with the most lavish encomiums, according to their own politeness. After having made a circuit round all the public places of entertainment in Paris, I was introduced into the company by an English family, residing in that city, and, among others, became acquainted with a French lady, whose charms were remarkably attractive. The Duke of K. was her admirer, but she lived in reputation with her mother, and an agreeable sister, whose lover was the Prince of C., for almost every lady in France has her aimant. With this charming woman, whose name was Madame de la T., I often made parties of pleasure, the Duke, Mr. S., she, and I, used to meet in the Bois de Boulogne, which is a pleasant wood, at a small distance from Paris, whither the company repairs in the summer season for the benefit of the air, and, after having amused ourselves among the groves, embarked in his grace's equipage, which was extremely elegant, being a calèche drawn by six fine long-tailed greys, adorned with ribbons, in the French taste, and thus we were conducted to a little enchanted, or at least enchanting, palace, possessed by the Duke, at one end of the town. The lower apartment, appropriated to me, was furnished with yellow and silver, the bed surrounded with looking-glasses, and the door opened into the garden, laid out in a cradle-walk, and intervening parterres of roses and other flowers. Above stairs, my female companion lodged in a chamber furnished with chintz. We supped all together in the saloon, which, though small, was perfectly elegant. The company was always good-humoured, the conversation sprightly and joyous, and the scene, though often repeated, still delightful and entertaining. At other times, Mr. S. and I used to pass our evenings at the palace of the Prince of C., which His Highness lent us for our accommodation. The apartments opened into the gardens of the Luxembourg, and were, in point of magnificence, suitable to the owner. Thither I used to repair in a flaming equipage, on pretense of visiting, and spent the best part of the night with him who was dearer to me than all the princes in the world. While I was happily engaged in these ravishing parties, my little lord was employed in his efforts to recover his health by restoratives, and I know not what, for he still lamented the enfeebling effects of his passion, and complained that he loved me more like an angel than a woman, though he strove to govern his affections according to the doctrines of the Christian religion, as he regulated his life by the maxims of Charles XII of Sweden. The meaning of this declaration I could never learn, and, indeed, I have been often tempted to believe he had no meaning at all. Be that as it will, I found my size visibly increasing, and my situation extremely uneasy, on account of the perpetual wrangling which prevailed between us, in consequence of his desiring to sleep with me again, after we had parted beds for the second time, and, that I might no longer be exposed to such disagreeable persecutions, I resolved to leave him, though at the hazard of my life. Thus determined, I went to the British ambassador, in a hackney coach, and, in order to disguise my youth, which might have prepossessed him against my judgment, muffled myself up in a black hood, which, as he said, instead of lending an air of gravity to my countenance, added a wildness to my looks, which was far from being disagreeable. 
he had been a gallant man in his youth, and even then, though well stricken in years, was not insensible to the power of beauty. This disposition, perhaps, rendered him more favorable to my cause, though he first advised me to return to my husband, but finding me obstinate, he undertook to serve me in my own way, and procured a protection from the French king, by virtue of which I could live at Paris unmolested by my lord. Nevertheless, he advised me, if I was determined to leave him, to make the best of my way to England and sue for a divorce. I relished his opinion, and concealed myself about three days in Paris, during which I borrowed some linen, for, as it was impossible to convey anything out of my own house without suspicion, I had neither clothes for my accommodation, nor a servant to wait on me. In this solitary condition, I took the road to Flanders, after I had put my lord upon a wrong scent, by writing a letter to him, dated at Calais, and travelled through an unknown country, without any other attendant than the postillion, being subjected to this inconvenience by the laws of France, which are so severe in some particulars, that, if any person had been apprehended with me, he would have suffered death for going off with a man's wife, though any man might go to bed with that same woman, without fear of incurring any legal punishment. I proceeded night and day without intermission, that I might the sooner reach Flanders, where I knew I should be safe, and as the nights were excessively cold, I was faint to wrap myself up in flannel, which I bought for the purpose, as I had no clothes to keep me warm, and travelled in an open chaise. While we passed through dreary woods, quite remote from the habitations of men, I was not without apprehension of being stripped and murdered by the postillion, and, in all probability, owed my safety to the indigence of my appearance, which might also protect me in two miserable places, where I was obliged to lie, before I got out of the territories of France, for, as I could not reach the great towns where I intended to lodge, I was under the necessity of putting up at little wretched hovels, where no provision was to be had, but sour brown bread, and sour cheese, and everything seemed to denote the dens of despair and assassination. I made shift, however, to subsist on this fare, uncomfortable as it was, confiding on the meanness of my equipage for the security of my person, and at length arriving at Brussels, fixed my quarters in the Hotel de Flandre, so well known to the English since, where I thought myself extremely happy in the accomplishment of my flight. I had not been two full days in this place, when I was blessed with the sight of my lover, who followed me on the wings of love, in pursuance of the plan we had projected before my departure from Paris. Here we concerted measures for proceeding to England. I hired a tall fine legio eyes for my maid, and setting out for Ostend, we embarked in a vessel, in which mistress had bespoke our passage. Our voyage was short and prosperous, and our time most agreeably spent in the company of my dear partner, who was a most engaging man in all respects, as I dare say my Lady C. has since found him, assumed the fictitious name, took private lodgings in Poland Street, retained lawyers, and commenced a suit for separation against my lord. I communicated the reasons of my elopement to my father, who was shocked and surprised at my conduct, which he condemned with expressions of sorrow and resentment. But the step was taken, nor did I repent of what I had done, except on his account. In the morning after my arrival at London, I waited upon the Lord Chief Justice, to whom I complained of the usage I had received from my Lord, whose temper was teasing, tiresome, and intolerably capricious. Indeed, his behaviour was a strange compound of madness and folly, seasoned with a small proportion of sense. No wonder then, that I, who am hot and hasty, should be wretched, under the persecution of such a perverse humorist, who used to terrify me, and scold at me the whole night without intermission, and shake my pillow from time to time, that I might not sleep, while he tormented me with his disagreeable expostulations. I have been often frightened almost out of my senses, at seeing him convulsed with the most unreasonable passion, and chagrin to the highest degree of disgust, to find, by repeated observation, his disposition so preposterous, that his satisfaction and displeasure never depended upon the cause he had to be satisfied or disobliged, but, on the contrary, when he had most reason to be pleased, he was always most discontented, and very often in good humour when he had reason enough for vexation. While I lived in Poland Street, I was engaged with lawyers, and so often visited by my father, that I could not dedicate my whole time as usual to my lover, nor was it convenient that he should be seen in my company, he therefore took a small house at Camberwell, whither I went as often as I had an opportunity, and maintained the correspondence with such eagerness and industry, that, although I was six months gone with child, I have often, by myself, set out for his habitation, in a hackney coach, at eleven o'clock at night, and returned by six in the morning, that I might be in my own bed when my father came to see me, for I concealed my amour, as well as the effects of it, from his knowledge, 
and frequently took quarter from the bridge, that my motions might not be discovered. Nothing but the most passionate love could have supported my spirits under such vicissitudes of fatigue, or enabled my admirer to spend whole days by himself in such a solitary retirement. By this time, my lord was arrived in England, and employed in discovering the place of my retreat, so that I lived in continual alarm, and provided myself with a speaking trumpet, which stood by my bedside, to be used in calling for assistance, in case my pursuer should make an attack upon my lodgings. This situation being extremely uncomfortable, I had no sooner begun my process against him, than I put myself entirely under the protection of Mr. S., who conducted me to the house of a friend of his who lived in the country, where I was secure from the attempts of my husband. The world had now given me up, and I had renounced the world with the most perfect resignation. I weighed in my breast what I should lose in point of character, with what I suffered in my peace at home, and found, that my reputation was not to be preserved, except at the expense of my quiet for his lordship was not disposed to make me easy, had I been ever so discreet. I therefore determined to give up a few ceremonial visits, and empty professions, for the more substantial enjoyments of life. We passed our time very agreeably in various amusements with this friend of Mr. S., until the term of my reckoning was almost expired, then returned to London, and took lodgings in Southampton Street, where I began to make the preparations for the approaching occasion. Here I proposed to live with the utmost circumspection. I disguised my name, saw nobody but my lawyer and lover, and never approached the window lest I should be discovered by accident. Notwithstanding these precautions, my French maid, whom I had sent for some of my clothes, was dogged in her return, and next morning my lord took my lodgings by storm. Had he given the assault in his person only, I make no doubt but he would have suffered a repulse from the opposition of the legal eyes, who made all the resistance in her power, but was obliged to give way to superior numbers. I was at that time abed and hearing an unusual noise below, rang my bell, in order to know the cause of such disturbance. I drew my curtain at the same time, and who should I see entering my chamber but his lordship, attended by a constable, and the footman who had discovered my retreat. Such an unexpected visit could not fail to affect me with surprise and consternation. However, I summoned all my fortitude to my aid, and perceiving the fellows were about to open my window shutters, desired their principal to order them downstairs. He readily complied with my request, and sitting down by my bedside, told me with an air of triumph, that he had found me at last, and I frankly owned, that I was heartily sorry for his success. Instead of upbraiding me with my escape, he proceeded to entertain me with all the news in town, and gave me a minute detail of everything that happened to him since our parting, among other articles of intelligence, giving me to understand, that he had challenged Mr. S., who refused to fight him, and was in disgrace with the Prince of W. on that account. But here his lordship did not strictly adhere to the naked truth. He had indeed, before our departure from the country, gone to my lover, and insisted upon having satisfaction in Hyde Park, two days from the date of his demand, and at three o'clock in the afternoon, S., believing him in earnest, accepted the invitation, though he observed, that these affairs could not be discussed too soon, and wished the time of meeting might be an earlier hour. But his lordship did not choose to alter the circumstances of his first proposal, and, when he went away, said he should expect him at the appointed place and time, if it did not rain. His antagonist gave me an account of the conversation, when I assured him the whole business would end in smoke. Accordingly, my lord sent him a letter on Monday, desiring that the assignation might be deferred till Thursday, that he might have time to settle his affairs, and pay S a hundred pounds, which he had formerly borrowed of him. When Thursday came, he was favoured with another epistle, importing that the challenger had changed his mind, and would seek satisfaction at law. Thus ended that heroic exploit, which his lordship now boasted of with such arrogant misrepresentation. While he thus regaled me with these interesting particulars, I was contriving a scheme to frustrate the discovery he had made, so that I did not contradict his assertions, but told him, that, if he would go downstairs, I would rise and come to breakfast. He consented to this proposal with great cheerfulness, and I and I was not a little surprised to find him, at this first interview in as good a humour as if nothing had happened to interrupt the felicity of our matrimonial union. It cost me some invention to conceal my condition from his notice, being now within a week of the expected crisis. But I knew I had to do with a man of no great penetration, and succeeded in my attempt accordingly. We breakfasted with great harmony, and I invited him to dinner, after having prevailed upon him to send away his mimidens, whom, nevertheless, he ordered to return at eleven o'clock at night. We conversed together with great gaiety and mirth. When I rallied him for visiting me in such a disobil, 
he stood on tiptoe to view himself in the glass, and, owning I was in the right, said he would go and dress himself before dinner. He accordingly went away, charging my maid to give him entrance at his return, and he was no sooner gone than I wrote to Mr. S., giving him an account of what had happened. Then, without having determined on any certain plan, I huddled on my clothes, muffled myself up, and calling a chair, went to the next tavern, where I stayed no longer than was sufficient to change my vehicle, and, to the astonishment of the drawers, who could not conceive the meaning of my perturbation, proceeded to a shop in the neighborhood, where I dismissed my second chair, and procured a hackney coach, in which I repaired to the lodgings of my lawyer, whom I could trust. Having made him acquainted with the circumstances of my distress, and consulted him about a proper place of retreat, after some recollection, he directed me to a little house in a court, to which, by the assistance of my lover, my woman and clothes were safely conveyed that same evening. My lord, however, came to dinner, according to invitation, and did not seem at all alarmed when my maid told him I was gone, but stepped to my lawyer to know if he thought I should return. Upon his answering in the affirmative, and advising his lordship to go back in the meantime, and eat the dinner I had provided, he very deliberately took his advice, made a very hearty meal, drank his bottle of wine, and, as I did not return according to his expectation, withdrew in order to consult his associates. This motion of his furnished my woman with an opportunity of making her a treat, and, when he returned at night, the coast was clear, and he found nobody in the house, but a porter, who had been left to take care of the furniture. He was so enraged at this disappointment, that he made a furious noise, which raised the whole neighborhood, reinforced his crew with the authority of a justice of the peace, tarried in the street till three o'clock in the morning, discharged a lodging he had hired at a barber's shop opposite to the house from which I had escaped, and retired with the comfortable reflection of having done everything which a man could do to retrieve me. The hurry of spirits and surprise I had undergone in effecting this retreat, produced such a disorder in my constitution, that I began to fear I should be delivered before I could be provided with the necessaries for the occasion. I signified my apprehension to Mr. S., who, with infinite care and concern, endeavoured to find a more convenient place, and, after all his inquiries, was obliged to fix upon a paltry apartment in the city, though his tenderness was extremely shocked at the necessity of choosing it. However, there was no remedy, nor time to be lost, to this miserable habitation I was carried in a hackney coach, and, though extremely ill, bore my fate with spirit and resignation, in testimony of my sincere and indelible attachment to my lover, for whose case and pleasure, I could have suffered every inconvenience, and even sacrificed my life. Immediately after I had taken possession of my wretched apartment, I was constrained by my indisposition to go to bed, and sent for necessary help, and in a few hours a living pledge of my love and indiscretion saw the light, though the terrors and fatigue I had undergone had affected this little innocent so severely, that it scarce discovered any visible signs of life. My grief at this misfortune was inexpressible. I forthwith dispatched a message to the dear, the anxious father, who flew to my arms, and shared my sorrow with all the gentleness of love and parental fondness, yet our fears were, for that time, happily disappointed by the recovery of our infant daughter, who was committed to the charge of a nurse in the neighborhood, so that I could every day be satisfied in my inquiries about her health. Thus I continued a whole fortnight in a state of happiness and tranquility, being blessed with the conversation and tender offices of my admirer, whose love and attention I wholly engrossed. In a word, he gave up all business and amusement, and concentrated all his care and as a duty in ministering to my ease and satisfaction, and sure I had no cause to regret what I had suffered on his account. But this my agreeable situation was one day disturbed by a most alarming accident, by which my life was drawn into imminent danger. The room under my bedchamber took fire, I immediately smelt it, and saw the people about me in the utmost perplexity and consternation, though they would not turn the true cause of their confusion, lest my health should suffer in the fright. Nevertheless, I was so calm in my inquiries, that they ventured to tell me my suspicion was but too just, upon which I gave such directions as I thought would secure me from catching cold, in case there should be a necessity for removing me. But the fire being happily extinguished, I escaped that ceremony, which might have cost me my life. Indeed, it was surprising that the agitation of my spirits did not produce some fatal effect upon my constitution, and I looked upon my deliverance as the protection of a particular providence. Though I escaped the hazard of a sudden removal, I found it was high time to change my lodgings, because the neighbors rushing into the house, upon the alarm of fire, had discovered my situation, though they were ignorant of my name, and I did not think myself safe in being the subject of their conjectures. Mr. S., therefore, procured another compartment, with better accommodation, 
to which I was carried as soon as my health would admit of my removal, and soon after my lord wrote to me by the hands of my lawyer, earnestly entreating me to drop my prosecution, and come home, but I could not comply with his request, and nothing was further from my intention than the desire of receiving any favours at his hands. Thus repulsed, he set on foot a most accurate search for my person, in the course of which he is said to have detected several ladies and young girls, who had reasons for keeping themselves concealed, and had liked to have been very severely handled for his impertinent curiosity. Being unsuccessful in all his attempts, he entered into a treaty with one Sir R. H., a person of a very indifferent character, who undertook to furnish him with an infallible expedient to discover the place of my abode, if he would gratify him with a bond for a thousand pounds, which being executed accordingly, this worthy knight advertised me and my maid in the public papers, offering one hundred pounds as a reward to any person who should disclose the place of our retirement. As soon as the paper fell into my hands, I was again involved in perplexity, and, being afraid of staying in town, resolved, with the concurrence of my lover, to accept of an invitation I had received from the Duke of K., who had by this time arrived in England, with that lady whom I have already mentioned as one of our parties at Paris. Having visited my little infant, I next day set out for the Duke's country seat, which is a most elegant chateau, and stands in a charming situation. Mr. S. followed in a few days. We met with a very cordial reception. His grace was civil and good-natured, lived nobly, and loved pleasure, Madame de Latte was formed to please. There was always a great deal of company in the house, so that we passed our time agreeably in playing at billiards and cards, hunting, walking, reading, and conversation but my terms of happiness were generally of short duration. In the midst of this felicity I was overtaken by a most severe affliction, in the death of my dear hapless infant, who had engrossed a greater share of my tenderness than perhaps I even should have paid to the offspring of a legitimate contract, because the circumstance of her birth would have been an insurmountable misfortune to her through the whole course of her life, and rendered her absolutely dependent on my love and protection. While I still lamented the untimely fate of this fair blossom, Lord, came down, and demanded me as his wife, but the suit which I then maintained against him deprived him, for the present, of a husband's right, and therefore the duke would not deliver me into his hands. In six months he repeated his visit and demand, and an agreement was patched up, in consequence of which I consented to live in the same house with him, on condition that he should never desire to sleep with me, or take any other measure to disturb my peace, otherwise I should be at liberty to leave him again, and entitled to the provision of a separate maintenance to these articles I assented, by the advice of my lawyers, with a view of obtaining the payment of my pin money, which I had never received since our parting, but subsisted on the sale of my jewels, which were very considerable, and had been presented to me with full power of alienation. As to my lover, he had no fortune to support me, and for that reason I was scrupulously cautious of augmenting his expense. We had now enjoyed each other's company for three years, during which our mutual passions had suffered no abatement nor had my happiness been mixed with any considerable alloy, except that late stroke of providence which I have already mentioned, and the reflection of the sorrow that my conduct had entailed upon my dear father, whom I loved beyond expression, and whom nothing could have compelled me to disoblige but a more powerful flame, that prevailed over every other consideration. As I was now forced to break off this enchanting correspondence, it is not to be doubted that our parting cost us the most acute sensations of grief and disappointment. However, there was no remedy. I tore myself from his arms, took my leave of the family, after having acknowledged my obligations to the Duke, and set out for the place of rendezvous, where I was met by my lord, attended by a steward whom he had lately engaged, and who was one chief cause of our future separations. My lord, having quitted his house in town, conducted me to his lodgings in Pall Mall, and insisted upon sleeping with me the first night, but I refused to gratify his desire, on the authority of our agreement. This dispute produced a quarrel in consequence of which I attempted to leave the house. He endeavouring to prevent my retreat, I fairly locked him in, ran downstairs, and, calling a hackney coach, made the best of my way into the city, to my father's lodgings, where I lay, the family being in town, though he himself was in the country. I wrote to him immediately, and, when he came to London, declared my intention of separating from my lord, in which, seeing me obstinate and determined, he at length acquiesced and a formal separation accordingly ensued, which at that time I thought binding and immutable. I was now sheltered under the wings of an indulgent father, who had taken me into favour again, on the supposition that my commerce with Mr. Rett was absolutely at an end. Nevertheless, though we had separated, in all appearance for ever, 
We had previously agreed to maintain our correspondence in private interviews, which should escape the notice of the world, with which I was again obliged to keep some measures. Our parting at the Duke of K.S. house in the country was attended with all the genuine marks of sincere and reciprocal affection, and I lived in the sweet hope of seeing him again, in all the transport of his former passion, when my lawyer, who received my letters, brought me a billet one night, just as I had gone to bed. Seeing the superscription of S.S. handwriting, I opened it with all the impatience of an absent lover, but how shall I describe the astonishment and consternation with which I was seized, when I perused the contents? Instead of the most tender vows and protestations, this fatal epistle began with, Madame, the best thing you can do is to return to your father, or some cold and killing expression to that effect. Heaven and earth! What did I feel at this dire conjuncture? The light forsook my eyes, a cold sweat bedewed my limbs, and I was overwhelmed with such a torrent of sorrow and surprise, that everybody present believed I would have died under the violent agitation. They endeavoured to support my spirits with repeated draughts of strong liquor, which had no sensible effect upon my constitution, though for eight whole years I had drunk nothing stronger than water, and I must have infallibly perished in the first ecstasy of my grief, had it not made its way in a fit of tears and exclamation, in which I continued all night, to the amazement of the family, whom my condition had alarmed, and raised from their repose. My father was the only person who guessed the cause of my affliction. He said he was sure I had received some ill usage in a letter or message from that rascal S, so he termed him in the bitterness of passion. At mention of that name, my agony redoubled to such a degree that all who were present wept at sight of my deplorable condition. My poor father shed a flood of tears, and conjured me to tell him the cause of my disquiet, upon which, rather than confess the truth, I amused his concern by pretending that my lover was ill. The whole family having stayed by me till I was a little more composed, left me to the care of my maid, who put me into bed about six in the morning, but I enjoyed no rest. I revolved every circumstance of my conduct endeavouring to find out the cause of this fatal change in S.S. disposition, and as I could recollect nothing which could justly give offence, concluded that some malicious persons had abused his ears with stories to my prejudice. With this conjecture I got up, and sent my lawyer to him with a letter, wherein I insisted upon seeing him, that I might have an opportunity of justifying myself in person, a task which would be easily performed, as I had never offended, but in loving too well. I waited with the most anxious impatience for the return of my messenger, who brought me an answer couched in the coldest terms of civility which indifference could dictate, acknowledging, however, that he had nothing to lay to my charge, but that it was for the good of us both that we should part. He ought to have reflected on that before, not after I had sacrificed my all for his love. I was well nigh distracted by this confirmation of his inconstancy, and I wonder to this day how I retained the use of my reason under such circumstances of horror and despair. My grief laid aside all decorum and restraint, I told my father that S. was dying, and that I would visit him with all expedition. Startled at the proposal, this careful parent demonstrated the fatal consequence of such an unguarded step, reminded me of the difficulty with which he had prevailed upon my mother and uncle to forgive my former imprudence, observed that his intention was to carry me into the country next day, in order to effect a perfect reconciliation. But now I was on the brink of forfeiting all pretensions to their regard, by committing another fatal error, which could not possibly be retrieved, and that, for his part, whatever pangs it might cost him, he was resolved to banish me from his sight forever. While he uttered this declaration, the tears trickled down his cheeks, and he seemed overwhelmed with the keenest sorrow and mortification, so it may be easily conceived what were the impressions of my grief, reinforced with the affliction of a father whom I dearly loved, and the consciousness of being the cause of all his disquiet. I was struck dumb with remorse and woe, and, when I recovered the use of speech, I told him how sensible I was of his great goodness and humanity, and owned how little I deserved his favour and affection, that the sense of my own unworthiness was one cause of my present distraction, for such was the condition of my fate, that I must either see S or die. I said, though I could not expect his forgiveness, I was surely worthy of his compassion, that nothing but the most irresistible passion could have misled me at first from my duty, or tempted me to incur the least degree of his displeasure, that the same fatal influence still prevailed, and would, in all probability, continue to the grave, which was the only abode in which I hoped for peace. While I expressed myself in this manner, my dear good father wept with the most tender sympathy, and, saying I might do as I pleased, for he had done with me, quitted the room, leaving me to the cruel sensations of my own heart, which almost burst with anguish, upbraiding me with a fault which I could not help committing. I immediately hired a chariot and six, and would have set out by myself, had not my father's affection, 
which all my errors could not efface, provided an attendant. He saw me quite delirious and desperate, and therefore engaged a relation of my own to accompany and take care of me in this rash expedition. During this journey, which lasted two days, I felt no remission of grief and anxiety, but underwent the most intolerable sorrow and suspense. At last we arrived at a little house called the Hut, on Salisbury Plain, where, in the most frantic agitation, I wrote a letter to S., describing the miserable condition to which I was reduced by his unkindness, and desiring to see him, with the most earnest solicitations. This billet I committed to the care of my attendant, and laid strong injunctions upon him to tell Mr. S., my injuries were so great, and my despair so violent, that, if he did not favour me with a visit, I would go to him, though at his sister's house, where he then was. He received my message with great coldness, and told my friend, that, if I would return to London without insisting upon the interview I demanded, he would, in a little time, follow me to town, and everything should be amicably adjusted, but when the messenger assured him, that I was too much transported with grief to hear of such a proposal, he consented to meet me in the middle of Salisbury Plain, that we might avoid all observation. And though I was little able to walk, I set out for the place of assignation, my companion following at a small distance. When I saw him leading his horse down the hill, I collected all my fortitude, and advanced to him with all the speed I could exert, but when I made an effort to speak, my tongue denied its office, and so lively was the expression of unutterable sorrow in my countenance, that his heart, hard as it was, melted at the sight of my sufferings, which he well knew proceeded from the sincerity of my love. At length I recovered the use of speech enough to tell him, that I was come to take my leave, and, when I would have proceeded, my voice failed me again. But, after a considerable pause, I found means, with great difficulty, to let him know how sensible I was of my own incapacity to retrieve his lost affections, but that I was willing, if possible, to retain his esteem, of which could I be assured, I would endeavour to compose myself, that I was determined to leave the kingdom, because I could not bear the sight of those places where we had been so happy in our mutual love, and that, till my departure, I hoped he would visit me sometimes, that I might, by degrees, wean myself from his company, for I should not be able to survive the shock of being deprived of him all at once. This address may seem very humble to an unconcerned observer, but love will tame the proudest disposition, as plainly appeared in my case, for I had naturally as much spirit, or more, than the generality of people have. Mr. S. was so much confounded at the manner of my behaviour, that he scarce knew what answer to make, for, as he afterwards owned, he expected to hear himself upbraided, but he was not proof against my tenderness. After some hesitation, he said, he never meant to forsake me entirely, that his affection was still unimpaired, and that he would follow me directly to London. I imposed upon myself, and believed what he said, because I could not bear to think of parting with him for ever, and return to town in a more tranquil state of mind than that in which I had left my father, though my heart was far from being at ease, my fears being ingenious enough to foresee, that I should never be able to overcome his indifference. I took lodgings in Mount Street, and my maid having disposed of herself in marriage, hired another, who supplied her place very much to my satisfaction. She was a good girl, had a particular attachment to me, and for many years, during which she lived in my service, was indefatigably assiduous in contributing to my ease, or rather in alleviating my affliction. For, though S. came up to town according to promise, and renewed a sort of correspondence with me for the space of five months, his complaisance would extend no farther, and he gave me to understand, that he had determined to go abroad with Mr. V., whom he accordingly accompanied in his envoy to D. I understood the real cause of this expedition, which, notwithstanding his oaths and protestations of unabated love and regard, I construed into a palpable mark of dislike and disrespect, nor could the repeated assurances I received from him in letters mitigate the anguish and mortification that preyed upon my heart. I therefore gave up all hopes of recovering the happiness I had lost. I told him on the eve of his departure, that he might exercise his gallantry a great while, before he would meet with my fellow, in point of sincerity and love, for I would rather have been a servant in his house, with the privilege of seeing him, than the Queen of England debarred of that pleasure. When he took his leave, and went downstairs, I shrunk at every step he made, as if a new wound had been inflicted upon me and when I heard the door shut behind him, my heart died within me. I had the satisfaction to hear afterwards, he lamented the loss of me prodigiously, and that he had never been so happy since. I sat down to write a letter, in which I forgave his indifference, because I knew the affections are altogether involuntary, and wished him all the happiness he deserved. I then walked up and down the room in the most restless anxiety, was put to bed by my maid, rose at six, 
mounted my horse and rode forty miles, in order to fatigue myself that I might next night enjoy some repose. This exercise I daily underwent for months together, and, when it did not answer my purpose, I used to walk round Hyde Park in the evening, when the place was quite solitary and unvisited by any other human creature. In the course of this melancholy perambulation, I was one day accosted by a very great man, who, after the first salutation, asked whether or not my intercourse with S was at an end, and if I had any allowance from my husband. To the first of these questions I replied in the affirmative, and to the last answered, that my lord did not allow me a great deal, indeed, I might have truly said nothing at all, but I was too proud to own my indigence. He then expressed his wonder, how one like me, who had been used to splendor and affluence from my cradle, could make shift to live in my present narrow circumstances, and, when I told him that I could make a very good shift, so I had peace, he seemed to lament my situation, and very kindly invited me to sup with his wife at his house. I accepted the invitation, without any apprehension of the consequence, and, when I went to the place, was introduced into an apartment magnificently lighted up, I suppose, for my reception. After I had stayed alone for some time in this mysterious situation, without seeing a living soul, my inviter appeared, and said, he hoped I would not take it amiss that he and I were to sup by ourselves, as he had something to say, which could not be so properly communicated before company or servants. I then, for the first time, perceived his drift, to my no small surprise and indignation, and, with evident marks of displeasure, told him, I was sure he had nothing to propose that would be agreeable to my inclination, and that I would immediately leave the house. Upon which he gave me to understand, that I could not possibly retire, because he had sent away my chair and all his servants were disposed to obey his orders. Incensed at this declaration, which I considered as an insult, I answered, with an air of resolution, it was very well, I despised his contrivance, and was afraid of nothing. Seeing me thus alarmed, he assured me I had no reason to be afraid, that he had loved me long, and could find no other opportunity of declaring his passion. He said the Q had told him that Lord, had renewed his addresses to me, and, as he understood from my own mouth, my correspondence with S. was absolutely broke off. He thought himself as well entitled as another to my regard. In conclusion, he told me that I might command his purse, and that he had power enough to bring me into the world again with éclat. To these advances I replied, that he was very much mistaken in his opinion of my character, if he imagined I was to be won by any temptations of fortune, and very frankly declared, that I would rather give myself to a footman, than sell myself to a prince. Supper being served, we sat down together, but I would neither eat nor drink anything, except a little bread and water, for I was an odd whimsical girl, and it came into my head, that he might perhaps have mixed something in the victuals or wine, which would alter my way of thinking. In short, finding himself baffled in all his endeavors, he permitted me about twelve o'clock to depart in peace, and gave up his suit as a desperate cause. This uncomfortable life did I lead for a whole twelve month, without feeling the least abatement of my melancholy. Finding myself worn to a skeleton, I resumed my former resolution of trying to profit by change of place, and actually went abroad, with no other attendant than my woman, and the utmost indifference for life. My intention was to have gone to the south of France, where I thought I could have subsisted on the little I had left, which amounted to five hundred pounds, until the issue of my lawsuit, by which I hoped to obtain some provision from my lord, and, without all doubt, my expectation would have been answered, had I put this my plan in execution. But, being at Paris, from whence I proposed to set forward in a few days, I sent to M. K., who had been formerly intimate with my father, and shown me many civilities during my first residence in France. This gentleman favoured me with a visit, and, when I made him acquainted with my scheme, dissuaded me from it, as an uncomfortable determination. He advised me to stay at Paris, where, with good economy, I could live as cheap as in any other place and enjoy the conversation and countenance of my friends, among which number he declared himself one of the most faithful. He assured me, that I should be always welcome to his table, and want for nothing. He promised to recommend me as a lodger to a friend of his, with whom I would live in a frugal and decent manner, and observed, that, as the woman was well known and esteemed by all the English company in Paris, it would be the most reputable step I could take, considering my youth and situation, to lodge with a creditable person, who could answer for my conduct. Thus persuaded, I very simply followed his advice, I say simply, because, notwithstanding his representations, I soon found my money melt away, without any prospect of a fresh supply. In lieu of this, however, I passed my time very agreeably in several English and some French families, where, in a little time, 
I became quite intimate, saw a great deal of company, and was treated with the utmost politeness and regard, yet, in the midst of these pleasures, many a melancholy sigh would rise at the remembrance of my beloved S, whom, for several years, I could not recollect without emotion, but time, company, amusements, and change of place, in a great measure dissipated these ideas, and enabled me to bear my fate with patience and resignation. On my last arrival at Paris, I was surrounded by a crowd of professed admirers, who sighed and flattered in the usual forms, but, besides that my heart was not in a condition to contract new engagements, I was prepossessed against them all, by supposing that they presumed upon their knowledge of my indiscretion with S, and therefore rejected their addresses with detestation and disdain, for, as I have already observed, I was not to be won but by the appearance of esteem, and the most respectful carriage, and though, by a false step, I had, in my own opinion, forfeited my title to the one, I was resolved to discourage the advances of any man who seemed deficient in the other. In this manner my lovers were one by one repulsed, almost as soon as they presented themselves, and I preserved the independence of my heart, until I became acquainted with a certain peer, whom I often saw at the house of Mrs. P., an English lady then resident at Paris. This young nobleman professed himself deeply enamoured of me, in a style so different from that of my other admirers, that I heard his protestations without disgust, and, though my inclinations were still free, could not find in my heart to discountenance his addresses, which were preferred with the most engaging modesty, disinterestedness, and respect. By these never-failing arts, he gradually conquered my indifference, and gained the preference in my esteem from Lord C. and the Prince of C., who were at that time his rivals. But what contributed more than any consideration to his success was his declaring openly, that he would marry me without hesitation, as soon as I could obtain a divorce from my present husband, which, in all probability, might have been easily procured, for, before I left England, Lord, had offered me five thousand pounds if I would consent to such a mutual release, that he might be at liberty to espouse one Miss W., of Kent, to whom he then made love upon honourable terms, but I was fool enough to refuse his proposal, by the advice of S. And whether or not his lordship, finding it impracticable to wed his new mistress, began to make love upon another footing, I know not, but, certain it is, the mother forbade him the house, a circumstance which he took so heinously ill, that he appealed to the world in a public advertisement, beginning with whereas, for some time, I have passionately loved Miss W., and, upon my not complying with the mother's proposals, they have turned me out of doors, this is to justify, etc. This declaration, signed with his name, was actually printed in a number of detached advertisements, which he ordered to be distributed to the public, and afterwards, being convinced by some of his friends that he had done a very silly thing, he recalled them at half a guinea apiece. A copy of one of them was sent to me at Paris, and I believe my father has now one of the originals in his possession. After this wise vindication of his conduct, he made an attempt to carry off the lady from church by force of arms, but she was rescued by the neighbours, headed by her brother, who, being an attorney, had like to have made his lordship smart severely for this exploit. Meanwhile my new admirer had made some progress in my heart, and, my finances being exhausted, I was reduced to the alternative of returning to Lord, again, or accepting Earl B.S. Love. When my affairs were brought to an issue, I made no hesitation in my choice, putting myself under the protection of a man of honour whom I esteemed, rather than suffer every sort of mortification from a person who was the object of my abhorrence and contempt. From a mistaken pride, I chose to live in Lord B.S. house, rather than be maintained at his expense in another place. We spent several months agreeably in balls and other diversions, visited Lord B., who lived at the distance of a few leagues from Paris, and stayed some days at his house, where the entertainment was, in all respects, delightful, elegant, and refined. Their habitation was the rendezvous of the best company in France, and Lady B. maintained the same superiority in her own sex for which her lord is so justly distinguished among the men. About Christmas we set out for England, accompanied by a little North Briton, who lived with Lord B. as his companion, and did not at all approve of our correspondence, whether out of real friendship for his patron, or apprehension that in time I might supersede his own influence with my lord, I shall not pretend to determine. Be that as it will, the frost was so severe, that we would detain ten days at Calais before we could get out of the harbour, and, during that time, I reflected seriously on what my new lover proposed. As he was very young, and unacquainted with the world, I thought my story might have escaped him, and therefore determined to give him a faithful detail of the whole, that he might not have anything to approach me within the sequel. Besides, 
I did not think it honest to engage him to do more for me than he might afterwards perhaps think I was worth. Accordingly, I communicated to him every particular of my life, and the narration, far from altering his sentiments, rather confirmed his good opinion, by exhibiting an undoubted proof of my frankness and sincerity. In short, he behaved with such generosity, as made an absolute conquest of my heart. But my love was of a different kind from that which had formerly reigned within my breast, being founded upon the warmest gratitude and esteem, exclusive of any other consideration, though his person was very agreeable, and his address engaging. When we arrived in England, I went directly to his country seat, about twelve miles from London, where he soon joined me, and we lived some time in perfect retirement. His relations being greatly alarmed with the apprehension that Lord would bring an action against him, though he himself desired nothing more, and lived so easy under that expectation, that they soon laid aside their fears on his account. We were visited by Mr. H. B., a relation of my lord, and one Mr. R., of the guards, who, with the little Scotchman and my lover, made an agreeable set, among whom I enjoyed hunting, and all manner of country diversions. As to Mr. H. B., if ever there was perfection in one man, it centred in him, or, at least, he, of all the men I ever knew, approached the nearest to that idea which I had conceived of a perfect character. He was both good and great, possessed an uncommon genius, and the best of hearts. Mr. R. was a very sociable man, had a good person, and cultivated understanding, and my lord was excessively good-humoured, so that, with such companions, no place could be dull or insipid. For my own part, I conducted the family, and, as I endeavoured to please and make everybody happy, I had the good fortune to succeed. Mr. B. told me, that before he saw me, he heard I was a fool, but finding, as he was pleased to say, that I had been egregiously misrepresented, he courted my friendship, and a correspondence commenced between us. Indeed, it was impossible for any person to know him, without entertaining the utmost esteem and veneration for his virtue. After I had lived some time in this agreeable retreat, my husband began to make a bustle. He sent a message, demanding me from Lord B., then came in person, with his nightcap in his pocket, intending to have stayed all night, had he been asked, and attended by a relation, whom he assured that I was very fond of him, and detained by force from his arms. Finding himself disappointed in his expectations, he commenced a lawsuit against Lord B., though not for a divorce, as we desired, but with a view to reclaim me as his lawful wife. His lawyers, however, attempted to prove criminal conversation, in hopes of extorting money from my lover for their endeavours were altogether fruitless, for no servant of Lord B.S. or mine could with justice say we were ever seen to trespass against modesty and decorum, so that the plaintiff was non-suited. While this cause was depending, all my lover's friends expressed fear and concern for the issue, while he himself behaved with the utmost resolution, and gave me such convincing proofs of a strong and steady affection, as augmented my gratitude, and riveted the ties of my love, which was unblemished, faithful, and sincere. Soon after this event, I was seized with a violent fit of illness, in which I was visited by my father, and attended by two physicians, one of whom despaired of my life, and took his leave accordingly, but Dr. S., who was the other, persisted in his attendance, and, in all human appearance, saved my life, a circumstance by which he acquired a great share of reputation. Yet, notwithstanding all his assistance, I was confined to my bed for ten weeks, during which Lord B.S. grief was immoderate his care and generosity unlimited. While I lay in this extremity, Mr. S., penetrated by my melancholy condition, which revived his tenderness, begged leave to be admitted to my presence, and Lord B. would have complied with his request, had I not been judged too weak to bear the shock of such an interview. My constitution, however, agreeably disappointed my fears, and the fever had no sooner left me, than I was removed to a hunting seat belonging to my lover, from whence, after I had recovered my strength, we went to B. Castle where we kept open house. And, while we remained at this place, Lord B. received a letter from Lord, dated in November, challenging him to single combat in May, upon the frontiers of France and Flanders. This defiance was sent in consequence of what had passed between them along before my indisposition, at a meeting in a certain tavern, where they quarrelled, and in the fray, my lover threw his antagonist under the table. I counselled him to take no notice of this rhodomontade, which I knew was void of all intention of performance, and he was wise enough to follow my advice, resolved, however, should the message be repeated, to take the challenger at his word. Having resided some time at this place, we returned to the other country house which he had left, where Lord B. addicted himself so much to hunting, and other male diversions, 
that I began to think he neglected me, and apprised him of my suspicion, assuring him, at the same time, that I would leave him as soon as my opinion should be confirmed. This declaration had no effect upon his behavior, which became so remarkably cold, that even Mr. R., who lived with us, imagined that his affection was palpably diminished. When I went to town, I was usually attended by his cousin, or this gentleman, or both, but seldom favored with his company, nay, when I repaired to Bath, for the re-establishment of my health, he permitted me to go alone, so that I was quite persuaded of his indifference, and yet I was mistaken in my opinion. But I had been spoiled by the behavior of my first husband, and Mr. S., who never quitted me for the sake of any amusement, and often resisted the calls of the most urgent business, rather than part from me, though but for a few hours. I thought every man who loved me truly would act in the same manner, and, whether I am right or wrong in my conjectures, I leave wiser casuists to judge. Certain it is, such sacrifice and devotion is the most pleasing proof of an admirer's passion, and, voyez moi plus souvent, et nimi donesren, is one of my favorite maxims. A man may give money, because he is profuse, he may be violently fond, because he is of a sanguine constitution. But, if he gives me his time, he gives me an unquestionable proof of my being in full possession of his heart. My appearance at Bath, without the company of Lord B., occasioned a general surprise, and encouraged the men to pester me with addresses, every new admirer endeavouring to advance his suit by demonstrating the unkind and disrespectful behaviour of his lordship. Indeed, this was the most effectual string they could touch. My pride and resentment were alarmed, I was weak enough to listen to one man, who had liked to have insinuated himself into my inclinations. He was tall and large-boned, with white hair, inclining to what is called sandy, and had the reputation of being handsome, though I think he scarce deserved that happy fit. He possessed a large fortune, loved mischief, and stuck at nothing for the accomplishment of his designs, one of his chief pleasures being that of setting any two lovers at variance. He employed his address upon me with great assiduity, and knew so well how to manage my resentment, that I was pleased with his manner, heard his vows without disgust, and, in a word, promised to deliberate with myself upon his proposals, and give him an account of my determination in writing. Thus resolved, I went to Lord B. in Wiltshire, whither I was followed by this pretender to my heart, who visited us on the footing of an acquaintance, but when I reflected on what I had done, I condemned my own conduct as indiscreet, though nothing decisive had passed between us, and began to hate him in proportion to the self-conviction I felt, perceiving that I had involved myself in a difficulty from which I should not be easily disengaged. For the present, however, I found means to postpone my declaration. He admitted my excuse, and I returned to London with Lord B., who was again summoned to the field by his former challenger. H.D.N., Governor, Counselor, and Steward to this little hero, came to Lord B. with a verbal message, importing that his lordship had changed his mind about going to Flanders, but expected to meet him, on such a day and hour, in the burying ground near Red Lion Square. Lord B. accepted the challenge and gave me an account of what had passed, but he had been anticipated by the messenger, who had already tried to alarm my fears from the consideration of the consequence, that I might take some measures to prevent their meeting. I perceived his drift, and told him plainly, that Lord had no intention to risk his person, though he endeavoured with all his might to persuade me, that his principle was desperate and determined. I knew my little husband too well to think he would bring matters to any dangerous issue, and was apprehensive of nothing but foul play, from the villainy of H.D.N., with which I was equally well acquainted. Indeed, I signified my doubts on that score to Mr. B., who would have attended his kinsman to the field, had he not thought he might be liable to censure, if anything should happen to Lord B., because he himself was heir at law, for that reason he judiciously declined being personally concerned, and we pitched upon the Earl of A., his lordship's uncle, who willingly undertook the office. At the appointed time they went to the house of rendezvous, where they had not waited long when the challenger appeared in a new pink satin waistcoat, which he had put on for the occasion, with his sword under his arm, and his steward by him, leaving, in a hackney coach at some distance, a surgeon whom he had provided for the care of his person. Thus equipped he advanced to his antagonist, and desired him to choose his ground, upon which Lord B. told him, that if he must fall, it was not material which grave he should tumble over. Our little hero, finding him so jocose and determined, turned to Lord A., and desired to speak with him, that he might disburden his conscience before they should begin the work of death. They accordingly went aside, and he gave him to understand, that his motive for fighting, was Lord B.S. detaining his wife from him by compulsion. The Earl of A. assured him, he was egregiously mistaken in his conjecture, 
that his nephew used no force or undue influence to keep me in his house, but it could not be expected that he would turn me out of doors. This explanation was altogether satisfactory to Lord, who said he was far from being so unreasonable as to expect Lord B. would commit such a breach of hospitality, and all he desired was, that his wife should be left to her own inclinations. Upon these articles, peace was concluded, and they parted without bloodshed. At least these are the particulars of the story, as they were related by Lord A., with whom I laughed heartily at the adventure, for I never doubted that the challenger would find some expedient to prevent the duel, though I wondered how he mustered up resolution enough to carry it so far. That he might not, however, give us any more trouble, we resolved to go and enjoy ourselves in France. Whither I went by myself, in hopes of being soon joined by my lover, who was obliged to stay some time longer in England, to settle his affairs. He was so much affected at our parting, though but for a few weeks, that he was almost distracted. And this affliction renewed my tenderness for him, because it was an undoubted proof of his love. I wrote to him every post from France, and, as I had no secrets, desired him to take care of all the letters that should come to his house, directed to me, after my departure from England. This was an unfortunate office for him, in the execution of which he chanced to open a letter from Sir T. A., with whom, as I have already observed, I had some correspondence at Bath. I had according to my promise, given this gentleman a decisive answer, importing that I was determined to remain in my present situation, but as Lord B. was ignorant of my sentiments in that particular, and perceived from the letter that something extraordinary had passed between us, and that I was earnestly solicited to leave him. He was seized with the utmost consternation and concern, and, having previously obtained the King's leave to go abroad, set out that very night for France, leaving his affairs in the greatest confusion. Sir T. A. hearing I was gone, without understanding the cause of my departure, took the same route, and both arrived at Dover next day. They heard of each other's motions. Each bribed the master of a packet boat to transport him with expedition, but that depending upon the wind, both reached Calais at the same time, though in different vessels. Sir T. sent his valet de chamber post, with a letter, entreating me to accompany him into Italy, where he would make me mistress of his whole fortune, and to set out directly for that country that he might not lose me by the arrival of Lord B., promising to join me on the road, if I would consent to make him happy. I sent his messenger back with an answer, wherein I expressed surprise at his proposals, after having signified my resolution to him before I left England. He was scarce dismissed, when I received another letter from Lord B., beseeching me to meet him at Clermont, upon the road from Calais, and conjuring me to avoid the sight of his rival, should he get the start of him in travelling. This, however, was not likely to be the case, as Lord B. rode post, and the other was, by his corpulence, obliged to travel in a chaise, yet, that I might not increase his anxiety, I left Paris immediately on the receipt of his message, and met him at the appointed place, where he received me with all the agitation of joy and fear, and asked if I had ever encouraged Sir T. A. in his addresses. I very candidly told him the whole transaction, at which he was incensed, but his indignation was soon appeased, when I professed my penitence and assured him that I had totally rejected his rival. Not that I approved of my behaviour to Sir T., who, I own, was ill-used in this affair, but surely it was more excusable to halt here, than proceed farther in my indiscretion. My lover being satisfied with my declaration, we went together to Paris, being attended by the Scotchman, whom I have already mentioned, though I believe he was not over and above well pleased to see matters thus amicably compromised. The furious knight followed us to the capital insisted on seeing me in person, told this North Britain, that I was actually engaged to him, wrote every hour, and railed at my perfidious conduct. I took no notice of these delirious transports, which were also disregarded by Lord B., till, one night, he was exasperated by the insinuations of Mr. C., who, I believe, inflamed his jealousy, by hinting a suspicion that I was really in love with his rival. What passed betwixt them I know not, but he sent for me from the opera, by a physician of Paris, who was a sort of go-between among us all, and who told me, that, if I did not come home in the instant, a duel would be fought on my account. I was very much shocked at this information, but, by being used to alarms from the behaviour of Lord, I had acquired a pretty good share of resolution, and with great composure entered the room where Lord B. was, with his companion, whom I immediately ordered to withdraw. I then gave his lordship to understand, that I was informed of what had passed and thought myself so much injured by the person who had just quitted the apartment, that I would no longer live under the same roof with him. Lord B. raved like a bedlamite, taxing me with want of candour and affection, but I easily justified my own integrity, 
and gave him such assurances of my love, that his jealousy subsided, and his spirits were recomposed. Nevertheless, I insisted upon his dismissing Mr. C., on pain of my leaving the house, as I could not help thinking he had used his endeavours to prejudice me in the opinion of my lord. If his conduct was the result of friendship for his patron, he certainly acted the part of an honest and trusty adherent. But I could not easily forgive him, because, a few weeks before, he had, by my interest, obtained a considerable addition to his allowance, and even after the steps he had taken to disoblige me, I was not so much his enemy but that I prevailed upon Lord B to double his salary, that his leaving the family might be no detriment to his fortune. His lordship having complied with my demand, this gentleman, after having stayed three days in the house, to prepare for his departure, during which I would not suffer him to be admitted into my presence, made his retreat with a fine young girl, who was my companion, and I have never seen him since that time. Sir T. still continued furious, and would not take a denial, except from my own mouth, upon which, with the approbation of Lord B., I indulged him with an interview. He entered the apartment with a stern countenance, and told me I had used him ill. I pleaded guilty to the charge, and begged his pardon accordingly. I attempted to reason the case with him, but he would hear no arguments except his own, and even tried to intimidate me with threats, which provoked me to such a degree, that I defied his vengeance. I told him, that I feared nothing but the report of my own conscience, that, though I had acted a simple part, he durst not say there was anything criminal in my conduct, and that, from his present frantic and unjust behaviour, I thought myself happy in having escaped him. He swore I was the most inflexible of all creatures, asked if nothing would move me, and when I answered, nothing, took his leave, and never after persecuted me with his addresses, though I have heard he was vain and false enough to boast of favours, which, upon my honour, he never received, as he himself, at one time, owned to Dr. Cantwell, at Paris. While he underwent all this frenzy and distraction upon my account, he was loved with the same violence of passion by a certain Scotch lady of quality, who, when he followed me to France, pursued him thither with the same eagerness and expedition. Far from being jealous of me as a rival, she used to come to my house, implore my good offices with the object of her love, and, laying herself on the floor at full length before the fire, weep and cry like a person bereft of her senses. She bitterly complained that he had never obliged her but once, and begged, with the most earnest supplications, that I would give her an opportunity of seeing him at my house. But I thought proper to avoid her company, as soon as I perceived her intention. We continued at Paris for some time, during which I contracted an acquaintance with the sister of Madame de la T. She was the supposed mistress of the Prince of C., endowed with a great share of understanding, and loved pleasure to excess, though she maintained her reputation on a respectable footing, by living with her husband and mother. This lady, perceiving that I had inspired her lover with a passion, which gave me uneasiness on her account, actually practised all her eloquence and art in persuading me to listen to his love, for it was a maxim with her to please him at any rate. I was shocked at her indelicate complaisance, and rejected the proposal as repugnant to my present engagement, which I held as sacred as any nuptial tie, and much more binding than the forced or unnatural marriage. Upon our return to England, we lived in great harmony and peace, and nothing was wanting to my happiness. But the one thing to me the most needful, I mean the enchanting tenderness and delightful enthusiasm of love. Lord B.S. Hart, I believe, felt the soft impressions, and, for my own part, I loved him with the most faithful affection. It is not enough to say I wished him well, I had the most delicate, the most genuine esteem for his virtue, I had an intimate regard and anxiety for his interest and felt for him as if he had been my own son. But still there was a vacancy in my heart, there was not that fervour, that transport, that ecstasy of passion which I had formerly known, my bosom was not filled with a little deity, I could not help recalling to my remembrance the fond, the ravishing moments I had passed with S. Had I understood the conditions of life, those pleasures were happily exchanged for my present situation, because, if I was now deprived of those rapturous enjoyments, I was also exempted from the cares and anxiety that attended them, but I was generally extravagant in my notions of happiness, and therefore construed my present tranquillity into an insipid languor and stagnation of life. While I remained in this inactivity of sentiment, Lord, having received a very considerable addition to his fortune, sent a message to me, promising, that if I would leave Lord B., he would make me a present of a house and furniture, where I should live at my case, without being exposed to his visits, except when I should be disposed to receive them. This proposal he made in consequence of what I had always declared, namely, that if he had not reduced me to the necessity of putting myself under the protection of some person or other, 
by depriving me of any other means of subsistence, I should never have given the world the least cause to scandalize my reputation, and that I would withdraw myself from my present dependence, as soon as he should enable me to live by myself. I was therefore resolved to be as good as my word, and accepted his offer, on condition that I should be wholly at my own disposal, and that he should never enter my door but as a visitant or common friend. These articles being ratified by his word and honor, the value of which I did not then know, a house was furnished according to my directions, and I signified my intention to Lord B., who consented to my removal, with this proviso, that I should continue to see him. I wrote also to his relation, Mr. B., who, in his answer, observed, that it was too late to advise, when I was actually determined. All my friends and acquaintance approved of the scheme, though it was one of the most unjustifiable steps I had ever taken, being a real act of ingratitude to my benefactor, which I soon did, and always shall regret and condemn. So little is the world qualified to judge of private affairs. When the time of our parting drew near, Lord B. became gloomy and discontented, and even entreated me to postpone my resolution, but I told him, that now everything was prepared for my reception, I could not retract without incurring the imputation of folly and extravagance. On the very day of my departure, Mr. B. endeavoured, with all the arguments he could suggest, to dissuade me from my purpose, and I made use of the same answer which had satisfied his friend. Finding me determined on removing, he burst out into a flood of tears, exclaiming, By God! If Lord B. can bear it, I can't! I was thunderstruck at this expression, for though I had been told that Mr. B. was in love with me, I gave no credit to the report, because he had never declared his passion, and this was the first hint of it that ever escaped him in my hearing. I was therefore so much amazed at the circumstance of this abrupt explanation, that I could make no answer, but having taken my leave, went away, ruminating on the unexpected declaration. Lord B., as I was informed, spoke not a word that whole night, and took my leaving him so much to heart, that two years elapsed before he got the better of his grief. This intelligence I afterwards received from his own mouth, and asked his forgiveness for my unkind retreat, though I shall never be able to obtain my own. As for Mr. B., he was overwhelmed with sorrow, and made such efforts to suppress his concern, as had well nigh cost him his life. Dr. S. was called to him in the middle of the night, and found him almost suffocated. He soon guessed the cause, when he understood that I had left the house, so that I myself was the only person concerned, who was utterly ignorant of his affection, for I solemnly declare he never gave me the least reason to suspect it while I lived with his relation, because he had too much honour to entertain a thought of supplanting his friend, and too good an opinion of me to believe he should have succeeded in the attempt. Though my love for Lord B. was not so tender and interesting as the passion I had felt for S., my fidelity was inviolable, and I never harboured the most distant thought of any other person, till after I had resolved to leave him, when, I own, I afforded some small encouragement to the addresses of a new admirer by telling him, that I should, in a little time, be my own mistress, though I was not now at my own disposal. I enjoyed my new house as a little paradise. It was accommodated with all sorts of conveniences, everything was new, and therefore pleasing, and the whole absolutely at my command. I had the company of relation, a very good woman, with whom I lived in the most amicable manner, was visited by the best people in town I mean those of the male sex. The ladies having long ago forsaken me, I frequented all reputable places of public entertainment, and had a concert at home once a week, so that my days rolled on in happiness and quiet, till all my sweets were embittered by the vexatious behaviour of my husband, who began to importune me again to live with him, and by the increasing anxiety of Lord B., who, though I still admitted his visits, plainly perceived that I wanted to relinquish his correspondence. This discovery raised such tempests of jealousy and despair within his breast, that he kept me in continual alarm. He sent messages to me every hour, signed his letters with his own blood, raved like a man in ecstasy of madness, railed at my ingratitude, and praised my conduct by turns. He offered to sacrifice everything for my love, to leave the kingdom forthwith, and live with me for ever in any part of the world where I should choose to reside. These were generous and tempting proposals, but I was beset with counsellors who were not totally disinterested, and who dissuaded me from embracing the proffers of my lover, on pretense that Lord, would be highly injured by my compliance. I listened to their advice, and hardened my heart against Lord B.S. sorrow and solicitations. My behaviour on this occasion is altogether unaccountable, this was the only time that ever I was a slave to admonition. The condition of Lord B. would have melted any heart but mine, and yet mine was one of the most sensible. He employed his cousin as an advocate with me, till that gentleman actually refused the office, telling him candidly, 
that his own inclinations were too much engaged to permit him to perform the task with fidelity and truth. He accordingly resolved to avoid my presence, until my lord and I should come to some final determination, which was greatly retarded by the perseverance of his lordship, who would not resign his hopes, even when I pretended that another man had engaged my heart, but said, that in time my affection might return. Our correspondence, however, gradually wore off, upon which Mr. B. renewed his visits, and many agreeable and happy hours we passed together. Not that he, or any other person whom I now saw, succeeded to the privilege of a fortunate lover, I knew he loved me to madness, but I could not gratify his passion any other way than by the most profound esteem and veneration for his virtues, which were altogether amiable and sublime, and I would here draw his character minutely, but it would take up too much time to set forth his merit, the only, man living of my acquaintance who resembles him, is Lord F., of whom I shall speak in the sequel. About this time I underwent a very interesting change in the situation of my heart. I had sent a message to my old lover S., desiring he would allow my picture, which was in his possession, to be copied, and he now transmitted it to me by my lawyer, whom he directed to ask, if I intended to be at the next masquerade. This curiosity had a strange effect upon my spirits, my heart fluttered at the question, and my imagination glowed with a thousand fond presages. I answered in the affirmative, and we met by accident at the ball. I could not behold him without emotion, when he accosted me, his well-known voice made my heart vibrate, like a musical chord, when its unison is struck. All the ideas of our past love, which the lapse of time and absence had enfeebled and lulled to sleep, now I woke, and were inspired by his appearance, so that his artful excuses were easily admitted, I forgave him all that I had suffered on his account, because he was the natural lord of my affection, and our former correspondence was renewed. I thought myself in a new world of bliss in consequence of this reconciliation, the rapture of which continued unimpaired for the space of four months, during which time he was fonder of me, if possible, than before, repeated his promise of marriage, if we should ever have it in our power, assured me he had never been happy since he left me, that he believed no woman loved like me. And indeed, to have a notion of my passion for that man, you must first have loved as I did. But, through a strange caprice, I broke off the correspondence, out of apprehension that he would forsake me again. From his past conduct I dreaded what might happen, and the remembrance of what I had undergone by his inconstancy, filled my imagination with such horror, that I could not endure the shocking prospect, and prematurely plunged myself into the danger, rather than endure the terrors of expectation. I remembered that his former attachment began in the season of my prosperity, when my fortune was in the zenith, and my youth in its prime, and that he had forsaken me in the day of trouble, when my life became embarrassed and my circumstances were on the decline. I foresaw nothing but continual persecution from my husband, and feared, that, once the keener transports of our reconciliation should be over, his affection would sink under the severity of its trial. In consequence of this desertion, I received a letter from him, acknowledging that he was rightly served, but that my retreat gave him inexpressible concern. Meanwhile Lord, continued to act in the character of a fiend, tormenting me with his nauseous importunities. He prevailed upon the Duke of L to employ his influence in persuading me to live with him, assuring his grace, that I had actually promised to give him that proof of my obedience, and that I would come home the sooner for being pressed to compliance by a person of his rank and character. Induced by these representations, the Duke honoured me with a visit, and, in the course of his exhortations, I understood how he had been thus misinformed. Upon which I sent for Lord, and, in his presence, convicted him of the falsehood by communicating to his grace the articles of our last agreement, which he did not think proper to deny, and the Duke, being undeceived, declared, that he would not have given me the trouble of vindicating myself, had he not been misled by the insincerity of my lord. Baffled in this attempt, he engaged Mr. H. V., and afterwards my own father, in the same task, and though I still adhered to my first resolution, persisted with such obstinacy in his endeavours to make me unhappy, that I determined to leave the kingdom. Accordingly, after I had spent the evening with him at Rainler, I went away about two o'clock in the morning, leaving my companion, with directions to restore to my lord his house, furniture, plate, and everything he had given me since our last accommodation, so far was I, upon this occasion, or at any other time of my life, from embezzling any part of his fortune. My friend followed my instructions most punctually, and his lordship knows and will acknowledge the truth of this assertion. Thus have I explained the true cause of my first expedition to Flanders, whither the world was good-natured enough to say, I followed Mr. B. and the whole army, which happened to be sent abroad that summer. Before my departure, 
I likewise transmitted to Lord B the dressing plate, China, and a very considerable settlement, of which he had been generous enough to make me a present. This was an instance of my integrity, which I thought due to a man who had laid me under great obligations, and though I lived to be refused a small sum both by him and S, I do not repent of my disinterested behavior, all the revenge I harbor against the last of these lovers, is the desire of having it in my power to do him good. I now found myself adrift in the world again, and very richly deserved the hardships of my condition, for my indiscretion in leaving Lord B, and entrusting to the word of Lord, without some further security, but I have dearly paid for my imprudence. The more I saw into the character of this man, whom destiny hath appointed my scourge, the more was I determined to avoid his fellowship and communication, for he and I are, in point of disposition, as opposite as any two principles in nature. In the first place, he is one of the most unsocial beings that ever existed, when I was pleased and happy. He was always out of temper, but if he could find means to overcast and cloud my mirth, though never so innocent, he then discovered signs of uncommon satisfaction and content, because, by this disagreeable temper, he banished all company from his house. He is extremely weak of understanding, though he possesses a good share of low cunning, which has so egregiously imposed upon some people, that they have actually believed him a good-natured easy creature, and blamed me because I did not manage him to better purpose, but, upon further acquaintance, they have always found him obstinate as a mule, and capricious as a monkey. Not that he is utterly void of all commendable qualities. He is punctual in paying his debts, liberal when in good humor, and would be well-bred, were he not subject to fits of absence, during which he is altogether unconversable, but he is proud, naturally suspicious, jealous, equally with and without cause, never made a friend, and is an utter stranger to the joys of intimacy, in short. He hangs like a damp upon society, and may be properly called killjoy, an epithet which he has justly acquired. He honored me with constant professions of love, but his conduct is so opposite to my sentiments of that passion, as to have been the prime source of all my misfortunes and affliction, and I have often wished myself the object of his hate, in hopes of profiting by a change in his behavior. Indeed, he has not been able to make me more unhappy than I believe he is in his own mind, for he is literally a self-tormentor, who never enjoyed one gleam of satisfaction except at the expense of another's quiet, and yet with this, I had almost called it diabolical quality, he expects that I should cherish him with all the tenderness of affection. After he has been at pains to incur my aversion, he punishes my disgust, by contriving schemes to mortify and perplex me, which have often succeeded so effectually, as to endanger my life and constitution, for I have been fretted and frighted into sundry fits of illness, and then I own I have experienced his care and concern. Over and above the oddities I have mentioned, he is so unsteady in his economy, that he is always new modeling his affairs, and exhausting his fortune by laying out ten pounds, in order to save a shilling. He inquires into the character of a servant, after he has lived two years in his family, and is so ridiculously stocked with vanity and self-conceit, that, notwithstanding my assurance before, and the whole series of my conduct since our marriage, which ought to have convinced him of my dislike, he is still persuaded, that, at bottom, I must admire and be enamored of his agreeable person and accomplishments, and that I could not fail to manifest my love were I not spirited against him by his own relations. Perhaps it might be their interest to foment the misunderstanding betwixt us, but really they give themselves no trouble about our affairs, and, so far as I know them, are a very good sort of people. On the whole, I think I may with justice pronounce my precious yoke fellow a trifling, teasing, insufferable, inconsistent creature. With the little money which remained of what I had received from his lordship for housekeeping, I transported myself to Flanders, and arrived in Ghent a few days after our troops were quartered in that city, which was so much crowded with these new visitants, that I should have found it impracticable to procure a lodging, had I not been accommodated by Lord B., the Duke of A.S. youngest brother, who very politely gave me up his own. Here I saw my friend Mr. B., who was overjoyed at my arrival, though jealous of every man of his acquaintance, for he loved me with all the ardor of passion, and I regarded him with all the perfection of friendship, which, had he lived, in time might have produced love, though that was a fruit which it never brought forth. Notwithstanding his earnest solicitations to the contrary, I stayed but a week in Ghent, from whence I proceeded to Brussels, and fixed my abode in the Hotel de Flandre, among an agreeable set of gentlemen and ladies, with whom I spent my time very cheerfully. There was a sort of court in this city, frequented by all the officers who could obtain permission to go thither, 
and the place in general was gay and agreeable. I was introduced to the best families, and very happy in my acquaintance, for the ladies were polite, good-tempered, and obliging, and treated me with the utmost hospitality and respect. Among others, I contracted a friendship with Madame la Comtesse de C. and her two daughters, who were very amiable young ladies, and became intimate with the Princess C. and Countess W., Lady of the Bedchamber to the Queen of Hungary, and a great favourite of the Governor, Monsieur D. H., in whose house she lived with his wife, who was also a lady of a very engaging disposition. Soon after I had fixed my habitation in Brussels, the company at our hotel was increased by three officers, who professed themselves my admirers, and came from Ghent, with a view of soliciting my love. This triumvirate consisted of the Scotch Earl of, Lord R. M., and another young officer, the first was a man of a very genteel figure and amorous complexion, danced well, and had a great deal of good humour, with a mixture of vanity and self-conceit. The second had a good face, though a clumsy person, and a very sweet disposition, very much adapted for the sentimental passion of love. And the third, Mr. W. by name, was tall, thin, and well-bred, with a great stock of good nature and vivacity. These adventurers began their addresses in general acts of gallantry, that comprehended several of my female friends, with whom we used to engage in parties of pleasure, both in the city and the environs, which are extremely agreeable. When they thought they had taken the preliminary steps of securing themselves in my good opinion and esteem, they agreed to go on without further delay, and that Lord, should make the first attack upon my heart. He accordingly laid siege to me, with such warmth and assiduity, that I believe he deceived himself, and began to think he was actually in love, though, at bottom, he felt no impulse that deserved the sacred name though I discouraged him in the beginning. He persecuted me with his addresses, he always sat by me at dinner, and imparted a thousand trifles in continual whispers, which attracted the notice of the company so much, that I began to fear his behaviour would give rise to some report to my prejudice, and therefore avoided him with the utmost caution. Notwithstanding all my care, however, he found means one night, while my maid, who lay in my room, went downstairs, to get into my chamber after I was abed. Upon which, I started up, and told him, that, if he should approach me, I would alarm the house, for I never wanted courage and resolution. Perceiving my displeasure, he kneeled by the bedside, begged I would have pity on his sufferings, and swore I should have cut Blanche to the utmost extent of his fortune. To these proposals I made no other reply, but that of protesting I would never speak to him again, if he did not quit my apartment that moment, upon which he thought proper to withdraw, and I never afterwards gave him an opportunity of speaking to me on the same subject. So that, in a few weeks, he separated himself from our society, though the ladies of Brussels considered him as my lover, because, of all the other officers, he was their greatest favourite. His lordship being thus repulsed, Mr. W. took the field, and assailed my heart in a very different manner. He said he knew not how to make love, but was a man of honour, and would keep the secret, and so forth. To this cavalier address I answered, that I was not angry as I otherwise should have been, at his blunt declaration, because I found by his own confession, he did not know what was due to the sex, and my unhappy situation in some shape excused him for a liberty which he would not have dreamed of taking, had not my misfortunes encouraged his presumption. But I would deal with him in his own way, and, far from assuming the prude, frankly assured him, that he was not at all to my taste, hoping he would consider my dislike as a sufficient reason to reject his love. Lord R. began to feel the symptoms of a genuine passion, which he carefully cherished in silence, being naturally diffident and bashful, but, by the very means he used to conceal it from my observation, I plainly discerned the situation of his heart, and was not at all displeased at the progress I had made in his inclinations. Meanwhile he cultivated my acquaintance with great assiduity and respect, attended me in all my excursions, and particularly in an expedition to Antwerp, with two other gentlemen, where, in downright gay art de coeur, we sat for our pictures, which were drawn in one piece, one of the party being represented in the dress of a hussar, and another in that of a running footman. This incident I mention, because the performance, which is now in my possession, gave birth to a thousand groundless reports circulated in England at our expense. It was immediately after this jaunt that Lord R. began to disclose his passion, though he, at the same time, started such objections as seemed to extinguish his hopes, lamenting that, even if he should have the happiness to engage my affections, his fortune was too inconsiderable to support us against the efforts of Lord, should he attempt to interrupt our felicity, and that he himself was obliged to follow the motions of the army. In short, he seemed to consider my felicity more than his own, and behaved with such delicacy, as gradually made an impression on my heart. 
so that, when we parted, we agreed to renew our correspondence in England. In the midst of these agreeable amusements, which I enjoyed in almost all the different towns of Flanders, I happened to be at Ghent one day, sitting among a good deal of company, in one of their hotels, when a post-chaise stopped at the gate, upon which we went to the windows to satisfy our curiosity, when who should step out of the convenience, but my little insignificant lord. I no sooner announced him to the company, than all the gentlemen asked whether they should stay and protect me, or withdraw, and when I assured them that their protection was not necessary, one and all them retired, the Lord R.M. went no farther than a parlour below, being determined to screen me against all violence and compulsion. I sent a message to my Lord, desiring him to walk up into my apartment, but although his sole errand was to see and carry me off, he would not venture to accept of my invitation, till he had demanded me in form from the governor of the place. That gentleman, being altogether a stranger to his person and character, referred him to the commanding officer of the English troops, who was a man of honour, and, upon his lordship's application, pretended to doubt his identity, observing, that he had always heard Lord, represented as a jolly, corpulent man. He gave him to understand, however, that even granting him to be the person, I was by no means subject to military law, unless he could prove that I had ever listed in His Majesty's service. Thus disappointed in his endeavours, he returned to the inn, and, with much persuasion, trusted himself in my dining-room, after having stationed his attendants at the door, in case of accidents. When I asked what had procured me the honour of this visit, he told me, his business and intention were to carry me home. This declaration produced a conference, in which I argued the case with him, and matters were accommodated for the present, by my promising to be in England some time in September, on condition that he would permit me to live by myself, as before, and immediately order the arrears of my pin money to be paid. He assented to everything I proposed, returned in peace to his own country, and the deficiencies of my allowance were made good, while I returned to Brussels, where I stayed until my departure for England, which I regulated in such a manner as was consistent with my engagement. I took lodgings in Paul Mall, and, sending for my lord, convinced him of my punctuality, and put him in mind of his promise, when, to my utter astonishment and confusion, he owned, that his promise was no more than a decoy to bring me over, and that I must lay my account with living in his house like a dutiful and obedient wife. I heard him with the indignation such treatment deserved, upbraiding him with his perfidious dealing, which I told him would have determined me against cohabitation with him had I not been already resolved, and, being destitute of all resource, repaired to Bath, where I afterwards met with Mr. D. and Mr. R., two gentlemen who had been my fellow passengers in the yacht from Flanders, and treated me with great friendship and politeness, without either talking or thinking of love. With these gentlemen, who were as idle as myself, I went to the Jubilee at Preston, which was no other than a great number of people assembled in a small town, extremely ill-accommodated, to partake of diversions that were bad imitations of plays, concerts, and masquerades. If the world should place to the account of my indiscretion my travelling in this manner with gentlemen to whom I had no particular attachment, let it also be considered, as an alleviation, that I always lived in terror of my lord, and consequently was often obliged to shift my quarters, so that, my finances being extremely slender, I stood the more in need of assistance and protection. I was, besides, young, inconsiderate, and so simple, as to suppose the figure of an ugly man would always secure me from censure on his account, neither did I ever dream of any man's addresses, until he made an actual declaration of his love. Upon my return to Bath, I was again harassed by Lord, who came thither accompanied by my father, whom I was very glad to see, though he importuned me to comply with my husband's desire, and for the future keep measures with the world. This remonstrance about living with my Lord, which he constantly repeated, was the only instance of his unkindness which I ever felt. But all his admonitions were not a force sufficient to shake my resolution in that particular, though the debate continued so late, that I told his lordship, it was high time to retire, for I could not accommodate him with a bed. He then gave me to understand, that he would stay where he was, upon which my father took his leave, on pretense of looking out for a lodging for himself. The little gentleman being now left with me, began to discover some signs of apprehension in his looks, but, mustering up all his resolution, he went to the door, called up three of his servants, whom he placed as sentinels upon the stairs, and flounced into my elbow chair, where he resigned himself to rest. Intending to go to bed, I thought it was but just and decent that I should screen myself from the intrusion of his footman, and with that view bolted the door. Lord, hearing himself locked in, started up in the utmost terror and consternation, kicked the door with his heel, and screamed aloud, as if he had been in the hands of an assassin. 
My father, who had not yet quitted the house, hearing these outcries, ran upstairs again, and, coming through my bedchamber into the dining room where we were, found me almost suffocated with laughter, and his heroic son-in-law staring like one who had lost his wits, with his hair standing on end. When my father asked the meaning of his exclamations, he told him, with all the symptoms of dismay, that I had locked him in, and he did not understand such usage. But I explained the whole mystery, by saying, I had bolted the door because I did not like the company of his servants, and could not imagine the cause of his panic, unless he thought I designed to ravish him, an insult than which nothing was farther from my intention. My father himself could scarce refrain from laughing at his ridiculous fear, but, seeing him in great confusion, took pity on his condition, and carried him off to his own lodgings, after I had given my word that I could not attempt to escape, but give him audience next morning. I accordingly kept my promise, and found means to persuade them to leave me at my own discretion. Next day I was rallied upon the stratagem I had contrived to frighten Lord, and a thousand idle stories were told about this adventure, which happened literally as I have related it. From Bath I betook myself to a small house near Lincoln, which I had hired of the D of A, because a country life suited best with my income, which was no more than four hundred pounds a year, and that not well paid. I continued some months in this retirement, and saw no company, except Lord Arem, who lived in the neighborhood, and visited me twice, till, finding myself indisposed, I was obliged to remove to London, and took lodgings in Maddox Street, where my garrison was taken by storm by my lord, and his steward, reinforced by Mr. L. V., who, as my lord told me, had a subsidy of five and twenty pounds before he would take the field, and a couple of hardy footmen. This formidable band rushed into my apartment, laid violent hands upon me, dragged me downstairs without gloves or a cloak, and, thrusting me into a coach that stood at the door, conveyed me to my lord's lodgings in Gloucester Street. Upon this occasion, his lordship courageously drew his sword upon my woman, who attempted to defend me from his insults, and, in all probability, would have intimidated him from proceeding, for he looked pale and aghast. His knees knocked together, and he breathed thick and hard, with his nostrils dilated, as if he had seen a ghost. But he was encouraged by his mercenary associate, who, for the five and twenty pounds, stood by him in the day of trouble, and spirited him on to this gallant enterprise. In consequence of this exploit, I was cooped up in a paltry apartment in Gloucester Street, where I was close beset by his lordship and his worthy steward Mr. H., with a set of servants that were the creatures of this fellow, of whom my lord himself stood in awe, so that I could not help thinking myself in Newgate, among thieves and ruffians. To such a degree did my terror avail, that I actually believed I was in danger of being poisoned, and would not receive any sustenance, except from the hands of one harmless-looking fellow, a foreigner, who, was my lord's valet de chamber. I will not pretend to say my fears were just, but such was my opinion of H., that I never doubted he would put me out of the way, if he thought my life interfered with his interest. On the second day of my imprisonment, I was visited by the Duke of Val, a friend of my lord, who found me sitting upon a trunk, in a poor little dining room filled with lumber, and lighted with two bits of tallow candle, which had been left overnight. He perceived in my face a mixture of rage, indignation, terror, and despair. He compassionated my sufferings, though he could not alleviate my distress any other way than by interceding with my tyrant to mitigate my oppression. Nevertheless, I remained eleven days in this uncomfortable situation. I was watched like a criminal all day, and one of the servants walked from one room to another all night, in the nature of a patrol, while my lord, who lay in the chamber above me, got out of bed and tripped to the window at the sound of every coach that chanced to pass through the street. H., who was consummate in the arts of a sycophant, began to court my favor, by condoling my affliction, and assuring me, that the only method by which I could regain my liberty was a cheerful compliance with the humor of my lord. I was fully convinced of the truth of this observation, and, though my temper is altogether averse to dissimulation, attempted to affect an air of serenity and resignation. But this disguise, I found, would not answer my purpose, and therefore I had recourse to the assistance of my maid, who was permitted to attend me in my confinement. With her I frequently consulted about the means of accomplishing my escape. In consequence of our deliberations, she directed a coach and six to be ready at a certain part of the town, and to wait for me three days in the same place, in case I could not come before the expiration of that term. This previous measure being taken according to my instructions, the next necessary step was to elude the vigilance of my guard, and in this manner did I effectuate my purpose. Being by this time indulged in the liberty of going out in the coach for the benefit of the air, attended by two footmen, 
who had orders to watch all my motions, I made use of this privilege one forenoon, when Lord, expected some company to dinner, and bade the coachman drive to the lodgings of a man who wrote with his mouth, intending to give my spies the slip, on pretense of seeing this curiosity, but they were too alert in their duty to be thus outwitted, and followed me upstairs into the very apartment. Disappointed in this hope, I resolved another scheme, which was attended with success. I bought some olives at an oil shop, and, telling the servants I would proceed to St. James's Gate, and take a turn in the park, broke one of the bottles by the way, complained of the misfortune when I was set down, and desired my coach might be cleaned before my return. While my attendants were employed in this office, I tripped across the parade to the horse guards, and chanced to meet with an acquaintance in the park, who said, he saw by my countenance that I was upon some expedition. I owned his suspicion was just, but, as I had not time to relate particulars, I quickened my pace, and took possession of a hackney coach, in which I proceeded to the vehicle I had appointed to be in waiting. While I thus compassed my escape, there was nothing but perplexity and confusion at home, dinner was delayed till six o'clock, my lord ran half the town over in quest of his equipage, which at last returned, with an account of my elopement. My maid was brought to the question, and grievously threatened, but, like all the women I ever had, remained unshaken in her fidelity. In the meantime, I travelled night and day towards my retreat in Lincolnshire, of which his lordship had not, as yet, got the least intelligence, and as my coachman was but an inexperienced driver, I was obliged to make use of my own skill in that exercise, and direct his endeavours the whole way, without venturing to go to bed, or take the least repose, until I reached my own habitation. There I lived in peace and tranquillity for the space of six weeks, when I was alarmed by one of my lord's myrmidons, who came into the neighbourhood, blustering and swearing that he would carry me off either dead or alive. It is not to be supposed that I was perfectly easy when I was made acquainted with his purpose and declaration, as my whole family consisted of no more than a couple of women and one footman. However, I summoned up my courage, which had been often dried, and never forsook me in the day of danger, and sent him word, that, if ever he should presume to approach my house, I would order him to be shot without ceremony. The fellow did not choose to put me to the trial, and returned to town without his errand, but as the place of my abode was now discovered, I laid my account with having a visit from his employer, I therefore planted spies upon the road, with a promise of reward to him who should bring me the first intelligence of his lordship's approach. Accordingly, I was one morning apprised of his coming, and, mounting horse immediately, with my woman and valet, away we rode, in defiance of winter. In two days I traversed the wilds of Lincolnshire and hundreds of Essex, crossed the river at Tilbury, breakfasted at Chatham, by the help of a guide and moonlight arrived at Dover the same evening, embarked for Calais, in which place I found myself next day at two o'clock in the afternoon, and being heartily tired with my journey, betook myself to rest. My maid, who was not able to travel with such expedition, followed me at an easier pace, and the footman was so astonished at my perseverance, that he could not help asking me upon the road, if ever I was weary in my life. Certain it is, my spirits and resolution have enabled me to undergo fatigues that are almost incredible. From Calais I went to Brussels, where I again set up my rest in private lodgings, was again perfectly well received by the fashionable people of that place, and, by the interest of my friends, obtained the Queen of Hungary's protection against the persecution of my husband, while I should reside in the Austrian Netherlands. Thus secured, I lived uncensured, conversing with the English company, with which this city was crowded, but spent the most agreeable part of my time with the Countess of Kalmburg, in whose house I generally dined and supped. And I also contracted an intimacy with the Princess of Kem, who was a great favourite with Madame Tarak, the Governor's Lady. I had not been long in this happy situation, when I was disturbed by the arrival of Lord, who demanded me of the Governor, but finding me sheltered from his power, he set out for Vienna, and, in consequence of his representations, strengthened with the Duke of Venice name, my protection was withdrawn. But, before this application, he had gone to the camp, and addressed himself to my Lord Stair, who was my particular friend and ally by my first marriage, desiring he would compel me to return to his house. His Lordship told him, that I was in no shape subject to his command, but invited him to dinner, with a view of diverting himself and company at the expense of his guest. In the evening, he was plied with so many bumpers to my health, that he became intoxicated, and extremely obstreperous, insisted upon seeing Lord Stair after he was retired to rest, and quarrelled with Lord D., who being a tall, large, raw-boned Scotchman, could have swallowed him at one mouthful, but he thought he might venture to challenge him, 
in hopes of being put under arrest by the general. Though he reckoned without his host, Lord Stair knew his disposition, and, in order to punish his presumption, winked at the affair. The challenger, finding himself mistaken in his conjecture, got up early in the morning, and went off post for Vienna. And Lord Stair desired a certain man of quality to make me a visit, and give me an account of his behaviour. Being now deprived of my protection and pin money, which my generous husband would no longer pay, I was reduced to great difficulty and distress. The Duchess de Remberg, Lord G., and many other persons of distinction, interceded in my behalf with His Majesty, who was then abroad, but he refused to interpose between man and wife. The Countess of Kallenberg wrote a letter to my father, in which she represented my uncomfortable situation, and undertook to answer for my conduct, in case he would allow me a small annuity, on which I could live independent of Lord, who, by all accounts, was a wretch with whom I could never enjoy the least happiness or quiet, otherwise she would be the first to advise me to an accommodation. She gave him to understand, that her character was neither doubtful nor obscure, and that, if my conduct there had not been irreproachable, she should not have taken me under her protection. That, as I proposed to board in a convent, a small sum would answer my occasions, but, if that should be denied, I would actually go to service, or take some other desperate step, to avoid the man who was my bane and aversion. To this kind remonstrance my father answered that his fortune would not allow him to assist me. He had now a young family, and that I ought, at all events, to return to my husband. By this time, such was the extremity of my circumstances, that I was forced to pour in my clothes, and every trifling trinket in my possession, and even to descend so far as to solicit Mr. S. for a loan of fifty pounds, which he refused. Thus was I deserted in my distress by two persons, to whom, in the season of my affluence, my purse had been always open. Nothing so effectually subdues a spirit unused to supplicate, as want. Repulsed in this manner, I had recourse to Lord B., who was also, it seems, unable to relieve my necessities. This mortification I deserved at his hands, though he had once put it in my power to be above all such paltry applications, and I should not have been compelled to the disagreeable task of troubling my friends, had not I voluntarily resigned what he formerly gave me. As to the other gentleman to whom I addressed myself on this occasion, I think he might have shown more regard to my situation, not only for the reasons already mentioned, but because he knew me too well to be ignorant of what I must have suffered in condescending to make such a request. Several officers, who guessed my adversity, generously offered to supply me with money, but I could not bring myself to make use of their friendship, or even to own my distress, except to one person, of whom I borrowed a small sum. To crown my misfortunes, I was taken very ill at a time when there was no other way of avoiding the clutches of my persecutor but by a precipitate flight. In this emergency, I applied to a worthy gentleman of Brussels, a very good friend of mine, but no lover. I say no lover, because every man is supposed to act in that capacity who befriends a young woman in distress. This generous Fleming set out with me in a night from Brussels, and conducted me to the frontier of France. Being very much indisposed both in mind and body when I was obliged to undertake this expedition, I should in all probability have sunk under the fatigue of travelling, had not my spirits been kept up by the conversation of my companion, who was a man of business and consequence, and undertook to manage my affairs in such a manner as would enable me to re-establish my residence in the place I had left. He was young and active, attended me with the utmost care and assiduity, and left nothing undone which he thought would contribute to my ease and satisfaction. I believe his friendship for me was a little tinctured with another passion, but he was married, and lived very well with his wife, who was also my friend, so that he knew I would never think of him in the light of a lover. Upon our arrival at Valentine, he accommodated me with a little money, for a little was all I would take, and returned to his own city, after we had settled a correspondence by letters. I was detained a day or two in this place by my indisposition, which increased, but, nevertheless, proceeded to Paris, to make interest for a protection from the King of France, which that monarch graciously accorded me, in three days after my first application, and his minister sent orders to all the governors and intendants of the province towns, to protect me against the efforts of Lord, in whatever place I should choose to reside. Having returned my thanks at Versailles for this favour, and tarried a few days at Paris, which was a place altogether unsuitable to the low ebb of my fortune, I repaired to Lyle, where I intended to fix my habitation, and my disorder recurred with such violence, that I was obliged to send for a physician, who seemed to have been a disciple of Sangrado, for he scarce left a drop of blood in my body, and yet I found myself never a whit the better. Indeed, I was so much exhausted by these evacuations, and my constitution so much impaired by fatigue and perturbation of mind, 
that I had no other hope of recovering but that of reaching England, and putting myself under the direction of a physician on whose ability I could depend. With this doubtful prospect, therefore, I determined to attempt a return to my native air, and actually departed from Lyle, in such a melancholy, enfeebled condition, that I had almost fainted when I was put into the coach. But before I resolved upon this journey, I was reduced to the utmost exigence of fortune, so that I could scarce afford to buy provisions, had it been in my power to eat, and should not have been able to defray my travelling expenses, had I not been generously befriended by Lord R. H., who, I am sure, would have done anything for my case and accommodation, though he has unjustly incurred the imputation of being parsimonious, and I had no reason to expect any such favour at his hands. In this deplorable state of health I was conveyed to Cali, being all the way, as it were, in the arms of death, without having swallowed the least sustenance on the road. So much was my indisposition augmented by the fatigue of the journey, that I swooned when I was brought into the inn, and had almost expired before I could receive the least assistance or advice. However, my spirits were a little revived by some bread and wine, which I took at the persuasion of a French surgeon, who, chancing to pass by the door, was called up to my relief. Having sent my servant to Brussels, to take care of my clothes, I embarked in the packet boat, and by the time we arrived at Dover was almost in extremity. Here I found return coach, in which I was carried to London, and was put to bed at the house we put up at, more dead than alive. The people of the inn sent for an apothecary, who administered some cordial that recalled me to life, and, when I recovered the use of speech, I told him who I was, and desired him to wait upon Dr. S., and inform him of my situation. A young girl, who was niece to the landlord's wife, seeing me unattended, made a tender of her service to me, and I accepted the offer, as well as of a lodging in the apothecary's house, to which I was conveyed as soon as my strength would admit of my removal. There I was visited by my physician, who was shocked to find me in such a dangerous condition. However, having considered my case, he perceived that my indisposition proceeded from the calamities I had undergone, and encouraged me with the hope of a speedy cure, provided I could be kept easy and undisturbed. I was accordingly attended with all imaginable care, my lord's name being never mentioned in my hearing, because I considered him as the fatal source of all my misfortunes, and in a month I recovered my health, by the great skill and tenderness of my doctor, who now finding me strong enough to encounter fresh troubles, endeavoured to persuade me, that it would be my wisest step to return to my husband, whom at that time he had often occasion to see. But I rejected his proposal, commencing a new lawsuit for separation and took a small house in St. James's Square. About this time my woman returned from Brussels, but without my clothes, which were detained on account of the money I owed in that place, and, asking her dismission from my service, set up shop for herself. I had not lived many weeks in my new habitation, when my persecutor renewed his attempts to make himself master of my person, but I had learned from experience to redouble my vigilance, and he was frustrated in all his endeavours. I was again happy in the conversation of my former acquaintance, and visited by a great number of gentlemen, mostly persons of probity and sense, who cultivated my friendship, without any other motive of attachment. Not that I was unsolicited on the article of love. That it was a theme on which I never wanted orators, and could I have prevailed upon myself to profit by the advances that were made, I might have managed my opportunities so as to have set fortune at defiance for the future. But I was none of these economists who can sacrifice their hearts to interested considerations. One evening, while I was conversing with three or four of my friends, my lawyer came in, and told me he had something of consequence to impart, upon which all the gentlemen but one went away. Then he gave me to understand, that my suit would immediately come to trial, and, though he hoped the best, the issue was uncertain. That, if it should be given against me, the decision would inspire my lord with fresh spirits to disturb my peace, and, therefore, it would be convenient for me to retire, until the affair should be brought to a determination. I was very much disconcerted at this intelligence, and the gentleman who stayed, perceiving my concern, asked what I intended to do, or if he could serve me in any shape, and desired to know whether I proposed to retreat. I affected to laugh, and answered, to a garret, I believe. To this overstrained reasoning he replied, that if I should, his friendship and regard would find a way to my apartment, and I had no reason to doubt the sincerity of his declaration. We consulted about the measures I should take, and I determined to remove into the country where I was soon favoured with a letter from him, wherein he expressed the infinite pleasure he had in being able to assure me that my suit had been successful, and that I might appear again with great safety. Accordingly, I returned to town in his coach and six, which he had sent for my convenience, and the same evening went with him to the masquerade, 
where we passed the night very agreeably, his spirits, as well as mine, being elevated to a joyous pitch by the happy event of my process. This gentleman was a person of great honor, worth, and good nature, he loved me extremely, but did not care that I should know the extent of his passion. On the contrary, he endeavored to persuade me. He had laid it down as a maxim, that no woman should ever have power enough over his heart to give him the least pain or disquiet. In short, he had made a progress in my affection, and to his generosity was I indebted for my subsistence two whole years, during which, he was continually professing this philosophic indifference, while, at the same time, he was giving me daily assurances of his friendship and esteem, and treated me with incessant marks of the most passionate love, so that I concluded his intention was cold, though his temper was warm. Considering myself as an encumbrance upon his fortune, I redoubled my endeavours to obtain a separate maintenance from my lord, and removed from St. James's Square to lodgings at Kensington, where I had not long enjoyed myself in tranquillity, before I was interrupted by a very unexpected visit. While I was busy one day dressing in my dining room, I found his lordship at my elbow before I was aware of his approach, although his coach was at the door, and the house already in the possession of his servants. He accosted me in a usual style, as if we had parted the night before, and I answered him with an appearance of the same careless familiarity, desiring him to sit down, while I retreated to my chamber, locked the door, and fairly went to bed, being perhaps the first woman who went thither for protection from the insults of a man. Here, then, I immured myself with my faithful Abigail. My lord finding me secured, knocked at the door, and through the keyhole begged to be admitted, assuring me that all he wanted was a conference. I desired to be excused, though I believed his assurance, but I had no inclination to converse with him, because I knew from experience the nature of his conversation, which was so disagreeable and tormenting, that I would have exchanged it at any time for a good beating, and thought myself a gainer by the bargain. However, he persisted in his importunities to such a degree, that I assented to his proposal, on condition that the Duke of L. should be present at the interview, and he immediately sent a message for his grace, while I, in peace, at my breakfast, conveyed in a basket, which was hoisted up to the window of my bedchamber. The Duke was so kind as to come at my lord's request, and, before I would open the door, gave me his word, that I should be protected from all violence and compulsion. Thus assured, they were permitted to enter. My little gentleman, sitting down by my bedside, began to repeat the old hackneyed arguments he had formerly used, with a view of inducing me to live with him, and I, on my side, repeated my former objections, or pretended to listen to his representations, while my imagination was employed in contriving the means of effecting an escape, as the Duke easily perceived by my countenance. Finding all his remonstrances ineffectual, he quitted the chamber, and left his cause to the eloquence of his grace, who sat with me a whole half-hour, without exerting himself much in behalf of his client, because he knew I was altogether obstinate and determined on that score, but joked upon the behaviour of his lordship, who, though jealous of most people, had left him alone with me in my bedchamber, observing, that he must neither have great confidence in his virtue, or a very bad opinion of him otherwise. In short, I found means to defer the categorical answer till next day, and invited the Duke and his lordship to dine with me tomorrow. My wise yoke fellow seemed to doubt the sincerity of this invitation, and was very much disposed to keep possession of my house. But, by the persuasion of his grace, and the advice of H., who was his chief counsellor and back, he was prevailed upon to take my word, and for the present left me. They were no sooner retired, than I rose with great expedition, packed up my clothes, and took shelter in Essex for the first time. Next day, my lord and his noble friend came to dinner, according to appointment, and being informed of my escape by my woman, whom I left in the house, his lordship discovered some signs of discontent, and insisted upon seeing my papers, upon which my maid produced a parcel of bills which I owed to different people. Notwithstanding this disappointment, he sat down to what was provided for dinner, and with great deliberation ate up a leg of lamb, the best part of a fowl, and something else, which I do not now remember, and then very peaceably went away, giving my maid an opportunity of following me to the place of my retreat. My intention was to have sought refuge, as formerly, in another country, but I was prevented from putting my design in execution by a fit of illness, during which I was visited by my physician and some of my own relations, particularly a distant cousin of mine, whom my lord had engaged in his interests, by promising to recompense her amply, if she could persuade me to comply with his desire. In this office she was assisted by the doctor, who was my friend, and a man of sense, for whom I have the most perfect esteem, though he and I have often differed in point of opinion. 
In a word, I was exposed to the incessant importunities of all my acquaintance, which, added to the desperate circumstances of my fortune, compelled me to embrace the terms that were offered, and I again returned to the domestic duties of a wife. I was conducted to my lord's house by an old friend of mine, a gentleman turned of fifty, of admirable parts and understanding, he was a pleasing companion, cheerful and humane, and had acquired a great share of my esteem and respect. In a word, his advice had great weight in my deliberations, because it seemed to be the result of experience and disinterested friendship. Without all doubt, he had an unfeigned concern for my welfare, but, being an admirable politician, his scheme was to make my interest coincide with his own inclinations, for I had, unwittingly, made an innovation upon his heart, and as he thought I should hardly favour his passion while I was at liberty to converse with the rest of my admirers, he counselled me to surrender that freedom, well knowing that my lord would be easily persuaded to banish all his rivals from the house, in which case, he did not doubt of his being able to insinuate himself into my affections, because he laid it down as an eternal truth, that, if any two persons of different sexes were obliged to live together in a desert, where they would be excluded from all other human intercourse, they would naturally and inevitably contract an inclination for each other. How just this hypothesis might be, I leave to the determination of the curious, though, if I may be allowed to judge from my own disposition, a couple so situated would be apartment to imbibe mutual disgusts from the nature and necessity of their union, unless their association was at first the effect of reciprocal affection and esteem. Be this as it will, I honour the gentleman for his plan, which was ingeniously contrived, and artfully conducted, but I happened to have too much address for him in the sequel, cunning as he was, though at first I did not perceive his drift, and his lordship was much less likely to comprehend his meaning. Immediately after this new accommodation, I was carried to a country house belonging to my lord, and was simple enough to venture myself, unattended by any servant on whose integrity I could depend, in the hands of his lordship, and H., whose villainy I always dreaded, though, at this time, my apprehensions were considerably increased by recollecting, that it was not his interest to let me live in the house, lest his conduct should be inquired into, and by remembering that the very house to which we were going had been twice burnt down in a very short space of time not without suspicion of his having been the incendiary, on account of some box of writings which was lost in the conflagration. True it is, this imputation was never made good, and, perhaps, he was altogether innocent of the charge, which nevertheless affected my spirits in such a manner, as rendered me the most miserable of all mortals. In this terror did I remain, till my consternation was awakened by the arrival of Mr. B., a good-natured worthy man, whom my lord had invited to his house, and I thought would not see me ill-used. In a few weeks we were joined by Dr. S. and his lady, who visited us according to their promise, and it was resolved that we should set out for Tunbridge, on a party of pleasure, and at our return examine H.S. accounts. This last part of our scheme was not at all relished by our worthy steward, who therefore determined to overturn our whole plan, and succeeded accordingly. My lord, all of a sudden, declared himself against the jaunt we had projected, and insisted upon my staying at home without assigning any reason for this peremptory behaviour, his countenance being cloudy, and, for the space of three days, he did not open his mouth. At last, he one night entered my bedchamber, to which he now had free access, with his sword under his arm, and, if I remember aright, it was ready drawn. I could not help taking notice of this alarming circumstance, which shocked me the more, as it happened immediately after a gloomy fit of discontent. However, I seemed to overlook the incident, and, dismissing my maid, went to bed, because I was ashamed to acknowledge, even to my own heart, any dread of a person whom I despised so much. However, the strength of my constitution was not equal to the fortitude of my mind. I was taken ill, and the servants were obliged to be called up, while my lord himself, terrified at my situation, ran upstairs to Mrs. S., who was in bed, told her, with evident perturbation of spirits, that I was very much indisposed, and said, he believed I was frightened by his entering my chamber with his sword in hand. This lady was so startled at his information, that she ran into my apartment half naked, and as she went downstairs, asked what reason could induce him to have carried his sword with him. Upon which he gave her to understand, that his intention was to kill the bats. I believe and hope he had no other design than that of intimidating me, but when the affair happened, I was of a different opinion. Mrs. S., having put on her clothes, sat up all night by my bedside, and was so good as to assure me that she would not leave me until I should be safely delivered from the apprehensions that surrounded me in this house, to which she and the doctor had been the principal cause of my coming, for my lord had haunted and importuned them incessantly on this subject, protesting that he loved me with the most inviolable affection, 
and all he desired was, that I would sit at his table, manage his family, and share his fortune. By these professions, uttered with an air of honesty and good nature, he had imposed himself upon them for the best-tempered creature upon earth, and they used all their influence with me to take him into favor. This has been the case with a great many people, who had but a superficial knowledge of his disposition, but, in the course of their acquaintance, they have never failed to discern and acknowledge their mistake. The doctor, on his return from Tunbridge, to which place he had made a trip by himself, found me ill abed, and the whole family in confusion. Surprised and concerned at this disorder, he entered into expostulation with my lord, who owned, that the cause of his displeasure and disquiet was no other than jealousy. He had informed him, that I had been seen to walk out with Mr. Bell in a morning, and that our correspondence had been observed, with many additional circumstances, which were absolutely false and groundless. This imputation was no sooner understood, than it was resolved that the accuser should be examined in presence of us all. He accordingly appeared, exceedingly drunk, though it was morning, and repeated the articles of the charge, as an information he had received from a man who came from town to hang the bells, and was long ago returned to London. This was an instance of his cunning and address, which did not forsake him even in his hours of intoxication. Had he fixed the calumny on any one of the servants, he would have been confronted and detected in his falsehood. Nevertheless, though he could not be legally convicted, it plainly appeared that he was the author of this defamation, which incensed Mr. Bell to such a degree, that he could scarce be withheld from punishing him on the spot, by manual chastisement. However, he was prevailed upon to abstain from such immediate vengeance, as a step unworthy of his character, and the affair was brought to this issue, that his lordship should either part with me or Mr. H., for I was fully determined against living under the same roof with such an incendiary. This alternative being proposed, my lord dismissed his steward, and we returned to town with the doctor and Mrs. S., for I had imbibed such horror and aversion for this country seat, though one of the pleasantest in England, that I could not bear to live in it. We therefore removed to a house in Bond Street, where, according to the advice of my friends, I exerted my whole power and complaisance in endeavours to keep my husband in good humour, but was so unsuccessful in my attempts, that, if ever he was worse tempered, more capricious, or intolerable, at one time than at another, this was the season in which his ill humour predominated in the most rancorous degree. I was scarce ever permitted to stir abroad, saw nobody at home, but my old male friend, whom I have mentioned above, and the doctor, with his lady, from whose conversation, also, I was at last excluded. Nevertheless, I contrived to steal our meeting now and then with my late benefactor, for whom I entertained a great share of affection, exclusive of that gratitude that was due to his generosity. It was not his fault that I compromised matters with my lord, for he was as free of his purse as I was unwilling to use it. It would, therefore, have been unfriendly, unkind, and ungrateful in me, now that I was in affluence, to avoid all intercourse with the man who had supported me in adversity. I think people cannot be too shy and scrupulous in receiving favours, but once they are conferred, they ought never to forget the obligation. And I was never more concerned at any incident of my life, than at hearing that this gentleman did not receive a letter, in which I acknowledged the last proof of his friendship and liberality which I had occasion to use, because I have since learned that he suspected me of neglect. But to return to my situation in Bond Street. I bore it as well as I could for the space of three months, during which I lived in the midst of spies, who were employed to watch my conduct, and underwent every mortification that malice, power, and folly could inflict. Nay, so ridiculous, so unreasonable was my tyrant in his spleen, that he declared he would even be jealous of Heidegger, if there was no other man to incur his suspicion, he expected that I should spend my whole time with him tete -a -tete. when I sacrificed my enjoyment to these comfortable parties, he never failed to lay hold on some innocent expression of mine, which he made the foundation of a quarrel, and, when I strove to avoid these disagreeable misinterpretations by reading or writing, he incessantly teased and tormented me with the imputation of being peevish, sullen, and reserved. Harassed by this insufferable behaviour, I communicated my case to Dr. S. and his lady, intimating that I neither could nor would expose myself any longer to such usage. The doctor exhorted me to bear my fate with patience, and Mrs. S. was silent on the subject, so that I still hesitated between staying and going, when the doctor, being one night at supper, happened to have some words with my lord, who was so violently transported with passion, that I was actually afraid of going to bed with him, and next morning, when he awakened, there was such an expression of frantic wildness in his countenance, that I imagined he was actually distracted. This alarming circumstance confirmed me in my resolution of decamping, and I accordingly moved my quarters to a house in Sackville Street, 
where I had lodged when I was a widow. From thence I sent a message to the Duke of Val, desiring he would make my lord acquainted with the place of my abode, my reasons for removing, and my intention to defend myself against all his attempts. The first night of this separation I went to bed by myself with as much pleasure as a man would feel in going to bed to his mistress whom he had long solicited in vain, so rejoiced was I to be delivered from my obnoxious bedfellow. From these lodgings I soon moved to Brook Street, where I had not long enjoyed the sweets of my escape, when I was importuned to return, by a new steward whom my lord had engaged in the room of H. This gentleman, who bore a very fair character, made such judicious representations, and behaved so candidly in the discharge of his function, that I agreed he should act as umpire in the difference betwixt us, and once more a reconciliation was effected, though his lordship began to be dissatisfied even before the execution of our agreement, in consequence of which he attended me to Bath, whither I went for the benefit of my health, which was not a little impaired. This accommodation had a surprising effect upon my lover, who, notwithstanding his repeated declarations, that no woman should ever gain such an ascendancy over his heart as to be able to give him pain, suffered all the agonies of disappointed love, when he now found himself deprived of the opportunities of seeing me, and behaved very differently from what he had imagined he should. His words and actions were desperate, one of his expressions to me was, it is like twisting my heart strings, and tearing it out of my body. Indeed, I never should have acted this part had I foreseen what he would have suffered, but I protest I believed him, when he said otherwise, so much, that his declaration on that subject was the occasion of my giving him up, and it was now too late to retract. In our expedition to Bath, I was accompanied by a very agreeable young lady, with whom I passed my time very happily, amid the diversions of the place, which screened me, in a good measure, from the vexatious society of my hopeful partner. From this place we repaired to his seat in the country, where we spent a few months, and thence returned again to our house in Bond Street. Here, while I was confined to my bed by illness, it was supposed my indisposition was no other than a private lying in, though I was under the roof with my lord, and attended by his servants. While the distemper continued, my lord, to do him justice, behaved with all imaginable tenderness and care, and his concern on these occasions I have already mentioned as a strange inconsistency in his disposition. If his actions were at all accountable, I should think he took pains to fret me into a fever first, in order to manifest his love and humanity afterwards. When I recovered my strength and spirits, I went abroad, saw company, and should have been easy, had he been contented, but as my satisfaction increased, his good humour decayed, and he banished from his house, one by one, all the people whose conversation could have made my life agreeable. I often expostulated with him on his malignant behaviour, protesting my desire of living peaceably with him and begging he would not lay me under the necessity of changing my measures. He was deaf to all my remonstrances, though I warned him more than once of the event, persisted in his maxims of persecution, and, after repeated quarrels, I again left his house fully determined to suffer all sorts of extremity, rather than subject myself to the tyranny of his disposition. This year was productive of one fatal event, which I felt with the utmost sensibility of sorrow, and I shall always remember with regret colon I mean the death of Mr. B., with whom I had constantly maintained an intimate correspondence since the first commencement of our acquaintance. He was one of the most valuable men, and promised to be one of the brightest ornaments that this or any other age had produced. I enjoyed his friendship without reserve, and such was the confidence he reposed in my integrity, from long experience of my truth, that he often said he would believe my bare assertion, even though it should contradict the evidence of his own senses. These being the terms upon which we lived, it is not to be supposed that I bore the loss of him without repining. Indeed, my grief was unspeakable, and, though the edge of it be now smoothed by the lenient hand of time, I shall never cease to cherish his memory with the most tender remembrance. During the last period of my living with my lord, I had agreed to the expediency of obtaining an act of Parliament, which would enable him to pay his debts, on which occasion there was a necessity of cancelling a deed that subsisted between us, relating to a separate maintenance, to which, on certain provisions, I was entitled, and this was to be set aside, so far as it interfered with the above-mentioned scheme, while the rest of it should remain in force. When this affair was about to be transacted, my lord very generously insisted upon my concurrence in annulling the whole settlement, and, when I refused to comply with this demand, because this was the sole resource I had against his ill usage, he would not proceed in the execution of his plan, though, by dropping it, he hurt nobody but himself and he accused me of having receded from my word, after I had drawn him into considerable expense. This imputation of breaking my word, which I defy the whole world to prove I ever did, incensed me the more, 
as I myself had proposed the scheme for his service, although I knew the accomplishment of it would endanger the validity of my own settlement, and my indignation was still more augmented by the behavior of Mr. G., who had always professed regard for my interest, and upon my last accommodation with my lord, undertaken to effect a reconciliation between my father and me, but, when he was questioned about the particulars of this difference, and desired to declare whether his lordship or I was to blame, he declined the office of arbitrator, refused to be explicit upon the subject, and by certain shrewd hums and ha's, signified his disapprobation of my conduct. Yet this very man, when I imparted to him, in confidence, my intention of making another retreat, and frankly asked his opinion of my design, seemed to acquiesce in the justice of it in these remarkable words, Madame, if I thought or had hopes of my lord growing better, I would down on my knees to desire you to stay, but, as I have not, I say nothing. If he connived at my conduct in this particular, why should he disapprove of it when all I asked was but common justice? But he was a dependent, and therefore I excuse his phlegmatic, not to call it unfriendly, behavior. Indeed, he could not be too cautious of giving offense to his lordship, who sometimes made him feel the effects of that wrath which other people had kindled, particularly in consequence of a small adventure which happened about this very period of time. A very agreeable, sprightly, good-natured young man, a near relation of my lord, happening to be at our house one evening, when there was a fire in the neighborhood, we agreed to go and sup at the tavern en famille, and, having spent the evening with great mirth and good humor, this young gentleman, who was naturally facetious, in taking his leave, saluted us all round. My lord, who had before entertained some jealousy of his kinsman, was very much provoked by this trifling incident, but very prudently suppressed his displeasure till he returned to his own house, where his rage cooperating with the champagne he had drunk, inflamed him to such a degree of resolution, that he sprang upon the innocent G, and collared him with great fury, though he was altogether unconcerned in the cause of his indignation. This extravagant and frantic behavior, added to other grievances under which I labored, hastened my resolution of leaving him, and he, to this day, blames his relation as the immediate cause of my escape, whereas he ought to place it to the account of his own madness and indiscretion. When I retired to Park Street, he cautioned all my tradesmen, not even excepting my baker, against giving me credit, assuring them that he would not pay any debts I should contract, and the difficulties to which I was reduced, in consequence of this charitable declaration, together with the reflection of what I had suffered, and might undergo, from the caprice and barbarity of his disposition, affected my health so much, that I was again taken ill, and my life thought in danger. My constitution, however, got the better of my distemper, and I was ordered into the country by my physicians, for the benefit of the air, so that I found myself under the necessity of keeping two houses, when I was little able to support one, and set up my chariot, because I could not defray the expense of a hackney coach, for I had as much credit given me as I asked for, notwithstanding my lord's orders to the contrary. Having recruited my spirits in the country, I returned to town, and was visited by my friends, who never forsook me in adversity, and in the summer removed to a house in Essex, where I lived a few months in great tranquillity, unmolested by my tyrant, who sometimes gave me a whole year's respite. Here I used to ride and drive by turns, as my humor dictated, with horses which were lent me, and I had the company of my lover, and another gentleman, who was a very agreeable companion, and of singular service to me in the sequel. At last, my lord having received intelligence of the place of my abode, and his tormenting humor occurring, he set out for my habitation, and in the morning appeared in his coach and six, attended by Mr. G. and another person, whom he had engaged for the purpose, with several domestics armed. I immediately shut up my doors at his approach, and refused him admittance, which he endeavored to obtain by a succession of prayers and threats, but I was deaf to both, and resolved to hold out to the last. Seeing me determined, he began his attack, and his servants actually forced their way into the house, upon which I retreated upstairs, and fortified myself in my apartment, which the assailants stormed with such fury, that the door began to give way, and I retired into another room. Whilst I remained in this post, Mr. G. demanded a parley, in which he begged I would favor my lord with an interview, otherwise he knew not what might be the consequence. To this remonstrance I replied, that I was not disposed to comply with his request, and though their design should be murder, I was not at all afraid of death. Upon this declaration they renewed their attacks, which they carried on with indifferent success till the afternoon, when my lord, as if he had been at play, sent a formal message to me, desiring that all hostilities should cease, till after both parties should have dined. At the same time, 
my own servants came for instructions, and I ordered them to let him have everything which he should call for, as far as the house would afford. He did not fail to make use of this permission, but sitting down with his companions, ate up my dinner without hesitation, after he had paid me the compliment of desiring to know what he should send up to my apartment. Far from having any stomach to partake of his meal, I sat solitary upon my bed, in a state of melancholy expectation. Having fastened the door of the outward room for my security, while I kept my chamber open for the convenience of air, the weather being excessively hot. His lordship, having indulged his appetite, resumed his attempt, and all of a sudden I heard a noise in the next room, upon which I started up, and perceiving that he had got into my antechamber, by the help of a bench that stood under the window, I flung to the door of my room, which I locked with great expedition, and opening another that communicated with the staircase, ran out of the house, through a crowd of more than a hundred people, whom this fray had gathered together. Being universally beloved in the neighborhood, and respected by my lord's servants, I passed among them untouched, and took refuge in a neighboring cottage, while his lordship bawled and roared for assistance, being afraid to come out as he had gone in. Without waiting for his deliberations, I changed clothes with the poor woman who had given me shelter, and in her blue apron and straw hat sallied out into the fields, intending to seek protection in the house of a gentleman not far off, though I was utterly ignorant of the road that led me to it. However, it was my good fortune to meet with a farmer, who undertook to conduct me to the place, otherwise I should have missed my way, and in all probability lain in the fields, for by this time it was eight o'clock at night. Under the direction of this guide, I traversed hedges and ditches, for I would not venture to travel in the highway, lest I should fall into the hands of my pursuer, and after I had actually tumbled into the mire, and walked six or seven long miles by the help of a good spirit, which never failed me on such occasions, I arrived at the place, and rung the bell at the garden gate for admittance. Seeing my figure, which was very uncouth, together with my draggled condition, they denied me entrance, but, when they understood who I was, immediately opened the door, and I was hospitably entertained, after having been the subject of mirth, on account of my dress and adventure. Next day I returned and took possession of my house again, where I resumed my former amusements, which I enjoyed in quiet for the space of a whole month, waiting with resignation for the issue of my lawsuit, when, one afternoon, I was apprised of his lordship's approach by one of my spies, whom I always employed to reconnoitre the road, and so fortunate was I in the choice of these scouts, that I never was betrayed by one of them, though they were often bribed for that purpose. I no sooner received this intelligence, than I ordered my horse to be saddled, and, mounting, rode out of sight immediately, directing my course a different way from the London road. I had not long proceeded in this track, when my career was all of a sudden stopped by a five-bar gate, which, after some hesitation, I resolved to leap, my horse being an old hunter, if I should find myself pursued. However, with much difficulty I made a shift to open it, and arrived in safety at the house of my very good friend Mr. G., who, being a justice of the peace, had promised me his protection, if it should be wanted. Thus secured for the present, I sent out spies to bring information of his lordship's proceedings, and understood that he had taken possession of my house, turned my servants adrift, and made himself master of all my movables, clothes, and papers. As for the papers, they were of no consequence, but of clothes I had a good stock, and, when I had reason to believe that he did not intend to relinquish his conquest, I thought it was high time for me to remove to a greater distance from his quarters. Accordingly, two days after my escape, I set out at eleven o'clock at night, in a chariot and four, which I borrowed of my friend, attended by a footman, who was a stout fellow, and well armed, I myself being provided with a brace of good pistols, which I was fully determined to use against any person who should presume to lay violent hands upon me except my lord, for whom a less mortal weapon would have sufficed, such as a bodkin or a tinder box. Nothing could be farther from my intention than the desire of hurting any living creature, much less my husband. My design was only to defend myself from cruelty and oppression, which I knew, by fatal experience, would infallibly be my lot, should he get me into his power. And I thought I had as good a right to preserve my happiness, as that which every individual has to preserve his life especially against a set of ruffians, who were engaged to rob me of it for a little dirty lucre. In the midst of our journey, the footman came up, and told me I was dogged, upon which I looked out, and, seeing a man riding by the chariot side, presented one of my pistols out of my window, and preserved that posture of defence, until he thought proper to retreat, and rid me of the fears that attended his company. I arrived in town, and, changing my equipage, hired an open chaise, in which, 
Though I was almost starved with cold, I travelled to Reading, which I reached by ten next morning, and from thence proceeded farther in the country, with a view of taking refuge with Mrs. C., who was my particular friend. Here I should have found shelter, though my lord had been beforehand with me, and endeavoured to prepossess her against my conduct, had not the house been crowded with company, among whom I could not possibly have been concealed, especially from her brother, who was an intimate friend of my persecutor. Things being thus situated, I enjoyed but a very short interview with her, in which her sorrow and perplexity on my account appeared with great expression in her countenance, and, though it was not in her power to afford me the relief I expected, she, in the most genteel manner, sent after me a small sum of money, thinking that, considering the hurry in which I left my house, I might have occasion for it on the road. I was, by this time, benumbed with cold, fatigued with travelling, and almost fretted to death by my disappointment. However, this was no time to indulge despondence, since nobody could or would assist me, I stood the more in need of my own resolution and presence of mind. After some deliberation, I steered my course back to London, and, being unwilling to return by the same road in which I came, as well as impatient to be at the end of my journey, I chose the Bagshot way, and ventured to cross the heath by moonlight. Here I was attacked by a footpad armed with a broad sword, who came up and demanded my money. My stock amounted to twelve guineas, and I foresaw that should I be stripped of the whole sum, I could not travel without discovering who I was, and consequently running the risk of being detected by my pursuer. On these considerations, I gave the fellow three guineas and some silver, with which he was so far from being satisfied, that he threatened to search me for more, but I ordered the coachman to proceed, and by good fortune escaped that ceremony, though I was under some apprehension of being overtaken with a pistol bullet in my flight, and therefore held down my head in the chaise, in imitation of some great men, who are said to have ducked in the same manner in the day of battle. My fears happened to be disappointed, I lay at an inn upon the road, and the next day arrived in town, in the utmost difficulty and distress, for I knew not where to fix my habitation, and was destitute of all means of support. In this dilemma, I applied to my lawyer, who recommended me to the house of a tradesman in Westminster, where I lodged and boarded upon credit, with my faithful Abigail, whom I shall distinguish by the name of Mrs. S., for the space of ten weeks, during which I saw nobody, and never once stirred abroad. While I was thus harassed out of all enjoyment of life, and reduced to the utmost indigence, by the cruelty of my persecutor, who had even stripped me of my wearing apparel, I made a conquest of Lord D., a nobleman who is now dead, and therefore I shall say little of his character, which is perfectly well known. This only will I observe, that, next to my own tyrant, he was the person of whom I had the greatest abhorrence. Nevertheless, when these two came in competition, I preferred the offers of this new lover, which were very considerable, and as an asylum was the chief thing I wanted, agreed to follow him to his country seat, whither I actually sent my clothes, which I had purchased upon credit. However, upon mature deliberation, I changed my mind, and signified my resolution in a letter, desiring at the same time that my baggage might be sent back. In consequence of this message, I expected a visit from him, in all the rage of indignation and disappointment, and gave orders that he should not be admitted into my house yet, notwithstanding this precaution, he found means to procure entrance, and one of the first objects that I saw, next morning, in my bedchamber, was my lover, armed with a horsewhip, against which, from a knowledge of the man, I did not think myself altogether secure, though I was not much alarmed, because I believed myself superior to him in point of bravery should the worst come to the worst. But, contrary to my expectation, and his usual behaviour to our sex, he accosted me very politely, and began to expostulate on the contents of my letter. I freely told him, that I had rashly assented to his proposal, for my own convenience only, that, when I reflected on what I had done, I thought it ungenerous in me to live with him upon these terms, and that, as I did not like him, and could not dissemble, such a correspondence could never tend to the satisfaction of either. He allowed the inference was just, though he was very much chagrined at my previous proceeding. He relinquished his claim, restored my clothes, and never afterwards upbraided me with my conduct in this affair, though he at one time owned, that he still loved me, and ever should, because I had used him ill, a declaration that strongly marks the peculiarity of his character. As for my own part, I own that my behaviour on this occasion is no other way excusable, and on account of the miserable perplexity of my circumstances, which were often so calamitous, that I wonder I have not been compelled to take such steps as would have rendered my conduct much more exceptionable than it really is. At last all my hopes were blasted by the issue of my suit, which was determined in favour of my lord. 
Even then I refused to yield, on the contrary, coming out of retirement, I took lodgings in Suffolk Street, and set my tyrant at defiance. But, being unwilling to trust my doors to the care of other people, I hired a house in Conduit Street, and no sooner appeared in the world again, than I was surrounded by divers and sundry sorts of admirers. I believe I received the incense and addresses of all kinds under the sun, except that sort which was most to my liking, a man capable of contracting and inspiring a mutual attachment. But such a one is equally rare and inestimable, not but that I owe myself greatly obliged to all those who cultivated my good graces, though they were very little beholden to me, for where I did not really love, I could never profess that passion, that sort of dissimulation is a slavery that no honest nature will undergo. Except one worthy young man whom I sometimes saw. They were a strange medley of insignificant beings, one was insipid, another ridiculously affected, a third void of all education, a fourth altogether inconsistent, and, in short, I found as many trifling characters among the men, as ever I observed in my own sex. Some of them I endeavoured to bring over to my maxims, while they attempted to make a proselyte of me, but, finding the task impracticable on both sides, we very wisely dropped each other. At length, however, I was blessed with the acquaintance of one nobleman, who is, perhaps, the first character in England, in point of honour, integrity, wit, sense, and benevolence, when I have thus distinguished him, I need scarce mention Lord. This great, this good man, possesses every accomplishment requisite to inspire admiration, love, and esteem. With infinitely more merit than almost ever fell to one man's share, he manifests such diffidence of his own qualifications, as cannot fail to prepossess every company in his favour. He seems to observe nothing, yet sees everything, his manner of telling a story, and making trifles elegant, is peculiar to himself, and, though he has a thousand oddities, they serve only to make him more agreeable. After what I have said, it may be supposed that I was enamoured of his person, but this was not the case, love is altogether capricious and fanciful, yet I admire, honour, and esteem him to the highest degree, and when I observe that his character resembled that of my dear departed friend Mr. B., or rather, that Mr. B., had he lived, would have resembled Lord, I pay the highest compliment I can conceive both to the living and to the dead. In this nobleman's friendship and conversation I thought myself happy, though I was, as usual, exposed to the indefatigable efforts of my Lord, who, one day, while I was favoured with the company of this generous friend, appeared at my door in his coach, attended by another gentleman, who demanded entrance with an air of authority. A very honest footman, who had been long in my service, ran upstairs in the utmost consternation, and gave me an account of what had happened below. Upon which I told him he had nothing to answer for, and ordered him to keep the door fast shut against all opposition, though I was so much affected with this unexpected assault, that Lord, said he was never more surprised and shocked in his life, than at the horror which appeared in my countenance, when I saw the coach stop at my door. My little hero being refused admittance, went away, threatening to return speedily with a reinforcement, and during this interval, I provided myself with a soldier, whom I placed sentinel at the door, with inside, to guard me from the danger of such assaults for the future. My lord, true to his promise, marched back with his auxiliaries, reinforced with a constable, and repeated his demand of being admitted, and my soldier opening the sash, in order to answer him, according to my directions, he no sooner perceived the red coat, than he was seized with such a panic, that he instantly fled with great precipitation, and, when he recounted the adventure, like Falstaff in the play, multiplied my guard into a whole file of musky tears. He also made a shift to discover the gentleman who had been so kind as to lend me one of his company, and complained of him to the Duke of N., in hopes of seeing him broke for his misdemeanour, but in that expectation he was luckily disappointed. Perceiving that in England I should never enjoy peace, but be continually subject to those alarms and disquarts which had already impaired my health and spirits, I resolved to repair again to France, my best refuge and sure retreat from the persecution of my tyrant. Yet, before I took this step, I endeavoured, by the advice of my friends, to conceal myself near Windsor, but was in a little time discovered by my lord, and hunted out of my lurking place accordingly. I then removed to Chelsea, where I suffered inconceivable uneasiness and agitation of mind, from the nature of my situation, my tranquillity being thus incessantly invaded by a man who could not be satisfied with me, and yet could not live without me. So that, though I was very much indisposed, I set out for France, by way of the Hague, as the war had shut up all other communication, having no other attendant but my womaness, who, though she dreaded the sea, and was upon the brink of matrimony, would not quit me in such a calamitous condition, 
until I was joined by my footman and another maid, whom I ordered to follow me with the baggage. But, before my departure, I sent a message to Lord, demanding my clothes, which he had seized in Essex, and, he refusing to deliver them, I was obliged to equip myself anew, upon credit. I was supplied with money for my journey by my good friend Dell, and, after a short and pleasant passage, arrived at The Hague, where I stayed two months, and parted with S, on whom I settled an annuity of five and twenty pounds, payable out of the provision which I had or might obtain from my husband. The same allowance had I prevailed upon Lord B to grant to another maid, who attended me while I lived in his house. I did not much relish the people in Holland, because they seemed entirely devoted to self-interest, without any taste for pleasure or politeness, a species of disposition that could not be very agreeable to me, who always despised money, had an unbounded benevolence of heart, and loved pleasure beyond every other consideration. When I say pleasure, I would not be understood to mean sensuality, which constitutes the supreme happiness of those only who are void of sentiment and imagination. Nevertheless, I received some civilities in this place, and, among the rest, the reputation of having for my lover the king a P.S. minister, who was young and airy, and visited me often, circumstances that were sufficient to lay me under the imputation of an amour, which I frequently incurred without having given the least cause of suspicion. Having taken leave of my Dutch friends, I departed from The Hague, in company with an English woman, whom I had chosen for that purpose, and arrived at Antwerp with much difficulty and danger, the highway being infested with robbers. After having reposed myself a few days in this city, I hired a coach for myself, and set out with my companion for Brussels, but, before we reached Mechelen, our vehicle was attacked by two hussars, who, with their sabres drawn, obliged the coachman to drive into a wood near the road. I at first imagined that they wanted to examine our passports, but was soon too well convinced of their design, and, though very much shocked at the discovery, found resolution enough to suppress my concern, so that it should not aggravate the terrors of the young woman, who had almost died with apprehension. I even encouraged her to hope for the best, and, addressing myself to the robbers in French, begged, in the most suppliant manner, that they would spare our lives, upon which one of them, who was a little fellow, assured me, in the same language, that we had nothing to fear for our persons. When we were conveyed in a state of dreadful suspense about three quarters of a mile into the wood, the ruffians came into the coach, and, taking my keys, which I kept ready in my hand for them, opened three large trunks that contained my baggage, and emptying them of everything but my hoops and a few books, packed up their booty in a cloth, then robbed me of my money and jewels, even to my shoe buckles and sleeve buttons, took my footman's laced hat, and gave it, by way of gratification, to a peasant, who came from behind the bushes, and assisted them in packing. This affair being dispatched, they ordered us to return to the road by a different way from that in which we were carried into the wood, and mounting their horses, rode off with the plunder, though not before the little fellow, who was the least ferocious of the two, had come and shaken me by the hand, wishing us a good journey, a compliment which I heartily returned, being extremely well pleased with the retreat of two such companions, who had detained us a whole half hour, during which, notwithstanding the assurance I had received, I was in continual apprehension of seeing their operation concluded with the murder of us all, for I supposed they were of that gang who had some time before murdered a French officer, and used a lady extremely ill, after having rifled her of all she had. Having thus undergone pillage, and being reduced to the extremity of indigence in a foreign land, it is not to be supposed that my reflections were very comfortable, and yet, though I sustained the whole damage, I was the only person in the company who bore the accident with any resolution and presence of mind. My coachman and valet seemed quite petrified with fear, and it was not till I had repeated my directions that the former drove farther into the wood, and took the first turning to the right, in order to regain the road, according to the command of the robbers, which I did not choose to disobey. This misfortune I suffered by the misinformation I received at Antwerp, where I would have provided myself with an escort, had not I been assured that there was not the least occasion to put myself to such extraordinary expense. And, indeed, the robbers took the only half-hour in which they could have had an opportunity of plundering us, for we no sooner returned into the highway, than we met with the French artillery coming from Brussels, which was a security to us during the rest of our journey. We were afterwards informed at a small village, that there was actually a large gang of deserters, who harboured in that wood, from which they made excursions in the neighbourhood, and kept the peasants in continual alarms. Having proceeded a little way, we were stopped by the artillery crossing a bridge, and, as the train was very long, must have been detained till night, had not a soldier informed me, that, if I would take the trouble to come out of my coach, and apply to the commandant, he would order them to halt, 
and allow me to pass. I took the man's advice, and was by him conducted, with much difficulty, through the crowd, to some officers, who seemed scarce to deserve the name, for, when I signified my request, they neither rose up, nor desired me to sit down, but, lolling in their chairs, with one leg stretched out, asked, with an air of disrespectful raillery, where I was going, and when I answered, to Paris, desired to know what I would do there. I, who am naturally civil where I am civilly used, and saucy enough where I think myself treated with disregard, was very much piqued at their insolent and unmannerly behaviour, and began to reply to the impertinent questions very abruptly, so that a very tart dialogue would have ensued, had not the conversation been interrupted by a tall, thin, genteel young French nobleman, an officer in the army, who, chancing to come in, asked with great politeness, what I would please to have. I then repeated my desire, and produced my passports, by which he learned who I was. He immediately gave orders that my coach should pass, and afterwards visited me at Paris, having obtained my permission, and taken my address at parting, while the others, understanding my name and quality, asked pardon for their impolite carriage, which they told me was owing to the representation of a soldier, who gave them to understand that I was a strolling actress. I could not help laughing heartily at this mistake, which might have proceeded from the circumstances of my appearance, my footman having been obliged to change hats with a peasant, and myself being without buckles on my shoes and buttons on my riding skirt, while my countenance still retained marks of the fear and confusion I had undergone. After all, perhaps the fellow was a droll, and wanted to entertain himself at my expense. The day was so far consumed in these adventures, that I was obliged to take up my lodgings at Mechelin, where I addressed myself to the intendant, giving him an account of the disaster I had met with, and desiring I might have credit to the inn, as our whole company could not raise the value of a sixpence. This gentleman, though a provincial, was polite in his way, and not only granted my request, but invited me to lodge at his own house. I accordingly gave him my company at supper, but did not choose to sleep at his quarters, because he appeared to be what the French call un vieux de bourg. Next day, he sent a trumpet to the general, with a detail of my misfortune, in hopes of retrieving what I had lost, but, notwithstanding all possible search, I was faint to put up with my damage, which, in linen, laces, clothes, and baubles, amounted to upwards of seven hundred pounds, a loss which never deprived me of one moment's rest, for, though I lodged at a miserable inn, and lay in a paltry bed, I slept as sound as if nothing extraordinary had happened, after I had written to London and Paris, directing that the payment of my bills of credit might be stopped. Indeed, I know of but two misfortunes in life capable of depressing my spirits, namely, the loss of health and friends, all others may be prevented or endured. The articles of that calamity which I chiefly regretted, were a picture of Lord W., and some inimitable letters from Mr. B. From Mechelen I proceeded to Brussels, where, being known, I got credit for some necessaries, and borrowed twenty guineas to defray the expense of my journey to Paris. Having consulted with my friends about the safest method of travelling through Flanders, I was persuaded to take places in the public voyage, and accordingly departed, not without fears of finding one part of the country as much infested with robbers as another. Nor were these apprehensions assuaged by the conversation of my fellow travellers, who, being of the lower sort of people, that delight in exaggerating dangers, entertained me all the way with an account of all the robberies and murders which had been committed on that road, with many additional circumstances of their own invention. After having been two days exposed to this comfortable conversation, among very disagreeable company, which is certainly one of the most disagreeable situations in life, I arrived at Lyle, where, thinking the dangerous part of the journey was now past, I hired a post chaise, and in two days more reached Paris without any further molestation. Upon my arrival in the capital, I was immediately visited by my old acquaintances, who, hearing my disaster, offered me their clothes, and insisted upon my wearing them until I could be otherwise provided. They likewise engaged me in parties, with a view of amusing my imagination, that I might not grow melancholy in reflecting upon my loss, and desired me to repeat the particulars of my story forty times over, expressing great surprise at our not being murdered, or ravished at least. As for this last species of outrage, the fear of it never once entered my head, otherwise I should have been more shocked and alarmed than I really was but it seems this was the chief circumstance of my companion's apprehension, and I cannot help observing, that a homely woman is always more apartment to entertain those fears, than one whose person exposes her to much more imminent danger. However, I now learned, that the risk I ran was much greater than I imagined it to be, those ruffians being familiarized to rape as well as murder. 
Soon after my appearance at Paris, I was favoured with the addresses of several French lovers, but I never had any taste for foreigners, or indeed for any amusement of that kind, except such as were likely to be lasting, and settled upon a more agreeable footing than that of common gallantry. When I deviated from this principle, my conduct was the effect of compulsion, and therefore I was never easy under it. Having been reduced to the alternative of two evils, the least of which I was obliged to choose, as a man leaps into the sea, in order to escape from a ship that is on fire. Though I rejected their love, I did not refuse their company and conversation, and, though my health was considerably impaired by the shock I received in my last adventure, which was considerably greater than I at first imagined, and affected my companion so much, that she did not recover her spirits till she returned to England, I say, though I was for some time a valetudinarian. I enjoyed myself in great tranquillity for the space of ten months, during which I was visited by English, Scotch, and French, of all parties and persuasions, for pleasure is of no faction, and that was the chief object of my pursuit, neither was I so ambitious of being a politician, as to employ my time and thoughts upon subjects which I did not understand. I had admirers of all sides, and should have spent my time very much to my liking, had not I felt my funds sensibly diminish, without any prospect of their being repaired for I had been obliged to lay out a great part of the sum allotted for my subsistence, in supplying my companion, my servant, and myself with necessaries, in lieu of those which we had lost. Having before my eyes the uncomfortable prospect of wanting money in a strange place, I found myself under the necessity of returning to England, where I had more resources than I could possibly have among foreigners, and with that view wrote to Lord S. Agents, desiring that I might be enabled to discharge my obligations at Paris, by the payment of my pin money. Thus a negotiation commenced, and his lordship promised to remit money for the clearance of my Paris debts, which amounted to four hundred pounds, but he would not advance one farthing more, though I gave him to understand, that, while he protracted the agreement, I must inevitably be adding to my encumbrances, and that I should be as effectually detained by a debt of twenty pounds, as if I owed a thousand. Notwithstanding all my representations, he would not part with one shilling over the net sum which I at first stipulated so that all my measures were rendered abortive, and I found it altogether impracticable to execute those resolutions I had formed in his favour. Thus did he for a mere trifle embarrass the woman for whom he professed the most unlimited love, and whose principles he pretended to hold in the utmost veneration. Indeed, his confidence in my integrity was not without foundation, for many wives, with one half of my provocation, would have ruined him to all intents and purposes, whereas, Notwithstanding all the extraordinary expenses to which I had been exposed by his continual persecution, he never paid a shilling on my account except one thousand pounds, exclusive of the small allowance which was my due. In a word, so much time elapsed before my lord could prevail upon himself to advance the bare four hundred, that I was involved in fresh difficulties, from which I found it impossible to extricate myself, and though I had occasion to write a letter to my benefactor lord, in which I expressed my acknowledgment of past favours, I could not venture to solicit more, even when I was encouraged by a very obliging answer, wherein he declared, that the good qualities of my mind and heart would bind him to me in friendship forever. While I ruminated on my uncomfortable situation, which would neither permit me to return to England, nor to stay much longer where I was, a young Englishman of immense fortune took Paris in his way from Italy, accompanied by a most agreeable Scotchman of very good sense and great vivacity. It was my good or ill fortune to become acquainted with these gentlemen, who, having seen me at the opera, expressed a desire of being known to me, and accordingly favoured me with a visit one afternoon, when the brisk North Briton engrossed the whole conversation, while the other seemed fearful and diffident even to a degree of bashfulness, through which, however, I could discern a delicate sensibility and uncommon understanding. There was in his person, which was very agreeable, as well as in his behaviour, a certain naivete that was very pleasing, and, at this first interview, we relished each other's company so well, that a sort of intimacy immediately commenced, and was carried on in a succession of parties of pleasure, in the course of which I found him fraught with all the tenderness and sentiment that render the heart susceptible of the most refined love, a disposition that immediately made me partial to him, while it subjected his own heart to all the violent impressions of a passion, which I little imagined our correspondence would have produced. Nevertheless, I was far from being displeased with my conquest because his person and qualifications, as well as his manner of address, were very much to my liking, and recommended him in a particular manner to my affection. Indeed, he made greater progress in my heart than I myself suspected, for there was something congenial in our souls, which, from our first meeting, I believe, 
had attracted us, unknown to ourselves, under the notions of friendship and regard, and now disclosed itself in the most passionate love. I listened to his addresses, and we were truly happy. His attachment was the quintessence of tenderness and sincerity, while his generosity knew no bounds. Not contented with having paid twelve hundred pounds on my account, in the space of one fortnight, he would have loaded me with present after present, had I not absolutely refused to accept such expensive marks of his munificence. I was even mortified at those instances of his liberality, which my situation compelled me to receive, lest, being but little acquainted with my disposition, he should suspect me of being interested in my love, and judge my conduct by the malicious reports of common fame, which, he afterwards owned, had at first obtained such credit with him, that he believed our mutual attachment would not be of long duration. But, in this particular, he was soon undeceived. His heart, though naturally adapted for the melting passion, had hitherto escaped untouched by all the ladies of Italy and France, and, therefore, the first impressions were the more deeply fixed. As he was unpractised in the ways of common gallantry and deceit, the striking simplicity in his character was the more likely to engage the heart of one who knew the perfidy of the world, and despised all the farce and bombast of fashionable profession, which I had always considered as the phrase of vanity and ostentation, rather than the genuine language of love. Besides, gratitude had a considerable share in augmenting my affection, which manifested itself in such a warm, cordial, artless manner, as increased his esteem, and riveted his attachment, for he could easily perceive, from the whole tenor of my conduct, that my breast was a natter stranger to craft and dissimulation, yet I was at first fearful of contracting any engagement with him, because, being younger than me, he might be more apartment to change, and the world might be malicious enough to suppose I had practised upon his inexperience, but, conscious of my own integrity, I set slander at defiance, trusting to my own behaviour, and his natural probity, for the continuance of his love. Though we did not live together in the same house, the greatest part of our time was spent in each other's company, we dined and supped at the same table, frequented public places, went upon parties to the country, and never parted, but for a few hours in the night, which we passed in the utmost impatience to meet again. In this agreeable manner did the days roll on, when my felicity was interrupted by a fit of jealousy with which I happened to be seized. I had contracted an acquaintance with a young married lady, who, though her personal attractions were but slender, was upon the whole an agreeable, cheerful, good-natured companion, with a little dash of the coquette in her composition. This woman being in very indigent circumstances, occasioned by some losses her husband had sustained, no sooner had an opportunity of seeing and conversing with my lover, than she formed the design of making a conquest of him. I should have forgiven her for this scheme, whatever pangs it might have cost me, had I believed it the effect of real passion, but I knew her too well to suppose her heart was susceptible of love, and accordingly resented it. In the execution of her plan, she neglected nothing which she thought capable of engaging his attention. She took all opportunities of sitting near him at table, ogled him in the most palpable manner, directed her whole discourse to him, trod upon his toes, nay, I believe, squeezed his hand. My blood boiled at her, though my pride, for some time, enabled me to conceal my uneasiness, till at length her behaviour became so arrogant and gross, that I could no longer suppress my indignation, and one day told my lover that I would immediately renounce his correspondence. He was greatly alarmed at this unexpected declaration, and, when he understood the cause of it, assured me, that, for the future, he would never exchange one word with her. Satisfied with this mark of his sincerity and regard, I released him from his promise, which he could not possibly keep, while she and I lived upon any terms, and we continued to visit each other as usual, though she still persisted in her endeavours to rival me in his affection, and contracted an intimacy with his companion, who seemed to entertain a passion for her, that she might have the more frequent opportunities of being among us, for she had no objection against favouring the addresses of both. One evening, I remember, we set out in my coach for the opera, and, in the way, this inamorata was so busy with her feet, that I was incensed at her behaviour, and, when we arrived at the place, refused to alight, but, setting them down, declared my intention of returning home immediately. She was so much pleased with this intimation, that she could not conceal the joy she felt at the thoughts of conversing with him, uninterrupted by my presence, an opportunity with which I had never favoured her before. This open exultation increased my anger and anxiety. I went home, but, being still tortured with the reflection of having left them together, adjusted myself in the glass, though I was too angry to take notice of my own figure, and without further delay returned to the opera. Having inquired for the box in which they sat, 
I took possession of one that fronted them, and, reconnoitring them, without being perceived, had the satisfaction of seeing him removed to as great a distance from her as the place would permit, and his head turned another way. Composed by this examination, I joined them without further scruple, when my young gentleman expressed great joy at my appearance, and told me he was determined to have left the entertainment, and come in quest of me, had I not returned at that instant. In our way homewards, my rival repeated her usual hints, and with her large hoop almost overshadowed my lover from my view, upon which my jealousy and wrath recurred with such violence, that I pulled the string as a signal for the coachman to stop, with a view of getting out, and going home afoot, a step which would have afforded a new spectacle to the people of Paris. But I reflected in a moment upon the folly of such resolution, and soon recollected myself, by calling my pride to my assistance. I determined, however, that she should act no more scenes of this kind in my presence, and that same night insisted upon my lover's dropping all intercourse and connection with this tormentor. He very cheerfully complied with my desire, and was even glad of an occasion to break off his acquaintance with a person about whom I had plagued him so much. Thus was I freed from the persecution of one of those creatures, who, though of little consequence in themselves, are yet the pests or society, and find means to destroy the harmony which reigns between two lovers, by the intrusion of a loose appetite, void of all sensibility and discretion. Having no feelings themselves, they cannot sympathize with those of other people, and do mischief out of mere wantonness. My lover being obliged to go to England, had settled me in a genteel house in Paris, with a view of returning when his affairs should be adjusted, but, when the time of his departure approached, he began to be uneasy at the prospect of separation, and, in order to alleviate his anxiety, desired me to accompany him to Calais, where we stayed together three or four days, during which the dread of parting became more and more intense, so that we determined upon my following him into England at the first opportunity, where I should live altogether in cog, that I might be concealed from the inquiries and attempts of my lord. Even after this resolution was fixed, we parted with all the agonies of lovers who despair of ever meeting again, and the wind blowing very high after he had embarked, increased my fears. But, by the return of the packet boat I was blessed with the report of his being safe arrived in England, and had the satisfaction of perusing his letters by every post. My admirer being thus detached from me, my thoughts were entirely employed in concerting some private method of conveying myself to him. As I would not trust myself in the common packet, for fear of being discovered, after having revolved divers schemes, I determined to transport myself in one of the Dutch fishing boats, though I knew the passage would be hazardous, but, in the case of such interesting concern, I overlooked all danger and inconvenience. Before I put this resolution in practice, I was so fortunate as to hear of a small English vessel, that arrived in Calais with a prisoner of war, in which I embarked, with my companion and another lady, who lived with me for some time afterwards, and, when he came on board, discovered that the ship was no other than a light collier, and that her whole company amounted to no more than three men. Nevertheless, though the sea was so rough, and the weather so unpromising, that no other boat would venture to put to sea, we set sail, and, between two storms, in about three hours arrived in safety in Dover. From hence my first companion went to her friends in the stage coach, while the other lady and I hired an open post chaise, though it snowed very hard, and, without any accident, performed our journey to London, where I met with my lover, who flew to my arms in all the transports of impatient joy, and, doubtless, I deserved his affection for the hardships, perils, and difficulties I had undergone to be with him, for I never scrupled to undertake anything practicable, in order to demonstrate the sincerity of what I professed. In consequence of our plan, I assumed a fictitious name, and never appeared in public, being fully satisfied and happy in the company and conversation of the man I loved, and, when he went into the country, contented myself with his correspondence, which he punctually maintained, in a series of letters, equally sensible, sincere, and affectionate. Upon his return to town for the remainder of the season, he devoted the greatest part of his time to our mutual enjoyment, left me with reluctance, when he was called away by indispensable business, and the civility which was due to his acquaintance, and very seldom went to any place of public entertainment, because I could not accompany and share with him in the diversion, nay, so much did I engross his attention that one evening, after he had been teased into an agreement of meeting some friends at a play, he went thither precisely at the appointed hour, and, as they did not arrive punctually at the very minute, he returned to me immediately, as much rejoiced at his escape as if he had met with some signal deliverance. Nor was his constancy inferior to the ardour of his love. We went once together to a ball in the Haymarket, where, in the midst of a thousand fine women, whose charms were enhanced by the peculiarity of the dresses they wore, 
He remained unshaken, unseduced, preserving his attachment for me in spite of all temptation. In the summer, he provided me with a house in the neighborhood of his own, but the accommodations being bad, and that country affording no other place fit for my residence, he brought me home to his own seat, and, by that step, raised such a universal clamor, though I saw no company, and led such a solitary life, that nothing but excessive love could have supported my spirits. Not but that he gave me as much of his time as he could possibly spare from the necessary duties of paying and receiving visits, together with the avocations of hunting, and other country amusements, which I could not partake. Formerly, indeed, I used to hunt and shoot, but I had left off both, so that I was now reduced to the alternative of reading and walking by myself, but love made up for all deficiencies to me, who think nothing else worth the living for. Had I been blessed with a partner for life, who could have loved sincerely, and inspired me with a mutual flame, I would have asked no more of fate. Interest and ambition have no share in my composition, love, which is pleasure, or pleasure, which is love, makes up the whole. A heart so disposed cannot be devoid of other good qualities, it must be subject to the impressions of humanity and benevolence, and enemy to nothing but itself. This you will give me leave to affirm, in justice to myself, as I have frankly owned my failings and misconduct. Towards the end of summer, my heart was a little alarmed by a report that prevailed, of my lovers being actually engaged in a treaty of marriage, however, I gave little credit to this rumor till I was obliged to go to town about business, and there I heard the same information confidently affirmed. Though I still considered it as a vague surmise, I wrote to him an account of what I had heard, and, in his answer, which is still in my possession, he assured me, with repeated vows and protestations, that the report was altogether false. Satisfied with this declaration, I returned to his house, and, though the tale was incessantly thundered in my ears, still believed it void of all foundation, till my suspicion was awakened by a very inconsiderable circumstance. One day, on his return from hunting, I perceived he had a very fine pair of Dresden ruffles on his shirt, which I could not suppose he would wear at such a rustic exercise, and, therefore, my fears took the alarm. When I questioned him about this particular of his dress, his color changed, and though he attempted to elude my suspicion, by imputing it to a mistake of his servant, I could not rest satisfied with this account of the matter, but inquired into the truth with such eagerness and penetration, that he could not deny he had been to make a visit. By degrees, I even extorted from him a confession, that he had engaged himself further than he ought to have proceeded, without making me acquainted with his design, though he endeavoured to excuse his conduct, and pacify my displeasure, by saying, that the affair would not be brought to bear for a great while, and, perhaps, might never come to a determination but he was in great confusion, and, indeed, hardly knew what he said. I would have quitted his house that moment, had not he beforehand obtained a promise that I would take no rash resolution of that kind, and put it out of my power to procure any method of conveyance by which I could make my retreat. I gave no vent to reproaches, but only upbraided him with his having permitted me to return, in ignorance, to the country, after I was once fairly gone, upon which he swore that he could not bear the thoughts of parting with me. This declaration was a mystery at that time, but I have been since so fully satisfied of his reasons for his conduct, that I heartily acquit him of all injustice to me. And, indeed, it is my sincere opinion, that, if ever young man deserved to be happy, he is certainly entitled to that privilege, and, if I may be allowed to judge, has a heart susceptible of the most refined enjoyment. The violence of the grief and consternation which I suffered from this stroke having a little subsided, I deliberated with myself about the measures I should take, and determined to leave his house some day when he should be abroad. I was encouraged in this resolution by the advice of our Scotch friend, who came about this time from London, on a visit to his fellow traveller. We thought such an abrupt departure would be less shocking than to stay and take a formal leave of my lover, whose heart was of such a delicate frame, that, after I told him I should one day withdraw myself in his absence, he never came home from the chase, or any other avocation, without trembling with apprehension that I had escaped. After he had been some time accustomed to these fears by my previous intimation, I at length decamped in good earnest, though my heart ached upon the occasion, because I left him loving and beloved, for his affection was evident, notwithstanding the step he had taken by the advice and importunity of all his relations, who laid a disagreeable restraint upon his inclinations, while they consulted his interest in every other particular. While I halted in the next great town, until I could be supplied with fresh horses, I was visited by a gentleman who had been formerly intimate with my lover, but a breach had happened in their friendship, and he now came to complain of the treatment he had received. Perceiving that I was not in a humor to listen to his story, he shifted the conversation to my own, 
and observed that I had been extremely ill-used. I told him that I was of a different opinion, that it was not only just, but expedient, that a young man of Mr. S. Fortune should think of making some alliance to strengthen and support the interest of his family, and that I had nothing to accuse him of but his letting me remain so long in ignorance of his intention. He then gave me to understand, that I was still ignorant of a great part of the ill usage I had received, affirming, that, while I lived in his house, he had amused himself with all the common women in that town, to some of whom this gentleman had personally introduced him. At first, I could not believe this imputation but he supported his assertion with so many convincing circumstances, that I could no longer doubt the truth of them, and I felt so much resentment, that my love vanished immediately into air. Instead of proceeding on my journey to London, I went back a considerable way, and sent a message desiring to see him in a little house, about midway between his own habitation and the town from whence I came. He obeyed my summons, and appeared at the place appointed, where I reproached him with great bitterness. He pleaded guilty to the charge, so far as acknowledging that he had corresponded with other women lately, in order to get the better of his affection for me. But the experiment had failed, and he found that he should be forever miserable. I did not look upon this candid confession as a sufficient atonement for his past dissimulation, and, in the sharpness of my revenge, demanded a settlement, which he peremptorily refused, so that for the present we held each other in the utmost contempt. Indeed, I afterwards despised myself for my condescension which was owing to the advice of my companion, supported and inflamed by the spirit of resentment. Nevertheless, he begged that I would return to his house, or stay all night where I was, but I was deaf to his entreaties, and, after a great deal of ironical civility on my side, I took my leave, and went away, yet, before I set out, I looked back, and saw him on horseback, with such an air of simplicity and truth, as called up a profound sigh, notwithstanding all that had passed in our conversation. Upon my arrival in London, I took lodgings in Leicester Fields, and answered a letter which I had some months before received from my lord, telling him that I would go home to him, without stipulating for any terms, to try what effect my confidence would have upon his generosity. He readily embraced the offer, and took a house in St. James's Street, where I proposed to comply with his humour in everything that was consistent with my own peace and tranquillity. Meanwhile, my lover passed his time very disagreeably in the country, with his friend, of whom, it seems, he had conceived some jealousy, which was increased by a letter I wrote to the gentleman, till he was made acquainted with the contents, which he read over forty times, and then his passion breaking out with more violence than ever, he not only expressed his feeling, in an epistle which I immediately received, but when he came to town suffered such agonies of despair as I had never seen before, except in Lord B. It was then in my power to have taken ample revenge upon him, as well as upon my insolent rival, who had insisted upon my leaving his house in a very abrupt manner, though he absolutely refused to gratify her malice, for he was now disposed to do anything for my satisfaction. But I knew his worth, and had too much regard for his reputation to advise him to act inconsistent with his honour. About this time, many tender feelings and sorrowful partings happened between us, till the marriage knot was tied, when he sent me a bank note for a thousand pounds, by way of specimen, as he called it, of his friendship, and of what he would do for me should I ever want his assistance. This mark of his generosity I received in a most tender billet, which I shall never part with, together with his picture set in diamonds. I now employed my thoughts in keeping measures with my lord, we lay in the same apartment, and for the first four or five months I neither dined nor supped abroad above twice, and then he knew where I was, and approved of my company. But all this complacency and circumspection had no effect upon his temper, which remained as capricious and dissatisfied as ever. Nay, to such a provoking degree did this unhappy humour prevail, that one day, in the presence of his lawyer, he harangued upon my misconduct since our last reunion, and very freely affirmed, that every step I had taken was diametrically opposite to his will. Conscious of the pains I had been at to please him, I was so incensed at these unjust invectives, that, starting up, I told him he was a little dirty fellow, and would have left the house immediately, had not his lawyer, and others, who were in the room, interposed and by dint of argument and importunity diverted me from my purpose. By the by, I have been informed by a person of rank, that my lord discovered exactly the same disposition in his further's lifetime, and only changed the subject of his complaint from the word further to that of wife. Indeed, he takes all opportunities of plaguing my dear parent, as he has just sagacity enough to know, that this is the most effectual way he can take to distress me. After repeated trials, I have given up all hopes of making him happy or of finding myself easy in my situation, 
and live with him at present to avoid a greater inconvenience. Not that his ill nature is all the grievance of which I complain, exclusive of the personal disgust I entertain for him. His folly is of that species which disobliges rather than diverts, and his vanity and affectation altogether intolerable, for he actually believes himself, or at least would impose himself upon mankind, as a pattern of gallantry and taste, and, in point of business, a person of infinite sagacity and penetration. But the most ridiculous part of his character is his pretended talent for politics, in which he so deeply concerns himself, that he has dismissed many a good servant, because he suspected him of having wrong connections, a theme upon which he has often quarrelled with me, even almost to parting, accusing me with holding correspondence with the Earls of B and C, and Mr. H. V., though I never had the least acquaintance with any of these gentlemen, except the Earl of C., to whom I have not spoken these ten years past. In short, I have often been at a loss to know, whether he was more mad and malicious in those fits of enthusiasm, wherein he seemed transported with zeal for the commonwealth, and tormented me with his admonitions out of all temper and patience. At length, however, I contrived an expedient which freed me from these troublesome expostulations, and silenced him effectually on the score of politics. This was no other than an open avowal of being connected with all those people whom I have named. Indeed, I knew him too well to believe there was anything solid in his intention or professions, even when he carried himself so far as to demand a private audience of the K in order to communicate a scheme for suppressing the rebellion, and that being denied, solicited the Duke of D.S. interest, for permission to raise and head a regiment of Kentish smugglers. Nay, to such a pitch did his loyalty soar, that he purchased a firelock of particular mechanism, calculated for the safety of the bearer, in case he had been placed sentinel at His Majesty's door, and kept his horses ready caparisoned, with a view of attending his sovereign to the field. Notwithstanding all these pompous preparations, had he been put to the proof, he would have infallibly crept out of his engagements, through some sneaking evasion, his imagination being very fertile in such saving pretenses. Yet he will talk sometimes so fervently, and even sensibly, on the subject, that a stranger would mistake him for a man of understanding, and determine zeal for the good of his country. Since my last return to his house, that act of Parliament passed, by which he was enabled to pay his debts, and, among the rest, a thousand pounds of my contracting, the only burden of that kind I ever entailed upon him, exclusive of my pin money, which was never regularly paid, nor would he have been subject to this, had he not, by his persecution and pursuit, exposed me to an extraordinary expense. I have also had it in my power to reward some of my faithful Abigails, in particular, to relieve from extreme distress that made to whom, as I have already observed, Lord B. granted an annuity, which she had sold, so that she was reduced to the most abject poverty, and I found her in a dismal hole with two infants perishing for want, a spectacle which drew tears from my eyes, and indeed could not but make deep impression upon a heart like mine, which the misery of my fellow creatures never failed to melt. Nor did I upon this occasion forget the attachment and fidelity of my other woman Mrs. S., who, hearing I was robbed in my passage through Flanders, had generously relinquished the allowance I had settled upon her at parting. The exercise of such acts of humanity and benevolence, and the pleasure of seeing my dear and tender parent often, in some measure alleviate the chagrin to which I am subject from the disagreeable disposition of my lord, who, consistent with his former inconsistency, upon our last reconciliation, cheerfully agreed to a proposal I made of having concerts in the house, and even approved of the scheme with marks of particular satisfaction. But, before one half of the winter was expired, he found means to banish all the company, beginning with Lord R.B., who, as he walked upstairs one evening, was stopped by a footman, who plainly told him he had orders to say to him in particular, that his lordship was not at home, yet the very next day, perceiving that nobleman and me walking together in the park, he joins us with an air of alacrity, as if no such thing had happened, and even behaved to Lord R. with the most fawning complaisance. His deportment was equally absurd and impertinent to the rest of his friends, who forsook us gradually, being tired of maintaining any friendly communication with such a disagreeable composition of ignorance and arrogance. For my own part, I look upon him as utterly incorrigible, and, as fate has subjected me to his power, endeavour to make the bitter draught go down, by detaching myself as much as possible from the supposition that there is any such existence upon earth. Indeed, if I had not fatal experience to the contrary, I should be apartment to believe that such a character is not to be found among the sons of men, because his conduct is altogether unaccountable by the known rules and maxims of life, and falls entirely under the poet's observation, when he says, 'Tis true, no meaning puzzles more than wit, 
Her ladyship having thus concluded her story, to the entertainment of the company, and the admiration of Peregrine, who expressed his astonishment at the variety of adventures she had undergone, which was such as he thought sufficient to destroy the most hardy and robust constitution, and therefore infinitely more than enough to overwhelm one of her delicate frame, one of the gentlemen present roundly taxed her with want of candor, in suppressing some circumstances of her life, which he thought essential in the consideration of her character. She reddened at this peremptory charge, which had an evident effect upon the countenances of the whole audience, when the accuser proceeded to explain his imputation, by observing, that, in the course of her narration, she had omitted to mention a thousand acts of uncommon charity, of which he himself knew her to be guilty, and that she had concealed a great many advantageous proposals of marriage, which she might have accepted before she was engaged. The company were agreeably undeceived by this explanation, which her ladyship acknowledged in very polite terms, as a compliment equally genteel and unexpected. And our hero, after having testified the sense he had of her complaisance and condescension, in regaling him with a mark of her confidence and esteem, took his leave, and went home in a state of confusion and perplexity, for, from the circumstances of the tale he had heard, he plainly perceived, that her ladyship's heart was too delicate to receive such incense as he, in the capacity of an admirer, could at present pay, because, though he had in some measure abridged the empire of Emilia in his own breast, it was not in his own power to restrain it so effectually, but that it would interfere with any other sovereign whom his thoughts should adopt, and unless lady, could engross his whole love, time, and attention, he foresaw that it would be impossible for him to support the passion which he might have the good fortune to inspire. He was, moreover, deterred from declaring his love, by the fate of her former admirers, who seemed to have been wound up to a degree of enthusiasm, that looked more like the effect of enchantment, than the inspiration of human attractions, an ecstasy of passion which he durst not venture to undergo. He, therefore, resolved to combat with the impressions he had already received, and, if possible, cultivate her friendship without soliciting her affection. But, before he could fix upon this determination, he desired to know the footing on which he stood in her opinion, and, by the intelligence of Crabtree, obtained in the usual manner, understood that her sentiments of him were very favourable, though without the least tincture of love. He would have been transported with joy, had her thoughts of him been of a more tender texture, though his reason was better pleased with the information he received, in consequence of which he mustered up the ideas of his first passion, and set them in opposition to those of this new and dangerous attachment, by which means he kept the balance in equilibrio, and his bosom tolerably quiet. 